Right now on America This Morning, your money, new turmoil in the Middle East hitting Americans in the wallet, oil and gas prices rising as the U.S. military takes new action against Iranian-backed rebels targeting ships in a key trading route. On alert, parts of the country dig out from a blizzard. Others are covered in dense fog. And now two storm systems targeting the west and east coast. The mystery surrounding a missing teenager in Texas, nine months pregnant. Her family saying she's been found dead. Her boyfriend was also reported missing. What police are saying this morning. Nearly two dozen states prepare to raise their minimum wage just days from now. How fast food chains are bracing for the higher labor costs. The workers now being laid off. My name's Bond. James Bond. Plus, James Bond actor Pierce Brosnan in trouble at Yellowstone National Park. Another streaming service announces big changes, costing some customers more. And later, the little boy who secretly unwrapped all his family Christmas presents at 3 a.m. Christmas morning. The reason why should make you laugh. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good Wednesday morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Dimber. I'm Andrea from GE in for Rhiannon. We begin with the rising cost of oil and gas as tensions escalate in the Middle East. The U.S. has launched airstrikes targeting militants in Iraq in recent days, and now another ship has come under attack in one of the world's most important trade routes, the Red Sea. All this is having consequences here at home. ABC's Liz Landers is here with details. Liz, good morning. Good morning, Andrea. Despite new action to address the security concerns, militia groups linked to Iran do not seem to be deterred from launching attacks, at least not yet. This morning, new tensions in the Middle East hitting your wallet. Oil and gas prices both on the rise after the Pentagon carried out airstrikes on Iranian-backed militants in Iraq. This is the damage left behind from the latest airstrike, payback for a drone attack on American troops that left one service member critically injured. This is very prevalent amongst the Iranians. It's how they conduct business. And it's very messy because they're using forces that sometimes don't actually take direct orders, but ultimately it's to push back against the influence of the United States. In a statement, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin saying he and President Biden, quote, will not hesitate to take necessary action to defend the United States, our troops, and our interests. There is no higher priority. About 3,500 U.S. troops remain in Iraq and Syria to prevent a resurgence of ISIS. And since the start of the Israel-Hamas war, the Pentagon estimates there have been roughly 100 attacks against U.S. personnel in the region, fueled by anti-Israeli sentiment. And now, a new attack in one of the busiest global shipping routes, the Red Sea. The U.S. officials reporting what is at least the 16th attack in the Red Sea since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. An American-led naval patrol group is now helping protect ships in the region. But the economic impact on everyday Americans now becoming clear with rising shipping costs. And oil prices up more than 2% in the last 24 hours. Gas prices up six cents per gallon nationwide in the last week, but rising as much as 16 cents in places like Florida. To show the extent of the problem, U.S. forces in the Red Sea say they shot down 17 drones and missiles fired by rebels in Yemen yesterday alone. Andrew? All right, Liz, thank you. Turning to the weather now, blizzard conditions are finally easing up in the northern plains. Travel has been treacherous across parts of Colorado, Nebraska, and the Dakotas. Ice is blamed for thousands of power outages, and now the concern is shifting east. Heavy rain is moving into Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and Washington, D.C. this morning. The storm system will push into the I-95 corridor in the northeast this afternoon, reaching New York City tonight. Dense fog remains a concern in the northeast. This was the scene in Boston yesterday, the skyline barely visible. We'll check your forecast in just a few minutes. Returning overseas, Israel is expanding its ground war in southern Gaza, focusing on refugee camps where Hamas fighters are believed to be hiding. A top advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with officials at the White House yesterday as the U.S. pushes for a pause in the fighting or a shift to a more targeted approach. One Israeli official says the military is close to dismantling Hamas. ABC's Britt Klenet is in Tel Aviv. Prime Minister Netanyahu in an op-ed laid out what he called three prerequisites for peace, writing, Hamas must be destroyed, Gaza must be demilitarized, and Palestinian society must be de-radicalized. This is Israel's army chief warns that the war will continue for many more months. 
And President Biden spoke with the leader of Qatar yesterday in hopes of jump-starting talks for a hostage deal. More than 100 hostages are being held by Hamas. The war in the Middle East is adding to security concerns for New Year's Eve. More than one million people are expected to pack into Times Square. A law enforcement threat assessment warns the ball drop could draw interest from malicious actors inspired by the conflict between Israel and Hamas. Protesters disrupted the Macy's parade on Thanksgiving, so New York officials are watching for a similar attempt on New Year's Eve. You have to be ready for those unpredictable circumstances. It's a real Herculean task to manage that number of people uh, without being heavy-handed, but being protective. Important to note here, authorities say there's no specific threat for New Year's Eve. We turn now to Texas, where a pregnant teenager and her boyfriend have been reported missing. Days later, a major development and a growing mystery when it comes to what police will reveal. This morning, what appears to be a tragic update in the search for a pregnant woman in Texas. The family of 18-year-old Savannah Soto says she and her boyfriend, Matthew Guerra, were found dead yesterday in a car outside a San Antonio apartment complex, three miles from Soto's home. But police are not yet confirming the identities of the victims. It appears to be a very complex crime scene. Soto, last seen near her home Friday, was nine months pregnant and one week past her due date. Her family says she was scheduled to be induced at the hospital Saturday, but never showed up. When I called her all morning, she wasn't answering. I was going straight to voicemail. And we went to the hospital anyways, and she was a no-show. And that's when I called the cops. She was so excited to have this baby. I mean, her, her, the house is already baby ready. She was so excited. She was going to be a mommy. Officials releasing few details, also not confirming how the victims died. But what we're looking at right now is a very, very perplexing crime scene. And detectives right now are looking at this as a possible murder. And uh, but we don't know for sure. Officials did say the bodies appear to have been inside the car for three to four days. According to court documents, Guerra was on probation for allegedly assaulting Soto on Christmas Day last year. I wasn't fond of him because of when he put hands on my daughter. The family is familiar with heartache. Soto's younger brother died in a shooting last year. Her family says Soto wanted to become a nurse. Again, police have not confirmed the victim's identities, saying the investigation continues. An unexpected stop for migrants being flown out of Texas. A commercial jet carrying more than 200 migrants from El Paso to New York City was diverted to Philadelphia due to bad weather. They were later put on buses. Some advocates believe Texas Governor Greg Abbott chartered the flight as officials struggled to cope with a record surge of migrants at the U.S. southern border. The final numbers are in from the holiday shopping season, and MasterCard says consumer spending was up about 3% compared to last year. That's about the same rate as the current inflation rate. Some experts say the fact that sales did not drop this holiday season shows a boost in consumer confidence. Restaurants saw the biggest increase in spending. Consumers are spending more to return gifts this year. One report found more than 80% of retailers are now charging fees for returns due to rising costs. It wasn't just the weather that delayed people at airports after Christmas. The TSA says an unusual number of sick calls in Atlanta, the nation's busiest airport, contributed to the delays. Nearly 7,000 flights were delayed yesterday. Passengers waited in line for hours. Time now for your Wednesday forecast. Good morning, Andrea and Andrew. Do you think we were done with the tough travel? Not so fast for late week. Wednesday morning, we're still dealing with ice. I-94 corridor and Bismarck to Fargo, dealing with slick roads and slick sidewalks, even a Thunder Bay. And if that wasn't enough, you're still seeing snow and a rain snow mix in places like Kansas City and St. Louis. This is gonna be to Wednesday nights. Rain in the I-95 corridor on the eastern coast there from Roanoke all the way into Boston. But New York, I'm focusing on you because you've got the potential for urban and street flooding. Yeah, basement apartments, those could be flooded. And if that wasn't enough, uh, dense fog advisories along the New England coast. Back to you, Andrea and Andrew. Coming up, fast food restaurants announce layoffs days before a minimum wage increase takes effect. But first, trapped for days after a crash, how an injured driver was finally found below a highway overpass. And the man previously known as Kanye West comes forward with a mea culpa. Whenever news breaks, 
We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. New video of firefighters rescuing a man who had been trapped in his truck for days after crashing into a river in Indiana. Police say he may have been there for one week. Two fishermen saw his truck while walking under a highway. Police say the crash victim couldn't reach his phone to call 911. Kanye West is apologizing to the Jewish community, posting a statement on Instagram in Hebrew after a series of anti-Semitic remarks. The rapper, who calls himself Ye, is asking for forgiveness. His apology comes just before the release of his new album. James Bond actor Pierce Brosnan is in hot water. He got a ticket at Yellowstone National Park for roaming into a thermal area that's off limits. He's reportedly been filming a movie in the area with Samuel L. Jackson. We turn now to the cost of living. As you probably know, it's been skyrocketing in recent years. But this January 1st, millions of Americans will get some help paying their bills. But not everyone is on board with the changes. With a new year comes new laws, and for many states, that means the minimum wage is going up. Beginning January 1st, 22 states will see their minimum hourly wage increase. In some states, the hike will be small, just 35 cents in Ohio. But in Hawaii, the minimum will rise by $2. The impact of the uh, increase in minimum wage uh, it just moves people closer and closer to um, out of poverty. In New York, a split. The minimum hourly wage in the New York City area will rise by a dollar, while the rest of the state sees an 80 cent raise. But it's California that has generated the most headlines. Wages there are growing up by 50 cents on January 1st. And then in April, fast food workers will see a far more substantial raise of $4 an hour. 557,000 people at 30,000 locations. This is a big deal. $20 an hour, 80% of the workforce force in these fast food places, 80% are people of color. Two-thirds two -thirds are women. This is for my ancestors. This is for all the farm workers, all the cotton pickers. This is for them. But the state is already paying the consequences. Two large Pizza Hut franchises announced yesterday that they're eliminating their in-house delivery services, resulting in more than 1,200 drivers being laid off. Customers will now have to use third-party apps like DoorDash for deliveries. And Chipotle and McDonald's have said they'll be raising prices in the state to offset the higher labor costs. 20 states are still at the federal minimum wage, which has been $7.25 an hour since 2009. $1 today can buy only about 70% of what it could buy back in 2009. Coming up, another health benefit of owning a pet. Also ahead, a new twist in the case of disgraced attorney and convicted killer Alec Murdoch that could help him get a new trial. We have
I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news, only on ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Breaking overnight, the South Korean actor Lee Sun Kyun has died. He's best known for his role in the Oscar winning movie Parasite. Police have been searching for the troubled actor. He was just 48. A new study suggests private equity firms taking over hospitals are bringing down the quality of care. Researchers found patients were more likely to fall and get infections after a private equity firm took over a hospital. They say the findings may reflect a priority for profit over safety. Another health benefit of owning a pet. A new study finds people prone to dementia may be able to delay the progression of the disease if they own a pet. That's because your dog or cat reduces loneliness, which doctors say is a risk factor for cognitive decline. We turn now to a new twist in the case of former South Carolina attorney and convicted murderer Alec Murdoch. His chance of winning a new trial may have improved thanks to a scandal surrounding the clerk who read the verdict. Guilty. In the aftermath of the verdict that sent disgraced attorney Alec Murdoch to prison for the murders of his wife and son, court clerk Becky Hill entered the spotlight. She co-wrote a book, Behind the Doors of Justice, The Murdoch Murders, promising an up-close look at the trial and her personal relationship with the Murdochs. But now, Hill is accused of plagiarizing part of that book from a British reporter. I was shocked. I was disappointed. Neil Gordon co-wrote the book with Hill. He says he found an ethical gaffe while reviewing Hill's emails. And I asked her if she could kind of explain maybe what happened. And she said that she felt like she was under a lot of deadline pressure. Hill has previously spoken openly about the Murdoch trial, including on a Netflix documentary. I had a feeling from our time together with the jury out at Moselle that it was not going to take our jury long to make the decision. In a statement responding to the plagiarism allegations, Hill's attorneys say she's deeply remorseful for this unfortunate lapse in judgment. But these developments could have consequences for Murdoch as he seeks a new trial. He previously claimed that Hill had tampered with the jury, a claim she denies and prosecutors insist is not credible. The plagiarism scandal could now put her credibility back in question as the judge weighs whether to grant a new trial. I think it's likely that Alec Murdoch gets a new trial, and this is why. Normally, you can't get into jury deliberations, but there's one important exception, and that's if there's outside influences in the jury room. The sales of Hill's book were suspended. As for Murdoch's request for a new trial, no hearing has been scheduled yet. In sports, it's not a record any team would want. The Detroit Pistons lost their 27th straight game last night, setting the record for longest single season losing streak. The 76ers still hold the overall record at 28 straight losses over two seasons. The Pistons could get loss number 28 tomorrow against the Celtics, who are the number one team in the East right now. 
Well, coming up, the $650 reservation at Applebee's. Plus, another popular streaming service makes a big change. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. All across the globe, the world will be celebrating the new year. And you can see it as it happens live. The global celebrations. See the new year as it comes in live. Streaming all day and night on ABC News Live. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis, weeknights on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Reporting from the front lines of the war in Israel, I'm Ian Panel. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the pulse, and we begin with another streaming service adding ads. This time, it's Amazon Prime Video. Subscribers were warned earlier this year, and now a date has finally been set. Beginning January 29th, movies and TV shows on the service will be broken up with advertising. Amazon says it plans to have fewer ads than other streaming providers. Ad-free programming will cost an extra $3 a month. Next, an expensive reservation at Applebee's. How about $650 to book a table? That's the cost if you want to hang out at the Applebee's in Times Square during the ball drop on New Year's Eve. If Applebee's isn't fancy enough, book a $12,000 ticket at a lounge nearby. That's worth it for the bathroom yeah, access, I think. There. <laughs> <laughs> Next, some police are accused of getting too aggressive in cracking down on speeding. USA Today is out with an opinion piece asking if aggressive speed traps are even legal. The newspaper cites the case of a small town in Ohio, population 500, but local police wrote 8,900 tickets in five months. A similar case was reported in a small town in Texas. Enforcement can make the streets safer, but critics claim it erodes trust in police, and they say towns that generate a large chunk of their revenue from fines and fees raise constitutional concerns. Everybody slow down. All right, next, a little boy in North Carolina who got a jump on Christmas. The three-year-old decided to sneak downstairs in the middle of the night to open his gifts and everyone else's. He unwrapped every present under the tree at 3 a.m. He only woke up his parents when he needed help opening his Spider-Man toy. Both of us uh, went to sleep uh, thinking everything was fine, everything was great. And then we were awoken uh, with a request for scissors, which is not really how you want to be woken up at 3 a.m. It just didn't enter our heads as a possibility that someone would go down and open all the presents. Now, his son said he unwrapped all the presents to make it less confusing for everyone. Mom raced to rewrap them before the other kids woke up. And finally, the Grinch had a pretty rough Christmas. He was over Louisiana when his flying machine suffered a mishap, causing him to crash into <gasps> the power lines. Whoops. Turns out he ran out of gas. He says he hung upside down <gasps> for about an hour, but was not hurt. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. <laughs> Top headlines, next. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. You're 
Wow, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Checking more top stories, Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Homeland Security Chief Alejandro Mayorkas will meet with Mexico's president today for talks on the migrant crisis at the border. It comes as the largest caravan in more than a year makes its way to the U.S. border with more than 8,000 migrants. Israel says it will not end its war against Hamas in Gaza anytime soon, despite global calls for a pause in the fighting. President Biden spoke yesterday to the leader of Qatar in hopes of jump-starting talks to release more hostages. In Florida, the reward is up to $10,000 in the manhunt for the suspect in a deadly mall shooting. Police say Albert Shell Jr. killed a man and wounded a woman in Ocala in a targeted attack that sent shoppers running for their lives. Today's weather, fog in the northeast, blizzard conditions finally wind down in the plains. The south is drying out, rain for the San Francisco Bay Area. And finally, dog lovers will love the Frosted Faces Foundation. Danny New explains. You want some belly rubs? At shelters, dogs in their golden years may not always be the first to get adopted. They have extra medical needs and maybe a little more attention. He's running! But what if those medical costs that usually accumulate with age were already covered? All they have to do is love the dog and we take care of the rest. Hi! Hi! Kelly and Andy run a San Diego-based shelter called Frosted Faces Foundation. Because senior dogs get like little white hairs. Yep. And basically, when you adopt one of the senior dogs at their facility, its medical costs, no matter how large, are covered for life. These dogs do end up passing away, and then someone's like, sure, I'll get my next dog from you, because then I get a dog and I get free medical care. Go find it. She's looking all around. Frosted Faces was born back in 2014. Kelly was working at a different shelter and was just very disappointed with how many senior dogs would either be put up for adoption or would never get adopted because of the expense. Our shelter system that nationwide, like, there's a crisis going on. Sit. Oh, that's very good girl. But now county shelters all over Southern California turn to Kelly and Andy to take those dogs that need a little more love. And nine years later, Frosted Faces is helping between 500 and 700 a year get adopted. Super rewarding. However, that's not going to be enough for Kelly and Andy. What are your goals? For the future. Our goal is to help more cats. <laughs> like that's a good direction to go in. And more nonprofits like these are popping up all over the country. But what makes Frosted Faces unique is that they even added their own veterinary staff on site two years ago. So now all adopted dogs guys can just come back and visit when they need something. Our thanks so to Danny New. Hey, older dogs need some love, too. Still lots of life left in those senior dogs. That's what's making news in America this morning. Have a great Wednesday.
Right now on America This Morning. Your money. New turmoil in the Middle East hitting Americans in the wallet. Oil and gas prices rising as the U.S. military takes new action against Iranian-backed rebels targeting ships in a key trading route. On alert, parts of the country dig out from a blizzard. Others are covered in dense fog. And now two storm systems targeting the west and east coasts. The mystery surrounding a missing teenager in Texas, nine months pregnant. Her family saying she's been found dead. Her boyfriend was also reported missing. What police are saying this morning. Nearly two dozen states prepare to raise their minimum wage just days from now. How fast food chains are bracing for the higher labor costs. The workers now being laid off. My name's Bond. James Bond. Plus, James Bond actor Pierce Brosnan in trouble at Yellowstone National Park. Another streaming service announces big changes, costing some customers more. And later, the little boy who secretly unwrapped all his family Christmas presents at 3 a.m. Christmas morning. The reason why should make you laugh. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good Wednesday morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Dimberg. I'm Andrea Fuji in for Rhiannon. We begin with the rising cost of oil and gas as tensions escalate in the Middle East. The U.S. has launched airstrikes targeting militants in Iraq in recent days, and now another ship has come under attack in one of the world's most important trade routes, the Red Sea. All this is having consequences here at home. ABC's Liz Landers is here with details. Liz, good morning. Good morning, Andrea. Despite new action to address the security concerns, militia groups linked to Iran do not seem to be deterred from launching attacks, at least not yet. This morning, new tensions in the Middle East hitting your wallet. Oil and gas prices both on the rise after the Pentagon carried out airstrikes on Iranian-backed militants in Iraq. This is the damage left behind from the latest airstrike, payback for a drone attack on American troops that left one service member critically injured. This is very prevalent amongst the Iranians. It's how they conduct business. And it's very messy because they're using forces that sometimes don't actually take direct orders, but ultimately it's to push back against the influence of the United States. In a statement, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin saying he and President Biden, quote, will not hesitate to take necessary action to defend the United States, our troops, and our interests. There is no higher priority. About 3,500 U.S. troops remain in Iraq and Syria to prevent a resurgence of ISIS. And since the start of the Israel-Hamas war, the Pentagon estimates there have been roughly 100 attacks against U.S. personnel in the region, fueled by anti-Israeli sentiment. And now, a new attack in one of the busiest global shipping routes, the Red Sea. U.S. officials reporting what is at least the 16th attack in the Red Sea since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. An American-led naval patrol group is now helping protect ships in the region. But the economic impact on everyday Americans now becoming clear with rising shipping costs. And oil prices up more than 2% in the last 24 hours. Gas prices up six cents per gallon nationwide in the last week, but rising as much as 16 cents in places like Florida. To show the extent of the problem, U.S. forces in the Red Sea say they shot down 17 drones and missiles fired by rebels in Yemen yesterday alone. Andrew? All right, Liz, thank you. Turning to the weather now, blizzard conditions are finally easing up in the northern plains. Travel has been treacherous across parts of Colorado, Nebraska, and the Dakotas. Ice is blamed for thousands of power outages, and now the concern is shifting east. Heavy rain is moving into Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and Washington, D.C. this morning. The storm system will push into the I-95 corridor in the northeast this afternoon, reaching New York City tonight. Dense fog remains a concern in the northeast. This was the scene in Boston yesterday. The skyline barely visible. We'll check your forecast in just a few minutes. Returning overseas, Israel is expanding its ground war in southern Gaza, focusing on refugee camps where Hamas fighters are believed to be hiding. A top advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with officials at the White House yesterday as the U.S. pushes for a pause in the fighting or a shift to a more targeted approach. One Israeli official says the military is close to dismantling Hamas. ABC's Britt Klenet is in Tel Aviv. Prime Minister Netanyahu in an op-ed laid out what he called three prerequisites for peace, writing, Hamas must be destroyed, Gaza must be demilitarized, and Palestinian society must be de-radicalized. This is Israel's army chief warns that the war will continue for many more months. 
And President Biden spoke with the leader of Qatar yesterday in hopes of jump-starting talks for a hostage deal. More than 100 hostages are being held by Hamas. The war in the Middle East is adding to security concerns for New Year's Eve. More than one million people are expected to pack into Times Square. A law enforcement threat assessment warns the ball drop could draw interest from malicious actors inspired by the conflict between Israel and Hamas. Protesters disrupted the Macy's parade on Thanksgiving, so New York officials are watching for a similar attempt on New Year's Eve. You have to be ready for those unpredictable circumstances. It's a real Herculean task to manage that number of people uh, without being heavy-handed, but being protective. Important to note here, authorities say there's no specific threat for New Year's Eve. We turn now to Texas, where a pregnant teenager and her boyfriend have been reported missing. Days later, a major development and a growing mystery when it comes to what police will reveal. This morning, what appears to be a tragic update in the search for a pregnant woman in Texas. The family of 18-year-old Savannah Soto says she and her boyfriend, Matthew Guerra, were found dead yesterday in a car outside a San Antonio apartment complex, three miles from Soto's home. But police are not yet confirming the identities of the victims. It appears to be a very complex crime scene. Soto, last seen near her home Friday, was nine months pregnant and one week past her due date. Her family says she was scheduled to be induced at the hospital Saturday, but never showed up. When I called her all morning, she wasn't answering. It was going straight to voicemail. And we went to the hospital anyways, and she was a no-show. And that's when I called the cops. She was so excited to have this baby. I mean, her, her, the house is already baby ready. She was so excited. She was going to be a mommy. Officials releasing few details, also not confirming how the victims died. But what we're looking at right now is a very, very perplexing crime scene. And detectives right now are looking at this as a possible murder. And uh, but we don't know for sure. Officials did say the bodies appear to have been inside the car for three to four days. According to court documents, Guerra was on probation for allegedly assaulting Soto on Christmas Day last year. I wasn't fond of him because of when he put hands on my daughter. The family is familiar with heartache. Soto's younger brother died in a shooting last year. Her family says Soto wanted to become a nurse. Again, police have not confirmed the victim's identities, saying the investigation continues. An unexpected stop for migrants being flown out of Texas. A commercial jet carrying more than 200 migrants from El Paso to New York City was diverted to Philadelphia due to bad weather. They were later put on buses. Some advocates believe Texas Governor Greg Abbott chartered the flight as officials struggled to cope with a record surge of migrants at the U.S. southern border. The final numbers are in from the holiday shopping season, and MasterCard says consumer spending was up about 3% compared to last year. That's about the same rate as the current inflation rate. Some experts say the fact that sales did not drop this holiday season shows a boost in consumer confidence. Restaurants saw the biggest increase in spending. Consumers are spending more to return gifts this year. One report found more than 80% of retailers are now charging fees for returns due to rising costs. It wasn't just the weather that delayed people at airports after Christmas. The TSA says an unusual number of sick calls in Atlanta, the nation's busiest airport, contributed to the delays. Nearly 7,000 flights were delayed yesterday. Passengers waited in line for hours. Time now for your Wednesday forecast. Good morning, Andrea and Andrew. Do you think we were done with the tough travel? Not so fast for late week. Wednesday morning, we're still dealing with ice. I-94 corridor and Bismarck to Fargo, dealing with slick roads and slick sidewalks, even a Thunder Bay. And if that wasn't enough, you're still seeing snow and a rain snow mix in places like Kansas City and St. Louis. This is gonna be to Wednesday nights. Rain in the I-95 corridor on the eastern coast there from Roanoke all the way into Boston. But New York, I'm focusing on you because you've got the potential for urban and street flooding. Yeah, basement apartments, those could be flooded. And if that wasn't enough, uh, dense fog advisories along the New England coast. Back to you, Andrea and Andrew. Coming up, fast food restaurants announce layoffs days before a minimum wage increase takes effect. But first, trapped for days after a crash, how an injured driver was finally found below a highway overpass. And the man previously known as Kanye West comes forward with a mea culpa.
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. news breaks it's so important to always remember that lives are changed here in london in buffalo uvalde texas edinburgh scotland reporting from rolling fork mississippi ukrainian refugees here in warsaw we're heading to a small community outside of mexico city getting you behind the stories as they happen abc news live prime we'll take you there stream abc news live weeknights wherever you stream your news only on abc news live why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. In Dnipro, Ukraine, I'm Martha Raddatz. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. New video of firefighters rescuing a man who had been trapped in his truck for days after crashing into a river in Indiana. Police say he may have been there for one week. Two fishermen saw his truck while walking under a highway. Police say the crash victim couldn't reach his phone to call 911. Kanye West is apologizing to the Jewish community, posting a statement on Instagram in Hebrew after a series of anti-Semitic remarks. The rapper, who calls himself Ye, is asking for forgiveness. His apology comes just before the release of his new album. James Bond actor Pierce Brosnan is in hot water. He got a ticket at Yellowstone National Park for roaming into a thermal area that's off limits. He's reportedly been filming a movie in the area with Samuel L. Jackson. We turn now to the cost of living. As you probably know, it's been skyrocketing in recent years. But this January 1st, millions of Americans will get some help paying their bills. But not everyone is on board with the changes. With a new year comes new laws, and for many states, that means the minimum wage is going up. Beginning January 1st, 22 states will see their minimum hourly wage increase. In some states, the hike will be small, just 35 cents in Ohio. But in Hawaii, the minimum will rise by $2. The impact of the uh, increase in minimum wage uh, it just moves people closer and closer to um, out of poverty. In New York, a split. The minimum hourly wage in the New York City area will rise by a dollar, while the rest of the state sees an 80 cent raise. But it's California that has generated the most headlines. Wages there are growing up by 50 cents on January 1st. And then in April, fast food workers will see a far more substantial raise of $4 an hour. 557,000 people at 30,000 locations. This is a big deal. $20 an hour, 80% of the workforce force in these fast food places, 80% are people of color. Two-thirds two -thirds are women. This is for my ancestors. This is for all the farm workers, all the cotton pickers. This is for them. But the state is already paying the consequences. Two large Pizza Hut franchises announced yesterday that they're eliminating their in-house delivery services, resulting in more than 1,200 drivers being laid off. Customers will now have to use third-party apps like DoorDash for deliveries. And Chipotle and McDonald's have said they'll be raising prices in the state to offset the higher labor costs. 20 states are still at the federal minimum wage, which has been $7.25 an hour since 2009. $1 today can buy only about 70% of what it could buy back in 2009. Coming up, another health benefit of owning a pet. Also ahead, a new twist in the case of disgraced attorney and convicted killer Alec Murdoch that could help him get a new trial. 
much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. All across the globe, the world will be celebrating the new year and you can see it as it happens live. The global celebrations. See the new year as it comes in live. Streaming all day and night on ABC News Live. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for best news program in all of television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis, weeknights on ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. The Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Breaking overnight, the South Korean actor Lee Sung Kyun has died. He's best known for his role in the Oscar winning movie Parasite. Police have been searching for the troubled actor. He was just 48. A new study suggests private equity firms taking over hospitals are bringing down the quality of care. Researchers found patients were more likely to fall and get infections after a private equity firm took over a hospital. They say the findings may reflect a priority for profit over safety. Another health benefit of owning a pet. A new study finds people prone to dementia may be able to delay the progression of the disease if they own a pet. That's because your dog or cat reduces loneliness, which doctors say is a risk factor for cognitive decline. We turn now to a new twist in the case of former South Carolina attorney and convicted murderer Alec Murdoch. His chance of winning a new trial may have improved thanks to a scandal surrounding the clerk who read the verdict. Guilty. In the aftermath of the verdict that sent disgraced attorney Alec Murdoch to prison for the murders of his wife and son, court clerk Becky Hill entered the spotlight. She co-wrote a book, Behind the Doors of Justice, The Murdoch Murders, promising an up-close look at the trial and her personal relationship with the Murdochs. But now, Hill is accused of plagiarizing part of that book from a British reporter. I was shocked. I was disappointed. Neil Gordon co-wrote the book with Hill. He says he found an ethical gaffe while reviewing Hill's emails. And I asked her if she could kind of explain maybe what happened. And she said that she felt like she was under a lot of deadline pressure. Hill has previously spoken openly about the Murdoch trial, including on a Netflix documentary. I had a feeling from our time together with the jury out at Moselle that it was not going to take our jury long to make the decision. In a statement responding to the plagiarism allegations, Hill's attorneys say she's deeply remorseful for this unfortunate lapse in judgment. But these developments could have consequences for Murdoch as he seeks a new trial. He previously claimed that Hill had tampered with the jury, a claim she denies and prosecutors insist is not credible. The plagiarism scandal could now put her credibility back in question as the judge weighs whether to grant a new trial. I think it's likely that Alec Murdoch gets a new trial, and this is why. Normally, you can't get into jury deliberations, but there's one important exception, and that's if there's outside influences in the jury room. The sales of Hill's book were suspended. As for Murdoch's request for a new trial, no hearing has been scheduled yet. In sports, it's not a record any team would want. The Detroit Pistons lost their 27th straight game last night, setting the record for longest single season losing streak. The 76ers still hold the overall record at 28 straight losses over two seasons. The Pistons could get loss number 28 tomorrow against the Celtics, who are the number one team in the East right now. 
Well, coming up, the $650 reservation at Applebee's. Plus, another popular streaming service makes a big change. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Reporting from South Korea, I'm Juhi Cho. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the pulse, and we begin with another streaming service adding ads. This time, it's Amazon Prime Video. Subscribers were warned earlier this year, and now a date has finally been set, beginning January 29th. Movies and TV shows on the service will be broken up with advertising. Amazon says it plans to have fewer ads than other streaming providers. Ad-free programming will cost an extra $3 a month. Next, an expensive reservation at Applebee's. How about $650 to book a table? That's the cost <laughs> if you want to hang out at the Applebee's in Times Square during the ball drop on New Year's Eve. If Applebee's isn't fancy enough, book a $12,000 ticket at a lounge nearby. That's worth it for the bathroom yeah, access, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Next, some police are accused of getting too aggressive in cracking down on speeding. USA Today is out with an opinion piece asking if aggressive speed traps are even legal. The newspaper cites the case of a small town in Ohio, population 500, but local police wrote 8,900 tickets in five months. A similar case was reported in a small town in Texas. Enforcement can make the streets safe but critics claim it erodes trust in police and they say towns that generate a large chunk of their revenue from fines and fees raise constitutional concerns. Everybody slow down. All right, next, a little boy in North Carolina who got a jump on Christmas. The three-year-old decided to sneak downstairs in the middle of the night to open his gifts and everyone else's. He unwrapped every present under the tree at 3 a.m. He only woke up his parents when he needed help opening his Spider-Man toy. Both of us uh, went to sleep uh, thinking everything was fine, everything was great, and then we were awoken uh, with a request for scissors, which is not really how you want to be woken up at 3 a.m. It just didn't enter our heads as a possibility that someone would go down and open all the presents. Now, his son said he unwrapped all the presents to make it less confusing for everyone. Mom raced to rewrap them before the other kids woke up. And finally, the Grinch had a pretty rough Christmas. He was over Louisiana when his flying machine suffered a mishap, causing him to crash into <gasps> the power lines. Whoops. Turns out he ran out of gas. He says he hung upside down <gasps> for about an hour, but was not hurt. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. <laughs> Top headlines, next. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. 
We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. so many people start their day here from abc news this is start here to be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories a lot of news today so let's get into it listen now to the daily news podcast honored with four edward r murrow awards and see why the new york times calls it a news podcast worth listening to start here abc news make it your daily first listen now that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming wherever you get your podcasts start here Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Checking more top stories, Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Homeland Security Chief Alejandro Mayorkas will meet with Mexico's president today for talks on the migrant crisis at the border. It comes as the largest caravan in more than a year makes its way to the U.S. border with more than 8,000 migrants. Israel says it will not end its war against Hamas in Gaza anytime soon, despite global calls for a pause in the fighting. President Biden spoke yesterday to the leader of Qatar in hopes of jump-starting talks to release more hostages. In Florida, the reward is up to $10,000 in the manhunt for the suspect in a deadly mall shooting. Police say Albert Shell Jr. killed a man and wounded a woman in Ocala in a targeted attack that sent shoppers running for their lives. Today's weather, fog in the northeast, blizzard conditions finally wind down in the plains. The south is drying out, rain for the San Francisco Bay Area. And finally, dog lovers will love the Frosted Faces Foundation. Danny New explains. You want some belly rubs? At shelters, dogs in their golden years may not always be the first to get adopted. They have extra medical needs and maybe a little more attention. He's running! But what if those medical costs that usually accumulate with age were already covered? All they have to do is love the dog and we take care of the rest. Hi! Hi! Kelly and Andy run a San Diego-based shelter called Frosted Faces Foundation. Because senior dogs get like little white hairs. Yep. And basically, when you adopt one of the senior dogs at their facility, its medical costs, no matter how large, are covered for life. These dogs do end up passing away, and then someone's like, sure, I'll get my next dog from you, because then I get a dog, and I get free medical care. Go find it. Just looking all around. Frosted Faces was born back in 2014. Kelly was working at a different shelter and was just very disappointed with how many senior dogs would either be put up for adoption or would never get adopted because of the expense. Our shelter system that nationwide, like, there's a crisis going on. Sit. Oh, that's very good girl. But now county shelters all over Southern California turn to Kelly and Andy to take those dogs that need a little more love. And nine years later, Frosted Faces is helping between 500 and 700 a year get adopted. Super rewarding. However, that's not going to be enough for Kelly and Andy. What are your goals? For the future. Our goal is to help more cats. <laughs> like that's a good direction to go in. And more nonprofits like these are popping up all over the country. But what makes Frosted Faces unique is that they even added their own veterinary staff on site two years ago. So now all adopted dogs guys can just come back and visit when they need something. Our thanks so to Danny New. Hey, older dogs need some love too. Still lots of life left in those senior dogs. That's what's making news in America this morning. Have a great Wednesday.
right now on America This Morning. Your money, new turmoil in the Middle East hitting Americans in the wallet, oil and gas prices rising as the U.S. military takes new action against Iranian-backed rebels targeting ships in a key trading route. On alert, parts of the country dig out from a blizzard. Others are covered in dense fog. And now two storm systems targeting the west and east coasts. The mystery surrounding a missing teenager in Texas, nine months pregnant. Her family saying she's been found dead. Her boyfriend was also reported missing. What police are saying this morning. Nearly two dozen states prepare to raise their minimum wage just days from now. How fast food chains are bracing for the higher labor costs. The workers now being laid off. My name is Bond. James Bond. Plus, James Bond actor Pierce Brosnan in trouble at Yellowstone National Park. Another streaming service announces big changes, costing some customers more. And later, the little boy who secretly unwrapped all his family Christmas presents at 3 a.m. Christmas morning. The reason why should make you laugh. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good Wednesday morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Dimberg. I'm Andrea Fuji in for Rhiannon. We begin with the rising cost of oil and gas as tensions escalate in the Middle East. The U.S. has launched airstrikes targeting militants in Iraq in recent days, and now another ship has come under attack in one of the world's most important trade routes, the Red Sea. All this is having consequences here at home. ABC's Liz Landers is here with details. Liz, good morning. Good morning, Andrea. Despite new action to address the security concerns, militia groups linked to Iran do not seem to be deterred from launching attacks, at least not yet. This morning, new tensions in the Middle East hitting your wallet. Oil and gas prices both on the rise after the Pentagon carried out airstrikes on Iranian-backed militants in Iraq. This is the damage left behind from the latest airstrike, payback for a drone attack on American troops that left one service member critically injured. This is very prevalent amongst the Iranians. It's how they conduct business. And it's very messy because they're using forces that sometimes don't actually take direct orders, but ultimately it's to push back against the influence of the United States. In a statement, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin saying he and President Biden, quote, will not hesitate to take necessary action to defend the United States, our troops and our interests. There is no higher priority. About 3,500 U.S. troops remain in Iraq and Syria to to prevent a resurgence of ISIS. And since the start of the Israel-Hamas war, the Pentagon estimates there have been roughly 100 attacks against U.S. personnel in the region, fueled by anti-Israeli sentiment. And now, a new attack in one of the busiest global shipping routes, the Red Sea. U.S. officials reporting what is at least the 16th attack in the Red Sea since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. An American-led naval patrol group is now helping protect ships in the region. But the economic impact on everyday Americans now becoming clear with rising shipping costs. And oil prices up more than 2% in the last 24 hours. Gas prices up six cents per gallon nationwide in the last week, but rising as much as 16 cents in places like Florida. To show the extent of the problem, U.S. forces in the Red Sea say they shot down 17 drones and missiles fired by rebels in Yemen yesterday alone. Andrew? All right, Liz, thank you. Turning to the weather now, blizzard conditions are finally easing up in the northern plains. Travel has been treacherous across parts of Colorado, Nebraska, and the Dakotas. Ice is blamed for thousands of power outages, and now the concern is shifting east. Heavy rain is moving into Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and Washington, D.C. this morning. The storm system will push into the I-95 corridor in the northeast this afternoon, reaching New York City tonight. Dense fog remains a concern in the northeast. This was the scene in Boston yesterday, the skyline barely visible. We'll check your forecast in just a few minutes. Returning overseas, Israel is expanding its ground war in southern Gaza, focusing on refugee camps where Hamas fighters are believed to be hiding. A top advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with officials at the White House yesterday as the U.S. pushes for a pause in the fighting or a shift to a more targeted approach. One Israeli official says the military is close to dismantling Hamas. ABC's Britt Klenet is in Tel Aviv. Prime Minister Netanyahu in an op-ed laid out what he called three prerequisites for peace, writing, Hamas must be destroyed, Gaza must be demilitarized, and Palestinian society must be de-radicalized. This is Israel's army chief warns that the war will continue for many more months. 
And President Biden spoke with the leader of Qatar yesterday in hopes of jump-starting talks for a hostage deal. More than 100 hostages are being held by Hamas. The war in the Middle East is adding to security concerns for New Year's Eve. More than one million people are expected to pack into Times Square. A law enforcement threat assessment warns the ball drop could draw interest from malicious actors inspired by the conflict between Israel and Hamas. Protesters disrupted the Macy's parade on Thanksgiving, so New York officials are watching for a similar attempt on New Year's Eve. You have to be ready for those unpredictable circumstances. It's a real Herculean task to manage that number of people uh, without being heavy-handed, but being protective. Important to note here, authorities say there's no specific threat for New Year's Eve. We turn now to Texas, where a pregnant teenager and her boyfriend have been reported missing. Days later, a major development and a growing mystery when it comes to what police will reveal. This morning, what appears to be a tragic update in the search for a pregnant woman in Texas. The family of 18-year-old Savannah Soto says she and her boyfriend, Matthew Guerra, were found dead yesterday in a car outside a San Antonio apartment complex, three miles from Soto's home. But police are not yet confirming the identities of the victims. It appears to be a very complex crime scene. Soto, last seen near her home Friday, was nine months pregnant and one week past her due date. Her family says she was scheduled to be induced at the hospital Saturday, but never showed up. When I called her all morning, she wasn't answering. It was going straight to voicemail. And we went to the hospital anyways, and she was a no-show. And that's when I called the cops. She was so excited to have this baby. I mean, her, her, the house is already baby ready. She was so excited. She was going to be a mommy. Officials releasing few details, also not confirming how the victims died. But what we're looking at right now is a very, very perplexing crime scene. And detectives right now are looking at this as a possible murder. And uh, but we don't know for sure. Officials did say the bodies appear to have been inside the car for three to four days. According to court documents, Guerra was on probation for allegedly assaulting Soto on Christmas Day last year. I wasn't fond of him because of when he put hands on my daughter. The family is familiar with heartache. Soto's younger brother died in a shooting last year. Her family says Soto wanted to become a nurse. Again, police have not confirmed the victim's identities, saying the investigation continues. An unexpected stop for migrants being flown out of Texas. A commercial jet carrying more than 200 migrants from El Paso to New York City was diverted to Philadelphia due to bad weather. They were later put on buses. Some advocates believe Texas Governor Greg Abbott chartered the flight as officials struggled to cope with a record surge of migrants at the U.S. southern border. The final numbers are in from the holiday shopping season, and MasterCard says consumer spending was up about 3% compared to last year. That's about the same rate as the current inflation rate. Some experts say the fact that sales did not drop this holiday season shows a boost in consumer confidence. Restaurants saw the biggest increase in spending. Consumers are spending more to return gifts this year. One report found more than 80% of retailers are now charging fees for returns due to rising costs. It wasn't just the weather that delayed people at airports after Christmas. The TSA says an unusual number of sick calls in Atlanta, the nation's busiest airport, contributed to the delays. Nearly 7,000 flights were delayed yesterday. Passengers waited in line for hours. Time now for your Wednesday forecast. Good morning, Andrea and Andrew. Do you think we were done with the tough travel? Not so fast for late week. Wednesday morning, we're still dealing with ice. I-94 corridor in Bismarck to Fargo, dealing with slick roads and slick sidewalks, even a Thunder Bay. And if that wasn't enough, you're still seeing snow and a rain-snow mix in places like Kansas City and St. Louis. This is going to be to Wednesday nights. Rain in the I-95 corridor on the eastern coast there, from Roanoke all the way into Boston. But New York, I'm focusing on you because you've got the potential for urban and street flooding. Yeah, basement apartments, those could be flooded. And if that wasn't enough, uh, dense fog advisories along the New England coast. Back to you, Andrea and Andrew. Coming up, fast food restaurants announce layoffs days before a minimum wage increase takes effect. But first, trapped for days after a crash, how an injured driver was finally found below a highway overpass. And the man previously known as Kanye West comes forward with a mea culpa. Whenever news breaks, 
We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. The year 2023. High stakes, high emotion, high drama. Now tonight. Amazing. The absolute wildest year. We're breaking it all down. Taylor Swift, Beyonce, Barbie. Can you get all that in there? And the stories that make you go, huh? You kidding? Can we say that on ABC? Yeah. Deal with it. It's the year 2023 with Robin Roberts. Getting ready to kiss 2023 goodbye. Tonight on ABC. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. New video of firefighters rescuing a man who had been trapped in his truck for days after crashing into a river in Indiana. Police say he may have been there for one week. Two fishermen saw his truck while walking under a highway. Police say the crash victim couldn't reach his phone to call 911. Kanye West is apologizing to the Jewish community, posting a statement on Instagram in Hebrew after a series of anti-Semitic remarks. The rapper, who calls himself Ye, is asking for forgiveness. His apology comes just before the release of his new album. James Bond actor Pierce Brosnan is in hot water. He got a ticket at Yellowstone National Park for roaming into a thermal area that's off limits. He's reportedly been filming a movie in the area with Samuel L. Jackson. We turn now to the cost of living. As you probably know, it's been skyrocketing in recent years. But this January 1st, millions of Americans will get some help paying their bills. But not everyone is on board with the changes. With a new year comes new laws, and for many states, that means the minimum wage is going up. Beginning January 1st, 22 states will see their minimum hourly wage increase. In some states, the hike will be small, just 35 cents in Ohio. But in Hawaii, the minimum will rise by $2. The impact of the uh, increase in minimum wage uh, it just moves people closer and closer to um, out of poverty. In New York, a split. The minimum hourly wage in the New York City area will rise by a dollar, while the rest of the state sees an 80 cent raise. But it's California that has generated the most headlines. Wages there are growing up by 50 cents on January 1st. And then in April, fast food workers will see a far more substantial raise of $4 an hour. 557,000 people at 30,000 locations. This is a big deal. $20 an hour, 80% 80 of the workforce force in these fast food places, 80% are people of color. Two-thirds two -thirds are women. This is for my ancestors. This is for all the farm workers, all the cotton pickers. This is for them. But the state is already paying the consequences. Two large Pizza Hut franchises announced yesterday that they're eliminating their in-house delivery services, resulting in more than 1,200 drivers being laid off. Customers will now have to use third-party apps like DoorDash for deliveries. And Chipotle and McDonald's have said they'll be raising prices in the state to offset the higher labor costs. 20 states are still at the federal minimum wage, which has been $7.25 an hour since 2009. $1 today can buy only about 70% of what it could buy back in 2009. Coming up, another health benefit of owning a pet. Also ahead, a new twist in the case of disgraced attorney and convicted killer Alec Murdoch that could help him get a new trial.
whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Breaking overnight, the South Korean actor Lee Sun Kyun has died. He's best known for his role in the Oscar winning movie Parasite. Police have been searching for the troubled actor. He was just 48. A new study suggests private equity firms taking over hospitals are bringing down the quality of care. Researchers found patients were more likely to fall and get infections after a private equity firm took over a hospital. They say the findings may reflect a priority for profit over safety. Another health benefit of owning a pet. A new study finds people prone to dementia may be able to delay the progression of the disease if they own a pet. That's because your dog or cat reduces loneliness, which doctors say is a risk factor for cognitive decline. We turn now to a new twist in the case of former South Carolina attorney and convicted murderer Alec Murdoch. His chance of winning a new trial may have improved thanks to a scandal surrounding the clerk who read the verdict. Guilty. In the aftermath of the verdict that sent disgraced attorney Alec Murdoch to prison for the murders of his wife and son, court clerk Becky Hill entered the spotlight. She co-wrote a book, Behind the Doors of Justice, The Murdoch Murders, promising an up-close look at the trial and her personal relationship with the Murdochs. But now, Hill is accused of plagiarizing part of that book from a British reporter. I was shocked. I was disappointed. Neil Gordon co-wrote the book with Hill. He says he found an ethical gaffe while reviewing Hill's emails. And I asked her if she could kind of explain maybe what happened. And she said that she felt like she was under a lot of deadline pressure. Hill has previously spoken openly about the Murdoch trial, including on a Netflix documentary. I had a feeling from our time together with the jury out at Moselle that it was not going to take our jury long to make the decision. In a statement responding to the plagiarism allegations, Hill's attorneys say she's deeply remorseful for this unfortunate lapse in judgment. But these developments could have consequences for Murdoch as he seeks a new trial. He previously claimed that Hill had tampered with the jury, a claim she denies and prosecutors insist is not credible. The plagiarism scandal could now put her credibility back in question as the judge weighs whether to grant a new trial. I think it's likely that Alec Murdoch gets a new trial, and this is why. Normally, you can't get into jury deliberations, but there's one important exception, and that's if there's outside influences in the jury room. The sales of Hill's book were suspended. As for Murdoch's request for a new trial, no hearing has been scheduled yet. In sports, it's not a record any team would want. The Detroit Pistons lost their 27th straight game last night, setting the record for longest single season losing streak. The 76ers still hold the overall record at 28 straight losses over two seasons. The Pistons could get loss number 28 tomorrow. 
against the Celtics, who are the number one team in the East right now. Well, coming up, the $650 reservation at Applebee's. Plus, another popular streaming service makes a big change. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. <laughs> dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. <laughs> Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. Reporting from Tallahassee, covering Hurricane Idalia, I'm Victor Okendo. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the pulse, and we begin with another streaming service adding ads. This time, it's Amazon Prime Video. Subscribers were warned earlier this year, and now a date has finally been set. Beginning January 29th, Movies and TV shows on the service will be broken up with advertising. Amazon says it plans to have fewer ads than other streaming providers. Ad-free programming will cost an extra $3 a month. Next, an expensive reservation at Applebee's. How about $650 to book a table? That's the cost <laughs> if you want to hang out at the Applebee's in Times Square during the ball drop on New Year's Eve. If Applebee's isn't fancy enough, book a $12,000 ticket at a lounge nearby. That's worth it for the bathroom yeah, access, I think. There. <laughs> <laughs> Next, some police are accused of getting too aggressive in cracking down on speeding. USA Today is out with an opinion piece asking if aggressive speed traps are even legal. The newspaper cites the case of a small town in Ohio, population 500, but local police wrote 8,900 tickets in five months. A similar case was reported in a small town in Texas. Enforcement can make the streets safer, but critics claim it erodes trust in police, and they say towns that generate a large chunk of their revenue from fines and fees raise constitutional concerns. Everybody slow down. All right, next, a little boy in North Carolina who got a jump on Christmas. The three-year-old decided to sneak downstairs in the middle of the night to open his gifts and everyone else's. He unwrapped every present under the tree at 3 a.m. He only woke up his parents when he needed help opening his Spider-Man toy. Both of us uh, went to sleep uh, thinking everything was fine, everything was great. And then we were awoken uh, with a request for scissors, which is not really how you want to be woken up at 3 a.m. It just didn't enter our heads as a possibility that someone would go down and open all the presents. Now, his son said he unwrapped all the presents to make it less confusing for everyone. Mom raced to rewrap them before the other kids woke up. And finally, the Grinch had a pretty rough Christmas. He was over Louisiana when his flying machine suffered a mishap, causing him to crash into the <gasps> power lines. Whoops. Turns out he ran out of gas. He says he hung upside down <gasps> for about an hour, but was not hurt. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. <laughs> Top headlines. Next. 
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families front. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Checking more top stories, Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Homeland Security Chief Alejandro Mayorkas will meet with Mexico's president today for talks on the migrant crisis at the border. It comes as the largest caravan in more than a year makes its way to the U.S. border with more than 8,000 migrants. Israel says it will not end its war against Hamas in Gaza anytime soon, despite global calls for a pause in the fighting. President Biden spoke yesterday to the leader of Qatar in hopes of jump-starting talks to release more hostages. In Florida, the reward is up to $10,000 in the manhunt for the suspect in a deadly mall shooting. Police say Albert Shell Jr. killed a man and wounded a woman in Ocala in a targeted attack that sent shoppers running for their lives. Today's weather, fog in the northeast, blizzard conditions finally wind down in the plains. The south is drying out, rain for the San Francisco Bay Area. And finally, dog lovers will love the Frosted Faces Foundation. Danny New explains. You want some belly rubs? At shelters, dogs in their golden years may not always be the first to get adopted. They have extra medical needs and maybe a little more attention. He's running! But what if those medical costs that usually accumulate with age were already covered? All they have to do is love the dog and we take care of the rest. Hi! Hi! Kelly and Andy run a San Diego-based shelter called Frosted Faces Foundation. Because senior dogs get like little white hairs. Yep. And basically, when you adopt one of the senior dogs at their facility, its medical costs, no matter how large, are covered for life. These dogs do end up passing away, and then someone's like, sure, I'll get my next dog from you, because then I get a dog, and I get free medical care. Go find it. Looking all around. Frosted Faces was born back in 2014. Kelly was working at a different shelter and was just very disappointed with how many senior dogs would either be put up for adoption or would never get adopted because of the expense. Our shelter system, that nationwide, like, there's a crisis going on. Sit. Oh, that's very good girl. But now, county shelters all over Southern California turn to Kelly and Andy to take those dogs that need a little more love. And nine years later, Frosted Faces is helping between 500 and 700 a year get adopted. Super rewarding. However, that's not going to be enough for Kelly and Andy. What are your goals for the future? Our goal is to help more cats. <laughs> like that's a good direction to go in. And more nonprofits like these are popping up all over the country. But what makes Frosted Faces unique is that they even added their own veterinary staff on site two years ago. So now all adopted dogs, guys, can just come back and visit when they need something. That's Our thanks so to Danny New. Hey, older dogs need some love, too. Still lots of life left in those senior dogs. That's what's making news in America this morning. Have a great Wednesday.
right now on America This Morning. Your money, new turmoil in the Middle East hitting Americans in the wallet, oil and gas prices rising as the U.S. military takes new action against Iranian-backed rebels targeting ships in a key trading route. On alert, parts of the country dig out from a blizzard. Others are covered in dense fog. And now two storm systems targeting the west and east coasts. The mystery surrounding a missing teenager in Texas, nine months pregnant. Her family saying she's been found dead. Her boyfriend was also reported missing. What police are saying this morning. Nearly two dozen states prepare to raise their minimum wage just days from now. How fast food chains are bracing for the higher labor costs. The workers now being laid off. My name's Bond. James Bond. Plus, James Bond actor Pierce Brosnan in trouble at Yellowstone National Park. Another streaming service announces big changes, costing some customers more. And later, the little boy who secretly unwrapped all his family Christmas presents at 3 a.m. Christmas morning. The reason why should make you laugh. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good Wednesday morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Dimberg. I'm Andrea from GE in for Rhiannon. We begin with the rising cost of oil and gas as tensions escalate in the Middle East. The U.S. has launched airstrikes targeting militants in Iraq in recent days, and now another ship has come under attack in one of the world's most important trade routes, the Red Sea. All this is having consequences here at home. ABC's Liz Landers is here with details. Liz, good morning. Good morning, Andrea. Despite new action to address the security concerns, militia groups linked to Iran do not seem to be deterred from launching attacks, at least not yet. This morning, new tensions in the Middle East hitting your wallet. Oil and gas prices both on the rise after the Pentagon carried out airstrikes on Iranian-backed militants in Iraq. This is the damage left behind from the latest airstrike, payback for a drone attack on American troops that left one service member critically injured. This is very prevalent amongst the Iranians. It's how they conduct business. And it's very messy because they're using forces that sometimes don't actually take direct orders, but ultimately it's to push back against the influence of the United States. In a statement, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin saying he and President Biden, quote, will not hesitate to take necessary action to defend the United States, our troops, and our interests. There is no higher priority. About 3,500 U.S. troops remain in Iraq and Syria to to prevent a resurgence of ISIS. And since the start of the Israel-Hamas war, the Pentagon estimates there have been roughly 100 attacks against U.S. personnel in the region, fueled by anti-Israeli sentiment. And now, a new attack in one of the busiest global shipping routes, the Red Sea. U.S. officials reporting what is at least the 16th attack in the Red Sea since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. An American-led naval patrol group is now helping protect ships in the region. But the economic impact on everyday Americans now becoming clear with rising shipping costs. And oil prices up more than 2% in the last 24 hours. Gas prices up six cents per gallon nationwide in the last week, but rising as much as 16 cents in places like Florida. To show the extent of the problem, U.S. forces in the Red Sea say they shot down 17 drones and missiles fired by rebels in Yemen yesterday alone. Andrew? All right, Liz, thank you. Turning to the weather now, blizzard conditions are finally easing up in the northern plains. Travel has been treacherous across parts of Colorado, Nebraska, and the Dakotas. Ice is blamed for thousands of power outages, and now the concern is shifting east. Heavy rain is moving into Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and Washington, D.C. this morning. The storm system will push into the I-95 corridor in the northeast this afternoon, reaching New York City tonight. Dense fog remains a concern in the northeast. This was the scene in Boston yesterday. The skyline barely visible. We'll check your forecast in just a few minutes. Returning overseas, Israel is expanding its ground war in southern Gaza, focusing on refugee camps where Hamas fighters are believed to be hiding. A top advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with officials at the White House yesterday as the U.S. pushes for a pause in the fighting or a shift to a more targeted approach. One Israeli official says the military is close to dismantling Hamas. ABC's Britt Klenet is in Tel Aviv. Prime Minister Netanyahu in an op-ed laid out what he called three prerequisites for peace, writing, Hamas must be destroyed, Gaza must be demilitarized, and Palestinian society must be de-radicalized. This is Israel's army chief warns that the war will continue for many more months. 
And President Biden spoke with the leader of Qatar yesterday in hopes of jump-starting talks for a hostage deal. More than 100 hostages are being held by Hamas. The war in the Middle East is adding to security concerns for New Year's Eve. More than one million people are expected to pack into Times Square. A law enforcement threat assessment warns the ball drop could draw interest from malicious actors inspired by the conflict between Israel and Hamas. Protesters disrupted the Macy's parade on Thanksgiving, so New York officials are watching for a similar attempt on New Year's Eve. You have to be ready for those unpredictable circumstances. It's a real Herculean task to manage that number of people uh, without being heavy-handed, but being protective. Important to note here, authorities say there's no specific threat for New Year's Eve. We turn now to Texas, where a pregnant teenager and her boyfriend have been reported missing. Days later, a major development and a growing mystery when it comes to what police will reveal. This morning, what appears to be a tragic update in the search for a pregnant woman in Texas. The family of 18-year-old Savannah Soto says she and her boyfriend, Matthew Guerra, were found dead yesterday in a car outside a San Antonio apartment complex, three miles from Soto's home. But police are not yet confirming the identities of the victims. It appears to be a very complex crime scene. Soto, last seen near her home Friday, was nine months pregnant and one week past her due date. Her family says she was scheduled to be induced at the hospital Saturday, but never showed up. When I called her all morning, she wasn't answering. I was going straight to voicemail. And we went to the hospital anyways, and she was a no-show. And that's when I called the cops. She was so excited to have this baby. I mean, her, her, the house is already baby ready. She was so excited. She was going to be a mommy. Officials releasing few details, also not confirming how the victims died. But what we're looking at right now is a very, very perplexing crime scene. And detectives right now are looking at this as a possible murder. And uh, but we don't know for sure. Officials did say the bodies appear to have been inside the car for three to four days. According to court documents, Guerra was on probation for allegedly assaulting Soto on Christmas Day last year. I wasn't fond of him because of when he put hands on my daughter. The family is familiar with heartache. Soto's younger brother died in a shooting last year. Her family says Soto wanted to become a nurse. Again, police have not confirmed the victim's identities, saying the investigation continues. An unexpected stop for migrants being flown out of Texas. A commercial jet carrying more than 200 migrants from El Paso to New York City was diverted to Philadelphia due to bad weather. They were later put on buses. Some advocates believe Texas Governor Greg Abbott chartered the flight as officials struggled to cope with a record surge of migrants at the U.S. southern border. The final numbers are in from the holiday shopping season, and MasterCard says consumer spending was up about 3% compared to last year. That's about the same rate as the current inflation rate. Some experts say the fact that sales did not drop this holiday season shows a boost in consumer confidence. Restaurants saw the biggest increase in spending. Consumers are spending more to return gifts this year. One report found more than 80% of retailers are now charging fees for returns due to rising costs. It wasn't just the weather that delayed people at airports after Christmas. The TSA says an unusual number of sick calls in Atlanta, the nation's busiest airport, contributed to the delays. Nearly 7,000 flights were delayed yesterday. Passengers waited in line for hours. Time now for your Wednesday forecast. Good morning, Andrea and Andrew. Do you think we were done with the tough travel? Not so fast for late week. Wednesday morning, we're still dealing with ice. I-94 corridor and Bismarck to Fargo, dealing with slick roads and slick sidewalks, even a Thunder Bay. And if that wasn't enough, you're still seeing snow and a rain snow mix in places like Kansas City and St. Louis. This is gonna be to Wednesday nights. Rain in the I-95 corridor on the eastern coast there from Roanoke all the way into Boston. But New York, I'm focusing on you because you've got the potential for urban and street flooding. Yeah, basement apartments, those could be flooded. And if that wasn't enough, uh, dense fog advisories along the New England coast. Back to you, Andrea and Andrew. Coming up, fast food restaurants announce layoffs days before a minimum wage increase takes effect. But first, trapped for days after a crash, how an injured driver was finally found below a highway overpass. And the man previously known as Kanye West comes forward with a mea culpa. 
year 2023. High stakes, high emotion, high drama. New tonight. Amazing. The absolute wildest year. We're breaking it all down. Taylor Swift, Beyonce, Barbie. Can you get all that in there? And the stories that make you go, huh? You kidding? Can we say that on ABC? Yeah. Deal with it. It's the year 2023 with Robin Roberts. Getting ready to kiss 2023 goodbye. Tonight on ABC. news breaks it's so important to always remember that lives are changed here in london in buffalo uvalde texas edinburgh scotland reporting from rolling fork mississippi ukrainian refugees here in warsaw we're heading to a small community outside of mexico city getting you behind the stories as they happen abc news live prime we'll take you there stream abc news live weeknights wherever you stream your news only on abc news live why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Reporting from the tarmac of LaGuardia Airport, I'm Trevor Alt. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. New video of firefighters rescuing a man who had been trapped in his truck for days after crashing into a river in Indiana. Police say he may have been there for one week. Two fishermen saw his truck while walking under a highway. Police say the crash victim couldn't reach his phone to call 911. Kanye West is apologizing to the Jewish community, posting a statement on Instagram in Hebrew after a series of anti-Semitic remarks. The rapper, who calls himself Ye, is asking for forgiveness. His apology comes just before the release of his new album. James Bond actor Pierce Brosnan is in hot water. He got a ticket at Yellowstone National Park for roaming into a thermal area that's off limits. He's reportedly been filming a movie in the area with Samuel L. Jackson. We turn now to the cost of living. As you probably know, it's been skyrocketing in recent years, but this January 1st, millions of Americans will get some help paying their bills, but not everyone is on board with the changes. With a new year comes new laws, and for many states, that means the minimum wage is going up. Beginning January 1st, 22 states will see their minimum hourly wage increase. In some states, the hike will be small, just 35 cents in Ohio. But in Hawaii, the minimum will rise by $2. The impact of the uh, increase in minimum wage uh, it just moves people closer and closer to um, out of poverty. In New York, a split. The minimum hourly wage in the New York City area will rise by a dollar, while the rest of the state sees an 80 cent raise. But it's California that has generated the most headlines. Wages there are growing up by 50 cents on January 1st. And then in April, fast food workers will see a far more substantial raise of $4 an hour. 557,000 people at 30,000 locations. This is a big deal. $20 an hour, 80% of the workforce force in these fast food places, 80% are people of color. Two-thirds two -thirds are women. This is for my ancestors. This is for all the farm workers, all the cotton pickers. This is for them. But the state is already paying the consequences. Two large Pizza Hut franchises announced yesterday that they're eliminating their in-house delivery services, resulting in more than 1,200 drivers being laid off. Customers will now have to use third-party apps like DoorDash for deliveries. And Chipotle and McDonald's have said they'll be raising prices in the state to offset the higher labor costs. 20 states are still at the federal minimum wage, which has been $7.25 an hour since 2009. $1 today can buy only about 70% of what it could buy back in 2009. Coming up, another health benefit of owning a pet. Also ahead, a new twist in the case of disgraced attorney and convicted killer Alec Murdoch. 
that could help him get a new trial. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all, that's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good Morning America. We want you to know every morning. We're right here and we got gotcha. you. The year 2023. High stakes, high emotion, high drama. Now tonight, it's the year 2023 with Robin Roberts. I'm getting ready to kiss. 2023 goodbye. Tonight on ABC. We have really good news. Really good news. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand. These were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. All across the globe, the world will be celebrating the new year. And you can see it as it happens live. The global celebrations. See the new year as it comes in live. Streaming all day and night on ABC News Live. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Breaking overnight, the South Korean actor Lee Sung Kyun has died. He's best known for his role in the Oscar winning movie Parasite. Police have been searching for the troubled actor. He was just 48. A new study suggests private equity firms taking over hospitals are bringing down the quality of care. Researchers found patients were more likely to fall and get infections after a private equity firm took over a hospital. They say the findings may reflect a priority for profit over safety. Another health benefit of owning a pet. A new study finds people prone to dementia may be able to delay the progression of the disease if they own a pet. That's because your dog or cat reduces loneliness, which doctors say is a risk factor for cognitive decline. We turn now to a new twist in the case of former South Carolina attorney and convicted murderer Alec Murdoch. His chance of winning a new trial may have improved thanks to a scandal surrounding the clerk who read the verdict. Guilty. In the aftermath of the verdict that sent disgraced attorney Alec Murdoch to prison for the murders of his wife and son, court clerk Becky Hill entered the spotlight. She co-wrote a book, Behind the Doors of Justice, The Murdoch Murders, promising an up-close look at the trial and her personal relationship with the Murdochs. But now, Hill is accused of plagiarizing part of that book from a British reporter. I was shocked. I was disappointed. Neil Gordon co-wrote the book with Hill. He says he found an ethical gaffe while reviewing Hill's emails. And I asked her if she could kind of explain maybe what happened. And she said that she felt like she was under a lot of deadline pressure. Hill has previously spoken openly about the Murdoch trial, including on a Netflix documentary. I had a feeling from our time together with the jury out at Moselle that it was not going to take our jury long to make the decision. In a statement responding to the plagiarism allegations, Hill's attorneys say she's deeply remorseful for this unfortunate lapse in judgment. But these developments could have consequences for Murdoch as he seeks a new trial. He previously claimed that Hill had tampered with the jury, a claim she denies and prosecutors insist is not credible. The plagiarism scandal could now put her credibility back in question as the judge weighs whether to grant a new trial. I think it's likely that Alec Murdoch gets a new trial, and this is why. Normally, you can't get into jury deliberations, but there's one important exception, and that's if there's outside influences in the jury room. Sales of Hill's book were suspended. As for Murdoch's request for a new trial, no hearing has been scheduled yet. In sports, it's not a record any team would want. The Detroit Pistons lost their 27th straight game last night, setting the record 
for longest single season losing streak. The 76ers still hold the overall record at 28 straight losses over two seasons. The Pistons could get loss number 28 tomorrow against the Celtics, who are the number one team in the East right now. Well, coming up, the $650 reservation at Applebee's. Plus, another popular streaming service makes a big change. The year 2023. High stakes, high emotion, high drama. Yeah. New tonight. <gasps> Amazing. The absolute wildest year. We're breaking it all down. Taylor Swift, Beyonce, Barbie. Can you get all that in there? And the stories that make you go, huh. You kidding? Can we say that on NBC? <laughs> Deal with it. It's the year 2023 with Robin Roberts. Getting ready to kiss. 2023 goodbye. Tonight on ABC. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City, getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Marciano in Tampa, Florida, reporting in Hurricane Adalia. Wherever the weather may take you, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the pulse, and we begin with another streaming service adding ads. This time, it's Amazon Prime Video. Subscribers were warned earlier this year, and now a date has finally been set. Beginning January 29th, Movies and TV shows on the service will be broken up with advertising. Amazon says it plans to have fewer ads than other streaming providers. Ad-free programming will cost an extra $3 a month. Next, an expensive reservation at Applebee's. How about $650 to book a table? That's the cost <laughs> if you want to hang out at the Applebee's in Times Square during the ball drop on New Year's Eve. If Applebee's isn't fancy enough, book a $12,000 ticket at a lounge nearby. That's worth it for the bathroom yeah, access, I think. There. <laughs> <laughs> Next, some police are accused of getting too aggressive in cracking down on speeding. USA Today is out with an opinion piece asking if aggressive speed traps are even legal. The newspaper cites the case of a small town in Ohio, population 500, but local police wrote 8,900 tickets in five months. A similar case was reported in a small town in Texas. Enforcement can make the streets safe but critics claim it erodes trust in police and they say towns that generate a large chunk of their revenue from fines and fees raise constitutional concerns. Everybody slow down. All right, next, a little boy in North Carolina who got a jump on Christmas. The three-year-old decided to sneak downstairs in the middle of the night to open his gifts and everyone else's. He unwrapped every present under the tree at 3 a.m. He only woke up his parents when he needed help opening his Spider-Man toy. Both of us uh, went to sleep uh, thinking everything was fine, everything was great, and then we were awoken uh, with a request for scissors, which is not really how you want to be woken up at 3 a.m. It just didn't enter our heads as a possibility that someone would go down and open all the presents. Now his son said he unwrapped all the presents to make it less confusing for everyone. Mom raced to rewrap them before the other kids woke up. And finally, the Grinch had a pretty rough Christmas. He was over Louisiana when his flying machine suffered a mishap, causing him to crash into the <gasps> power lines. Whoops. Turns out he ran out of gas. He says he hung upside down <gasps> for about an hour, but was not hurt. 
You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. <gasps> Top headlines, next. <gasps> the year 2023. High stakes, high emotion, high drama. Now tonight, it's the year 2023 with Robin Roberts. I'm getting ready to kiss. 2023 goodbye. Tonight on ABC. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Checking more top stories, Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Homeland Security Chief Alejandro Mayorkas will meet with Mexico's president today for talks on the migrant crisis at the border. It comes as the largest caravan in more than a year makes its way to the U.S. border with more than 8,000 migrants. Israel says it will not end its war against Hamas in Gaza anytime soon, despite global calls for a pause in the fighting. President Biden spoke yesterday to the leader of Qatar in hopes of jump-starting talks to release more hostages. In Florida, the reward is up to $10,000 in the manhunt for the suspect in a deadly mall shooting. Police say Albert Shell Jr. killed a man and wounded a woman in Ocala in a targeted attack that sent shoppers running for their lives. Today's weather, fog in the northeast, blizzard conditions finally wind down in the plains. The south is drying out, rain for the San Francisco Bay Area. And finally, dog lovers will love the Frosted Faces Foundation. Danny New explains. You want some belly rubs? At shelters, dogs in their golden years may not always be the first to get adopted. They have extra medical needs and maybe a little more attention. He's running! But what if those medical costs that usually accumulate with age were already covered? All they have to do is love the dog and we take care of the rest. Hi! Hi! Kelly and Andy run a San Diego-based shelter called Frosted Faces Foundation. Because senior dogs get like little white hairs. Yep. And basically, when you adopt one of the senior dogs at their facility, its medical costs, no matter how large, are covered for life. These dogs do end up passing away, and then someone's like, sure, I'll get my next dog from you, because then I get a dog and I get free medical care. Go find it. Just looking all around. Frosted Faces was born back in 2014. Kelly was working at a different shelter and was just very disappointed with how many senior dogs would either be put up for adoption or would never get adopted because of the expense. Our shelter system nationwide, like, there's a crisis going on. Sit. Oh, that's very good girl. But now, county shelters all over Southern California turn to Kelly and Andy to take those dogs that need a little more love. And nine years later, Frosted Faces is helping between 500 and 700 a year get adopted. Super rewarding. However, that's not going to be enough for Kelly and Andy. What are your goals for the future? Our goal is to help more cats. <laughs> like that's a good direction to go in. And more nonprofits like these are popping up all over the country. But what makes Frosted Faces unique is that they even added their own veterinary staff on site two years ago. So now all adopted dogs, guys, can just come back and visit when they need something. 
with our thanks so to Danny New. Hey, older dogs need some love, too. Still lots of life left in those senior dogs. That's what's making news in America this morning. Have a great Wednesday. Right now on America This Morning, your money. New turmoil in the Middle East hitting Americans in the wallet. Oil and gas prices rising as the U.S. military takes new action against Iranian-backed rebels targeting ships in a key trading route. On alert, parts of the country dig out from a blizzard. Others are covered in dense fog. And now two storm systems targeting the west and east coasts. The mystery surrounding a missing teenager in Texas, nine months pregnant. Her family saying she's been found dead. Her boyfriend was also reported missing. What police are saying this morning. Nearly two dozen states prepare to raise their minimum wage just days from now. How fast food chains are bracing for the higher labor costs. The workers now being laid off. My name's Bond. James Bond. Plus, James Bond actor Pierce Brosnan in trouble at Yellowstone National Park. Another streaming service announces big changes, costing some customers more. And later, the little boy who secretly unwrapped all his family Christmas presents at 3 a.m. Christmas morning. The reason why should make you laugh. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good Wednesday morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Dimberg. I'm Andrea from GE in for Rhiannon. We begin with the rising cost of oil and gas as tensions escalate in the Middle East. The U.S. has launched airstrikes targeting militants in Iraq in recent days, and now another ship has come under attack in one of the world's most important trade routes, the Red Sea. All this is having consequences here at home. ABC's Liz Landers is here with details. Liz, good morning. Good morning, Andrea. Despite new action to address the security concerns, militia groups linked to Iran do not seem to be deterred from launching attacks, at least not yet. This morning, new tensions in the Middle East hitting your wallet. Oil and gas prices both on the rise after the Pentagon carried out airstrikes on Iranian-backed militants in Iraq. This is the damage left behind from the latest airstrike, payback for a drone attack on American troops that left one service member critically injured. This is very prevalent amongst the Iranians. It's how they conduct business. And it's very messy because they're using forces that sometimes don't actually take direct orders, but ultimately it's to push back against the influence of the United States. In a statement, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin saying he and President Biden, quote, will not hesitate to take necessary action to defend the United States, our troops, and our interests. There is no higher priority. About 3,500 U.S. troops remain in Iraq and Syria to prevent a resurgence of ISIS. And since the start of the Israel-Hamas war, the Pentagon estimates there have been roughly 100 attacks against U.S. personnel in the region, fueled by anti-Israeli sentiment. And now, a new attack in one of the busiest global shipping routes, the Red Sea. U.S. officials reporting what is at least the 16th attack in the Red Sea since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. An American-led naval patrol group is now helping protect ships in the region. But the economic impact on everyday Americans now becoming clear with rising shipping costs. And oil prices up more than 2% in the last 24 hours. Gas prices up six cents per gallon nationwide in the last week, but rising as much as 16 cents in places like Florida. To show the extent of the problem, U.S. forces in the Red Sea say they shot down 17 drones and missiles fired by rebels in Yemen yesterday alone. Andrew? All right, Liz, thank you. Turning to the weather now, blizzard conditions are finally easing up in the northern plains. Travel has been treacherous across parts of Colorado, Nebraska, and the Dakotas. Ice is blamed for thousands of power outages, and now the concern is shifting east. Heavy rain is moving into Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and Washington, D.C. this morning. The storm system will push into the I-95 corridor in the northeast this afternoon, reaching New York City tonight. Dense fog remains a concern in the northeast. This was the scene in Boston yesterday. The skyline barely visible. We'll check your forecast in just a few minutes. Returning overseas, Israel is expanding its ground war in southern Gaza, focusing on refugee camps where Hamas fighters are believed to be hiding. A top advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with officials at the White House yesterday as the U.S. pushes for a pause in the fighting or a shift to a more targeted approach. One Israeli official says the military is close to dismantling Hamas. ABC's Britt Klenet is in Tel Aviv. 
Prime Minister Netanyahu in an op-ed laid out what he called three prerequisites for peace, writing, Hamas must be destroyed, Gaza must be demilitarized, and Palestinian society must be de-radicalized. This is Israel's army chief warns that the war will continue for many more months. And President Biden spoke with the leader of Qatar yesterday in hopes of jump-starting talks for a hostage deal. More than 100 hostages are being held by Hamas. The war in the Middle East is adding to security concerns for New Year's Eve. More than one million people are expected to pack into Times Square. A law enforcement threat assessment warns the ball drop could draw interest from malicious actors inspired by the conflict between Israel and Hamas. Protesters disrupted the Macy's parade on Thanksgiving, so New York officials are watching for a similar attempt on New Year's Eve. You have to be ready for those unpredictable circumstances. It's a real Herculean task to manage that number of people uh, without being heavy-handed, but being protective. Important to note here, authorities say there's no specific threat for New Year's Eve. We turn now to Texas, where a pregnant teenager and her boyfriend have been reported missing. Days later, a major development and a growing mystery when it comes to what police will reveal. This morning, what appears to be a tragic update in the search for a pregnant woman in Texas. The family of 18-year-old Savannah Soto says she and her boyfriend, Matthew Guerra, were found dead yesterday in a car outside a San Antonio apartment complex, three miles from Soto's home. But police are not yet confirming the identities of the victims. It appears to be a very complex crime scene. Soto, last seen near her home Friday, was nine months pregnant and one week past her due date. Her family says she was scheduled to be induced at the hospital Saturday, but never showed up. When I called her all morning, she wasn't answering. It was going straight to voicemail. And we went to the hospital anyways, and she was a no-show. And that's when I called the cops. She was so excited to have this baby. I mean, her, her, the house is already baby ready. She was so excited. She was going to be a mommy. Officials releasing few details, also not confirming how the victims died. But what we're looking at right now is a very, very perplexing crime scene. And detectives right now are looking at this as a possible murder. And uh, but we don't know for sure. Officials did say the bodies appear to have been inside the car for three to four days. According to court documents, Guerra was on probation for allegedly assaulting Soto on Christmas Day last year. I wasn't fond of him because of when he put hands on my daughter. The family is familiar with heartache. Soto's younger brother died in a shooting last year. Her family says Soto wanted to become a nurse. Again, police have not confirmed the victim's identities, saying the investigation continues. An unexpected stop for migrants being flown out of Texas. A commercial jet carrying more than 200 migrants from El Paso to New York City was diverted to Philadelphia due to bad weather. They were later put on buses. Some advocates believe Texas Governor Greg Abbott chartered the flight as officials struggled to cope with a record surge of migrants at the U.S. southern border. The final numbers are in from the holiday shopping season, and MasterCard says consumer spending was up about 3% compared to last year. That's about the same rate as the current inflation rate. Some experts say the fact that sales did not drop this holiday season shows a boost in consumer confidence. Restaurants saw the biggest increase in spending. Consumers are spending more to return gifts this year. One report found more than 80% of retailers are now charging fees for returns due to rising costs. It wasn't just the weather that delayed people at airports after Christmas. The TSA says an unusual number of sick calls in Atlanta, the nation's busiest airport, contributed to the delays. Nearly 7,000 flights were delayed yesterday. Passengers waited in line for hours. Time now for your Wednesday forecast. Good morning, Andrea and Andrew. Do you think we were done with the tough travel? Not so fast for late week. Wednesday morning, we're still dealing with ice. I-94 corridor and Bismarck to Fargo, dealing with slick roads and slick sidewalks, even a Thunder Bay. And if that wasn't enough, you're still seeing snow and a rain snow mix in places like Kansas City and St. Louis. This is gonna be to Wednesday nights. Rain in the I-95 corridor on the eastern coast there from Roanoke all the way into Boston. But New York, I'm focusing on you because you've got the potential for urban and street flooding. Yeah, basement apartments, those could be flooded. And if that wasn't enough, uh, dense fog advisories along the New England coast. Back to you, Andrea and Andrew.
Coming up, fast food restaurants announce layoffs days before a minimum wage increase takes effect. But first, trapped for days after a crash, how an injured driver was finally found below a highway overpass. And the man previously known as Kanye West comes forward with a mea culpa. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. New video of firefighters rescuing a man who had been trapped in his truck for days after crashing into a river in Indiana. Police say he may have been there for one week. Two fishermen saw his truck while walking under a highway. Police say the crash victim couldn't reach his phone to call 911. Kanye West is apologizing to the Jewish community, posting a statement on Instagram in Hebrew after a series of anti-Semitic remarks. The rapper, who calls himself Ye, is asking for forgiveness. His apology comes just before the release of his new album. James Bond actor Pierce Brosnan is in hot water. He got a ticket at Yellowstone National Park for roaming into a thermal area that's off limits. He's reportedly been filming a movie in the area with Samuel L. Jackson. We turn now to the cost of living. As you probably know, it's been skyrocketing in recent years. But this January 1st, millions of Americans will get some help paying their bills. But not everyone is on board with the changes. With a new year comes new laws. And for many states, that means the minimum wage is going up. Beginning January 1st, 22 states will see their minimum hourly wage increase. In some states, the hike will be small, just 35 cents in Ohio. But in Hawaii, the minimum will rise by $2. The impact of the uh, increase in minimum wage, uh, it just moves people closer and closer to um, out of poverty. In New York, a split. The minimum hourly wage in the New York City area will rise by a dollar, while the rest of the state sees an 80 cent raise. But it's California that has generated the most headlines. Wages there are growing up by 50 cents on January 1st. And then in April, fast food workers will see a far more substantial raise of $4 an hour. 557,000 people at 30,000 locations. This is a big deal. $20 an hour. 80% Eight, of the workforce force in these fast food places, 80% are people of color. Two-thirds two -thirds are women. This is for my ancestors. This is for all the farm workers, all the cotton pickers. This is for them. But the state is already paying the consequences. Two large Pizza Hut franchises announced yesterday that they're eliminating their in-house delivery services, resulting in more than 1,200 drivers being laid off. Customers will now have to use third-party apps like DoorDash for deliveries. And Chipotle and McDonald's have said they'll be raising prices in the state to offset the higher labor costs.
20 states are still at the federal minimum wage, which has been $7.25 an hour since 2009. $1 today can buy only about 70% of what it could buy back in 2009. Coming up, another health benefit of owning a pet. Also ahead, a new twist in the case of disgraced attorney and convicted killer Alec Murdoch that could help him get a new trial. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Breaking overnight, the South Korean actor Lee Sung Kyun has died. He's best known for his role on the Oscar winning movie Parasite. Police have been searching for the troubled actor. He was just 48. A new study suggests private equity firms taking over hospitals are bringing down the quality of care. Researchers found patients were more likely to fall and get infections after a private equity firm took over a hospital. They say the findings may reflect a priority for profit over safety. Another health benefit of owning a pet. A new study finds people prone to dementia may be able to delay the progression of the disease if they own a pet. That's because your dog or cat reduces loneliness, which doctors say is a risk factor for cognitive decline. We turn now to a new twist in the case of former South Carolina attorney and convicted murderer Alec Murdoch. His chance of winning a new trial may have improved thanks to a scandal surrounding the clerk who read the verdict. Guilty. In the aftermath of the verdict that sent disgraced attorney Alec Murdoch to prison for the murders of his wife and son, court clerk Becky Hill entered the spotlight. She co-wrote a book, Behind the Doors of Justice, The Murdoch Murders, promising an up-close look at the trial and her personal relationship with the Murdochs. But now, Hill is accused of plagiarizing part of that book from a British reporter. I was shocked. I was disappointed. Neil Gordon co-wrote the book with Hill. He says he found an ethical gaffe while reviewing Hill's emails. And I asked her if she could kind of explain maybe what happened. And she said that she felt like she was under a lot of deadline pressure. Hill has previously spoken openly about the Murdoch trial, including on a Netflix documentary. I had a feeling from our time together with the jury out at Moselle that it was not going to take our jury long to make the decision. In a statement responding to the plagiarism allegations, Hill's attorneys say she's deeply remorseful for this unfortunate lapse in judgment. But these developments could have consequences for Murdoch as he seeks a new trial. He previously claimed that Hill had tampered with the jury, a claim she denies and prosecutors insist is not credible. The plagiarism scandal could now put her credibility back in question as the judge weighs whether to grant a new trial. I think it's likely that Alec Murdoch gets a new trial, and this is why. Normally, you can't get into jury deliberations, but there's one important exception, and that's if there's outside influences in the jury room. 
Well, sales of Hill's book were suspended. As for Miradoc's request for a new trial, no hearing has been scheduled yet. In sports, it's not a record any team would want. The Detroit Pistons lost their 27th straight game last night, setting the record for longest single season losing streak. The 76ers still hold the overall record at 28 straight losses over two seasons. The Pistons could get loss number 28 tomorrow against the Celtics, who are the number one team in the East right now. Oh, coming up, the $650 reservation at Applebee's. Plus, another popular streaming service makes a big change. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. <laughs> dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. <laughs> With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From Fulton County Court in Atlanta, I'm Aaron Katursky. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. To check the pulse and we begin with another streaming service adding ads this time it's amazon prime video subscribers were warned earlier this year and now a date has finally been set beginning january 29th movies and tv shows on the service will be broken up with advertising amazon says it plans to have fewer ads than other streaming providers ad free programming will cost an extra three dollars a month next an expensive reservation at applebee's how about $650 to book a table? That's the cost if you want to hang out at the Applebee's in Times Square during the ball drop on New Year's Eve. If Applebee's isn't fancy enough, book a $12,000 ticket at a lounge nearby. That's worth it for the bathroom yeah, access, I think. There. <laughs> <laughs> Next, some police are accused of getting too aggressive in cracking down on speeding. USA Today is out with an opinion piece asking if aggressive speed traps are even legal. The newspaper cites the case of a small town in Ohio, population 500. But local police wrote 8,900 tickets in five months. A similar case was reported in a small town in Texas. Enforcement can make the streets safer, but critics claim it erodes trust in police. And they say towns that generate a large chunk of their revenue from fines and fees raise constitutional concerns. Everybody slow down. All right, next, a little boy in North Carolina who got a jump on Christmas. The three-year-old decided to sneak downstairs in the middle of the night to open his gifts and everyone else's. He unwrapped every present under the tree at 3 a.m. He only woke up his parents when he needed help opening his Spider-Man toy. Both of us uh, went to sleep uh, thinking everything was fine, everything was great. And then we were awoken uh, with a request for scissors, which is not really how you want to be woken up at 3 a.m. It just didn't enter our heads as a possibility that someone would go down and open all the presents now, his son said he unwrapped all the presents to make it less confusing for everyone. Mom raced to rewrap them before the other kids woke up. And finally, the Grinch 
had a pretty rough Christmas. He was over Louisiana when his flying machine suffered a mishap, causing him to crash into <gasps> these power lines. Whoops. Turns out he ran out of gas. He says he hung upside down <gasps> for about an hour, but was not hurt. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. <gasps> Top headlines. Next. <gasps> this is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. The year 2023. High stakes, high emotion, high drama. Now tonight. <gasps> Amazing. The absolute wildest year. We're breaking it all down. Taylor Swift, Beyonce, Barbie. Can you get all that in there? And the stories that make you go. Huh. You kidding? Can we say that on ABC? Yeah. Deal with it. It's the year 2023 with Robin Roberts. Getting ready to kiss 2023 goodbye. Tonight on ABC. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Checking more top stories, Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Homeland Security Chief Alejandro Mayorkas will meet with Mexico's president today for talks on the migrant crisis at the border. It comes as the largest caravan in more than a year makes its way to the U.S. border with more than 8,000 migrants. Israel says it will not end its war against Hamas in Gaza anytime soon, despite global calls for a pause in the fighting. President Biden spoke yesterday to the leader of Qatar in hopes of jump-starting talks to release more hostages. In Florida, the reward is up to $10,000 in the manhunt for the suspect in a deadly mall shooting. Police say Albert Shell Jr. killed a man and wounded a woman in Ocala in a targeted attack that sent shoppers running for their lives. Today's weather, fog in the northeast, blizzard conditions finally wind down in the plains. The south is drying out, rain for the San Francisco Bay Area. And finally, dog lovers will love the Frosted Faces Foundation. Danny New explains. You want some belly rubs? At shelters, dogs in their golden years may not always be the first to get adopted. They have extra medical needs and maybe a little more attention. He's running! But what if those medical costs that usually accumulate with age were already covered? All they have to do is love the dog and we take care of the rest. Hi! Hi! Kelly and Andy run a San Diego-based shelter called Frosted Faces Foundation. Because senior dogs get like little white hairs. Yep. And basically, when you adopt one of the senior dogs at their facility, its medical costs, no matter how large, are covered for life. These dogs do end up passing away, and then someone's like, sure, I'll get my next dog from you, because then I get a dog and I get free medical care. Go find it. He's looking all around. Frosted Faces was born back in 2014. Kelly was working at a different shelter and was just very disappointed with how many senior dogs would either be put up for adoption or would never get adopted because of the expense. Our shelter system that nationwide, like, there's a crisis going on. Sit. Oh, that's a very good girl. But now county shelters all over Southern California turn to Kelly and Andy to take those dogs that need a little more love. And nine years later, Frosted Faces is helping between 500 and 700 a year get adopted. Super rewarding. However, that's not going to be enough for Kelly and Andy. What are your goals? For the future. Our goal is to help more cats. <laughs> <laughs> like that's a good direction to go in.
And more nonprofits like these are popping up all over the country. But what makes Frosted Faces unique is that they even added their own veterinary staff on site two years ago. So now all adopted dogs, guys, can just come back and visit when they need something. Our thanks so to Danny New. Hey, older dogs need some love, too. Still lots of life left in those senior dogs. That's what's making news in America this morning. Have a great Wednesday. Right now on America This Morning, your money. New turmoil in the Middle East hitting Americans in the wallet. Oil and gas prices rising as the U.S. military takes new action against Iranian-backed rebels targeting ships in a key trading route. On alert, parts of the country dig out from a blizzard. Others are covered in dense fog. And now two storm systems targeting the west and east coast. The mystery surrounding a missing teenager in Texas, nine months pregnant. Her family saying she's been found dead. Her boyfriend was also reported missing. What police are saying this morning. Nearly two dozen states prepare to raise their minimum wage just days from now. How fast food chains are bracing for the higher labor costs. The workers now being laid off. My name's Bond. James Bond. Plus, James Bond actor Pierce Brosnan in trouble at Yellowstone National Park. Another streaming service announces big changes, costing some customers more. And later, the little boy who secretly unwrapped all his family Christmas presents at 3 a.m. Christmas morning. The reason why should make you laugh. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good Wednesday morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Dimber. I'm Andrew Reef with GE in for Rhiannon. We begin with the rising cost of oil and gas as tensions escalate in the Middle East. The U.S. has launched airstrikes targeting militants in Iraq in recent days, and now another ship has come under attack in one of the world's most important trade routes, the Red Sea. All this is having consequences here at home. ABC's Liz Landers is here with details. Liz, good morning. Good morning, Andrea. Despite new action to address the security concerns, militia groups linked to Iran do not seem to be deterred from launching attacks, at least not yet. This morning, new tensions in the Middle East hitting your wallet. Oil and gas prices both on the rise after the Pentagon carried out airstrikes on Iranian-backed militants in Iraq. This is the damage left behind from the latest airstrike, payback for a drone attack on American troops that left one service member critically injured. This is very prevalent amongst the Iranians. It's how they conduct business. And it's very messy because they're using forces that sometimes don't actually take direct orders, but ultimately it's to push back against the influence of the United States. In a statement, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin saying he and President Biden, quote, will not hesitate to take necessary action to defend the United States, our troops and our interests. There is no higher priority. About 3,500 U.S. troops remain in Iraq and Syria to prevent a resurgence of ISIS. And since the start of the Israel-Hamas war, the Pentagon estimates there have been roughly 100 attacks against U.S. personnel in the region, fueled by anti-Israeli sentiment. And now a new attack in one of the busiest global shipping routes, the Red Sea. The U.S. officials reporting what is at least the 16th attack in the Red Sea since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. An American-led naval patrol group is now helping protect ships in the region. But the economic impact on everyday Americans now becoming clear with rising shipping costs. And oil prices up more than 2% in the last 24 hours. Gas prices up six cents per gallon nationwide in the last week, but rising as much as 16 cents in places like Florida. To show the extent of the problem, U.S. forces in the Red Sea say they shot down 17 drones and missiles fired by rebels in Yemen yesterday alone. Andrew? All right, Liz, thank you. Turning to the weather now, blizzard conditions are finally easing up in the northern plains. Travel has been treacherous across parts of Colorado, Nebraska, and the Dakotas. Ice is blamed for thousands of power outages, and now the concern is shifting east. Heavy rain is moving into Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and Washington, D.C. this morning. The storm system will push into the I-95 corridor in the northeast this afternoon, reaching New York City tonight. Dense fog remains a concern in the northeast. This was the scene in Boston yesterday. The skyline barely visible. We'll check your forecast in just a few minutes.
Returning overseas, Israel is expanding its ground war in southern Gaza, focusing on refugee camps where Hamas fighters are believed to be hiding. A top advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with officials at the White House yesterday as the U.S. pushes for a pause in the fighting or a shift to a more targeted approach. One Israeli official says the military is close to dismantling Hamas. ABC's Britt Klenet is in Tel Aviv. Prime Minister Netanyahu in an op-ed laid out what he called three prerequisites for peace, writing, Hamas must be destroyed, Gaza must be demilitarized, and Palestinian society must be de-radicalized. This is Israel's army chief warns that the war will continue for many more months. And President Biden spoke with the leader of Qatar yesterday in hopes of jump-starting talks for a hostage deal. More than 100 hostages are being held by Hamas. The war in the Middle East is adding to security concerns for New Year's Eve. More than one million people are expected to pack into Times Square. A law enforcement threat assessment warns the ball drop could draw interest from malicious actors inspired by the conflict between Israel and Hamas. Protesters disrupted the Macy's parade on Thanksgiving, so New York officials are watching for a similar attempt on New Year's Eve. You have to be ready for those unpredictable circumstances. It's a real Herculean task to manage that number of people uh, without being heavy-handed, but being protective. Important to note here, authorities say there's no specific threat for New Year's Eve. We turn now to Texas, where a pregnant teenager and her boyfriend have been reported missing. Days later, a major development and a growing mystery when it comes to what police will reveal. This morning, what appears to be a tragic update in the search for a pregnant woman in Texas. The family of 18-year-old Savannah Soto says she and her boyfriend, Matthew Guerra, were found dead yesterday in a car outside a San Antonio apartment complex, three miles from Soto's home. But police are not yet confirming the identities of the victims. It appears to be a very complex crime scene. Soto, last seen near her home Friday, was nine months pregnant and one week past her due date. Her family says she was scheduled to be induced at the hospital Saturday, but never showed up. When I called her all morning, she wasn't answering. I was going straight to voicemail. And we went to the hospital anyways, and she was a no-show. And that's when I called the cops. She was so excited to have this baby. I mean, her, her, the house is already baby ready. She was so excited. She was going to be a mommy. Officials releasing few details, also not confirming how the victims died. But what we're looking at right now is a very, very perplexing crime scene. And detectives right now are looking at this as a possible murder. And uh, but we don't know for sure. Officials did say the bodies appear to have been inside the car for three to four days. According to court documents, Guerra was on probation for allegedly assaulting Soto on Christmas Day last year. I wasn't fond of him because of when he put hands on my daughter. The family is familiar with heartache. Soto's younger brother died in a shooting last year. Her family says Soto wanted to become a nurse. Again, police have not confirmed the victim's identities, saying the investigation continues. An unexpected stop for migrants being flown out of Texas. A commercial jet carrying more than 200 migrants from El Paso to New York City was diverted to Philadelphia due to bad weather. They were later put on buses. Some advocates believe Texas Governor Greg Abbott chartered the flight as officials struggled to cope with a record surge of migrants at the U.S. southern border. The final numbers are in from the holiday shopping season, and MasterCard says consumer spending was up about 3% compared to last year. That's about the same rate as the current inflation rate. Some experts say the fact that sales did not drop this holiday season shows a boost in consumer confidence. Restaurants saw the biggest increase in spending. Consumers are spending more to return gifts this year. One report found more than 80% of retailers are now charging fees for returns due to rising costs. It wasn't just the weather that delayed people at airports after Christmas. The TSA says an unusual number of sick calls in Atlanta, the nation's busiest airport, contributed to the delays. Nearly 7,000 flights were delayed yesterday. Passengers waited in line for hours. Time now for your Wednesday forecast. Good morning, Andrea and Andrew. Do you think we were done with the tough travel? Not so fast for late week. Wednesday morning, we're still dealing with ice. I-94 corridor and Bismarck to Fargo, dealing with slick roads and slick sidewalks, even to Thunder Bay. And if that wasn't enough, you're still seeing snow and a rain snow mix in places like Kansas City and St. Louis. This is going to be to Wednesday nights. Rain 
in the I-95 corridor on the eastern coast there from Roanoke all the way into Boston. But New York, I'm focusing on you because you've got the potential for urban and street flooding. Yeah, basement apartments, those could be flooded. And if that wasn't enough, uh, dense fog advisories along the New England coast. Back to you, Andrea and Andrew. Coming up, fast food restaurants announce layoffs days before a minimum wage increase takes effect. But first, trapped for days after a crash, how an injured driver was finally found below a highway overpass. And the man previously known as Kanye West comes forward with a mea culpa. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. news breaks it's so important to always remember that lives are changed here in london in buffalo uvalde texas edinburgh scotland reporting from rolling fork mississippi the ukrainian refugees here in warsaw we're heading to a small community outside of mexico city getting you behind the stories as they happen abc news live prime we'll take you there stream abc news live weeknights wherever you stream your news only on abc news live why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Reporting from Joint Base Andrews, I'm Gio Benitez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. New video of firefighters rescuing a man who had been trapped in his truck for days after crashing into a river in Indiana. Police say he may have been there for one week. Two fishermen saw his truck while walking under a highway. Police say the crash victim couldn't reach his phone to call 911. Kanye West is apologizing to the Jewish community, posting a statement on Instagram in Hebrew after a series of anti-Semitic remarks. The rapper, who calls himself Ye, is asking for forgiveness. His apology comes just before the release of his new album. James Bond actor Pierce Brosnan is in hot water. He got a ticket at Yellowstone National Park for roaming into a thermal area that's off limits. He's reportedly been filming a movie in the area with Samuel L. Jackson. We turn now to the cost of living. As you probably know, it's been skyrocketing in recent years. But this January 1st, millions of Americans will get some help paying their bills. But not everyone is on board with the changes. With a new year comes new laws, and for many states, that means the minimum wage is going up. Beginning January 1st, 22 states will see their minimum hourly wage increase. In some states, the hike will be small, just 35 cents in Ohio. But in Hawaii, the minimum will rise by $2. The impact of the uh, increase in minimum wage, uh, it just moves people closer and closer to um, out of poverty. In New York, a split. The minimum hourly wage in the New York City area will rise by a dollar while the rest of the state sees an 80 cent raise. But it's California that has generated the most headlines. Wages there are growing up by 50 cents on January 1st. And then in April, fast food workers will see a far more substantial raise of $4 an hour. 557,000 people at 30,000 locations. This is a big deal. $20 an hour, 80% of the workforce force in these fast food places, 80% are people of color, two thirds, Two thirds are women. This is for my ancestors. This is for all the farm workers, all the cotton pickers. 
This is for them. But the state is already paying the consequences. Two large Pizza Hut franchises announced yesterday that they're eliminating their in-house delivery services, resulting in more than 1,200 drivers being laid off. Customers will now have to use third-party apps like DoorDash for deliveries. And Chipotle and McDonald's have said they'll be raising prices in the state to offset the higher labor costs. 20 states are still at the federal minimum wage, which has been $7.25 an hour since 2009. $1 today can buy only about 70% of what it could buy back in 2009. Coming up, another health benefit of owning a pet. Also ahead, a new twist in the case of disgraced attorney and convicted killer Alec Murdoch that could help him get a new trial. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. All across the globe, the world will be celebrating the new year. And you can see it as it happens live. The global celebrations. See the new year as it comes in live. Streaming all day and night on ABC News Live. The year 2023. High stakes, high emotion, high drama. It's the year 2023 with Robin Roberts. Tonight on ABC. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news, only on ABC News Live. Breaking overnight, the South Korean actor Lee Sung Kyun has died. He's best known for his role on the Oscar winning movie Parasite. Police have been searching for the troubled actor. He was just 48. A new study suggests private equity firms taking over hospitals are bringing down the quality of care. Researchers found patients were more likely to fall and get infections after a private equity firm took over a hospital. They say the findings may reflect a priority for profit over safety. Another health benefit of owning a pet. A new study finds people prone to dementia may be able to delay the progression of the disease if they own a pet. That's because your dog or cat reduces loneliness, which doctors say is a risk factor for cognitive decline. We turn now to a new twist in the case of former South Carolina attorney and convicted murderer Alec Murdoch. His chance of winning a new trial may have improved thanks to a scandal surrounding the clerk who read the verdict. Guilty. In the aftermath of the verdict that sent disgraced attorney Alec Murdoch to prison for the murders of his wife and son, court clerk Becky Hill entered the spotlight. She co-wrote a book, Behind the Doors of Justice, The Murdoch Murders, promising an up-close look at the trial and her personal relationship with the Murdochs. But now, Hill is accused of plagiarizing part of that book from a British reporter. I was shocked. I was disappointed. Neil Gordon co-wrote the book with Hill. He says he found an ethical gaffe while reviewing Hill's emails. And I asked her if she could kind of explain maybe what happened. And she said that she felt like she was under a lot of deadline pressure. Hill has previously spoken openly about the Murdoch trial, including on a Netflix documentary. I had a feeling from our time together with the jury out at Moselle that it was not going to take our jury long to make the decision. In a statement responding to the plagiarism allegations, Hill's attorneys say she's deeply remorseful for this unfortunate lapse in judgment. But these developments could have consequences for Murdoch as he seeks a new trial. He previously claimed that Hill had tampered with the jury, a claim she denies and prosecutors insist is not credible. 
The plagiarism scandal could now put her credibility back in question as the judge weighs whether to grant a new trial. I think it's likely that Alec Murdoch gets a new trial, and this is why. Normally, you can't get into jury deliberations, but there's one important exception, and that's if there's outside influences in the jury room. Well, sales of Hill's book were suspended. As for Murdoch's request for a new trial, no hearing has been scheduled yet. In sports, it's not a record any team would want. The Detroit Pistons lost their 27th straight game last night, setting the record for longest single season losing streak. The 76ers still hold the overall record at 28 straight losses over two seasons. The Pistons could get loss number 28 tomorrow against the Celtics, who are the number one team in the East right now. Well, coming up, the $650 reservation at Applebee's. Plus, another popular streaming service makes a big change. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Reporting from the FBI, I'm Pierre Thomas. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the pulse, and we begin with another streaming service adding ads. This time, it's Amazon Prime Video. Subscribers were warned earlier this year, and now a date has finally been set, beginning January 29th. Movies and TV shows on the service will be broken up with advertising. Amazon says it plans to have fewer ads than other streaming providers. Ad-free programming will cost an extra $3 a month. Next, an expensive reservation at Applebee's. How about $650 to book a table? That's the cost <laughs> if you want to hang out at the Applebee's in Times Square during the ball drop on New Year's Eve. If Applebee's isn't fancy enough, Book a $12,000 ticket at a lounge nearby. That's worth it for the bathroom yeah, access, I think. There. <laughs> <laughs> Next, some um, police are accused of getting too aggressive in cracking down on speeding. USA Today is out with an opinion piece asking if aggressive speed traps are even legal. The newspaper cites the case of a small town in Ohio, population 500. But local police wrote 8,900 tickets in five months. A similar case was reported in a small town in Texas. Enforcement can make the streets safer, but critics claim it erodes trust in police, and they say towns that generate a large chunk of their revenue from fines and fees raise constitutional concerns. Everybody slow down. All right, next, a little boy in North Carolina who got a jump on Christmas. The three-year-old decided to sneak downstairs in the middle of the night to open his gifts and everyone else's. He unwrapped every present under the tree at 3 a.m. He only woke up his parents when he needed help opening his Spider-Man toy. Both of us uh, went to sleep 
uh, thinking everything was fine, everything was great. And then we were awoken uh, with a request for scissors, which is not really how you want to be woken up at 3 a.m. It just didn't enter our heads as a possibility that someone would go down and open all the presents. Now, his son said he unwrapped all the presents to make it less confusing for everyone. Mom raced to rewrap them before the other kids woke up. And finally, the Grinch had a pretty rough Christmas. He was over Louisiana when his flying machine suffered a mishap, causing him to crash into the <gasps> power lines. Whoops. Turns out he ran out of gas. He says he hung upside down <gasps> for about an hour, but was not hurt. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. <laughs> Top headlines, next. The year 2023. High stakes, high emotion, high drama. Now tonight. Amazing. The absolute wildest year. We're breaking it all down. Taylor Swift, Beyonce, Barbie. Can you get all that in there? And the stories that make you go, huh? You kidding? Can we say that on NBC? <laughs> Deal with it. It's the year 2023 with Robin Roberts. Getting ready to kiss 2023 goodbye. Tonight on ABC. Give it to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Checking more top stories, Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Homeland Security Chief Alejandro Mayorkas will meet with Mexico's president today for talks on the migrant crisis at the border. It comes as the largest caravan in more than a year makes its way to the U.S. border with more than 8,000 migrants. Israel says it will not end its war against Hamas in Gaza anytime soon, despite global calls for a pause in the fighting. President Biden spoke yesterday to the leader of Qatar in hopes of jump-starting talks to release more hostages. In Florida, the reward is up to $10,000 in the manhunt for the suspect in a deadly mall shooting. Police say Albert Shell Jr. killed a man and wounded a woman in Ocala in a targeted attack that sent shoppers running for their lives. Today's weather, fog in the northeast, blizzard conditions finally wind down in the plains. The south is drying out, rain for the San Francisco Bay Area. And finally, dog lovers will love the Frosted Faces Foundation. Danny New explains. You want some belly rubs? At shelters, dogs in their golden years may not always be the first to get adopted. They have extra medical needs and maybe a little more attention. He's running! But what if those medical costs that usually accumulate with age were already covered? All they have to do is love the dog and we take care of the rest. Hi! Hi! Kelly and Andy run a San Diego-based shelter called Frosted Faces Foundation. Because senior dogs get like little white hairs. Yep. And basically, when you adopt one of the senior dogs at their facility, its medical costs, no matter how large, are covered for life. These dogs do end up passing away, and then someone's like, sure, I'll get my next dog from you, because then I get a dog and I get free medical care. Go find it. He's looking all around. Frosted Faces was born back in 2014. Kelly was working at a different shelter and was just very disappointed with how many senior dogs would either be put up for adoption or would never get adopted because of the expense. Our shelter system, that nationwide, like, there's a crisis going on. Sit 
oh, that's a very good girl. But now county shelters all over Southern California turn to Kelly and Andy to take those dogs that need a little more love. And nine years later, Frosted Faces is helping between 500 and 700 a year get adopted. Super rewarding. However, that's not going to be enough for Kelly and Andy. What are your goals for the future? Our goal is to help more cats. <laughs> like that's a good direction to go in. And more nonprofits like these are popping up all over the country. But what makes Frosted Faces unique is that they even added their own veterinary staff on site two years ago. So now all adopted dogs, guys, can just come back and visit when they need something. Our thanks so to Danny New. Hey, older dogs need some love, too. Still lots of life left in those senior dogs. That's what's making news in America this morning. Have a great Wednesday. I'm Alexis Christophorus. Today on ABC News Live First, massive winter blast. Blizzard conditions in five states as more than a foot of snow pounds parts of the heartland with winds whipping up snow drifts, forcing highways to shut down. Heavy rains and dense fog now coating the east, cutting visibility along the I-95 corridor. Now the heavy rain moving in. We're tracking it all this morning. Rising tensions. Israel's defense minister says it's under attack from seven different fronts as it expands its ground assault in Gaza, the U.S. firing back at Iran-linked militants near the Red Sea. The fears of the war spreading in the region growing. New Year's alert. The heightened security in Times Square as the Big Apple gets ready for the million-plus people coming to Times Square to ring in 2024. It's time to make your New Year's resolutions. Whether you're aiming to eat healthier, build wealth, or quit those bad habits, we have tips on how to stick with your resolutions past January. We'll break it down with nutrition, motivation, and finance experts in our group chat. But we begin with a triple threat of dangerous and extreme weather. In the nation's heartland, the aftermath of a winter blizzard and dangerous ice storm is making for treacherous travel conditions. That same storm now heading east, bringing rain and dense fog, making city skylines nearly invisible. While out west, rain and snow is expected in Washington, Oregon, and California. Flash flooding, a major possibility in parts of Northern California. All of this threatening to disrupt travel ahead of tomorrow, which triple LA reports could be one of the busiest travel days of the year. ABC's transportation correspondent Gio Benitez is following the travel rush, but we begin with meteorologist Samara Theodore tracking those dangerous storms. A major winter storm on the move, pummeling parts of the plains with heavy snow, strong wind, unrelenting ice, and whiteout conditions. From Colorado to South Dakota, authorities issuing a blizzard warning. But across the region, the icy roads also a major threat. This truck spinning out of control, crashing into an ambulance in Oregon. Luckily, no injuries were reported. In South Dakota, cars stuck on the side of the road, some in ditches, officials closing I-90 after blizzard conditions. Authorities in Denver, Colorado, forced to shut down portions of I-70 after slick, hazardous conditions. An ice storm damaging dozens of power lines in Fargo, North Dakota, leaving more than 7,000 people in the dark. Parts of this storm system making its way east, already impacting areas in the northeast with fog. In Boston, skyscrapers peeking out from the dense fog. And overnight, a flight transporting over 200 migrants from Texas to New York City was diverted to Philadelphia due to weather conditions. The worst of the winter portion of that storm has now moved out, but we're dealing with all of the rain to come and the fog. So many East Coast cities have been shrouded in fog. You can see that here in New York City. All right, so let's talk about the timing on this rain. So as we head through Wednesday, we, some, we see some of the heaviest rain making its way into the mid-Atlantic region, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and then through tonight, that heavy rain travels into New Jersey, Philadelphia, even New York City, parts of Long Island getting in on some of that heavy rain. It could lead to flash flooding one to two inches possible. Possible. By Thursday morning, the worst of it is then in New England before it departs. How much rain are we talking? Well, we could see anywhere from two to three inches of rain. It's not just about the number there. It's about how quickly this rain is coming down. That could really lead to flooding in parts of the Delmarva Peninsula and right on into South New Jersey, just outside of Philadelphia. Finally, on the back end of this system, still some straggling snow trying to hold out, sweeping deep into the Tennessee Valley. And look at the temperatures. This is wind chills, what it's going to feel like Friday afternoon in Nashville, just around freezing.
Back to you, Alexis. All right, Samaria Theodore, thank you. And that winter storm is impacting travel plans for millions of Americans now making their way home from Christmas and getting ready for the new year. The TSA says the busiest days for travelers expected to last until January 2nd. Just yesterday, the TSA says more than 2.5 million people made their way through airports nationwide. Here's ABC News transportation correspondent Gio Benitez. The mad dash to get back home after millions of travelers hit the roads and skies for Christmas. Both our flights left late. You've got to expect it to be crazy. The TSA is screening more than 14 and a half million people at airports between last Wednesday when the holiday rush began through Christmas Day Monday. That's almost 2 million more than last year. The lines at TSA have been going really well. Um, long but smooth. Travel itself also mostly smooth with airlines like American and United reporting their best performance ever. But TSA and FAA staffing issues creating hiccups at Atlanta's Hartsfield Jackson International Airport, the busiest in the world. Our Faith Abube was there. You can see the TSA screening line is wrapped around the atrium. It goes all the way over there. Some travelers telling me it's taking them about two hours from the time they walk through the doors to drop off their bags to getting through the security line. We've never seen it this crazy. We live here, so we know to get here way early. The TSA telling ABC News we did have an unusual number of employees call in sick today. Additionally, there were blizzard warnings issued, creating a very busy morning at ATL. I think we're in a wait probably twice as long as our flight. And in Denver, ground stops because of weather and staffing at air traffic control. Super busy. It was kind of like organized craziness. Yeah. <laughs> And the next busiest day for air travel is this Friday, so make sure you get ready for that. Meanwhile, the roads are going to be busy today between 1 and 7 p.m., so try to get out there early or later tonight. But the gas prices, they're looking pretty good. They're at 312 a gallon right now. That's the national average. That's up a bit over last week, but still down 13 cents from a month ago. Alexis? All right, ending on a good note, Gio Benitez, thank you. and leaders in the Middle East are hoping to find a way forward in Gaza. Overnight, President Biden spoke to the leader of Qatar in a high-stakes phone call discussing efforts to secure the release of more than 100 hostages still held in Gaza. This comes as the fighting there intensifies and the U.S. responds to another round of attacks by Iran-backed militants. Foreign correspondent Britt Clinton has the latest from Israel. President Biden speaking with Qatar's Amir, talking in a phone call about the urgent effort to secure the release of all remaining hostages held by Hamas, including American citizens, and the need to boost humanitarian aid to Gaza. The high-stakes call coming just a day after top Israeli official Ron Derner met with Secretary of State Blinken at the White House, discussing military operations and the possible return of hostages. But this urgent effort growing more complicated this morning as Israel expands its ground offensive to central Gaza, launching over 200 rockets in a day, Hamas saying more than 250 people were killed in the last 24 hours. Israeli Army Chief of Staff Herzi Halevi now warning the war will continue for many more months. This amid rising concerns the conflict in the region could grow even wider. Israel's defense minister saying the country is now under attack from seven different fronts, including Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon and Iran. <laughs> Protesters there taking to the streets after reports from state media claiming an Israeli airstrike in Syria killed a top Iranian general, directly responsible for arming proxy groups in the region. Iranian officials vowing revenge. And U.S. Central Command confirming Tuesday it shot down ten more drones and five missiles launched by the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. The U.S. military carried out multiple airstrikes in Iraq in retaliation for attacks by Tehran-linked militants. Iran calling it a hostile act that infringed its sovereignty. Alexis. Foreign correspondent Britt Clinton in Israel, thank you. The conflict in the Middle East is adding to security concerns in New York City ahead of New Year's Eve. Law enforcement officials say they're on high alert as an estimated one million revelers will head to Times Square this weekend. Senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky in Times Square with the latest. New York City's getting ready for the biggest party of the year. Three, two, one. Happy New Year! More than a million people are expected to cram into Times Square to watch the ball drop on New Year's Eve. The mayor says police will be prepared. There's always a serious concern around safety in New Year's Eve because there's a large number of people. The police department is on top of it. 
ABC News has obtained a threat assessment by the FBI, NYPD, and other agencies that says the ball drop could draw interest from malicious actors looking for targets of opportunity or from lone offenders inspired by or reacting to the ongoing Israel-Hamas conflict. The security plan includes thousands of officers, miles of metal barricades, plus drones, dogs, and hundreds of surveillance cameras, all to keep the crowds safe. I think it's a pretty safe bet that someone is going to try to do something to distract or disrupt the events in Times Square. In recent years, though, extremists have almost exclusively targeted law enforcement or military personnel. Just a year ago at this very celebration, a young man from Maine attacked police officers with a knife as they worked a security checkpoint. It's a real Herculean task to manage that number of people without being heavy-handed but being protective. One additional concern this year, the possibility demonstrations over the war in Israel could disrupt. But there's no specific threat, and Alexis crowds have been gathering in Times Square on New Year's Eve in some form since 1904. So the police have a long history of keeping things secure. Alexis. All right, senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky, thank you. And now to the crisis at the southern border with Mexico. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and other top U.S. officials are expected to meet with Mexico's president today to discuss the unprecedented surge of migrants. Small towns along the border say they're feeling the pressure. Meanwhile, a caravan of 6,000 migrants is on the move, headed through Mexico and toward the U.S. ABC's Jay O'Brien has the latest now from the White House. Hi, Jay. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas traveling to Mexico City for a high-stakes meeting with the Mexican president to address the ongoing immigration crisis at the southern border. Administration officials expected to push the Mexican government to step up immigration enforcement within their own borders. The urgent meeting comes as migrant border crossings hit historic highs. Border Patrol reporting on average nearly 10,000 apprehensions a day last week. And these images, an apparent caravan of an estimated 6,000 migrants now making their way to the U.S. border. Norve Diaz from Colombia is traveling with his children, saying he's fighting for the well-being of his family. White House officials blaming volatility in Central and South American countries. There's a lot of factors, and part of that is, of course, dealing with instability. But Republicans blasting the president. The policies of the Biden administration are attracting people from all over the world. We have to change those policies to secure our border. Back in the U.S., Border Patrol in places like Eagle Pass, Texas, overwhelmed. And this weekend, buses carrying migrants, nearly 130 in total, stopping in suburbs outside Chicago. The latest in a series of migrants transported to northern cities by Texas Governor Greg Abbott. All of this comes as the White House has now locked intense negotiations with Republicans and Democrats on Capitol Hill over immigration reform that's now been directly linked to any future aid for Israel and Ukraine. And with Congress still out on recess, sources tell us there are no active negotiations happening right now and there are no in-person meetings expected until at least the new year. Alexis? Jay O'Brien there at the White House. Thank you. Coming up, the holiday sales scorecard is out. How much money Americans spent this year and what they spent it on. Also ahead, would you be able to put out a fire in an emergency? The must-see fire safety demo and four steps you need to know to protect you and your family. But first, some of our ABC News colleagues are sharing their New Year's resolutions. Hey, it's Alex Mache from Columbus, Ohio, and my New Year's resolution is to be more connected to the stories that we tell, to the community I belong to, and also to my loved ones. Hi, from the Capitol, I'm Jay O'Brien. I just got engaged, so my New Year's resolution is to plan a wedding while covering all the twists and turns of the presidential election and everything happening here in D.C. Wish me luck. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. 
suffering with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I think it's going to be to read to my eight-year-old every night before bed. But now that she can read, we don't do that very often. To read to her every night a story when she goes to bed. And to win at fantasy football in my league. But that's not realistic. I can't do that. Happy New Year. Happy New Year's, ABC News Live. What would my New Year's resolution be? Wow. Well, I'm hoping the Lakers win another championship and that LeBron James is the MVP. And hoping for being my best at work and at home. My New Year's resolution is to open my mind to dogs because Lord knows cats are the best animals there are. <laughs> Welcome back to ABC News Live First. That was some of our ABC News family sharing their New Year's resolutions for 2024. And maybe your resolution is to be a better shopper and save where you can. That's a good one. Well, the new holiday sales scorecard shows despite lingering effects of high inflation, Americans spent more this year than last year. It's an encouraging sign for the economy. ABC News' Morgan Norwood has the details. Morgan? From winter wardrobes to fine dining, holiday shoppers really showed up this year, easing immediate fears of an economic slowdown. Overall, consumer spending grew by 3.1% compared to the same time last year. But what were we actually buying? Well, it wasn't the fancy pair of earrings or new TVs. Jewelry and electronic purchases actually shrunk. Instead, shoppers went big on clothing, food gathering around the table. You know, look, spending at restaurants jumped nearly 8%. Shoppers also preferred to add to cart versus push the cart as online spending was up 6.3% compared to in-store shopping's 2.2%. So what about the economy for the year ahead? Let's talk about this. Americans continue to spend inflation, which hit its highest level in 40 years earlier this year, has actually cooled to 3%. So people are getting jobs. Unemployment is at a 50-year low. Uh, these are really good signs ahead of 2024. Remember that 2023 recession that experts were predicting? Where? We didn't see that. But if there was anything that initially gave economists pause heading into the holidays, it was the the record high credit card debt Americans picked up once inflation spiked now at more than one trillion dollars. And that was Morgan Norwood. Our thanks to her for that report. Now to a safety alert about the fire hazards in your home, especially during the holidays. Take a look at how quickly a Christmas tree can go up in flames with so many drying trees still up in homes around the country. Look at that. Experts say it's important to have a fire extinguisher and know how to use it. ABC's Whit Johnson put some moms in New Jersey to the test. These women are battling a kitchen fire. <laughs> Fortunately, it's a controlled test created just for them. Oh, my gosh. We set up a fire safety challenge under the careful control of firefighters at the Bergen County Fire Academy. First into the fire, Susie Fine. We're going to put you to the test. Put out that fire. At first, she struggles to pull the pin. But once she gets it free, she's able to move in and quickly extinguish the fire. Up next, mom of two, Jen Altman. Put out that fire. OK, here we go. Shoot. Oh she God. also struggles uh... with the pin and nozzle. Careful I... where you point that. I down. know, right? My house is going to burn. 
and has to step in close as she aims at the top of the flames first, but then corrects herself and is able to sweep the base of the fire, putting it out after 33 seconds. I learned that I need to be more prepared. Up next, Judy Sika. Come on in says they have extinguishers, but admits she's not sure how to actually use one. Oh, God. Oh, wait, there's a lock on it. She forgets to pull the pin. I don't know how to do it. But with a bit of help, is finally able to douse the flames after a nail-biting 44 seconds. Though experts caution that if you can't put out a fire in 30 seconds, you should get out. It's so important to act as quickly as you can. Dial 911, get the fire extinguisher, aim at the fire, try to put the fire out, and then leave. Up last, mom of four, Lisa Ati, has three fire extinguishers at home. Put out that fire right over there. But once she gets the extinguisher, oh, I pull the pin. she oh, struggles God. for almost 20 seconds. I can't get it. Before she is able to tug it free and put out the blaze. Oh. Remember the word pass. First, pull the pin. Then, aim at the base of the fire, Squeeze the handle and sweep side to side. But before you even reach for that extinguisher, firefighters say the first thing you need to do is call 911. Important tips there from Whit Johnson. Thank you. Coming up, lottery fever is taking over. The nearly $700 million Powerball jackpot now up for grabs. And today in our group chat, we're going to talk about how to stick to your New Year's resolutions. And now first, here's some of our ABC News colleagues sharing their goals for 2024. Hi everyone, I'm Emwin with ABC News in Bali, Indonesia, and my New Year's resolutions is to read more and deliver more great stories to you at home. My New Year's resolution is to be calm with uncertainty. Hey, Stephen Portnoy here from ABC News Radio. Happy New Year. This year, I resolved to waste less time on social media and spend more time valuably reading books. Hello from our ABC News booth at the White House. I am Mary Alice Parks, and my New Year's resolution is to not rush so much when I get home. It's important to me that my son, who turns 10 months on Christmas Day, is not only just seeing his mom rush around. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. <laughs> dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner. Oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs. Now streaming on Hulu. <laughs> Reporting in Atlanta, Georgia, outside the Fulton County Courthouse, I'm M. Wynn. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. 
My New Year's resolution is to try to get better at doing little things that can help future me in a very big way. I'm talking about just taking a couple minutes at night to tee things up for the next day so my start to the day isn't so frazzled and my kids can get off to school smoothly, lining up backpacks, making sure the snacks are ready, and for me, making sure the coffee is ready for the next morning for my very early shifts. Our New Year's resolution is to host more dinner parties. What do you think about that? My New Year's resolution is to be present. Don't check the phone all the time. Be present wherever you are. Oh, that's a good one from Martha Raddatz. All right, tonight, lottery fever in America with all eyes on the Powerball jackpot. So the grand prize climbed to an estimated $685 million after no one matched all six numbers during Monday night's drawing. Here's ABC's Andrew Dimbert. It's time to play America's favorite jackpot game. All eyes on tonight's Powerball drawing as it climbs to an estimated $685 million after no ticket matched all six numbers on Christmas Day. Lottery fever growing across the country as people try to roll their luck before the next drawing. What I would do is do my best to help the family, community, charities. Go on vacation, you know, buy a new house. The chances of winning are, well, slim. Just one in 292.2 million, according to Powerball. But not all was lost with Monday's Powerball drawing at this Nashua, New Hampshire convenience store. It's about time! The store manager was thrilled to be the store to give one lucky winner $1 million. Back in 2019, Mike Worski won a $273 million Mega Millions jackpot after a stranger returned his lost winning ticket in New Jersey. We interviewed him in July, and what's his advice to others who might win it big? The best thing I can tell them is invest the money and get ready to learn how to say no, because everybody's going to come at you looking for money. So a few tickets around the country narrowly missed by just one number, but they were still good for a $1 to $2 million payday. Not the worst Christmas gift, if you ask me, Alexis. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll take it, Andrew Dimbert. Thank you. Coming up, a grim discovery in Texas, what appears to be a tragic ending in the search for a missing pregnant woman. Also ahead, the new scandal linked to the trial of convicted murderer Alex Murdoch, what it could mean for the push for a retrial. Plus, Uber for the win, the new way to handle your holiday returns without leaving your home. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. The year 2023. High stakes, high emotion, high drama. Yeah. Not tonight. <gasps> Amazing. The absolute wildest year. We're breaking it all down. Taylor Swift, Beyonce, Barbie. Can you get all that in there? And the stories that make you go, huh? You kidding? Can we say that on ABC? Yeah. Deal with it. It's the year 2023 with Robin Roberts. Getting ready to kiss. 2023 goodbye. Tonight on ABC. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Whenever, 
wherever news breaks. It's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, the Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Thanks for streaming with us. You are looking at the fog, trying to lift here above New York City on this Wednesday. We've got a lot of news to get to, so here's the rundown right now. A massive winter blast making travel treacherous this holiday week. More than a foot of snow has already pounded parts of the heartland with wind drifts forcing some highways to shut down. Now heavy rains and dense fog cutting visibility on the I-95 corridor. A commercial jet carrying more than 200 migrants from El Paso to New York City was diverted to Philadelphia due to bad weather. They were later put on buses. Some advocates believe Texas Governor Greg Abbott chartered the flight as officials struggle to cope with a record surge of migrants at the southern border. The governor's office has not claimed responsibility for the flight and has not yet responded to our requests for comment. And South Korean actor Lee Sun Kyun has died. He is best known for his role in the Oscar-winning movie Parasite. Police are investigating the death as a possible suicide, but few details are known at this time. Lee Sun Kyun was just 48 years old. And if you are struggling with mental health distress, including thoughts of suicide, substance use, or emotional distress, you're not alone. Text or dial 988 and free help is available 24-7. We have some breaking news now. The Michigan Supreme Court has rejected an appeal seeking to keep former President Trump off the state's 2024 ballot. The watchdog group Free Speech for People filed the challenge seeking to bar Trump from the ballot on constitutional grounds. They argue the 14th Amendment bars anyone who has engaged in insurrection from running for office and that Trump's actions on January 6th disqualify him from holding office again. Now, this comes after Colorado Supreme Court court came to the opposite conclusion, ruling Trump would be kept off that state's primary ballot. That case now appears headed for the U.S. Supreme Court. An investigation underway in Texas after the family of a pregnant teenager says she and her boyfriend were found dead. Authorities are not yet identifying the bodies which were discovered in a vehicle in San Antonio on Tuesday evening. Police calling the case, quote, very, very perplexing. Here's ABC's Andrea Fujii. This morning, what appears to be a tragic update in the search for a pregnant woman in Texas. The family of 18-year-old Savannah Soto says she and her boyfriend, Matthew Guerra, were found dead yesterday in a car outside a San Antonio apartment complex, three miles from Soto's home. But police are not yet confirming the identities of the victims. It appears to be a very complex crime scene. Soto, last seen near her home Friday, was nine months pregnant and one week past her due date. Her family says she was scheduled to be induced at the hospital Saturday, but never showed up. When I called her all morning, she wasn't answering. I was going straight to voicemail. And we went to the hospital anyways, and she was a no-show. And that's when I called the cops. She was so excited to have this baby. I mean, her, her, the house is already baby ready. She was so excited. She was going to be a mommy. Officials releasing few details, also not confirming how the victims died. But what we're looking at right now is a very, very perplexing crime scene. And detectives right now are looking at this as a possible murder. And uh, but we don't know for sure. Officials did say the bodies appear to have been inside the car for three to four days. According to court documents, Guerra was on probation for allegedly assaulting Soto on Christmas Day last year. I wasn't fond of him because of when he put hands on my daughter. The family is familiar with heartache. Soto's younger brother died in a shooting last year. 
That was Andrea Fujii reporting. Her family says Soto wanted to become a nurse. Again, police have not confirmed the victim's identity, saying the investigation is ongoing. There's a new twist in the case of convicted murderer Alex Murdoch, who is currently serving life in prison for the murder of his wife and son. The outspoken court clerk in his case is now under fire after writing a book about the trial and the Murdoch family. In an ABC News exclusive, her co-author now says she plagiarized part of it, putting her credibility in question once again. But will it get Murdoch a new trial? ABC News' Trevor Alt has the details. Yet another twist and scandal surrounding the trial of convicted murderer Alec Murdoch, once again centered around the county clerk who read his verdict. Guilty, guilty, guilty. In the aftermath of that bombshell trial, Becky Hill co-wrote Behind the Doors of Justice, The Murdoch Murders, in which she details her role in the trial and her decades-long personal relationship with the Murdoch family. But she's now accused of plagiarizing a section of that book. I was shocked. I was disappointed. I was sad. Neil Gordon is the book's co-author. He says he discovered what he called the ethical gaffe while reviewing thousands of Hill's emails that had been released to reporters through Freedom of Information Act requests. She said that she felt like she was under a lot of deadline pressure and she remembered that that particular article was on her email. This screenshot shows in February, Hill received a lengthy excerpt of an article by a BBC journalist about the trial. It appears Hill copied from it directly for the opening of the book, prompting Gordon to publicly apologize to the BBC and the reporter. I decided to look at our book because the words were very familiar to me. And sure enough, it was the preface of our book. I was sick to my stomach. Hill has spoken openly about the Murdoch trial on numerous occasions, including giving an interview in a Netflix documentary series about the case. I had a feeling from our time together with the jury out at Moselle that it was not going to take our jury long to make the decision in this case. In a statement responding to these new allegations, Hill's attorneys say she's deeply remorseful for this unfortunate lapse in judgment. And this comes just months after Alec Murdoch's attorneys had accused Hill of jury tampering, saying she pressured jurors to reach a quick verdict in hopes of securing a book deal for herself, a claim she denied and prosecutors called unfounded and not credible. Because of the seriousness of these charges, when the judge holds the evidentiary hearing to consider whether to grant a new trial, Becky Hill probably won't be able to testify. If she does, she's going to risk being cross-examined and her credibility is completely shot because now she's an admitted liar. And Alexis, Becky Hill's attorney says she reached out to that BBC journalist to personally apologize. The book had been self-published, only available through Amazon and Audible. Both authors now say it has since been unpublished. Alexis? Trevor Alt, thank you. And ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer joining me now for more on this. Brian, this all comes, of course, on the heels of that jury tampering accusation. So how does this new development about Hill's book impact the case, and could this lead to a mistrial? Well, good morning, Alexis. And, and the short answer is yes. The defense is going to paint this ethical gaffe, as Gordon, the co-author of the book, puts it, and saying this isn't just that a co-author ripped information from one article and put it into her book, but the actual BBC author said that she mistakenly sent it to Becky Hill, asked her to delete it. She didn't. And in fact, the next day, Becky Hill emailed a friend saying, look at what a friend is working on. That was back in February 20th. This book was published in July 20th, some five months after. So what are the deadlines? What are the pressures that she's feeling? That could be something she faces on cross-examination at an evidentiary hearing asking for a mistrial. So could Becky Hill then face a lawsuit for plagiarism, do you think? Absolutely. So plagiarism is a copyright infringement uh, violation. Now, she's self-published, so luckily for her, she's not going to have a publisher coming after her, but the BBC um, author or reporter of that article could come after her. It's probably why they stopped publishing the book to limit any potential damages after they found the fault, and also why they're looking to apologize to try to stop any potential upcoming litigation. And Brian, what happens for Alex Murdoch now? This just becomes more fuel for the fire. Now, 
Ultimately, he's serving a life sentence for the double murder of his wife and his young son, but also he's facing 27 years for the financial crimes that he later, later pled guilty to. So this might be less about getting him out of prison anytime soon and more about clearing his name. He's always been very adamant that he committed financial crimes, but he did not kill his family. All right, ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer, thank you. Coming My up... Life. Spot the hazard. We teamed up with the CPSC to help one family find the commonly overlooked dangers that parents should be aware of to help keep their kids safe. And what are your goals for 2024? We're taking it to the group chat for some tips. But first, some of our ABC News colleagues are sharing their New Year's resolutions. New Year's resolution. Actually, let's make it resolutions. Break more news, read more books, try to find a way to maybe get a little more sleep. My resolution for next year is to keep reporting on Ukraine. The world's attention has obviously drifted away from the war there. That's why I think next year will be more important than ever to keep covering it. My New Year's resolution this year, pretty simple. Spend less time scrolling TikTok and more time playing pickleball. My resolution this year is to donate more of my time to charity all throughout the year. The year 2023. High stakes, high emotion, high drama. Yeah. Now tonight, it's the year 2023 with Robin Roberts. I'm getting ready to kiss. 2023 goodbye. Tonight on ABC. Get ready, America. Every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis, weeknights on ABC News Live. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. My New Year's resolution is to have my toddler eat more vegetables. So my New Year's resolution is to spend less time on screens online and more time in real life, in the real world, with real people I care about. My 2024 New Year resolution, I want to be able to read 10 books and also do 10 push-ups. So here's to that. Here's to strengthening my mind and my body. My New Year's resolution this year, to be more on time. Yikes. Welcome back. We may think we know what it takes to childproof a home, but there are unexpected dangers that many of us miss. ABC's Eva Pilgrim brought a safety expert to the home of a family with two young kids to spot the hidden hazards in their kitchen and bedroom. Take a look. For Yemi and Taiwo Yeni, keeping their home safe for their two kids is a priority, especially with a curious toddler. This is sort of the phase I feel like where they like could do themselves the most harm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. GMA working with the Consumer Product Safety Commission to set up some child-proofing hazards in the Oyeni's home to see if they can spot them. You can't remove all hazards. No. So what, what's a parent to do? It's taking the extra steps to uh, prevent some of the hazards that exist. Starting in their daughter's room. The chest dresser is probably a hazard. You're supposed to, you know, 
bolted to the wall. We never did that. That's correct. Furniture should be anchored. Nothing in the room that they can climb on, especially with the window that we have over here. And question if it's time to change out the crib. She's yeah. been trying to climb it. Time to bring in the chairman of the CPSC to tell them how they did. You pointed out the, the dresser and the risk of tip overs. Nearly 200 kids have died in dresser related tip overs in the past two decades. As you pointed out, windows are risky for kids. Installing uh, window stops or guards can help prevent a fall. And as for when it's time to transition the crib, you want to do that before she actually climbs out. One other hazard he spots. You have a lot of uh, outlets. Make sure to install outlet covers anywhere a child can access. Next, can they spot the hazards in the kitchen? This could be hot. Making sure that the handles are away from the edge. I usually just prefer to use the middle burner. Clean supplies in here, so this yeah. needs to be locked. Correct. Cleaning supplies should be stored in a locked cabinet or up high. But did they spot all the hazards? You pointed out that the handle of the pan was, you know, over here. <laughs> and if a kid's running by, it's so easy to grab it. Absolutely. And then it goes everywhere. And the stove knobs should have covers. So, he points out a couple additional hazards they missed. Towel hanging on something, it makes it so much easier for a child just to pull on something and open. And they overlooked a set of keys. These tiny little batteries are so easy to swallow by a child. The CPSC says to keep yeah. items with button batteries out of reach. You spotted a lot of the, the hazards that are out there. <laughs> and you know, taking care of those means that it's just a safer environment for everybody. Great advice. I remember those days. Eva Pilgrim, thank you. Coming up, a new year, a new you. How to motivate yourself to stick to your New Year's resolutions. Also ahead was the night before Christmas, a little boy on a mission. The viral image showing him unwrapping every gift under the tree. But first, some of our ABC News colleagues are sharing their New Year's resolutions with us. My resolution for 2024 is to do one thing each day that makes somebody, whether it's a viewer, a colleague, friend, family, whoever, smile because kindness is contagious. And my hope for the new year is that we can get a little chain reaction going of kindness. Happy holidays. A mobility exercise every single day. By any means necessary, even for a few minutes, that's my resolution. So I'm probably joining the masses when I say this one, but in 2024, I really want to find more time to work out consistently and just cook healthier meals more often. So my New Year's resolution this year is to get more sleep. That's my New Year's resolution every year. We'll see how it goes. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. 
Hello. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. <laughs> dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner. Oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs. Now streaming on Hulu. <laughs> Reporting from the aftermath of the Maui fires, I'm Melissa Adon. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Oh my goodness, I mean, I, literally, I have so many, but in uh, 2024, I want to enter a car race at the Nürburgring, and I want to learn some new, some new salsa steps in 2024. My New Year's resolution this year is to spend as much time as possible with my kids. Happy New Year! Happy New Year! We can all get on board with that. Welcome back, everybody. So we're counting down to the new year, and just like our ABC News colleagues, many are starting to think about their New Year's resolutions. But how can you motivate yourself to stick to those goals throughout 2024? Let's take this to our group chat, motivational speaker and life coach, Gio Derice, founder and lead nutritionist at Maya Feller Nutrition, Maya Feller, and personal finance content creator, Humphrey Yang. Great to have you all here with us today. Gio, I want to start with you here at the desk. Your biggest piece of advice to find that motivation and to stick to those goals in the new year. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is really attaching it to identity. I think a lot of times we always have these goals of, here's the new behaviors I'm gonna do. But the identity precedes the behaviors. It's like when I tell my son, you're a dog, he automatically barks, right? <laughs> and so those ideas of what is a word that you would like to use that would anchor your year, but make sure that it's something that um, is an identity face. So like for me, it's provoke. But I would say I'm a provoker. So for the, two, the new year, I would provoke certain things, steer it up. That means go get a gym membership. Go ahead and change your, your nutrition. Right. So just doing something, but having the identity be the biggest piece is what's going to really anchor you throughout the year. And have it be something that's actionable. It sounds 100%. like that. 100%. To provoke is actionable. Yes. All right. So Maya, I want to get to you. Many people say their New Year's resolution is to be healthier. That's a good one. You say that small steps are key here. So what are some small steps that we can practice to get towards that goal? Absolutely. So most people say, you know, I'm going to rehaul my entire eating plan. And what I say to folks is think about the small things that you want to do. For example, do you want to eat more vegetables? What are the vegetables that are accessible, affordable, culturally relevant to you that you can add into your pattern of eating day after day? You like broccoli? What are the ways that you can get broccoli in? You can do fresh, you can do frozen, you can do boxed, you can do freeze dried. Think about those small, small steps. Also think about how you can add rather than reduce. Oftentimes, you know, we like to cut out foods. Think about what you can put on your plate and eat from around the globe. As you choose flavors, temperatures, and textures, and you go all around the globe, you're gonna have so much nutrient-rich food that add excitement to your plate. And I, I like that, add something instead of taking away. It's all in the attitude. So Humphrey, let's talk money. That's my, that's my wheelhouse. Some resolutions on saving money. Now you say saving $10,000 in 2024 could be achieved by simple lifestyle fixes. Tell us about that. Yeah, so if you break down your $10,000 savings goal over the course of, let's say, 12 months, it's about $833 a month that you need to save, which comes out to about $27 a day. So if you do some simple lifestyle fixes, like perhaps you maybe eat out once per week instead of twice per week, so you eat out one, ex, you know, one times less per week out, that could save you $10 to $20 uh, uh, per day. And then if you, you know, cancel subscriptions, perhaps you switch your insurance providers, Maybe you make some coffee at home here and there. The idea is that as long as you can work these habits into your normal everyday lifestyle, you can start to see those savings really add up. And sometimes it's just these simple lifestyle fixes. You know, you make a small change here and that compounds over the entire year. And so that's what I really try to advocate for is like, let's try to see if we can just clean up our spending habits just a little bit through the new year. Yeah, baby steps, right? So Gio, what's your advice uh, for picking up new skills or hobbies? A lot of us want to do that too in the new year. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is to make sure that you pick something that is exciting but also has challenges. Which are, What it allows is for you to go and reach milestones throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So you don't like fade out of your New Year's resolutions in like March, right? So you want to do something like whether it's 
picking up a new book, writing a book about your life story, maybe picking up dance lessons, I need them, and then um, <laughs> just, you know, just some fun things and activities that you could do. But I think the biggest thing is milestones because that way you can get excited over and over again. Absolutely, I know that I need them. One of my milestones is that I want to come up with a family cookbook. I keep telling the kids they want me to do it, this is the year, guys. I'm going to do it. Do I'm going to sit down and actually do it with pictures and everything. So, Maya, you suggest that people seek out foods from around the world. You mentioned that a moment ago to stick to eating better. Talk to us a little bit more about that. Absolutely. So, you know, as a person of Afro-Caribbean descent, I love flavor. And I work with people who are always saying, you know, I'm in a food rut, and that can be so, so real. And what I say to them is I want you to think about the color that's on your plate as well as the flavor that's showing up. And what we find is when people actually add all of these wonderful flavors in, herbs, spices, you know, not only are we increasing the bioavailability, what the nutrients are on our plate and in our body, we're also more likely to return to that healthy plate and want to eat it over and over again. Yeah, find some condiments you like too, right? Pour that on as well. Uh, doesn't It also helps with the calorie count, I think. So Humphrey, want to get in another money question. What's a good way to budget for something to make sure that we're not overspending this year? Because just because we have the money doesn't necessarily mean we should be spending it, right? Exactly. I think one way, one easy way to do it is that if you, even if you have the money for something, it doesn't mean that you can afford it. So oftentimes, you know, a general rule that you can think of is like, if you can buy it twice, then you can afford it. But another thing you can think about is to think about your discretionary purchases as if it's a percentage of your monthly income. So let's say you make $3,000 a month. If you're trying to contemplate a decision that's a $300 purchase, that's 10% of your income. So if you think about it in that way, in percentage terms, it can really give you some perspective in how much you're spending of your monthly income, as well as the fact is, if you think about how much it costs you in terms of your hourly wages, that could be another good way to kind of decide if you really want to make that purchase or not and really try to question, you know, be introspective and question if you need that purchase or not. Yeah, a little self-reflection to start the new year for sure. Motivational speaker and life coach Gio Duris, founder and lead nutritionist at Maya Feller Nutrition, Maya Feller, and personal finance content creator Humphrey Yang. Our thanks to you all. May we all stick to our New Year's resolutions. And now to a toddler who may need to make patience his resolution. The three-year-old just couldn't wait to open his Christmas gifts. His parents could not believe what they found under the tree at three in the morning. ABC News' Andrew Dimbert has the details. Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature was stirring. <laughs> Except for a three-year-old? Both of us uh, went to sleep uh, thinking everything was fine, everything was great. And then we were awoken uh, with a request for scissors, which is not really how you want to be woken up at 3 a.m. Not an odd request, considering it was Christmas morning, but it was alarming because it was 3 in the morning. It just didn't enter our heads as a possibility that someone would go down and open all the presents. Parents Scott and Katie Reinken went downstairs to find every single present unwrapped, paper strewn about, and gift bags upended. And you could see the presents he didn't really care about because he, would, he ripped them open, looked at them, and moved on to the next one. But literally every little tiny thing except for the stockings were unwrapped. The toddler explaining his altruistic motive. He like told us, he was like, well, I just was trying to make it less confusing. I wanted to open them so that everyone kind of understood like what presents were for who. The parents quickly re-wrapping as best they could with the other two children, none the wiser, caught up in the magic of Christmas morning. It's like, it was hard to be mad at them. Like, we, we just know what a joyous sort of thing that was. It caused us some brief panic. And then, you know what? We enjoyed the rest of our day. <laughs> Those kids meant business. Andrew Dimbert, thank you. Next year, the family says they'll be keeping the presents out of reach up until a reasonable hour on Christmas morning. That does sound reasonable. Thanks so much for streaming with us. I'm Alexis Christophorus. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. The year 2023. High stakes, high emotion, high drama. Now tonight. Amazing. The absolute wildest year. We're breaking it all down. Taylor Swift, Beyonce, Barbie. Can you get all that in there? And the stories that make you go, huh. 
You kidding? Can we say that on ABC? <laughs> Deal with it. It's the year 2023 with Robin Roberts. Getting ready to kiss 2023 goodbye. Tonight on ABC. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoon. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Everybody, I'm Alexis Christophorus today on ABC News Live First. Rising tensions. Israel's defense minister says it's under attack from seven different fronts as it expands its ground assault in Gaza. The U.S. firing back at Iran linked militants near the Red Sea. The fears of the war spreading in the region growing. Breaking news Michigan's Supreme Court has rejected an appeal seeking to keep former President Trump off the state's 2024 ballot. What's next in the legal battle is another case appears headed for the U.S. Supreme Court. Court. Massive winter blast, blizzard conditions in five states as more than a foot of snow pounds parts of the heartland with winds whipping up snow drifts, forcing highways to shut down. Heavy rains and dense fog now coating the east, cutting visibility along the I-95 corridor. And now the heavy rain moving in. We are tracking it all for you. And on the move as millions make their way home from the holidays. What could be a record-setting few days at the nation's airports, staff shortages leading to hours-long lines and snow forcing cancellations in Denver. What to expect if you're heading out today. But we begin with the White House and leaders in the Middle East hoping to find a way forward in Gaza. Overnight, President Biden spoke to the leader of Qatar in a high-stakes phone call discussing efforts to secure the release of more than 100 hostages still held in Gaza. This comes as the fighting there intensifies and the U.S. responds to another round of attacks by Iran-backed militants. Foreign correspondent Britt Klinet has the latest from Israel. President Biden speaking with Qatar Zamir, talking in a phone call about the urgent effort to secure the release of all remaining hostages held by Hamas, including American citizens, and the need to boost humanitarian aid to Gaza. The high-stakes call coming just a day after top Israeli official Ron Derner met with Secretary of State Blinken at the White House, discussing military operations and the possible return of hostages. But this urgent effort growing more complicated this morning as Israel expands its ground offensive to central Gaza, launching over 200 rockets in a day, Hamas saying more than 250 people were killed in the last 24 hours. Israeli Army Chief of Staff Herzi Halevi now warning the war will continue for many more months. This amid rising concerns the conflict in the region could grow even wider. Israel's defense minister saying the country is now under attack from seven different fronts, including Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon and Iran. 
Protesters there taking to the streets after reports from state media claiming an Israeli airstrike in Syria killed a top Iranian general directly responsible for arming proxy groups in the region. Iranian officials vowing revenge. And U.S. Central Command confirming Tuesday it shot down 10 more drones and five missiles launched by the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. Foreign correspondent Britt Clinton joins me now from Tel Aviv. So, Britt, yesterday you and I talked about the Israeli War Cabinet meeting to discuss possible hostage deals. Since then, there have been new talks between the White House and leaders in the Middle East. So where do hostage negotiations and a ceasefire deal stand right now? Well, look, there hasn't been much movement. The Qataris are working on it. The Egyptians are working on it. These regional players are extremely important to act as uh, a middle player, you know, middle ground, creating uh, some kind of uh, narrowing the divide in some shape or form. Uh, the Israelis say they are discussing a deal to release the hostages, but I speak to those hostage families every single day, and the desperation I hear from them, the calls for negotiations just grow stronger every single day. They are extremely frustrated that there just hasn't been a deal. And we saw uh, the Egyptian... Seems we may have lost uh, her for just a moment. Britt Clinton will try to get back to her a bit later on, but our thanks to her for that report. Elsewhere today, the Michigan Supreme Court has rejected an appeal seeking to keep former President Trump off the state's 2024 ballot. The watchdog group Free Speech for People filed the challenge seeking to bar Trump from the ballot on constitutional grounds. They argue the 14th Amendment bars anyone who has engaged in insurrection from running for office and that Trump's actions on January 6th disqualify qualify him from holding office again. Let's bring in senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky for more joining me here at the desk. Good to see you again, Aaron. You too. So this, of course, comes after Colorado's Supreme Court came to the opposite uh, conclusion, ruling that Trump would be kept off that state's uh, primary ballot. That case now appears headed for the U.S. Supreme Court. So what happens next? How significant, I guess, is this decision today? Well, it's significant in that we now have competing views. Uh, although the Michigan Supreme Court did not weigh the issues the way the Colorado Supreme Court did, it just declined to hear the appeal. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what additional arguments may have been made, whether something new may have been brought to the fore in Michigan. The Supreme Court simply affirmed the decision of two lower courts to say that Trump belongs on the ballot and that the challenges by the group uh, that you mentioned just didn't need to be uh, heard at the highest level. But it does now present an interesting dichotomy because you have competing decisions in the states uh, so it does seem ripe for U.S. Supreme Court review. Meaning that other states may just pick a side at this point because there seems to be a case to, for either side to be made. Well, in some ways, yes, and there are decisions pending in more than a dozen states where legal challenges to Trump's ballot eligibility have been filed. Now, some of those are left to the courts. In the case of Maine, for example, it's left to the, the Secretary of State, and, and we're expecting a decision from the Secretary of State in Maine any day now. Mm -hmm. So it depends how the state laws are, are structured and who gets to hear the challenges, who gets to decide. But in the case of, of Colorado, certainly we do expect former President Trump to file an appeal, though he hasn't done it yet. All right, senior investigative uh, correspondent Aaron Katursky. They're keeping you on your toes with all of these Truly. decisions. Thank you. Thanks, Alexis. All right, now to the crisis at the southern border with Mexico. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and other top U.S. officials are expected to meet with Mexico's president today to discuss the unprecedented surge of migrants. Small towns along the border say they're feeling the pressure. Meanwhile, a caravan of 6,000 migrants is on the move, headed through Mexico and toward the U.S. ABC sees Jay O'Brien has the latest from the White House. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas traveling to Mexico City for a high-stakes meeting with the Mexican president to address the ongoing immigration crisis at the southern border. Administration officials expected to push the Mexican government to step up immigration enforcement within their own borders. The urgent meeting comes as migrant border crossings hit historic highs. Border Patrol reporting on average nearly 10,000 apprehensions a day last week. And these images, an apparent caravan of an estimated 6,000 migrants now making their way to the U.S. border. Norve Diaz from Colombia is traveling with his children. Saying he's fighting for the well-being of his family. White House officials blaming volatility in Central and South American countries. There's a lot of factors, and part of that is 
of course, dealing with instability. But Republicans blasting the president. The policies of the Biden administration are attracting people from all over the world. We have to change those policies to secure our border. Back in the U.S., Border Patrol in places like Eagle Pass, Texas, overwhelmed. And this weekend, buses carrying migrants, nearly 130 in total, stopping in suburbs outside Chicago. The latest in a series of migrants transported to northern cities by Texas Governor Greg Abbott. All of this comes as the White House is now locked in tense negotiations with Republicans and Democrats on Capitol Hill over immigration reform that's now been directly linked to any future aid for Israel and Ukraine. And with Congress still out on recess, sources tell us there are no active negotiations happening right now and there are no in-person meetings expected until at least the new year. Alexis? Jay O'Brien at the White House, thank you. And now to that triple threat of dangerous and extreme weather in the nation's heartland, the aftermath of a winter blizzard and dangerous ice storm is making for treacherous travel conditions. That same storm now heading east, bringing rain and dense fog, making city skylines nearly invisible. While out west, rain and snow expected in Washington, Oregon, and California. Flash flooding, now a major possibility in parts of Northern California. All of this threatening to disrupt travel ahead of tomorrow, which AAA reports could be one of the busiest travel days of the year. ABC's transportation correspondent Gio Benitez has been following the travel rush, but we want to begin with meteorologist Samara Theodore tracking those dangerous storms. A major winter storm on the move, pummeling parts of the plains with heavy snow, strong wind, unrelenting ice, and whiteout conditions. From Colorado to South Dakota, authorities issuing a blizzard warning. But across the region, the icy roads also a major threat. This truck spinning out of control, crashing into an ambulance in Oregon. Luckily, no injuries were reported. In South Dakota, cars stuck on the side of the road, some in ditches, officials closing I-90 after blizzard conditions. Authorities in Denver, Colorado, forced to shut down portions of I-70 after slick, hazardous conditions. An ice storm damaging dozens of power lines in Fargo, North Dakota, leaving more than 7,000 people in the dark. Parts of this storm system making its way east, already impacting areas in the northeast with fog. In Boston, skyscrapers peeking out from the dense fog. And overnight, a flight transporting over 200 migrants from Texas to New York City was diverted to Philadelphia due to weather conditions. The worst of the winter portion of that storm has now moved out, but we're dealing with all of the rain to come and the fog. So many East Coast cities have been shrouded in fog. You can see that here in New York City. All right, so let's talk about the timing on this rain. So as we head through Wednesday, we, some, we see some of the heaviest rain making its way into the mid-Atlantic region, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and then through tonight, that heavy rain travels into New Jersey, Philadelphia, even New York City, parts of Long Island getting in on some of that heavy rain. It could lead to flash flooding one to two inches possible. By Thursday morning, the worst of it is then in New England before it departs. How much rain are we talking? Well, we could see anywhere from two to three inches of rain. It's not just about the number there. It's about how quickly this rain is coming down that could really lead to flooding in parts of the Delmarva Peninsula and right on into south New Jersey, just outside of Philadelphia. Finally, on the back end of this system, still some straggling snow trying to hold out, sweeping deep into the Tennessee Valley. And look at the temperatures. This is wind chills, what it's going to feel like Friday afternoon in Nashville, just around freezing. Back to you, Alexis. Samara Theodore, thank you. That winter storm is impacting travel plans now for millions of Americans making their way home from Christmas and getting ready for the new year. The TSA says the busiest days for travelers are expected to be the last until January 2nd. Just yesterday, the TSA says more than two and a half million people made their way through airports nationwide. Here's ABC News transportation correspondent Gio Benitez. The mad dash to get back home after millions of travelers hit the roads and skies for Christmas. Both our flights left late. You've got to expect it to be crazy. The TSA is screening more than 14 and a half million people at airports between last Wednesday when the holiday rush began through Christmas Day Monday. That's almost two million more than last year. The lines of TSA have been going really well. Um, long but smooth. Travel itself also mostly smooth with airlines like American and United reporting their best performance ever. But TSA and FAA staffing issues creating hiccups at Atlanta's Hartsfield Jackson International Airport, the busiest in the world. Our Faith Abube was there. 
where you can see the TSA screening line is wrapped around the atrium. It goes all the way over there. Some travelers telling me it's taken them about two hours from the time they walk through the doors to drop off their bags to getting through the security line. We've never seen it this crazy. We live here, so we know to get here way early. The TSA telling ABC News we did have an unusual number of employees call in sick today. Additionally, there were blizzard warnings issued, creating a very busy morning at ATL. I think we're in a way probably twice as long as our flight. And in Denver, ground stops because of weather and staffing at air traffic control. Super busy. It was kind of like organized craziness. Yeah. <laughs> And the next busiest day for air travel is this Friday, so make sure you get ready for that. Meanwhile, the roads are going to be busy today between 1 and 7 p.m., so try to get out there early or later tonight. But the gas prices, they're looking pretty good. They're at 312 a gallon right now. That's the national average. That's up a bit over last week, but still down 13 cents from a month ago. Alexis. All right, a sliver of good news there. Gio Benitez, thank you. Coming up, the new details involving Apple Watches and an ongoing patent rights dispute. Also ahead, the convenient new ways to return those unwanted holiday gifts. But first, some of our ABC News colleagues are sharing their New Year's resolutions. I think it's going to be to read to my eight-year-old every night before bed, but now that she can read, we don't do that very often. To read to her every night a story when she goes to bed and to win at fantasy football in my league, but that's not realistic. I can't do that. Happy New Year. Happy New Year's, ABC News Live. What would my New Year's resolution be? Well, I'm hoping the Lakers win another championship and LeBron James is the MVP, and I'm hoping for being my best at work at it. My New Year's resolution is to open my mind to dogs because Lord knows cats are the best animals there are. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crooks, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner Oh, Crooks 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. with ABC News in Bali, Indonesia, and my New Year's resolution is to read more and deliver more great stories to you at home. My New Year's resolution is to be calm with uncertainty. Hey, Stephen Portnoy here from ABC News Radio. Happy New Year. This year, I resolved to waste less time on social media and spend more time valuably reading books. Hello from our ABC News booth at the White House. I am Mary Alice Parks, and my New Year's resolution is to not rush so much when I get home. It's important to me that my son, who turns 10 months on Christmas Day, is not only just seeing his mom rush around. I like it. Welcome back.
We're counting down to 2024, and we've got a unique spot you could ring in the new year in today's business headlines. But first, Apple has appealed a ruling that banned imports of the latest Apple Watches over a patent rights dispute with a medical monitoring company. The ruling by federal regulators took effect yesterday. At issue is a blood oxygen sensing technology by a company called Massimo, which also accused Apple of hiring away its workers. Another ruling is due in January. Amazon Prime Video subscribers were warned earlier this year, and now a date has been set. Beginning January 29th, movies and TV shows on the service will be broken up with advertising. Amazon says it plans to have fewer ads than other streaming providers. Ad-free programming will cost an extra $2.99 a month. And if you're looking for a spot in the middle of Times Square to see the ball drop, maybe a little open bar and dinner, how about Applebee's? For about $650 per person, you can grab a seat at a table for you and six friends. You'll also be escorted to see the ball drop. You can check their website for pricing as space gets filled up at two of their locations near Times Square. And if you have any finance questions for me, leave a message on our Instagram feed. I might just answer your question right here on Thursday. Always love hearing from you guys. Meanwhile, the holiday return rush is now on, but the thought of going to a shipper and getting in all those lines can be pretty daunting. But now there are some ways to avoid it. Call an Uber. GMA3, GMA3 anchor Eva Pilgrim has a look at that new feature. If you find yourself with a special gift, like Clark from the movie National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. What is it? It's a, a one-year membership in the Jelly of the Month Club. Then now is the time to make those returns. It's a gift that keeps on giving. Companies like Uber are making what can be a daunting task easier with a new return a package feature, which they talk to us exclusively about. With returns, it's another hassle. Uh, for consumers today, and what we offer is that time savings. To see how it works, we gave it a try. Too small, sending it back. First, I package up my Amazon return, address too small for my daughter, then open the Uber app as if I'm going to order a car, but instead hit this package icon. We've got a driver, 18 minutes away it says. Once the driver arrives, I hand them my return package, and in this case, he takes it off to the local UPS store. The service can drop packages at UPS, FedEx, or USPS locations. It costs $5 a trip for up to five packages or $3 for Uber One members. If you are an Uber One member, we're running a holiday special. It is free returns all the way through January 6th. Known for its food delivery, DoorDash is also getting in on the return game. The company offering deliveries to UPS, FedEx, and USPS. It'll cost you $5 a trip for up to five packages, but through December 30th, DoorDash is offering free package pickups for all users. For our return with Uber, the driver texted us when he arrived to the UPS store and we were able to track his trip. Okay, I just got a notification that the driver has returned the package and he even took a copy of a receipt so that I can see that it was... An easy return and one less errand to run. Good job, Eva Pilgrim. Our thanks to her for that. And coming up, the Colorado man on a mission attempting to set a new record. How he plans to travel from California to Hawaii while going green at the same time. And as we head into the new year, some of our ABC News colleagues are making their resolutions. Hey, it's Alex Prashay from Columbus, Ohio. And my New Year's resolution is to be more connected to the stories that I tell, to the community I belong to, and also to my loved ones. Hi, from the Capitol, I'm Jay O'Brien. I just got engaged, so my New Year's resolution is to plan a wedding while covering all the twists and turns of the presidential election and everything happening here in D.C. Wish me luck. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news.
give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. A 36-year-old man from Boulder, Colorado is attempting to set a new record by rowing 5,000 miles solo from Hawaii to Australia while dedicating his journey to saving the planet. It's the second leg of an adventure for Tez Steinberg, who rowed for 71 days in 2020 from Monterey, California to Oahu, Hawaii. Take a look. If you want to badly enough, anyone could row across an ocean. My name is Tez Steinberg. So I'm setting out to row a boat by myself from Hawaii to Australia, over 5,000 miles in four months alone. I got into endurance sports while going through depression in college, started racing and it helped me feel better. But as I went farther and farther, I discovered this belief in myself that I'm so much stronger than I thought I was. And then in 2016, after years of racing, my father, suddenly died and he actually took his life. After he died, I decided to row across an ocean by myself. I thought if someone who's not a rower, not a sailor can row across an ocean, maybe it can also inspire other people to believe in themselves and their potential to change and grow. I'm completely alone at sea. There's no support boat, no chase boat. I bring everything I need for the whole time. So 800,000 calories of food, all the supplies, equipment, medical supplies. This wild expedition is an idea that came to me when I was at sea in my first expedition. In 2020, I rode a boat, the same boat, from California to Hawaii, a 71-day row. And while I was at sea, I saw so much plastic. I saw plastic every day. It took me about a year to feel normal again. It was actually really difficult to integrate the polarity of the experience of being at sea, of seeing all this beautiful wildlife, and at the same time, see all the plastic that they're swimming through. When I came back and I rested and got to a spot where I was ready to take on this next expedition and focus it on ocean conservation. And, and so that's one of the greatest challenges is taking what we have and adapting to it, whether you're in a boat or you're in life. We often tell ourselves a story about what we need to do or achieve before we go after our dreams. Or we tell ourselves a story that we can't fix climate change or we can't help protect the ocean. But if we start telling ourselves, everything I have is in my boat, start relating to our resources from that position, it's a game changer. And that continues to be how I need to grow, how I get to grow through this expedition as well. Right, each time I face that challenge, reminding myself that I have, both in myself and with my team, we have everything we need to solve this. So inspiring, and our thanks to GMA Digital for that. And if you want some more feel-good stories, just head over to goodmorningamerica.com. Thanks so much for streaming with us. I'm Alexis Christophorus. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. 
get really good at this. <laughs> good. At least with your I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand. These were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Thanks for streaming with us. You are looking at the fog trying to lift here above New York City on this Wednesday. We've got a lot of news to get to. So here's the rundown right now. A massive winter blast making travel treacherous this holiday week. More than a foot of snow has already pounded parts of the heartland with wind drifts forcing some highways to shut down. Now heavy rains and dense fog cutting visibility on the I-95 corridor. A commercial jet carrying more than 200 migrants from El Paso to New York City was diverted to Philadelphia due to bad weather. They were later put on buses. Some advocates believe Texas Governor Greg Abbott chartered the flight as officials struggle to cope with a record surge of migrants at the southern border. The governor's office has not claimed responsibility for the flight and has not yet responded to our requests for comment. And South Korean actor Lee Sun Kyun has died. He is best known for his role in the Oscar-winning movie Parasite. Police are investigating the death as a possible suicide, but few details are known at this time. Lee Sun Kyun was just 48 years old. And if you are struggling with mental health distress, including thoughts of suicide, substance use, or emotional distress, you're not alone. Text or dial 988 and free help is available 24-7. We have some breaking news now. The Michigan Supreme Court has rejected an appeal seeking to keep former President Trump off the state's 2024 ballot. The watchdog group Free Speech for People filed the challenge seeking to bar Trump from the ballot on constitutional grounds. They argue the 14th Amendment bars anyone who has engaged in insurrection from running for office and that Trump's actions on January 6th disqualify him from holding office again. Now, this comes after Colorado's Supreme Court court came to the opposite conclusion, ruling Trump would be kept off that state's primary ballot. That case now appears headed for the U.S. Supreme Court. An investigation underway in Texas after the family of a pregnant teenager says she and her boyfriend were found dead. Authorities are not yet identifying the bodies which were discovered in a vehicle in San Antonio on Tuesday evening. Police calling the case, quote, very, very perplexing. Here's ABC's Andrea Fujii. What appears to be a tragic update in the search for a pregnant woman in Texas. The family of 18-year-old Savannah Soto says she and her boyfriend, Matthew Guerra, were found dead yesterday in a car outside a San Antonio apartment complex, three miles from Soto's home. But police are not yet confirming the identities of the victims. It appears to be a very complex crime scene. Soto, last seen near her home Friday, was nine months pregnant and one week past her due date. Her family says she was scheduled to be induced at the hospital Saturday, but never showed up. When I called her all morning, she wasn't answering. I was going straight to voicemail. And we went to the hospital anyways, and 
She was a no-show. And that's when I called the cops. She was so excited to have this baby. I mean, her, her, the house is already baby ready. She was so excited. She was going to be a mommy. Officials releasing few details, also not confirming how the victims died. But what we're looking at right now is a very, very perplexing crime scene. And detectives right now are looking at this as a possible murder. And, uh, but we don't know for sure. Officials did say the bodies appear to have been inside the car for three to four days. According to court documents, Guerra was on probation for allegedly assaulting Soto on Christmas Day last year. I wasn't fond of him because of when he put hands on my daughter. The family is familiar with heartache. Soto's younger brother died in a shooting last year. That was Andrea Fujii reporting. Her family says Soto wanted to become a nurse. Again, police have not confirmed the victim's identity, saying the investigation is ongoing. There's a new twist in the case of convicted murderer Alex Murdoch, who is currently serving life in prison for the murder of his wife and son. The outspoken court clerk in his case is now under fire after writing a book about the trial and the Murdoch family. In an ABC News exclusive, her co-author now says she plagiarized part of it, putting her credibility in question once again. But will it get Murdoch a new trial? ABC News' Trevor Alt has the details. Yet another twist and scandal surrounding the trial of convicted murderer Alec Murdoch, once again centered around the county clerk who read his verdict. Guilty, guilty, guilty. In the aftermath of that bombshell trial, Becky Hill co-wrote Behind the Doors of Justice, The Murdoch Murders, in which she details her role in the trial and her decades-long personal relationship with the Murdoch family. But she's now accused of plagiarizing a section of that book. I was shocked. I was disappointed. I was sad. Neil Gordon is the book's co-author. He says he discovered what he called the ethical gaffe while reviewing thousands of Hill's emails that had been released to reporters through Freedom of Information Act requests. She said that she felt like she was under a lot of deadline pressure and she remembered that that particular article was on her email. This screenshot shows in February, Hill received a lengthy excerpt of an article by a BBC journalist about the trial. It appears Hill copied from it directly for the opening of the book, prompting Gordon to publicly apologize to the BBC and the reporter. I decided to look at our book because the words were very familiar to me. And sure enough, it was the preface of our book. I was sick to my stomach. Hill has spoken openly about the Murdoch trial on numerous occasions, including giving an interview in a Netflix documentary series about the case. I had a feeling from our time together with the jury out at Moselle that it was not going to take our jury long to make the decision in this case. In a statement responding to these new allegations, Hill's attorneys say she's deeply remorseful for this unfortunate lapse in judgment. And this comes just months after Alec Murdoch's attorneys had accused Hill of jury tampering, saying she pressured jurors to reach a quick verdict in hopes of securing a book deal for herself, a claim she denied and prosecutors called unfounded and not credible. Because of the seriousness of these charges, when the judge holds the evidentiary hearing to consider whether to grant a new trial, Becky Hill probably won't be able to testify. If she does, she's going to risk being cross-examined and her credibility is completely shot because now she's an admitted liar. And Alexis, Becky Hill's attorney says she reached out to that BBC journalist to personally apologize. The book had been self-published, only available through Amazon and Audible. Both authors now say it has since been unpublished. Alexis? Trevor All, thank you. And ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer joining me now for more on this. Brian, this all comes, of course, on the heels of that jury tampering accusation. So how does this new development about Hill's book impact the case? And could this lead to a mistrial? Well, good morning, Alexis. And, and the short answer is yes. The defense is going to paint this ethical gaffe, as Gordon, the co-author of the book, puts it, and saying this isn't just that a co-author ripped information from one article and put it into her book, but the actual BBC author said that she mistakenly sent it to Becky Hill, asked her to delete it. She didn't. And in fact, the next day, Becky Hill emailed a friend saying, look at what a friend is working on. That was back in February 20th. 
This book was published in July 20th, some five months after. So what are the deadlines? What are the pressures that she's feeling? That could be something she faces on cross-examination at an evidentiary hearing asking for a mistrial. So could Becky Hill then face a lawsuit for plagiarism, do you think? Absolutely. So plagiarism is a copyright infringement uh, violation. Now, she's self-published, so luckily for her, she's not going to have a publisher coming after her. But the BBC um, author or reporter of that article could come after her. It's probably why they stopped publishing the book to limit any potential damages after they found the fault, and also why they're looking to apologize to try to stop any potential upcoming litigation. And Brian, what happens for Alex Murdoch now? This just becomes more fuel for the fire. Now, ultimately, he's serving a life sentence for the double murder of his wife and his young son, but also he's facing 27 years for the financial crimes that he later, later played guilty to. So this might be less about getting him out of prison anytime soon and more about clearing his name. He's always been very adamant that he committed financial crimes, but he did not kill his family. All right, ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer, thank you. Coming right. up... Spot the hazard. We teamed up with the CPSC to help one family find the commonly overlooked dangers that parents should be aware of to help keep their kids safe. And what are your goals for 2024? We're taking it to the group chat for some tips. But first, some of our ABC News colleagues are sharing their New Year's resolutions. New Year's resolutions. Actually, let's make it resolutions. Break more news, read more books, try to find a way to maybe get a little more sleep. My resolution for next year is to keep reporting on Ukraine. The world's attention has obviously drifted away from the war there. That's why I think next year will be more important than ever to keep covering it. My New Year's resolution this year, pretty simple. Spend less time scrolling TikTok and more time playing pickleball. My resolution this year is to donate more of my time to charity all throughout the year. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Customized to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. We have really good news. <laughs> I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis, weeknights on ABC News Live. My New Year's resolution is to have my toddler eat more vegetables. And my New Year's resolution is to spend less time on screens online and more time in real life, in the real world, with real people I care about. My 2024 New Year resolution, I want to be able to read 10 books and also do 10 push-ups. So here's to that. Here's to strengthening my mind and my body. My New Year's resolution this year, to be more on time. 
Yikes. Welcome back. We may think we know what it takes to childproof a home, but there are unexpected dangers that many of us miss. ABC's Eva Pilgrim brought a safety expert to the home of a family with two young kids to spot the hidden hazards in their kitchen and bedroom. Take a look. For Yemi and Taiwo Yeni, keeping their home safe for their two kids is a priority, especially with a curious toddler. This is sort of the phase I feel like where they like could do themselves the most harm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. GMA working with the Consumer Product Safety Commission to set up some child-proofing hazards in the Oyeni's home to see if they can spot them. You can't remove all hazards. No. So what, what's a parent to do? It's taking the extra steps to uh, prevent some of the hazards that exist. Starting in their daughter's room. The chest dresser is probably a hazard. You're supposed to, you know, bolt it to the wall. We never did that. That's correct. Furniture should be anchored. Nothing in the room that they can climb on, especially with the window that we have over here. And question if it's time to change out the crib. She's been trying to climb it. Time to bring in the chairman of the CPSC to tell them how they did. You pointed out the, the dresser and the risk of tip overs. Nearly 200 kids have died in dresser related tip overs in the past two decades. As you pointed out, windows are risky for kids. Installing uh, window stops or guards can help prevent a fall. And as for when it's time to transition the crib. You want to do that before she actually climbs out. One other hazard he spots. You have a lot of uh, outlets. Make sure to install outlet covers anywhere a child can access. Next, can they spot the hazards in the kitchen? This could be hot. Making sure that the handles are away from the edge. I usually just prefer to use the middle burner. Clean supplies in here, so this yeah. needs to be locked. Correct. Cleaning supplies should be stored in a locked cabinet or up high. But did they spot all the hazards? You pointed out that the handle of the pan was, you know, over here. <laughs> and if a kid's running by, it's so easy to grab it. And then it goes everywhere. And the stove knobs should have covers. He points out a couple additional hazards they missed. Towel hanging on something makes it so much easier for a child just to pull on something and open. And they overlooked a set of keys. These tiny little batteries are so easy to swallow by a child. The CPSC says to keep items with button batteries out of reach. You spotted a lot of the, the hazards that are out there. <laughs> and, you know, taking care of those means that it's just a safer environment for everybody. Great advice. I remember those days. Eva Pilgrim, thank you. Coming up, a new year, a new you. How to motivate yourself to stick to your New Year's resolutions. Also ahead was the night before Christmas, a little boy on a mission. The viral image showing him unwrapping every gift under the tree. But first, some of our ABC News colleagues are sharing their New Year's resolutions with us. My resolution for 2024 is to do one thing each day that makes somebody, whether it's a viewer, a colleague, friend, family, whoever, smile because kindness is contagious. And my hope for the new year is that we can get a little chain reaction going of kindness. Happy holidays. A mobility exercise every single day. By any means necessary, even for a few minutes, that's my resolution. So I'm probably joining the masses when I say this one, but in 2024, I really want to find more time to work out consistently and just cook healthier meals more often. So my New Year's resolution this year is to get more sleep. That's my New Year's resolution every year. We'll see how it goes. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. When the 
announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is a place to sing to magic. Our winner, oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Reporting from the Labor Department in Washington, I'm ABC's Elizabeth Solzi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Oh my goodness, I mean, I, literally, I have so many, but in uh, 2024, I want to enter a car race at the Nürburgring, and I want to learn some new, some new salsa steps in 2024. My New Year's resolution this year is to spend as much time as possible with my kids. Happy New Year. Happy New Year! We can all get on board with that. Welcome back, everybody. So we're counting down to the new year, and just like our ABC News colleagues, many are starting to think about their New Year's resolutions. But how can you motivate yourself to stick to those goals throughout 2024? Let's take this to our group chat, motivational speaker and life coach, Gio Duris, founder and lead nutritionist at Maya Feller Nutrition, Maya Feller, and personal finance content creator, Humphrey Yang. Great to have you all here with us today. Gio, I want to start with you here at the desk. Your biggest piece of advice to find that motivation and to stick to those goals in the new year. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is really attaching it to identity. I think a lot of times we always have these goals of, here's the new behaviors I'm gonna do. But the identity precedes the behaviors. It's like when I tell my son, you're a dog, he automatically barks, right? <laughs> and so those ideas of what is a word that you would like to use that would anchor your year, but make sure that it's something that um, is an identity face. So like for me, it's provoke. But I would say I'm a provoker. So for the, two, the new year, I would provoke certain things, steer it up. That means go get a gym membership. Go ahead and change your, your nutrition. Right. So just doing something, but having the identity be the biggest piece is what's going to really anchor you throughout the year. And have it be something that's actionable. It sounds 100%. like that. To provoke is actionable. Yes. All right. So Maya, I want to get to you. Many people say their New Year's resolution is to be healthier. That's a good one. You say that small steps are key here. So what are some small steps that we can practice to get towards that goal? Absolutely. So most people say, you know, I'm going to rehaul my entire eating plan. And what I say to folks is think about the small things that you want to do. For example, do you want to eat more vegetables? What are the vegetables that are accessible, affordable, culturally relevant to you that you can add into your pattern of eating day after day? You like broccoli? What are the ways that you can get broccoli in? You can do fresh, you can do frozen, you can do boxed, you can do freeze dried. Think about those small, small steps. Also think about how you can add rather than reduce. Oftentimes, you know, we like to cut out foods. Think about what you can put on your plate and eat from around the globe. As you choose flavors, temperatures, and textures, and you go all around the globe, you're gonna have so much nutrient-rich food that add excitement to your plate. And I, I like that, add something instead of taking away. It's all in the attitude. So Humphrey, let's talk money. That's my, that's my wheelhouse, some resolutions on saving money. Now you say saving $10,000 in 2024 could be achieved by simple lifestyle fixes. Tell us about that. Yeah, so if you break down your $10,000 savings goal over the course of, let's say, 12 months, it's about $833 a month that you need to save, which comes out to about $27 a day. So if you do some simple lifestyle fixes, like perhaps you maybe eat out once per week instead of twice per week, so you eat out one x, you know, one times less per week out, that could save you $10 to $20 uh, uh, per day. And then if you, you know, cancel subscriptions, perhaps you switch your insurance providers, 
maybe make some coffee at home here and there. The idea is that as long as you can work these habits into your normal everyday lifestyle, you can start to see those savings really add up. And sometimes it's just these simple lifestyle fixes. You know, you make a small change here and that compounds over the entire year. And so that's what I really try to advocate for is like, let's try to see if we can just clean up our spending habits just a little bit through the new year. Yeah, baby steps, right? So Gio, what's your advice uh, for picking up new skills or hobbies? A lot of us want to do that too in the new year. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is to make sure that you pick something that is exciting, but also has challenges, which are, what it allows is for you to go ahead and reach milestones throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So you don't like fade out of your New Year's resolutions in like March, right? So you want to do something like whether it's picking up a new book, writing a book about your life story, maybe picking up dance lessons, I need them. And then um, <laughs> just, you know, just some fun things and activities that you could do. But I think the biggest thing is milestones because that way you can get excited over and over again. Absolutely, I know that I need them. One of my milestones is that I wanna come up with a family cookbook. I keep telling the kids they want me to do it, this is the year, guys. I'm going to do it. I'm going to sit down and actually do it with pictures and everything. So, Maya, you suggest that people seek out foods from around the world. You mentioned that a moment ago to stick to eating better. Talk to us a little bit more about that. Absolutely. So, you know, as a person of Afro-Caribbean descent, I love flavor. And I work with people who are always saying, you know, I'm in a food rut, and that can be so, so real. And what I say to them is I want you to think about the color that's on your plate as well as the flavor that's showing up. And what we find is when people actually add all of these wonderful flavors in, herbs, spices, you know, not only are we increasing the bioavailability, what the nutrients are on our plate and in our body, we're also more likely to return to that healthy plate and want to eat it over and over again. Yeah, find some condiments you like too, right? Pour that on as well. Uh, doesn't It also helps with the calorie count, I think. So Humphrey, want to get in another money question. What's a good way to budget for something to make sure that we're not overspending this year? Because just because we have the money doesn't necessarily mean we should be spending it, right? Exactly. I think one way, one easy way to do it is that if you, even if you have the money for something, it doesn't mean that you can afford it. So oftentimes, you know, a general rule that you can think of is like, if you can buy it twice, then you can afford it. But another thing you can think about is to think about your discretionary purchases as if it's a percentage of your monthly income. So let's say you make $3,000 a month. If you're trying to contemplate a decision that's a $300 purchase, that's 10% of your income. So if you think about it in that way, in percentage terms, it can really give you some perspective in how much you're spending of your monthly income, as well as the fact is, if you think about how much it costs you in terms of your hourly wages, that could be another good way to kind of decide if you really want to make that purchase or not and really try to question, you know, be introspective and question if you need that purchase or not. Yeah, a little self-reflection to start the new year for sure. Motivational speaker and life coach Gio Duris, founder and lead nutritionist at Maya Feller Nutrition, Maya Feller, and personal finance content creator Humphrey Yang. Our thanks to you all. May we all stick to our New Year's resolutions. And now to a toddler who may need to make patience his resolution. The three-year-old just couldn't wait to open his Christmas gifts. His parents could not believe what they found under the tree at three in the morning. ABC News' Andrew Dimbert has the details. Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature was stirring. <laughs> Except for a three-year-old? Both of us uh, went to sleep uh, thinking everything was fine, everything was great. And then we were awoken uh, with a request for scissors, which is not really how you want to be woken up at 3 a.m. Not an odd request, considering it was Christmas morning, but it was alarming because it was 3 in the morning. It just didn't enter our heads as a possibility that someone would go down and open all the presents. Parents Scott and Katie Reinken went downstairs to find every single present unwrapped, paper strewn about, and gift bags upended. And you could see the presents he didn't really care about because he ripped him open, looked at him, and moved on to the next one. But literally every little tiny thing except for the stockings were unwrapped. The toddler explaining his altruistic motive. He like told us, he was like, well, I just was trying to make it less confusing. I wanted to open them so that everyone kind of understood like what presents were for who. The parents quickly rewrapping as best they could with the other two children, none the wiser, caught up in the magic of Christmas morning. It's like, it was hard to be mad at them. Like we, we just know what a joyous sort of thing that was. It caused us some brief panic. And then you know what? We enjoyed the rest of our day. <laughs> Those kids meant business. Andrew Dimbert, thank you. Next year, the family says they'll be keeping the presents out of reach 
up until a reasonable hour on Christmas morning. That does sound reasonable. Thanks so much for streaming with us. I'm Alexis Christophers. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from San Francisco, I'm Selena Wang. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome, I'm Alexis Christophorus. Today on ABC News Live First, rising tensions. Israel's defense minister says it is under attack from seven different fronts as it expands its ground assault in Gaza. The U.S. firing back at Iran-linked militants near the Red Sea. The fears of the war spreading in the region growing. New Year's alert, the heightened security in Times Square as the Big Apple gets ready for the million-plus people coming to Times Square to ring in 2024. Massive winter blast, blizzard conditions in five states as more than a foot of snow pounds parts of the heartland with winds whipping up snow drifts forcing highways to shut down heavy rains and dense fog coating the east cutting the visibility along the i-95 corridor now the heavy rain moving in we're tracking it all for you and breakout stars 2023 coming to a close and we're looking back at the performers who made a splash this year from pedro pascal to carol g who had the best year ever but we begin with the White House and leaders in the Middle East hoping to find a way forward in Gaza. Overnight, President Biden spoke to the leader of Qatar in a high-stakes phone call discussing efforts to secure the release of more than 100 hostages still held in Gaza. This comes as the fighting there intensifies and the U.S. responds to another round of attacks by Iran-backed militants. Foreign correspondent Britt Klinet has the latest from Israel. President Biden speaking with Qatar's Amir, talking in a phone call about the urgent effort to secure the release of all remaining hostages held by Hamas, including American citizens, and the need to boost humanitarian aid to Gaza. The high-stakes call coming just a day after top Israeli official Ron Derner met with Secretary of State Blinken at the White House, discussing military operations and the possible return of hostages. But this urgent effort growing more complicated this morning as Israel expands its ground offensive to central Gaza, launching over 200 rockets in a day, Hamas saying more than 250 people were killed in the last 24 hours. Israeli Army Chief of Staff Herzi Halevi now warning the war will continue for many more months. This amid rising concerns the conflict in the region could grow even wider. Israel's defense minister saying the country is now under attack from seven different fronts, including Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon and Iran. 
Protesters there taking to the streets after reports from state media claiming an Israeli airstrike in Syria killed a top Iranian general directly responsible for arming proxy groups in the region. Iranian officials vowing revenge. And U.S. Central Command confirming Tuesday it shot down 10 more drones and five missiles launched by the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. Alexis, the U.S. military carried out multiple airstrikes in Iraq in retaliation for attacks by Tehran-linked militants. Iraq calling it a hostile act that infringed its sovereignty. Alexis? All right, Britt Clinton in Tel Aviv, Israel. Thank you. ABC News national security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy joins me now for more on this. So, Mick, Iranian officials vowing revenge after an Israeli airstrike in Syria reportedly killed a top Iranian general behind arming proxy groups in the region. How concerning is that? Oh, Alexis, it is to be expected. This individual was head of what's called Unit 2250, which, as you say, was in charge of all logistics in Syria, which was a very substantial part of their efforts. And he was very close to Qasem Soleimani, uh, the former head of Quds Force uh, that we killed in Iraq. So this individual was very close uh, to the Iranian leadership, and they will undoubtedly respond to it. I don't know what it'll be, but it'll probably be substantial. And of course, they are directing all their proxies to attack the United States in both Syria and, and Iraq already. So this is something that was expected, but certainly uh, Israel took off somebody off the battlefield who was responsible for a lot of the attacks against Israel from Syria. So the Israeli defense minister says the country is under attack from seven different sectors. What kind of challenge does this pose to Israel, and what does this mean for the trajectory of the war? So this was something I think the United States predicted. And it's why we've seen so many of our military assets move to the region, to include those two area uh, aircraft carrier strike groups that were moved to the eastern Mediterranean. This is so that if this war expands substantially, and as you said, they're already being attacked from multiple directions, but most of those are indirect and sporadic. If it was a concerted effort to actually, say, invade Israel, then the United States is there to support them. Not with ground forces. Israelis have plenty of ground forces, but air and, and, and basically offshore military assets that can deliver fire onto targets to assist them. So that is one of the th reasons why the United States did this. Uh, they obviously don't want it to happen, but they're trying to deter it from happening. And Mick, the U.S. says it, it shot down 10 more drones and five missiles launched by the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. What could this mean for a potential wider war? So this is a huge expansion. If this continues to happen, we're already seeing major uh, maritime shipping companies electing to go all the way around Africa to, to deliver their goods, which adds like two weeks and a considerable amount of uh, money, quite frankly, which of course gets passed on to the consumer. So the United States is leading this prosperity guardian this, this effort to combat this. They need more countries to sign up. And ultimately, they're going to have to respond to these attacks, not just by def deflecting them, if you will, but actually going back to the point of origin to strike these and also take out the arsenals that Iran is supplying to the Houthis to shoot these at commercial vessels and military ships. That needs to be removed from the battle space, and I'm sure pe the Pentagon and Central Command is looking at doing that right now. They just need the order uh, from the commander-in-chief. ABC News national security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy, always great to get your insights. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden and the First Lady are traveling to St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands, where they will remain through the New Year holiday. ABC News' Elizabeth Schulze joins us now from St. Croix. Uh, so, Elizabeth, we know the president spoke to Qatar officials to negotiate the release of, of more hostages, and a top aide also uh, met with U.S. officials to discuss more aid into Gaza. What more can you tell us about the president's response to this? Hey, Alexis. Well, before the president made his way here to St. Croix, he did have that call with the emir of Qatar. And of course, the two leaders emphasized the urgent need to try to get the remaining hostages out. The White House said that, of course, includes the Americans who are still being held hostage. Remember that Qatar was the critical intermediary in the hostage negotiations for that first ceasefire. Qatar and Egypt together helped broker that deal to get the hostages out and to have that ceasefire in place. And it comes as there's this ongoing discussion over another ceasefire to try to 
to get that in place while also getting more aid into Gaza in. The White House has said that it's continued to increase its warnings on Israel to try to minimize civilian casualties. You saw in Brit's piece the, the terrible death toll that's mounting there. And so this senior advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was meeting with top White House officials, including Secretary of State Blinken, to try to reinforce that message that they're taking civilian deaths into account while they're trying to get more aid in at the same time, Alexis. And with no signs, Elizabeth, of the migrant surge slowing down, Secretary Blinken's expected to meet with Mexico's president to discuss the crisis at the southern uh, border. What's on the agenda, and can we expect any major deliverables from this meeting? And this meeting really does highlight how critical of an issue this has become for the White House, both from the political point of view, but also just in dealing with the influx of migrants with border communities overwhelmed with the record number of migrants that we're seeing cross over the past month so far. So uh, today, Secretary of State Blinken's on his way to meet with the president of Mexico. Uh, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas will also be part of that meeting. As far as deliverables, one of the White House's key points is to try to get Mexico to step up its enforcement of trying to keep more migrants in Mexico. There has been ongoing conversations. The President Biden spoke with the president of Mexico last week. There had been an agreement that Mexico would try to uh, eliminate or at least decrease the number of people coming from Venezuela through the border. So the White House trying to make sure that they can at least try to contain that number. We are seeing this huge caravan of an estimated between six to 10,000 people making their way up to the border. The president uh, trying to get that slower, that, that flow to to slow. At the same time, Alexis, we also know, a source tells us that there are these negotiations that are now continuing on Capitol Hill over a border security package. Of course, this talks over how to increase border security and comprehensive immigration reform has become tied up over additional, with additional aid to Ukraine and to Israel. So the White House is trying to continue those conversations with key negotiators on Capitol Hill. As far as solutions there, they're looking at tightening asylum restrictions, increasing uh, technology and security at the border. This has been a sticking point, but one that we are told the negotiations are at least continuing, even though Congress is in recess and the president is on vacation, Alexis. On vacation, indeed. I was going to say we're all jealous talking about how beautiful it looks there. We're in gloomy, <laughs> foggy New York City. So hopefully you have time for a little bit of fun, too, while you're, <laughs> while you're covering the president. It's not a terrible assignment. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth Schulze in St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands. Thank you. The conflict in the Middle East is adding to security concerns here in New York City ahead of New Year's Eve. Law enforcement officials say they're on high alert as an estimated one million revelers will head to Times Square this weekend. Here's senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky. New York City is getting ready for the biggest party of the year. Three, two. More than a million people are expected to cram into Times Square to watch the ball drop on New Year's Eve. The mayor says police will be prepared. There's always a serious concern around safety in New Year's Eve because there's a large number of people. The police department is on top of it. ABC News has obtained a threat assessment by the FBI, NYPD, and other agencies that says the ball drop could draw interest from malicious actors looking for targets of opportunity or from lone offenders inspired by or reacting to the ongoing Israel-Hamas conflict. The security plan includes thousands of officers, miles of metal barricades, plus drones, dogs, and hundreds of surveillance cameras, all to keep the crowds safe. I think it's a pretty safe bet that someone is going to try to do something to distract or disrupt the events in Times Square. In recent years, though, extremists have almost exclusively targeted law enforcement or military personnel. Just a year ago at this very celebration, a young man from Maine attacked police officers with a knife as they worked a security checkpoint. It's a real Herculean task to manage that number of people without being heavy handed, but being protective. One additional concern this year, the possibility demonstrations over the war in Israel could disrupt. But there's no specific threat, and Alexis crowds have been gathering in Times Square on New Year's Eve in some form since 1904, so the police have a long history of keeping things secure. Alexis. 
that they do. Senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky, thank you. The Michigan Supreme Court has rejected an appeal seeking to keep former President Trump off the state's 2024 ballot. The watchdog group Free Speech for People filed the challenge seeking to bar Trump from the ballot on constitutional grounds. They argue the 14th Amendment bars anyone who's engaged in insurrection from running for office and that Trump's actions on January 6th disqualify him from holding office again. It comes after Colorado's Supreme Court came to the opposite conclusion, ruling Trump would be kept off that state's primary ballot. That case appears headed for the U.S. Supreme Court. Now to that triple threat of dangerous and extreme weather in the nation's heartland. The aftermath of a winter blizzard and dangerous ice storm is making for treacherous, treacherous travel conditions there. That same storm now heading east, bringing rain and dense fog, making city skylines nearly invisible. While out west, rain and snow is expected in Washington, Oregon, and California. Flash flooding now a major possibility in parts of Northern California. All of this threatening to disrupt travel ahead of tomorrow, which AAA reports could be one of the busiest travel days of the year. Here's ABC News' transportation correspondent, Gio Benitez. This morning, the mad dash to get back home after millions of travelers hit the roads and skies for Christmas. Both our flights left late. you got to expect it to be crazy. The TSA is screening more than 14 and a half million people at airports between last Wednesday, when the holiday rush began, through Christmas Day Monday. That's almost 2 million more than last year. The lines at TSA have been going really well, um, long but smooth. Travel itself also mostly smooth, with airlines like American and United reporting their best performance ever. But TSA and FAA staffing issues creating hiccups at Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport, the busiest in the world. Our Faith Abube was there. You can see the TSA screening line is wrapped around the atrium. It goes all the way over there. Some travelers telling me it's taking them about two hours from the time they walk through the doors to drop off their bags to getting through the security line. We've never seen it this crazy. We live here, so we know to get here way early. The TSA telling ABC News, we did have an unusual number of employees call in sick today. Additionally, there were blizzard warnings issued, creating a very busy morning at ATL. I think we're in a way probably twice as long as our flight. And in Denver, ground stops because of weather and staffing at air traffic control. Super busy. It was kind of like organized craziness. Yeah. <laughs> And the next busiest day for air travel is this Friday, so make sure you get ready for that. Meanwhile, the roads are going to be busy today between 1 and 7 p.m., so try to get out there early or later tonight. But the gas prices, they're looking pretty good. They're at 312 a gallon right now. That's the national average. That's up a bit over last week, but still down 13 cents from a month ago. Alexis. Gio Benitez, thank you. We turn now to the cost of living. As you know, it's been skyrocketing in recent years, but this January 1st, millions of Americans will get some help paying those bills, but not everyone is on board with the changes. Here's ABC's Andrew Dimbert. Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, <laughs> except for a three-year-old. Both of us uh, went to sleep. Uh, thinking everything was fine, everything was great. And then we were awoken uh, with a request for scissors, which is not really how you want to be woken up at 3 a.m. Not an odd request, considering it was... We're going to get you the right piece in just a little bit, so stick around. But that was a, a report about the federal minimum wage. 20 states are still at the federal minimum wage, which has been $7.25 an hour since 2009. $1 today, by the way, can buy only about 70% of what it could buy in 2009. Coming up, the holiday sales scorecard is out. How much money Americans spent this year and what they spent it on. Also ahead with New Year's just around the corner, how parents can help their kids stick to their resolutions. We'll be right back. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. 
traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. My New Year's resolution is to try to get better at doing little things that can help future me in a very big way. I'm talking about just taking a couple minutes at night to tee things up for the next day so my start to the day isn't so frazzled and my kids can get off to school smoothly. Lining up backpacks, making sure the snacks are ready, and for me, making sure the coffee is ready for the next morning for my very early shifts. Our New Year's resolution is to host more dinner parties. What do you think about that? My New Year's resolution is to be present. Don't check the phone all the time. Be present wherever you are. I love it. Good advice. Be present. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. That was some of our ABC News family sharing their New Year's resolutions for 2024. And maybe your resolution is to be a better shopper and save where you can. Well, the new holiday sales scorecard shows despite lingering effects of inflation, Americans spent more this year than last year. It's an encouraging sign for the economy. ABC News' Morgan Norwood has the details. From winter wardrobes to fine dining, holiday shoppers really showed up this year, easing immediate fears of an economic slowdown. Overall, consumer spending grew by 3.1% compared to the same time last year. But what were we actually buying? Well, it wasn't the fancy pair of earrings or new TVs. Jewelry and electronic purchases actually shrunk. Instead, shoppers went big on clothing, food gathering around the table. You know, look, spending at restaurants jumped nearly 8%. Shoppers also preferred to add to cart versus push the cart as online spending was up 6.3% compared to in-store shopping's 2.2%. So what about the economy for the year ahead? Let's talk about this. Americans continue to spend inflation, which hit its highest level in 40 years earlier this year, has actually cooled to 3%. So people are getting jobs. Unemployment is at a 50-year low. Uh, these are really good signs ahead of 2024. Remember that 2023 recession that experts were predicting? Where? We didn't see that. But if there was anything that initially gave economists pause heading into the holidays, it was the the record high credit card debt Americans picked up once inflation spiked now at more than one trillion dollars. And that was Morgan Norwood. Our thanks to her for that report. We are counting down to the new year. And just like our ABC News colleagues, many are starting to think about their New Year's resolutions. But what about if you're a parent? What are some good resolutions for both you and your family? ABC News medical contributor and physician at Stanford Children's Health, Dr. Alok Patel, joining me now for more on this. Dr. Patel, great to see you. So first of all, are resolutions actually good for our health? Alexis, they totally can be, because if you look at polls across the years, the most popular resolutions tend to be around improving one's health. 20 to 30% of people say it's split between eating healthier, losing weight, we're focusing on mental health or exercising more, and you'll be happy. Another 20% tends to be around saving more money in finances. So this is all win-win. But the important thing is actually keeping that resolution with polls showing that less than 20% of people actually stick with them. So motivation is only part of it. A plan is everything. So here's a tip for everyone. Make your resolution smart. Make it S as in specific, M as in measurable, A as in achievable, R relevant, and T time bound. So if your resolution is to be 
about eating more fiber, for example, you could instead frame it as saying, I'm gonna eat 25 to 30 grams more fiber a day by eating more whole grains and vegetables. I'll start by incorporating these foods into my breakfast, measure my progress over the course of three months. And this is gonna be great for my gut, heart health, and my cancer risk. I like that goal, actually. People should eat more fiber. That goal, I might borrow that goal. Um, it's, it's, it's smart to have these attainable goals, right? These mini goals that we can sort of reach and feel good about ourselves along the way. So I wanna talk though about parents with busy lives, young kids. What are some resolutions they should be thinking about? It is all about mini goals, exactly as you said, Alexis. Now these are goals put together by the American Academy of Pediatrics. These are easy ones for parents. Run through these and try to get through these as a family because these are all extremely smart and important resolutions. Start making a family media plan, dictating how much people should really be spending on smartphones and devices. Try cooking as a family. This is great for everyone, even young kids. Go outside more, explore the world. You wanna check car seats. If you have young kids, just an annual check to make sure that they're facing the right way, they're safe, they're strapped in correctly. Make sure the family's up to date with vaccines. And I hate to say this last one, but it's important. Having a family disaster plan, meaning the right kits, depending on where you live, emergency phone numbers, and an escape route in the event of any natural disasters is very important. Easy resolutions. Always be prepared, as the Boy Scouts say. Absolutely. ABC News medical contributor, Dr. Alok Patel, thank you and happy new year. Happy New Year to you, Alexis. Thank you. Coming up, a sneak peek at our annual special, the year 2023. The new stars and shows that have made this past year so memorable. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. We have really good news. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, you're <laughs> I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from the Carter Presidential Library, I'm Faith Abube. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. As we wrap up 2023, we're taking a look back at the new stars and shows that made it shine. The ABC News special, The Year 2023, brings us those pop culture moments from movies, TV, and music. Deborah Roberts gives us a preview of the breakout stars we'll see on tonight's show. 2023 was Pedro Pascal's year. Put your seatbelt on. Are we gonna help him? No. And we were just along for the ride. I only watched The Last of Us because of Pedro Pascal, okay? I think what happened with Pedro this year is that he sort of embodied himself. Because he knows that we're out here. He knows that we're liking TikToks of him. He knows, and he winks about it. And next on the menu... 
How could you remember the name? Because you're the bear. Jeremy Allen White had a saying. Yes, chef. And you want a uh, star? I think it'd be nice, yeah. With comedy chops as sharp as her knives, it's no surprise Vanity Fair was hungry for Ayo Adebri. Stop, stop, I'm eating my spaghetti. <laughs> spaghetti. Italian, I'm literally fluent. My precious. This year, Young Hollywood was in the fast lane. And for Ashley Park, it was all about the journey. I guess it kind of sounds cliche, but I would say it was about growth for me. Before her leading role in the summer smash hit Joyride, Ashley was known for buzzy shows like Emily in Paris, Beef, and even a new stint in season three of Only Murders in the Building. Growing up, I never wanted to just be like the Asian girl, but I think that through the process of doing Joyride, I realized I want everyone to know that I'm an Asian person and also see me as the full person that I am. Twenty twenty three has been a groundbreaking year for Carol G, becoming the first woman to debut an all Spanish language album atop the Billboard charts. Like for me, I have to say, like Latinas, we have like this special energy of fun and love what we do, and I feel so proud that there are like so many Latinos that I'm getting like we're doing big things. And what's bigger this year than landing a song in the hit Barbie movie? On stuff to look forward to tonight, our thanks to Deborah Roberts for that. You can see the year 2023, hosted by Robin Roberts, tonight at 9, 8 central on ABC and streaming on Hulu. Thanks so much for streaming with us today. I'm Alexis Christophorus. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crooks, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner Oh, Crooks 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Alexis Christophorus today on ABC News Live First. Rising tensions. Israel's defense minister says it's under attack from seven different fronts as it expands its ground assault in Gaza. The U.S. firing back at Iran linked militants near the Red Sea. The fears of the war spreading in the region growing. Breaking news Michigan's Supreme Court has rejected an appeal seeking to keep former President Trump off the state's 2024 ballot. What's next in the legal battle is another case appears headed for the U.S. Supreme Court. Massive winter blast, blizzard conditions in five states as more than a foot of snow pounds parts of the heartland with winds whipping up snow drifts, forcing highways to shut down. Heavy rains and dense fog now coating the east, cutting visibility along the I-95 corridor. And now the heavy rain moving in. We are tracking it all for you. And on the move as millions make their way home from the holidays. What could be a record-setting few days at the nation's airports. Staff shortages leading to hours-long lines and snow forcing cancellations in Denver. What to expect if you're heading out today. 
But we begin with the White House and leaders in the Middle East hoping to find a way forward in Gaza. Overnight, President Biden spoke to the leader of Qatar in a high-stakes phone call discussing efforts to secure the release of more than 100 hostages still held in Gaza. This comes as the fighting there intensifies and the U.S. responds to another round of attacks by Iran-backed militants. Foreign correspondent Britt Clinton has the latest from Israel. President Biden speaking with Qatar's Amir, talking in a phone call about the urgent effort to secure the release of all remaining hostages held by Hamas, including American citizens, and the need to boost humanitarian aid to Gaza. The high-stakes call coming just a day after top Israeli official Ron Derner met with Secretary of State Blinken at the White House, discussing military operations and the possible return of hostages. But this urgent effort growing more complicated this morning as Israel expands its ground offensive to central Gaza, launching over 200 rockets in a day, Hamas saying more than 250 people were killed in the last 24 hours. Israeli Army Chief of Staff Herzi Halevi now warning the war will continue for many more months. This amid rising concerns the conflict in the region could grow even wider. Israel's defense minister saying the country is now under attack from seven different fronts, including Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon and Iran. <laughs> Protesters there taking to the streets after reports from state media claiming an Israeli airstrike in Syria killed a top Iranian general directly responsible for arming proxy groups in the region. Iranian officials vowing revenge. And U.S. Central Command confirming Tuesday it shot down ten more drones and five missiles launched by the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. Foreign correspondent Britt Clinton joins me now from Tel Aviv. So Britt, yesterday you and I talked about the Israeli War Cabinet meeting to discuss possible hostage deals. Since then, there have been new talks between the White House and leaders in the Middle East. So where do hostage negotiations and a ceasefire deal stand right now? Well, at least publicly, there hasn't been much movement. We know that efforts are being made by the Egyptians, by the Qataris, but just nothing concrete yet. Several hostage deals are being discussed, we believe, but in the latest round, you know, a deal uh, brokered by uh, Egypt, promised uh, by Egypt, th that was a deal that would weaken Hamas in Gaza, and Hamas did not agree to that. Unsurprisingly, Hamas insists uh, that all fighting needs to stop before any hostages are released. But hostages, the families I speak to say that they are growing more frustrated by the day. They are demanding that Netanyahu comes up with a deal to release their loved ones as soon as possible. Foreign correspondent Britt Clinton in Israel, thank you. The Michigan Supreme Court has rejected an appeal seeking to keep former President Trump off the state's 2024 ballot. The watchdog group Free Speech for People filed the challenge seeking to bar Trump from the ballot on constitutional grounds. They argue the 14th Amendment bars anyone who was engaged in insurrection from running for office and that Trump's actions on January 6th disqualify him from holding office again. Let's bring in senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky for more on this. Good to see you again, Aaron. You too. So this, of course, comes after Colorado's Supreme Court came to the opposite uh, conclusion, ruling that Trump would be kept off that state's uh, primary ballot. That case now appears headed for the U.S. Supreme Court. So what happens next? How significant, I guess, is this decision today? Well, it's significant in that we now have competing views. Uh, although the Michigan Supreme Court did not weigh the issues the way the Colorado Supreme Court did. It just declined to hear the appeal. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what additional arguments may have been made, whether something new may have been brought to the fore in Michigan. The Supreme Court simply affirmed the decision of two lower courts to say that Trump belongs on the ballot and that the challenges by the group uh, that you mentioned just didn't need to be uh, heard at the highest level. But it does now present an interesting dichotomy because you have competing decisions in the states, uh, so it does seem ripe for U.S. Supreme Court review. Meaning that other states may just pick a side at this point because there seems to be a case to, for either side to be made. Well, in some ways, yes, and there are decisions pending in more than a dozen states where legal challenges to Trump's ballot eligibility have been filed. Now, some of those are left to the courts. In the case of Maine, for example, it's left to the, the Secretary of State, and, and we're expecting a decision from the Secretary of State in Maine any day now. Mm -hmm. So it depends how the state laws are, are structured and who gets to hear the challenges, who gets to decide. But in the case of, of Colorado, certainly we do expect 
former President Trump to file an appeal, though he hasn't done it yet. All right, senior investigative uh, correspondent Aaron Katursky. They're keeping you on your toes with all of these Truly. decisions. Thank you. Thanks, Alexis. All right, now to the crisis at the southern border with Mexico. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and other top U.S. officials are expected to meet with Mexico's president today to discuss the unprecedented surge of migrants. Small towns along the border say they're feeling the pressure. Meanwhile, a caravan of 6,000 migrants is on the move, headed through Mexico and toward the U.S. ABC's Jay O'Brien has the latest from the White House. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas traveling to Mexico City for a high-stakes meeting with the Mexican president to address the ongoing immigration crisis at the southern border. Administration officials expected to push the Mexican government to step up immigration enforcement within their own borders. The urgent meeting comes as migrant border crossings hit historic highs. Border Patrol reporting on average nearly 10,000 apprehensions a day last week. And these images, an apparent caravan of an estimated 6,000 migrants now making their way to the U.S. border. Norve Diaz from Colombia is traveling with his children, saying he's fighting for the well-being of his family. White House officials blaming volatility in Central and South American countries. There's a lot of factors, and part of that is, of course, dealing with instability. But Republicans blasting the president. The policies of the Biden administration are attracting people from all over the world. We have to change those policies to secure our border. Back in the U.S., Border Patrol in places like Eagle Pass, Texas, overwhelmed. And this weekend, buses carrying migrants, nearly 130 in total, stopping in suburbs outside Chicago. The latest in a series of migrants transported to northern cities by Texas Governor Greg Abbott. All of this comes as the White House is now locked in tense negotiations with Republicans and Democrats on Capitol Hill over immigration reform that's now been directly linked to any future aid for Israel and Ukraine. And with Congress still out on recess, sources tell us there are no active negotiations happening right now and there are no in-person meetings expected until at least the new year. Alexis? Jay O'Brien at the White House, thank you. And now to that triple threat of dangerous and extreme weather. In the nation's heartland, the aftermath of a winter blizzard and dangerous ice storm is making for treacherous travel conditions. That same storm now heading east, bringing rain and dense fog, making city skylines nearly invisible. While out west, rain and snow expected in Washington, Oregon, and California. Flash flooding, now a major possibility in parts of Northern California. All of this threatening to disrupt travel ahead of tomorrow, which AAA reports could be one of the busiest travel days of the year. ABC's transportation correspondent Gio Benitez has been following the travel rush, but we want to begin with meteorologist Samara Theodore tracking those dangerous storms. A major winter storm on the move, pummeling parts of the plains with heavy snow, strong wind, unrelenting ice, and whiteout conditions. From Colorado to South Dakota, authorities issuing a blizzard warning. But across the region, the icy roads also a major threat. This truck spinning out of control, crashing into an ambulance in Oregon. Luckily, no injuries were reported. In South Dakota, cars stuck on the side of the road, some in ditches, officials closing I-90 after blizzard conditions. Authorities in Denver, Colorado, forced to shut down portions of I-70 after slick, hazardous conditions. An ice storm damaging dozens of power lines in Fargo, North Dakota, leaving more than 7,000 people in the dark. Parts of this storm system making its way east, already impacting areas in the northeast with fog. In Boston, skyscrapers peeking out from the dense fog. And overnight, a flight transporting over 200 migrants from Texas to New York City was diverted to Philadelphia due to weather conditions. The worst of the winter portion of that storm has now moved out, but we're dealing with all of the rain to come and the fog. So many East Coast cities have been shrouded in fog. You can see that here in New York City. All right, so let's talk about the timing on this rain. So as we head through Wednesday, we, some, we see some of the heaviest rain making its way into the mid-Atlantic region, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and then through tonight, that heavy rain travels into New Jersey, Philadelphia, even New York City, parts of Long Island getting in on some of that heavy rain. It could lead to flash flooding one to two inches possible. By Thursday morning, the worst of it is then in New England before it departs. 
How much rain are we talking? Well, we could see anywhere from two to three inches of rain. It's not just about the number there. It's about how quickly this rain is coming down. That could really lead to flooding in parts of the Delmarva Peninsula and right on into South New Jersey, just outside of Philadelphia. Finally, on the back end of this system, still some straggling snow trying to hold out, sweeping deep into the Tennessee Valley. And look at the temperatures. This is wind chills, what it's going to feel like Friday afternoon in Nashville, just around freezing. Back to you, Alexis. All right, Samaria Theodore, thank you. And that winter storm is impacting travel plans for millions of Americans now making their way home from Christmas and getting ready for the new year. The TSA says the busiest days for travelers expected to last until January 2nd. Just yesterday, the TSA says more than two and a half million people made their way through airports nationwide. Here's ABC News transportation correspondent Gio Benitez. A mad dash to get back home after millions of travelers hit the roads and skies for Christmas. Both our flights left late. You've got to expect it to be crazy. The TSA is screening more than 14 and a half million people at airports between last Wednesday, when the holiday rush began, through Christmas Day Monday. That's almost two million more than last year. The lines at TSA have been going really well. Um, long but smooth. Travel itself also mostly smooth, with airlines like American and United reporting their best performance ever. But TSA and FAA staffing issues creating hiccups at Atlanta's Hartsfield Jackson International Airport, the busiest in the world. Our Faith Abube was there. You can see the TSA screening line is wrapped around the atrium. It goes all the way over there. Some travelers telling me it's taking them about two hours from the time they walk through the doors to drop off their bags to getting through the security line. We've never seen it this crazy. We live here, so we know to get here way early. The TSA telling ABC News, we did have an unusual number of employees call in sick today. Additionally, there were blizzard warnings issued, creating a very busy morning at ATL. I think we're in a way probably twice as long as our flight. And in Denver, ground stops because of weather and staffing at air traffic control. Super busy. It was kind of like organized craziness. Yeah. <laughs> And the next busiest day for air travel is this Friday, so make sure you get ready for that. Meanwhile, the roads are going to be busy today between 1 and 7 p.m., so try to get out there early or later tonight. But the gas prices, they're looking pretty good. They're at 312 a gallon right now. That's the national average. That's up a bit over last week, but still down 13 cents from a month ago. Alexis. All right, a sliver of good news there. Gio Benitez, thank you. Coming up, the new details involving Apple Watches and an ongoing patent rights dispute. Also ahead, the convenient new ways to return those unwanted holiday gifts. But first, some of our ABC News colleagues are sharing their New Year's resolutions. I think it's going to be to read to my eight-year-old every night before bed, but now that she can read, we don't do that very often. To read to her every night a story when she goes to bed. And to win at fantasy football in my league, but that's not realistic. I can't do that. Happy New Year. Happy New Year's, ABC News Live. What would my New Year's resolution be? Well, I'm hoping the Lakers win another championship and LeBron James is the MVP. And hoping for being my best at work at it. My New Year's resolution is to open my mind to dogs because Lord knows cats are the best animals there are. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. news breaks it's so important to always remember that lives are changed here in london in buffalo uvalde texas edinburgh scotland reporting from rolling fork mississippi ukrainian refugees here in warsaw we're heading to a small community outside of mexico city getting you behind the stories as they happen abc news live prime we'll take you there 
Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. The year 2023. High stakes, high emotion, high drama. Yeah. Not tonight. Amazing. The absolute wildest year. We're breaking it all down. Taylor Swift, Beyonce, Barbie. Can you get all that in there? And the stories that make you go, huh? You kidding? Can we say that on ABC? Yeah. Deal with it. It's the year 2023 with Robin Roberts. Getting ready to kiss 2023 goodbye. Tonight on ABC. with ABC News in Bali, Indonesia, and my New Year's resolution is to read more and deliver more great stories to you at home. My New Year's resolution is to be calm with uncertainty. Hey, Stephen Portnoy here from ABC News Radio. Happy New Year. This year, I resolved to waste less time on social media and spend more time valuably reading books. Hello from our ABC News booth at the White House. I am Mary Alice Parks, and my New Year's resolution is to not rush so much when I get home. It's important to me that my son, who turns 10 months on Christmas Day, is not only just seeing his mom rush around. I like it. Welcome back. We're counting down to 2024, and we've got a unique spot you could ring in the new year in today's business headlines. But first, Apple has appealed a ruling that banned imports of the latest Apple Watches over a patent rights dispute with a medical monitoring company. The ruling by federal regulators took effect yesterday. At issue is a blood oxygen sensing technology by a company called Massimo, which also accused Apple of hiring away its workers. Another ruling is due in January. Amazon Prime Video subscribers were warned earlier this year, and now a date has been set. Beginning January 29th, movies and TV shows on the service will be broken up with advertising. Amazon says it plans to have fewer ads than other streaming providers. Ad-free programming will cost an extra $2.99 a month. And if you're looking for a spot in the middle of Times Square to see the ball drop, maybe a little open bar and dinner, how about Applebee's? For about $650 per person, you can grab a seat at a table for you and six friends. You'll also be escorted to see the ball drop. You can check their website for pricing as space gets filled up at two of their locations near Times Square. And if you have any finance questions for me, leave a message on our Instagram feed. I might just answer your question right here on Thursday. Always love hearing from you guys. Meanwhile, the holiday return rush is now on, but the thought of going to a shipper and getting in all those lines can be pretty daunting, but now there are some ways to avoid it. Call an Uber, GMA3, GMA3 anchor Eva Pilgrim has a look at that new feature. If you find yourself with a special gift, like Clark from the movie National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. What is it? It's a, a one-year membership in the Jelly of the Month Club. Then now is the time to make those returns. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Companies like Uber are making what can be a daunting task easier with a new return a package feature, which they talk to us exclusively about. With returns, it's another hassle. Uh, for consumers today, and what we offer is that time savings. To see how it works, we gave it a try. Too small, sending it back. First, I package up my Amazon return, address too small for my daughter, then open the Uber app as if I'm going to order a car, but instead hit this package icon. We've got a driver, 18 minutes away it says. Once the driver arrives, I hand them my return package, and in this case, he takes it off to the local UPS store. The service can drop packages at UPS, FedEx, or USPS locations. It costs $5 a trip for up to five packages or $3 for Uber One members. If you are an Uber One member, we're running a holiday special. It is free returns 
all the way through January 6th. Known for its food delivery, DoorDash is also getting in on the return game. The company offering deliveries to UPS, FedEx, and USPS. It'll cost you $5 a trip for up to five packages. But through December 30th, DoorDash is offering free package pickups for all users. For our return with Uber, the driver texted us when he arrived to the UPS store and we were able to track his trip. Okay, I just got a notification that the driver has returned the package and he even took a copy of a receipt so that I can see that it was... An easy return and one less errand to run. Our thanks to Eva Pilgrim for that report. Coming up, the Colorado man on a mission attempting to set a new record. How he plans to travel from Hawaii to Australia while going green at the same time. And as we head into the new year, some of our ABC News colleagues are making their resolutions. Hey, it's Alex Prashay from Columbus, Ohio, and my New Year's resolution is to be more connected to the stories that I tell, to the community I belong to, and also to my loved ones. Hi, from the Capitol, I'm Jay O'Brien. I just got engaged, so my New Year's resolution is to plan a wedding while covering all the twists and turns of the presidential election and everything happening here in D.C. Wish me luck. We have really good I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. From an Israeli military position near Gaza, I'm James Longman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. A 36-year-old man from Boulder, Colorado is attempting to set a new record by rowing 5,000 miles solo from Hawaii to Australia while dedicating his journey to saving the planet. It's the second leg of an adventure for Tez Steinberg, who rowed for 71 days in 2020 from Monterey, California to Oahu, Hawaii. Take a look. If you want to badly enough, anyone could row across an ocean. My name is Tez Steinberg. So I'm setting out to row a boat by myself from Hawaii to Australia, over 5,000 miles in four months alone. I 
got into endurance sports while going through depression in college, started racing, and it helped me feel better. But as I went farther and farther, I discovered this belief in myself that I'm so much stronger than I thought I was. And then in 2016, after years of racing, my father suddenly died and he actually took his life. After he died, I decided to row across an ocean by myself. I thought, if someone who's not a rower, not a sailor, can row across an ocean, maybe it can also inspire other people to believe in themselves and their potential to change and grow. I'm completely alone at sea. There's no support boat, no chase boat. I bring everything I need for the whole time. So 800,000 calories of food, all the supplies, equipment, medical supplies. This wild expedition is an idea that came to me when I was at sea in my first expedition. In 2020, I rode a boat, the same boat, from California to Hawaii, a 71-day row. And while I was at sea, I saw so much plastic. I saw plastic every day. It took me about a year to feel normal again. It was actually really difficult to integrate the polarity of the experience of being at sea, of seeing all this beautiful wildlife, and at the same time, see all the plastic that they're swimming through. And I came back and I rested and got to a spot where I was ready to take on this next expedition and focus it on ocean conservation. And, and so that's one of the greatest challenges is taking what we have and adapting to it. Whether you're in a boat or you're in life, we often tell ourselves a story about what we need to do or achieve before we go after our dreams. Or we tell ourselves a story that we can't fix climate change or we can't help protect the ocean. But if we start telling ourselves, everything I have is in my boat, start relating to our resources from that position, it's a game changer. And that continues to be how I need to grow, how I get to grow through this expedition as well, right? Each time I face that challenge, reminding myself that I have, both in myself and with my team, we have everything we need to solve this. So inspiring. And our thanks to GMA Digital for that. And if you want some more feel-good stories, just head over to goodmorningamerica.com. Thanks so much for streaming with us. I'm Alexis Christophorus. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. 
Reporting in Moscow, Idaho, I'm Kana Whitworth. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome, I'm Alexis Christophorus. Today on ABC News Live, first, rising tensions. Israel's defense minister says it is under attack from seven different fronts as it expands its ground assault in Gaza. The U.S. firing back at Iran-linked militants near the Red Sea. The fears of the war spreading in the region growing. New Year's alert, the heightened security in Times Square as the Big Apple gets ready for the million-plus people coming to Times Square to ring in 2024. Massive winter blast, blizzard conditions in five states as more than a foot of snow pounds parts of the heartland with winds whipping up snow drifts forcing highways to shut down heavy rains and dense fog coating the east cutting the visibility along the i-95 corridor now the heavy rain moving in we're tracking it all for you and breakout stars 2023 coming to a close and we're looking back at the performers who made a splash this year from pedro pascal to carol g who had the best year ever but we begin with the White House and leaders in the Middle East hoping to find a way forward in Gaza. Overnight, President Biden spoke to the leader of Qatar in a high-stakes phone call discussing efforts to secure the release of more than 100 hostages still held in Gaza. This comes as the fighting there intensifies and the U.S. responds to another round of attacks by Iran-backed militants. Foreign correspondent Britt Klinet has the latest from Israel. President Biden speaking with Qatar Zamir, talking in a phone call about the urgent effort to secure the release of all remaining hostages held by Hamas, including American citizens, and the need to boost humanitarian aid to Gaza. The high-stakes call coming just a day after top Israeli official Ron Derner met with Secretary of State Blinken at the White House, discussing military operations and the possible return of hostages. But this urgent effort growing more complicated this morning as Israel expands its ground offensive to central Gaza, launching over 200 rockets in a day, Hamas saying more than 250 people were killed in the last 24 hours. Israeli Army Chief of Staff Herzi Halevi now warning the war will continue for many more months. This amid rising concerns, the conflict in the region could grow even wider. Israel's defense minister saying the country is now under attack from seven different fronts, including Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon and Iran. <laughs> Protesters there taking to the streets after reports from state media claiming an Israeli airstrike in Syria killed a top Iranian general directly responsible for arming proxy groups in the region. Iranian officials vowing revenge. And U.S. Central Command confirming Tuesday it shot down ten more drones and five missiles launched by the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. Alexis, the U.S. military carried out multiple airstrikes in Iraq in retaliation for attacks by Tehran-linked militants. Iraq calling it a hostile act that infringed its sovereignty. Alexis? All right, Britt Clinton in Tel Aviv, Israel. Thank you. ABC News national security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy joins me now for more on this. So, Mick, Iranian officials vowing revenge after an Israeli airstrike in Syria reportedly killed a top Iranian general behind arming proxy groups in the region. How concerning is that? So, oh, Alexis, it is to be expected. This individual was head of what's called Unit 2250, which, as you say, was in charge of all logistics in Syria, which was a very substantial part of their efforts. And he was very close to Qasem Soleimani, uh, the former head of Quds Force uh, that we killed in Iraq. So this individual was very close uh, to the Iranian leadership, and they will undoubtedly respond to it. I don't know what it will be, but it will probably be substantial. And, of course, they are directing all their proxies to attack the United States in both Syria and, and Iraq already. So this is something that was expected, but certainly uh, Israel took off somebody off the battlefield who was responsible for a lot of the attacks against Israel from Syria. So the Israeli defense minister says the country is under attack from seven different sectors. What kind of challenge does this pose to Israel and what does this mean for the trajectory of the war? So this was something I think the United States predicted and it's why we've seen so many of our military assets move to the region, to include those two area uh, aircraft carrier strike groups that were moved to the eastern Mediterranean. This is so that if this war expands substantially, and as you said, they're already being attacked from multiple directions, but most of those are indirect and sporadic. If it was a concerted effort to actually, say, invade Israel, then the United States is there to support them. 
not with ground forces. Israelis have plenty of ground forces, but air and, and, and basically offshore military assets that can deliver fire on the targets to assist them. So that is one of the th reasons why the United States did this. Uh, they obviously don't want it to happen, but they're trying to deter it from happening. And Mick, the U.S. says it, it shot down 10 more drones and five missiles launched by the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. What could this mean for a potential wider war? So this is a huge expansion. If this continues to happen, we're already seeing major uh, maritime shipping companies electing to go all the way around Africa to, to deliver their goods, which adds like two weeks and a considerable amount of uh, money, quite frankly, which of course gets passed on to the consumer. So the United States is leading this prosperity guardian, this, this effort to combat this. They need more countries to sign up. And ultimately, they're going to have to respond to these attacks, not just by def de deflecting them, if you will, but actually going back to the point of origin to strike these and also take out the arsenals that Iran is supplying to the Houthis to shoot these at commercial vessels and military ships. That needs to be removed from the battle space, and I'm sure pe the Pentagon and Central Command is looking at doing that right now. They just need the order uh, from the Commander-in-Chief. ABC News National Security and Defense Analyst Mick Mulroy, always great to get your insights. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden and the First Lady are traveling to St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands, where they will remain through the New Year holiday. ABC News' Elizabeth Schulze joins us now from St. Croix. Uh, so, Elizabeth, we know the president spoke to Qatar officials to negotiate the release of, of more hostages, and a top aide also uh, met with U.S. officials to discuss more aid into Gaza. What more can you tell us about the president's response to this? Hey, Alexis. Well, before the president made his way here to St. Croix, he did have that call with the Emir of Qatar. And of course, the two leaders emphasized the urgent need to try to get the remaining hostages out. The White House said that, of course, includes the Americans who are still being held hostage. Remember that Qatar was the critical intermediary in the hostage negotiations for that first ceasefire. Qatar and Egypt together helped broker that deal to get the hostages out and to have that ceasefire in place. And it comes as there's this ongoing discussion over another ceasefire to try to get that in place while also getting more aid into Gaza in. The White House has said that it's continued to increase its warnings on Israel to try to minimize civilian casualties. You saw in Brit's piece the, the terrible death toll that's mounting there. And so this senior advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was meeting with top White House officials, including Secretary of State Blinken, to try to reinforce that message that they're taking civilian deaths into account while they're trying to get more aid and at the same time, Alexis. And with no signs, Elizabeth, of the migrants surge slowing down. Secretary Blinken's expected to meet with Mexico's president to discuss the crisis at the southern uh, border. What's on the agenda and can we expect any major deliverables from this meeting? And this meeting really does highlight how critical of an issue this has become for the White House, both from the political point of view, but also just in dealing with the influx of migrants, with border communities overwhelmed with the record number of migrants that we're seeing cross over the past month so far. So uh, today, Secretary of State Blinken's on his way to meet with the president of Mexico's uh, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas will also be part of that meeting. As far as deliverables, one of the White House's key points is to try to get Mexico to step up its enforcement of trying to keep more migrants in Mexico. There has been ongoing conversations. The President Biden spoke with the President of Mexico last week. There had been an agreement that Mexico would try to uh, eliminate or at least decrease the number of people coming from Venezuela through the border. So the White House trying to make sure that they can at least try to contain that number. We are seeing this huge caravan of an estimated between six to 10,000 people making their way up to the border. The president uh, trying to get that slower, that, that flow to too slow. At the same time, Alexis, we also know a source tells us that there are these negotiations that are now continuing on Capitol Hill over a border security package. Of course, this talks over how to increase border security and comprehensive immigration reform has become tied up over additional with additional aid to Ukraine and to Israel. So the White House is trying to continue those conversations with key negotiators on Capitol Hill. As far as solutions there, they're looking at tightening asylum restrictions, increasing uh, technology and security at the border. This has been a sticking point, but one that we are told the negotiations are at least continuing, even though Congress is in recess and the president is on vacation, Alexis. On vacation, indeed. I was going to say we're all jealous talking about how beautiful it looks there. We're in gloomy, <laughs> foggy New York City. So hopefully you have time for a little bit of fun, too, while you're, <laughs> while you're covering the president.
It's not a terrible assignment. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth Schulze in St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands. Thank you. The conflict in the Middle East is adding to security concerns here in New York City ahead of New Year's Eve. Law enforcement officials say they're on high alert as an estimated one million revelers will head to Times Square this weekend. Here's senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky. New York City's getting ready for the biggest party of the year. Three, two, one, happy New Year! More than a million people are expected to cram into Times Square to watch the ball drop on New Year's Eve. The mayor says police will be prepared. There's always a serious concern around safety in New Year's Eve because there's a large number of people. The police department is on top of it. ABC News has obtained a threat assessment by the FBI, NYPD, and other agencies that says the ball drop could draw interest from malicious actors looking for targets of opportunity or from lone offenders inspired by or reacting to the ongoing Israel-Hamas conflict. The security plan includes thousands of officers, miles of metal barricades, plus drones, dogs, and hundreds of surveillance cameras, all to keep the crowd safe. I think it's a pretty safe bet that someone is going to try to do something to distract or disrupt the events in Times Square. In recent years, though, extremists have almost exclusively targeted law enforcement or military personnel. Just a year ago at this very celebration, a young man from Maine attacked police officers with a knife as they worked a security checkpoint. It's a real Herculean task to manage that number of people without being heavy handed, but being protective. One additional concern this year, the possibility demonstrations over the war in Israel could disrupt. But there's no specific threat, and Alexis crowds have been gathering in Times Square on New Year's Eve in some form since 1904. So the police have a long history of keeping things secure. Alexis. That they do. Senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky, thank you. The Michigan Supreme Court has rejected an appeal seeking to keep former President Trump off the state's 2024 ballot. The watchdog group Free Speech for People filed the challenge seeking to bar Trump from the ballot on constitutional grounds. They argue the 14th Amendment bars anyone who's engaged in insurrection from running for office and that Trump's actions on January 6th disqualify him from holding office again. It comes after Colorado Supreme Court came to the opposite opposite conclusion ruling Trump would be kept off that state's primary ballot. That case appears headed for the U.S. Supreme Court. Now to that triple threat of dangerous and extreme weather in the nation's heartland. The aftermath of a winter blizzard and dangerous ice storm is making for treacherous, treacherous travel conditions there. That same storm now heading east, bringing rain and dense fog, making city skylines nearly invisible. While out west, rain and snow is expected in Washington, Oregon, and California. Flash flooding now a major possibility in parts of Northern California. All of this threatening to disrupt travel ahead of tomorrow, which AAA reports could be one of the busiest travel days of the year. Here's ABC News's transportation correspondent, Gio Benitez. This morning, the mad dash to get back home after millions of travelers hit the roads and skies for Christmas. Both our flights left late. You've got to expect it to be crazy. The TSA is screening more than 14 and a half million people at airports between last Wednesday, when the holiday rush began, through Christmas Day Monday. That's almost 2 million more than last year. The lines at TSA have been going really well. Um, long but smooth. Travel itself also mostly smooth, with airlines like American and United reporting their best performance ever. But TSA and FAA staffing issues creating hiccups at Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport, the busiest in the world. Our Faith Abube was there. You can see the TSA screening line is wrapped around the atrium. It goes all the way over there. Some travelers telling me it's taking them about two hours from the time they walk through the doors to drop off their bags to getting through the security line. We've never seen it this crazy. We live here, so we know to get here way early. The TSA telling ABC News we did have an unusual number of employees call in sick today. Additionally, there were blizzard warnings issued, creating a very busy morning at ATL. I think we're in a wait probably twice as long as our flight. And in Denver, ground stops because of weather and staffing at air traffic control. Super busy. It was kind of like organized craziness. Yeah. <laughs> And the next busiest day for air travel is this Friday, so make sure you get ready for that. Meanwhile, the roads are going to be busy today between 1 and 7 p.m., so try to get out there early or later tonight. But the gas prices, they're looking pretty good. They're at 3.12 a gallon right now. That's the national average. That's up a bit over last week, but still down 13 cents.
from a month ago. Alexis? Gio Benitez, thank you. We turn now to the cost of living. As you know, it's been skyrocketing in recent years, but this January 1st, millions of Americans will get some help paying those bills, but not everyone is on board with the changes. Here's ABC's Andrew Dimbert. With a new year comes new laws, and for many states, that means the minimum wage is going up. Beginning January 1st, 22 states will see their minimum hourly wage increase. In some states, the hike will be small, just 35 cents in Ohio. But in Hawaii, the minimum will rise by $2. The impact of the uh, increase in minimum wage, uh, it just moves people closer and closer to um, out of poverty. In New York, a split. The minimum hourly wage in the New York City area will rise by a dollar while the rest of the state sees an 80 cent raise. But it's California that has generated the most headlines. Wages there are growing up by 50 cents on January 1st. And then in April, fast food workers will see a far more substantial raise of $4 an hour. 557,000 people at 30,000 locations. This is a big deal. $20 an hour, 80% of the workforce force in these fast food places, 80% are people of color, two thirds Two-thirds are women. This is for my ancestors. This is for all the farm workers, all the cotton pickers. This is for them. But the state is already paying the consequences. Two large Pizza Hut franchises announced yesterday that they're eliminating their in-house delivery services, resulting in more than 1,200 drivers being laid off. Customers will now have to use third-party apps like DoorDash for deliveries. And Chipotle and McDonald's have said they'll be raising prices in the state to offset the higher labor costs. Andrew Dimbert, thank you. 20 states are still at the federal minimum wage, which has been $7.25 an hour since 2009. $1 today can buy only about 70% of what it could buy in 2009. Coming up, the holiday sales scorecard is out. How much money Americans spent this year and what they spent it on. Also ahead, with New Year's just around the corner, how parents can help their kids stick to their resolutions. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crooks, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner, oh, Crooks 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. My New Year's resolution is to try to get better at doing little things that can help future me in a very big way. I'm talking about just taking a couple minutes at night to tee things up for the next day so my start to the day isn't so frazzled and my kids can get off to school smoothly. Lining up backpacks, making sure the snacks are ready, and for me, making sure the coffee is ready for the next morning for my very early shifts. Our New Year's resolution is to host more dinner parties. What do you think about that? My New Year's resolution is to be present. 
don't check the phone all the time. Be present wherever you are. I love it. Good advice. Be present. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. That was some of our ABC News family sharing their New Year's resolutions for 2024. And maybe your resolution is to be a better shopper and save where you can. Well, the new holiday sales scorecard shows despite lingering effects of inflation, Americans spent more this year than last year. It's an encouraging sign for the economy. ABC News' Morgan Norwood has the details. From winter wardrobes to fine dining, holiday shoppers really showed up this year, easing immediate fears of an economic slowdown. Overall, consumer spending grew by 3.1% compared to the same time last year. But what were we actually buying? Well, it wasn't the fancy pair of earrings or new TVs. Jewelry and electronic purchases actually shrunk. Instead, shoppers went big on clothing, food gathering around the table. You know, look, spending at restaurants jumped nearly 8%. Shoppers also preferred to add to cart versus push the cart as online spending was up 6.3% compared to in-store shopping's 2.2%. So what about the economy for the year ahead? Let's talk about this. Americans continue to spend. Inflation, which hit its highest level in 40 years earlier this year, has actually cooled to 3%. So people are getting jobs. Unemployment is at a 50-year low. Uh, these are really good signs ahead of 2024. Remember that 2023 recession that experts were predicting? Where? We didn't see that. But if there was anything that initially gave economists pause heading into the holidays, it was the record high credit card debt Americans picked up once inflation spiked now at more than one trillion dollars. And that was Morgan Norwood. Our thanks to her for that report. We are counting down to the new year. And just like our ABC News colleagues, many are starting to think about their New Year's resolutions. But what about if you're a parent? What are some good resolutions for both you and your family? ABC News medical contributor and physician at Stanford Children's Health, Dr. Alok Patel, joining me now for more on this. Dr. Patel, great to see you. So first of all, are resolutions actually good for our health? Alexis, they totally can be, because if you look at polls across the years, the most popular resolutions tend to be around improving one's health. 20 to 30 percent of people say it's split between eating healthier, losing weight, we're focusing on mental health or exercising more, and you'll be happy. Another 20 percent tends to be around saving more money in finances. So this is all win-win. But the important thing is actually keeping that resolution with polls showing that less than 20 percent of people actually stick with them. So motivation is only part of it. A plan is everything. So here's a tip for everyone. Make your resolution smart. Make it S as in specific, M as in measurable, A as in achievable, R relevant, and T time bound. So if your resolution is to be about eating more fiber, for example, you could instead frame it as saying, I'm going to eat 25 to 30 grams more fiber a day by eating more whole grains and vegetables. I'll start by incorporating these foods into my breakfast, measure my progress over the course of three months. And this is going to be great for my gut, heart health, and my cancer risk. I like that goal, actually. People should eat more fiber. That goal. I might borrow that goal. Um, it's, it's, it's smart to have these attainable goals, right? These mini goals that we can sort of reach and feel good about ourselves along the way. So I want to talk, though, about parents with busy lives, young kids. What are some resolutions they should be thinking about? It is all about mini goals, exactly as you said, Alexis. Now, these are goals put together by the American Academy of Pediatrics. These are easy ones for parents. Run through these and try to get through these as a family because these are all extremely smart and important resolutions. Start making a family media plan, dictating how much people should really be spending on smartphones and devices. Try cooking as a family. This is great for everyone, even young kids. Go outside more, explore the world. You want to check car seats. If you have young kids, just an annual check to make sure that they're facing the right way, they're safe, they're strapped in correctly. Make sure the family's up to date with vaccines. And I hate to say this last one, but it's important. Having a family disaster plan, meaning the right kits, depending on where you live, emergency phone numbers, and an escape route in the event of any natural disasters is very important. Easy resolutions. Always be prepared, as the Boy Scouts say. Absolutely. ABC News medical contributor, Dr. Alok Patel, thank you and happy new year. Happy New Year to you, Alexis. Thank you. Coming up, a sneak peek at our annual special, The Year 2023. The new stars and shows that have made this past year so memorable. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television.
Give it to me. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Mola Lenghi in Beirut, Lebanon, and wherever the story goes, we'll take you there. You're watching ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. As we wrap up 2023, we're taking a look back at the new stars and shows that made it shine. The ABC News special, The Year 2023, brings us those pop culture moments from movies, TV, and music. Deborah Roberts gives us a preview of the breakout stars we'll see on tonight's show. 2023 was Pedro Pascal's year. Are we going to help him? And we were just along for the ride. I only watched The Last of Us because of Pedro Pascal, okay? I think what happened with Pedro this year is that he sort of embodied himself. Because he knows that we're out here. He knows that we're liking TikToks of him. He knows, and he winks about it. And next on the menu... How could you remember the name? because you're the bear. Jeremy Allen White had us saying, Yes, chef. You want a uh, star? I think it'd be nice, yeah. With comedy chops as sharp as her knives, it's no surprise Vanity Fair was hungry for Ayo Adebri. Stop, stop, I'm eating my spaghetti. <laughs> spaghetti. Italian, I'm literally fluent. My precious. This year, Young Hollywood was in the fast lane. And for Ashley Park, it was all about the journey. I guess it kind of sounds cliche, but I would say it was about growth for me. Before her leading role in the summer smash hit Joyride, Ashley was known for buzzy shows like Emily in Paris, Beef, and even a new stint in season three of Only Murders in the Building. Growing up, I never wanted to just be like the Asian girl, but I think that through the process of doing Joyride, I realized I want everyone to know that I'm an Asian person and also see me as the full person that I am. Twenty twenty three has been a groundbreaking year for Carol G, becoming the first woman to debut an all Spanish language album atop the Billboard charts. Like for me, I have to say, like Latinas, we have like this special energy of fun and love what we do. And I feel so proud that there are like so many Latinos that I'm getting, like we're doing big things. And what's bigger this year than landing a song in the hit Barbie movie? On stuff to look forward to tonight. Our thanks to Deborah Roberts for that. You can see the year 2023 hosted by Robin Roberts tonight at 9, 8 central on ABC and streaming on Hulu. Thanks so much for streaming with us today. I'm Alexis Christophorus. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here.
Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Thanks for streaming with us. You are looking at the fog trying to lift here above New York City on this Wednesday. We've got a lot of news to get to, so here's the rundown right now. A massive winter blast making travel treacherous this holiday week. More than a foot of snow has already pounded parts of the heartland with wind drifts forcing some highways to shut down. Now heavy rains and dense fog cutting visibility on the I-95 corridor. A commercial jet carrying more than 200 migrants from El Paso to New York City was diverted to Philadelphia due to bad weather. They were later put on buses. Some advocates believe Texas Governor Greg Abbott chartered the flight as officials struggle to cope with a record surge of migrants at the southern border. The governor's office has not claimed responsibility for the flight and has not yet responded to our requests for comment. And South Korean actor Lee Sun Kyun has died. He is best known for his role in the Oscar-winning movie Parasite. Police are investigating the death as a possible suicide, but few details are known at this time. Lee Sun Kyun was just 48 years old. And if you are struggling with mental health distress, including thoughts of suicide, substance use, or emotional distress, you're not alone. Text or dial 988 and free help is available 24-7. We have some breaking news now. The Michigan Supreme Court has rejected an appeal seeking to keep former President Trump off the state's 2024 ballot. The watchdog group Free Speech for People filed the challenge seeking to bar Trump from the ballot on constitutional grounds. They argue the 14th Amendment bars anyone who has engaged in insurrection from running for office and that Trump's actions on January 6th disqualify him from holding office again. Now, this comes after Colorado Supreme Court court came to the opposite conclusion, ruling Trump would be kept off that state's primary ballot. That case now appears headed for the U.S. Supreme Court. An investigation underway in Texas after the family of a pregnant teenager says she and her boyfriend were found dead. Authorities are not yet identifying the bodies which were discovered in a vehicle in San Antonio on Tuesday evening. Police calling the case, quote, very, very perplexing. Here's ABC's Andrea Fujii. What appears to be a tragic update in the search for a pregnant woman in Texas. The family of 18-year-old Savannah Soto says she and her boyfriend, Matthew Guerra, were found dead yesterday in a car outside a San Antonio apartment complex, three miles from Soto's home. But police are not yet confirming the identities of the victims. It appears to be a very complex crime scene. Soto, last seen near her home Friday, was nine months pregnant and one week past her due date. Her family says she was scheduled to be induced at the hospital Saturday, but never showed up. When I called her all morning, she wasn't answering. I was going straight to voicemail. And we went to the hospital anyways, and she was a no-show. And that's when I called the cops. She was so excited to have this baby. I mean, her, her the house is already baby ready. She was so excited. She was going to be a mommy. Officials releasing few details, also not confirming how the victims died. But what we're looking at right now is a very, very perplexing crime scene. And detectives right now are looking at this as a possible murder. And uh, but we don't know for sure. Officials did say the bodies appear to have been inside the car for three to four days. According to court documents, Guerra was on probation for allegedly assaulting Soto on Christmas Day last year. I wasn't fond of him because of when he put hands on my daughter. The family is familiar with heartache. Soto's younger brother died in a shooting last year. That was Andrea Fujii reporting. Her family says Soto wanted to become a nurse. Again, police have not confirmed the victim's identity, saying the investigation is ongoing. There's a new twist in the case of convicted murderer Alex Murdoch, who is currently serving life in prison for the murder of his wife and son. The outspoken court clerk in his case is now under fire after writing a book about the trial and the Murdoch family. In an ABC News exclusive, her co-author now says she plagiarized part of it, putting her credibility in question once again. But will it get Murdoch a new trial? ABC News' Trevor Alt has the details. Yet another twist and scandal surrounding the trial of convicted murderer Alec Murdoch, once again centered around the county clerk who read his verdict. Guilty, guilty, guilty. In the aftermath of that bombshell trial, Becky Hill co-wrote Behind the Doors of Justice, The Murdoch Murders, in which she details her role in the trial and her decades-long personal relationship with the Murdoch family. But she's now accused of plagiarizing a section of that book. I was shocked. I was disappointed. 
I was sad. Neil Gordon is the book's co-author. He says he discovered what he called the ethical gaffe while reviewing thousands of Hill's emails that had been released to reporters through Freedom of Information Act requests. She said that she felt like she was under a lot of deadline pressure and she remembered that that particular article was on her email. This screenshot shows in February, Hill received a lengthy excerpt of an article by a BBC journalist about the trial. It appears Hill copied from it directly for the opening of the book, prompting Gordon to publicly apologize to the BBC and the reporter. I decided to look at our book because the words were very familiar to me. And sure enough, it was the preface of our book. I was sick to my stomach. Hill has spoken openly about the Murdoch trial on numerous occasions, including giving an interview in a Netflix documentary series about the case. I had a feeling from our time together with the jury out at Moselle that it was not going to take our jury long to make the decision in this case. In a statement responding to these new allegations, Hill's attorneys say she's deeply remorseful for this unfortunate lapse in judgment. And this comes just months after Alec Murdoch's attorneys had accused Hill of jury tampering, saying she pressured jurors to reach a quick verdict in hopes of securing a book deal for herself, a claim she denied and prosecutors called unfounded and not credible. Because of the seriousness of these charges, when the judge holds the evidentiary hearing to consider whether to grant a new trial, Becky Hill probably won't be able to testify. If she does, she's going to risk being cross-examined and her credibility is completely shot because now she's an admitted liar. And Alexis, Becky Hill's attorney says she reached out to that BBC journalist to personally apologize. The book had been self-published, only available through Amazon and Audible. Both authors now say it has since been unpublished. Alexis? Trevor All, thank you. And ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer joining me now for more on this. Brian, this all comes, of course, on the heels of that jury tampering accusation. So how does this new development about Hill's book impact the case? And could this lead to a mistrial? Well, good morning, Alexis. And, and the short answer is yes. The defense is going to paint this ethical gaffe, as Gordon, the co-author of the book, puts it, and saying this isn't just that a co-author ripped information from one article and put it into her book, but the actual BBC author said that she mistakenly sent it to Becky Hill, asked her to delete it. She didn't. And in fact, the next day, Becky Hill emailed a friend saying, look at what a friend is working on. That was back in February 20th. This book was published in July 20th, some five months after. So what are the deadlines? What are the pressures that she's feeling? That could be something she faces on cross-examination at an evidentiary hearing asking for a mistrial. So could Becky Hill then face a lawsuit for plagiarism, do you think? Absolutely. So plagiarism is a copyright infringement uh, violation. Now, she's self-published, so luckily for her, she's not going to have a publisher coming after her. But the BBC um, author or reporter of that article could come after her. It's probably why they stopped publishing the book to limit any potential damages after they found the fault, and also why they're looking to apologize to try to stop any potential upcoming litigation. And Brian, what happens for Alex Murdoch now? This just becomes more fuel for the fire. Now, ultimately, he's serving a life sentence for the double murder of his wife and his young son, but also he's facing 27 years for the financial crimes that he later, later played guilty to. So this might be less about getting him out of prison anytime soon and more about clearing his name. He's always been very adamant that he committed financial crimes, but he did not kill his family. All right, ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer, thank you. Coming right. up... Spot the hazard. We teamed up with the CPSC to help one family find the commonly overlooked dangers that parents should be aware of to help keep their kids safe. And what are your goals for 2024? We're taking it to the group chat for some tips. But first, some of our ABC News colleagues are sharing their New Year's resolutions. New Year's resolutions. Actually, let's make it resolutions. Break more news, read more books, try to find a way to maybe get a little more sleep. My resolution for next year is to keep reporting on Ukraine. The world's attention has obviously drifted away from the war there. That's why I think next year will be more important than ever to keep covering it. My New Year's resolution this year, pretty simple. Spend less time scrolling TikTok and more time playing pickleball. 
My resolution this year is to donate more of my time to charity all throughout the year. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. I was 13 years old, the day I escaped my father's cult. Our father was the leader of a Mormon religious cult. He was more revered than Jesus. We were taught to conceal the polygamous lifestyle. He raised us all with a gun in our hands. Our family was killing people. Really good people were left to do terrible things. This is when I found out that I was born and raised in a cult. Daughters of the Cult, only on Hulu. My New Year's resolution is to have my toddler eat more vegetables. So my New Year's resolution is to spend less time on screens online and more time in real life, in the real world, with real people I care about. My 2024 New Year resolution, I want to be able to read 10 books and also do 10 push-ups. So here's to that. Here's to strengthening my mind and my body. My New Year's resolution this year, to be more on time. Yikes. Welcome back. We may think we know what it takes to childproof a home, but there are unexpected dangers that many of us miss. ABC's Eva Pilgrim brought a safety expert to the home of a family with two young kids to spot the hidden hazards in their kitchen and bedroom. Take a look. For Yemi and Taiwo Yeni, keeping their home safe for their two kids is a priority, especially with a curious toddler. This is sort of the phase I feel like where they like could do themselves the most harm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. GMA working with the Consumer Product Safety Commission to set up some child-proofing hazards in the Oyeni's home to see if they can spot them. You can't remove all hazards. No. So what, what's a parent to do? It's taking the extra steps to uh, prevent some of the hazards that exist. Starting in their daughter's room. The chest dresser is probably a hazard. You're supposed to, you know, bolt it to the wall. We never did that. That's correct. Furniture should be anchored. Nothing in the room that they can climb on, especially with the window that we have over here. And question if it's time to change out the crib. She's been trying to climb it. Time to bring in the chairman of the CPSC to tell them how they did. You pointed out the, the dresser and the risk of tip overs. Nearly 200 kids have died in dresser related tip overs in the past two decades. As you pointed out, windows are risky for kids. Installing window stops or guards can help prevent a fall. And as for when it's time to transition the crib. You want to do that before she actually climbs out. One other hazard he spots. You have a lot of uh, outlets. Make sure to install outlet covers anywhere a child can access. Next, can they spot the hazards in the kitchen? This could be hot. Making sure that the handles are away from the edge. I usually just prefer to use the middle burner. Clean supplies in here, so this yeah. needs to be locked. 
Correct. Correct. Cleaning supplies should be stored in a locked cabinet or up high. But did they spot all the hazards? You pointed out that the handle of the pan was, you know, over here. <laughs> and if a kid's running by, it's so easy to grab it. And then it goes everywhere. And the stove knobs should have covers. He points out a couple additional hazards they missed. Towel hanging on something it makes it so much easier for a child just to pull on something and open. And they overlooked a set of keys. These tiny little batteries are so easy to swallow by a child. The CPSC says to keep items with button batteries out of reach. You spotted a lot of the, the hazards that are out there. <laughs> and, you know, taking care of those means that it's just a safer environment for everybody. Great advice. I remember those days. Eva Pilgrim, thank you. Coming up, a new year, a new you. How to motivate yourself to stick to your New Year's resolutions. Also ahead, was the night before Christmas, a little boy on a mission. The viral image showing him unwrapping every gift under the tree. But first, some of our ABC News colleagues are sharing their New Year's resolutions with us. My resolution for 2024 is to do one thing each day that makes somebody, whether it's a viewer, a colleague, friend, family, whoever, smile because kindness is contagious. And my hope for the new year is that we can get a little chain reaction going of kindness. Happy holidays. A mobility exercise every single day. By any means necessary, even for a few minutes, that's my resolution. So I'm probably joining the masses when I say this one, but in 2024, I really want to find more time to work out consistently and just cook healthier meals more often. So my New Year's resolution this year is to get more sleep. That's my New Year's resolution every year. We'll see how it goes. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. <gasps> Welcome to Crooks, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. <laughs> Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news. Exclusives. Live reporting. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Oh my goodness, I mean, I, literally, I have so many, but in uh, 2024, I want to enter a car race at the Nürburgring, and I want to learn some new, some new salsa steps in 2024. My New Year's resolution this year is to spend as much time as possible with my kids. Happy New Year! Happy New Year! We can all get on board with that. Welcome back, everybody. So we're counting down to the new year, and just like our ABC News colleagues, many are starting to think about their New Year's resolutions. But how can you motivate yourself to stick to those goals throughout 2024? Let's take this to our group chat, motivational speaker and life coach, Gio Duris, founder and lead nutritionist at Maya Feller Nutrition, Maya Feller, and personal finance content creator, Humphrey Yang. Great to have you all here with us today. Gio, I want to start with you here at the desk. Your biggest piece of advice to 
find that motivation and to stick to those goals in the new year? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is really attaching it to identity. I think a lot of times we always have these goals of, here's the new behaviors I'm going to do. But the identity precedes the behaviors. It's like when I tell my son, you're a dog, he automatically barks, right? <laughs> and so those ideas of what is a word that you would like to use that would anchor your year, but make sure that it's something that um, is an identity face. So like for me, it's provoke. But I would say I'm a provoker. So for the, two, the new year, I would provoke certain things, steer it up. That means go get a gym membership. Go ahead and change your, your nutrition. Right. So just doing something, but having the identity be the biggest piece is what's going to really anchor you throughout the year. And have it be something that's actionable. It sounds 100%. like that. To provoke is actionable. Yes. All right. So Maya, I want to get to you. Many people say their New Year's resolution is to be healthier. That's a good one. You say that small steps are key here. So what are some small steps that we can practice to get towards that goal? Absolutely. So most people say, you know, I'm going to rehaul my entire eating plan. And what I say to folks is think about the small things that you want to do. For example, do you want to eat more vegetables? What are the vegetables that are accessible, affordable, culturally relevant to you that you can add into your pattern of eating day after day? You like broccoli? What are the ways that you can get broccoli in? You can do fresh, you can do frozen, you can do boxed, you can do freeze dried. Think about those small, small steps. Also think about how you can add rather than reduce. Oftentimes, you know, we like to cut out foods. Think about what you can put on your plate and eat from around the globe. As you choose flavors, temperatures, and textures, and you go all around the globe, you're gonna have so much nutrient-rich food that add excitement to your plate. And I, I like that, add something instead of taking away. It's all in the attitude. So Humphrey, let's talk money. That's my, that's my wheelhouse, some resolutions on saving money. Now you say saving $10,000 in 2024 could be achieved by simple lifestyle fixes. Tell us about that. Yeah, so if you break down your $10,000 savings goal over the course of, let's say, 12 months, it's about $833 a month that you need to save, which comes out to about $27 a day. So if you do some simple lifestyle fixes, like perhaps you maybe eat out once per week instead of twice per week, so you eat out one x, you know, one times less per week out, that could save you $10 to $20 uh, uh, per day. And then if you, you know, cancel subscriptions, perhaps you switch your insurance providers, Maybe you make some coffee at home here and there. The idea is that as long as you can work these habits into your normal everyday lifestyle, you can start to see those savings really add up. And sometimes it's just these simple lifestyle fixes. You know, you make a small change here and that compounds over the entire year. And so that's what I really try to advocate for is like, let's try to see if we can just clean up our spending habits just a little bit through the new year. Yeah, baby steps, right? So Gio, what's your advice uh, for picking up new skills or hobbies? A lot of us want to do that too in the new year. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is to make sure that you pick something that is exciting, but also has challenges, which are, what it allows is for you to go and reach milestones throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So you don't like fade out of your New Year's resolutions in like March, right? So you want to do something like whether it's picking up a new book, writing a book about your life story, maybe picking up dance lessons, I need them. And then um, <laughs> just, you know, just some fun things and activities that you could do. But I think the biggest thing is milestones because that way you can get excited over and over again. Absolutely, I know that I need them. One of my milestones is that I wanna come up with a family cookbook. I keep telling the kids they want me to do it, this is the year, guys. I'm going to do it. I'm going to sit down and actually do it with pictures and everything. So, Maya, you suggest that people seek out foods from around the world. You mentioned that a moment ago to stick to eating better. Talk to us a little bit more about that. Absolutely. So, you know, as a person of Afro-Caribbean descent, I love flavor. And I work with people who are always saying, you know, I'm in a food rut, and that can be so, so real. And what I say to them is I want you to think about the color that's on your plate as well as the flavor that's showing up. And what we find is when people actually add all of these wonderful flavors in, herbs, spices, you know, not only are we increasing the bioavailability, what the nutrients are on our plate and in our body, we're also more likely to return to that healthy plate and want to eat it over and over again. Yeah, find some condiments you like too, right? Pour that on as well. Uh, doesn't It also helps with the calorie count, I think. So Humphrey, want to get in another money question. What's a good way to budget for something to make sure that we're not overspending this year? Because just because we have the money doesn't necessarily mean we should be spending it, right? Exactly. I think one way, one easy way to do it is that if you, even if you have the money for something, it doesn't mean that you can afford it. So oftentimes, 
you know, a general rule that you can think of is like, if you can buy it twice, then you can afford it. But another thing you can think about is to think about your discretionary purchases as if it's a percentage of your monthly income. So let's say you make $3,000 a month. If you're trying to contemplate a decision that's a $300 purchase, that's 10% of your income. So if you think about it in that way, in percentage terms, it can really give you some perspective in how much you're spending of your monthly income, as well as the fact is if you think about how much it costs you in terms of your hourly wages, that could be another good way to kind of decide if you really want to make that purchase or not and really try to question, you know, be introspective and question if you need that purchase or not. Yeah, a little self-reflection to start the new year for sure. Motivational speaker and life coach Gio Duris, founder and lead nutritionist at Maya Feller Nutrition, Maya Feller, and personal finance content creator Humphrey Yang. Our thanks to you all. May we all stick to our New Year's resolutions. And now to a toddler who may need to make patience his resolution. The three-year-old just couldn't wait to open his Christmas gifts. His parents could not believe what they found under the tree at three in the morning. ABC News's Andrew Dimbert has the details. Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature was stirring. <laughs> Except for a three-year-old? Both of us uh, went to sleep uh, thinking everything was fine, everything was great. And then we were awoken uh, with a request for scissors, which is not really how you want to be woken up at 3 a.m. Not an odd request, considering it was Christmas morning, but it was alarming because it was 3 in the morning. It just didn't enter our heads as a possibility that someone would go down and open all the presents. Parents Scott and Katie Reinken went downstairs to find every single present unwrapped, paper strewn about, and gift bags upended. And you could see the presents he didn't really care about because he ripped him open, looked at him, and moved on to the next one. But literally every little tiny thing except for the stockings were unwrapped. The toddler explaining his altruistic motive. He like told us, he was like, well, I just was trying to make it less confusing. I wanted to open them so that everyone kind of understood like what presents were for who. The parents quickly rewrapping as best they could with the other two children, none the wiser, caught up in the magic of Christmas morning. It's like, it was hard to be mad at them. Like we, we just know what a joyous sort of thing that was. It caused us some brief panic. And then you know what? We enjoyed the rest of our day. <laughs> Those kids meant business. Andrew Dimbert, thank you. Next year, the family says they'll be keeping the presents out of reach up until a reasonable hour on Christmas morning. That does sound reasonable. Thanks so much for streaming with us. I'm Alexis Christophers. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. In Dnipro, Ukraine, I'm Martha Raddatz. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Today on ABC News Live, crisis at the border. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrives in Mexico amid a surge of new migrant crossings. His meeting with the Mexican president as they discuss the situation down south. Donald Trump stays on the ballot in Michigan, the state Supreme Court rejecting the latest challenge to Trump's candidacy. What it means for the former president and for his bid to return to the White House. And massive winter blast, blizzard conditions in five states as more than a foot of snow pounds parts of the heart heartland. We follow the storm and its impact on your holiday travel plan. Hi everyone, I'm Terry Moran and our top story this hour, President Biden and the First Lady Dr. Jill Biden are vacationing in St. Croix in the Virgin Islands where they will remain through New Year's. All this as Secretary of State Antony Blinken and other top U.S. officials travel to Mexico today to meet with Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. The crisis at the border tops today's meeting in, South, in Mexico. And it comes as another caravan of migrants, estimated to be the largest in more than a year with as many as 6,000 people, makes its way north towards our border. President Biden spoke with the Mexican president last week and Obrador saying, the United States and Mexico need each other and need to work together. Avis News' Elizabeth Schulze is in St. Croix covering the president. She joins us now with the tough duty down there, but uh, nice weather. <laughs> but the subject is tough, that's for sure. This is really a huge issue. Uh, the president of Mexico has called out what he says are inhumane activities along the U.S.-Mexico border. What's he mean by that and what can we expect out of today's meeting? Right, Terry. As President Biden has just arrived here in St. Croix, he really has dispatched these high-level diplomats from his administration to try to get at some of the root causes of this migration problem. So we know Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas are meeting with Mexico's president today. And as far as what they're trying to do, a key motivation is to try to get an agreement on enforcement of some of the border security to try to stem the flow of migrants. As you mentioned, there is this caravan of an estimated six to 10,000 people making its way toward the U.S. border through Mexico from countries including Honduras, Venezuela, El Salvador. And the president is trying to get that uh, flow lesson. Of course, the U.S. and Mexico reached an agreement earlier this year to try to limit the number of Venezuelans specifically coming across the border. So there is an assumption and part of their phone call, they agreed that border security and just trying to increase the enforcement is really a key goal. But uh, it comes, as the president of Mexico, Terry, is saying building walls and just increasing enforcement is not enough. They want to get at the root problem, and he says that currently the discussions from the U.S. side are too focused on putting up those barriers and not at getting at the reason why a lot of these people are fleeing their countries in the first place. So part, walking that line as far as trying to understand what can be done from the U.S. side to address those root problems while addressing the problem now that is overwhelming so many of those border communities, Terry. Yeah, I wonder, Elizabeth, isn't the root problem that the U.S.-Mexico border represents the largest wage differential across the border, largest income differential in the world by far? And that's what that's really the root problem. Solving that is going to be tough. Uh, and I just want to ask about the uh, American Congress's efforts to solve that problem. People remember just before uh, the Christmas holiday, Congress working on a border package that could also go with Ukraine aid and Israel aid. They, the negotiations stopped for the holiday. They're resuming. What can we expect? Is there a potential deal among um, American politicians to do something about the border? And as you point out so rightfully, it has been decades before there has been any comprehensive action to address how to actually fix that flow or understand how to get people into the U.S. through the legal process. And when it comes to the negotiation that's happening right now with Senate negotiators and the White House, it is not a lot, not a lot of that, Terry, is focused on those long-term fixes. They're looking at how to increase technology at the border. They're looking at how to deal with some short-term asylum restrictions. So these are fixes that Republicans have been pu pushing for as part of their effort to say that any additional aid for other countries, and they have said Israel and Ukraine, that needs to come with more money going toward the southern border. So those negotiations we do know have resumed today. Senators are, me are talking virtually over that package that would include uh, from the White House, they've put forward t 10 to $13 billion toward the border. That's an additional to $60 billion for Ukraine, other billions for Israel. Um, those negotiations are continuing to Today, and we expect that they will continue to say that there's progress as Congress is still out of session, though, Terry. 
So, Elizabeth, uh, President Biden came into office uh, promising he'd take a different approach from President Trump. Uh, some people think it's not different enough. Others think it's not similar enough. It's a political issue is the point. How concerned is the White House about this issue and what are they going to do about it? Look, no question, this is a political liability for President Biden. He started the year making a trip to the southern border at the urging of so many Republicans in Congress. He went down and he said this is a priority for the administration. And now here we are. It's the end of the year. And this is still something that is clearly not resolved. The White House, by sending the Secretary of State to Mexico City, is, is making the assumption that this is something that they need to be taking seriously and something that the president knows he needs to take seriously as we head into an election year. All right, Elizabeth Schulze in St. Croix there with the president. Thank you very much for that. Speaking of politics and law today, the Michigan State Supreme Court rejected an appeal to bar former President Donald Trump from the state's 2024 primary ballot for his role in the January 6th insurrection. The court said in a three to nothing opinion that the challenge was not ripe on procedural grounds. It hadn't come uh, to the right point for the justices of the state Supreme Court to review it, but that they were quite, there are questions, they say, there that should be reviewed by their court, just not yet. Trump had celebrated the ruling on social media saying the Michigan Supreme Court strongly and rightfully denied disparate, desperate Democratic attempt to take him off the ballot. This comes after Colorado's Supreme Court surprised everyone and disqualified Trump from their 2024 primary. Senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky joins us now with more details. Uh, Aaron, this all centers around the 14th Amendment passed after the Civil War, trying to keep Confederate insurrectionists out of government uh, positions. What does this ruling in Michigan mean for that effort mounted by Democrats and liberals to keep Donald Trump off the ballot? It doesn't really settle anything because we've got that contrasting opinion in Colorado, Terry. So the question of whether the 14th Amendment applies to our modern day politics and specifically January 6th, whether it's akin to what the framers might have imagined in the case of the of the Confederacy, um, uh, w w you know, that that doesn't doesn't help us. Uh, the, the, the question is, should former President Trump uh, be disqualified for engaging in insurrection after he previously took an oath to defend the Constitution. Uh, and, and the Michigan court didn't even hear the, the, the appeal, didn't hear the challenge to a lower court decision, which said this is a, a political question, not one that's ripe for judicial review. And so the Michigan Supreme Court uh, seemed to think that that's, that's the right answer, that, that it should be left uh, to politics, to the voters, and not necessarily to the courts. So, Aaron, thank you for that. It, it, we've got Michigan going one way, saying, you know, that this is a political question, shouldn't really be part of our purview as judges. And we have the Colorado Supreme Court saying, we can take this case, and in fact, we're barring Trump from the primary ballot in that state. It, it feels like this is headed for the Supreme Court. It does, doesn't it? Because you have these contrasting outcomes in, in Michigan and Colorado and, and other viable challenges uh, in Maine and Oregon, which have yet to... Uh, to come to any definitive answer. Other states where there have been some significant challenges based on the 14th Amendment to Trump's eligibility on the ballot, uh, those have been denied. So uh, right now, Colorado is an outlier, but there are other states pending. And it does seem like the, the U.S. Supreme Court is the place for this to be decided. Now, they're under no obligation to take it up. Trump has not even filed his appeal yet of the Colorado outcome, but he said today that he will. Yeah, I'm going to ask you to put on your political reporter hat uh, for a moment. What, what does this effort to use uh, the 14th Amendment to keep Trump away from the White House again, what impact do you think that has on his campaign for the nomination and beyond, and on, on Democrats as well, that that's, that that's the choice of, of many of them to keep him out of the White House? Well, for Trump, it seems to be emboldening him, doesn't it? You uh, so, said that he was celebrating the outcome today on, on social media, and he's able to now say that this is just a desperate gambit by the Democrats to, to keep him off because he's the leading candidate. And, and he really seems to be leaning into this, as he does all of his legal challenges, to try and uh, incorporate it into a, a political case to make to his voters. 
Uh, for Democratic voters, uh, does it say that they're scared of Trump, that, that they don't think they can win at the ballot box? Uh, or does it say that maybe there should be a consequence for January 6th, which they've come to believe is an insurrection? Only the House of Representatives, though, has reached that conclusion in the form of an impeachment. The former president was acquitted by the Senate. And Terry, when the special counsel charged him, over efforts to overturn the 2020 election and, and all of that, which culminated in January 6th. Uh, notably, the special counsel did not charge Trump with inciting an insurrection. So that question has never really been decided. And there is, there is a federal law against insurrection, and Trump wasn't charged. Aaron Katursky, thanks very much for that. Out of the war between Israel and Hamas, Israel says it is now close to dismantling Hamas battalions in northern Gaza. But military operations show no sign of slowing down. The IDF's chief of staff says the Israeli Air Force has been conducting what he claims has been a, quote, precise and focused campaign inside Gaza. As the White House and leaders from other Middle Eastern countries uh, continue to discuss the release of more than 100 hostages still being held by Hamas. Foreign correspondent Britt Clinton has the latest from Tel Aviv, Israel. President Biden speaking with Qatar's Amir, talking in a phone call about the urgent effort to secure the release of all remaining hostages held by Hamas, including American citizens, and the need to boost humanitarian aid to Gaza. The high-stakes call coming just a day after top Israeli official Ron Derner met with Secretary of State Blinken at the White House, discussing military operations and the possible return of hostages. But this urgent effort growing more complicated this morning as Israel expands its ground offensive to central Gaza, launching over 200 rockets in a day, Hamas saying more than 250 people were killed in the last 24 hours. Israeli Army Chief of Staff Herzi Halevi now warning the war will continue for many more months. This amid rising concerns the conflict in the region could grow even wider. Israel's defense minister saying the country is now under attack from seven different fronts, including Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon and Iran. <laughs> Protesters there taking to the streets after reports from state media claiming an Israeli airstrike in Syria killed a top Iranian general directly responsible for arming proxy groups in the region. Iranian officials vowing revenge. And U.S. Central Command confirming Tuesday it shot down 10 more drones and five missiles launched by the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. And our foreign correspondent, Britt Klenna, joins us now from Tel Aviv. Britt, I was struck in your report by the remarks of the Israeli commander saying this war could go on for many more months. Uh, what is that about? They're, they're going to make the rubble bounce? I mean, as Winston Churchill said when they said there are no more targets in Germany, he said make the rubble bounce. What, how are they going to sustain a war that has already been so destructive for many more months? Yeah, and, and I think you're right, Terry. And I have to say, you know, when we are in southern Israel, one thing that really surprises us, I guess, is that despite all these attacks, this bombardment by Israel, that we are still seeing interceptions above our head by the Iron Dome. So again, how do they still have the capabilities to fire rockets from uh, inside of Gaza towards Israel? That's a huge question. Meanwhile, overnight, in the 24-hour period, Israel fired more than 200 rockets uh, towards Gaza. The IDF uh, saying that targets were hit by land, sea and air. The UN expressing grave concern after Israeli strikes reportedly killed dozens of people in Berej, at Nuzerat and Magazi camps. Uh, that was in recent days. But heavy fighting is also continuing uh, to the south in the city of Han Yunus. Commandos uh, fighting there say they've destroyed tunnels, uh, killed what they say many, uh, uh, many terrorists are killed and carried out operational focused attacks uh, destroyed infrastructure and weaponry. That's according uh, to the IDF, Terry. And, and one of the war aims, Brit, of Israel is to get the hostages back, more, more than 100 still being held. Uh, and what are the status of those negotiations oh, and maybe a ceasefire coming with them? 
Well, publicly at least not much movement there, Terry. You know, we know that efforts uh, are being made by Egyptians and the Qataris, but nothing concrete. Several hostage deals are being discussed, and, and the latest round, we discussed this uh, yesterday, you know, uh, which was brokered by Egypt. That ended in a failure. It was a deal that would see a, a government overhaul in Gaza, and that was perceived uh, by Hamas as something that would weaken it. So they did not agree to that. Uh, Hamas saying it wants an end to Israel's campaign in Gaza before it releases any of the hostages. And Israel wants an end to Hamas. Uh, so uh, obviously there is more in this war to come, alas. Britt Clenet in Tel Aviv. Thanks very much. We're going to take a break. Coming up, wicked winter weather. A brutal holiday storm is wreaking havoc across the heartland. Now it's taking aim at the northeast. The forecast coming up next. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Welcome back. The second in a series of major storms is hitting the West Coast today, bringing heavy rain and high winds from Northern California into Oregon and Washington. Wind gusts could reach up to 65 miles per hour there. The storm is also producing huge waves up and down the West Coast. Meanwhile, the storm that brought snow to the Midwest is now disrupting holiday travel uh, and is affecting the East Coast now. Millions this morning dealing with fog and now heavy rain up and down the I-95 corridor from D.C. to New York City. ABC meteor meteorologist Kenton Gawicki joins us now for more. Kenton, uh, what are you keeping a lookout for? Yeah, Terry, so this storm that did bring all that blizzard-like conditions over to the heartland has kind of broken off into two now. Uh, now we have the uh, still some snow over in the heartland. St. Louis now starting to see some of that rain change over into a bit of snow, but really it's over here on the east. That's the bigger story now at this point with rain already moving through much of the mid-Atlantic, but now it's getting into the northeast through D.C., Philadelphia, New York City. Here's 9 p.m. here this evening, and we can see that heavier rain getting through New Jersey and still along the I-95 corridor. So if if you're traveling out there this evening, certainly make sure that you are cautious, taking it slow. There's going to be pondings on some of these roadways. Uh, and then as we head towards tomorrow morning around 7 a.m., it's getting through Boston. Maybe some sprinkles still there, but otherwise it will be drying out. But we're looking at about two to three inches for a lot of this area along that I-95 corridor, including New York City and New Jersey. Again, that is where we have the greatest risk for some potential for some flash flooding. Otherwise, out in the west, as we mentioned earlier, we do have another storm coming on. High surf there, breaking waves up to 35 feet in beach erosion possible there too. So we'll keep an eye over on the west as well with more storms to come uh, in the coming days, Terry. All right, Kenton Jewicki, thank you so much for that report and forgive me for getting your name wrong. Down you there, got right. it. Thanks very much.
Uh, that winter storm is, as Kenton was saying, impacting travel plans for millions of Americans since now, now who are now making their way home, getting ready to ring in the new year. The TSA says more than 2.5 million people made their way through airports nationwide yesterday, and that travel rush is expected to continue over the next several days. Here's ABC News transportation correspondent Gio Benitez. The mad dash to get back home after millions of travelers hit the roads and skies for Christmas. Both our flights left late. You've got to expect it to be crazy. The TSA is screening more than 14 and a half million people at airports between last Wednesday, when the holiday rush began, through Christmas Day Monday. That's almost 2 million more than last year. The lines at TSA have been going really well. Um, long but smooth. Travel itself also mostly smooth, with airlines like American and United reporting their best performance ever. But TSA and FAA staffing issues creating hiccups at Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport, the busiest in the world. Our Faith Abube was there. You can see the TSA screening line is wrapped around the atrium. It goes all the way over there. Some travelers telling me it's taken them about two hours from the time they walk through the doors to drop off their bags to getting through the security line. We've never seen it this crazy. We live here, so we know to get here way early. The TSA telling ABC News we did have an unusual number of employees call in sick today. Additionally, there were blizzard warnings issued, creating a very busy morning at ATL. I think we're in a way probably twice as long as our flight. And in Denver, ground stops because of weather and staffing at air traffic control. Super busy. It was kind of like organized craziness. Yeah. <laughs> And the next busiest day for air travel is this Friday, so make sure you're getting ready for that. Meanwhile, on the roads, they're going to be very busy between 1 and 7 p.m. today. But gas prices are looking pretty good. The national average right now is at 3.12 a gallon. That's up a bit over last week, but still down 13 cents from last month. Terry? Bit of good news there. Gio Benitez, thanks very much. Well, coming up, a new record is set in the NBA, but for all of the wrong reasons. We'll tell you why the engines are stalled in Detroit. They are bad in just a sec. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand. These were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. I'm Rebecca Jarvis reporting from the New York Stock Exchange and wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Here are some of the other top headlines we're following at this hour. Jody Hildebrandt, the business partner of YouTuber and Utah mom Ruby Frankie, appeared in court today on charges 
of child abuse. Hildebrandt will face the same judge as Frankie in Utah's Washington County after Frankie pled guilty to multiple counts of aggravated child abuse and agreed to testify against her. Both were charged with multiple counts of child abuse after one of Frankie's children escaped from Hildebrandt's home and ran to a neighbor's house asking for food and water. Well, the New York Times is suing OpenAI and Microsoft, alleging that both companies are advancing their AI tech, artificial intelligence tech, through what they call the, quote, unlawful use of the Times work to create artificial products that compete with it. The New York Times wants Microsoft to stop using its stories to train its chatbot and alluded to other copyright infringement issues as well. Microsoft declined to comment, while OpenAI has yet to respond to the story. And making the wrong kind of history, the Detroit Pistons are bad. They've lost 27 straight games last night. That is a new NBA record for the longest losing streak in a single season. They're now just one loss away from tying that 76ers 28-game losing streak. That one spanned two seasons, so they had a summer in between. That's the longest losing streak in all of pro sports. Come on, Detroit, go, go win one, just not against the Bulls. But now we want to turn to the stars, new stars, and shows that have made 2023 so memorable. The ABC News special, The Year 2023, brings us those unforgettable pop culture moments from movies and TV and music. 2020 co-anchor Deborah Roberts brings us a preview of all those breakout stars we'll see on tonight's show. Take a look. 2023 was Pedro Pascal's year. Put your seatbelt on. Are we going to help him? No. And we were just along for the ride. I only watched The Last of Us because of Pedro Pascal, okay? I think what happened with Pedro this year is that he sort of embodied himself. Because he knows that we're out here. He knows that we're liking TikToks of him. He knows, and he winks about it. And next on the menu... How could you remember the name? Because you're the bear. Jeremy Allen White had a saying... Yes, chef. And you want a uh, star? I think it'd be nice, yeah. With comedy chops as sharp as her knives, it's no surprise Vanity Fair was hungry for Ayo Adebri. Stop, I'm eating my spaghetti. <laughs> spaghetti. Italian, I'm literally fluent. My precious. This year, young Hollywood was in the fast lane. And for Ashley Park, it was all about the journey. I guess it kind of sounds cliche, but I would say it was about growth for me. Before her leading role in the summer smash hit Joyride, Ashley was known for buzzy shows like Emily in Paris, Beef, and even a new stint in season three of Only Murders in the Building. Growing up, I never wanted to just be like the Asian girl, but I think that through the process of doing Joyride, I realized I want everyone to know that I'm an Asian person and also see me as the full person that I am. Twenty twenty three has been a groundbreaking year for Carol G, becoming the first woman to debut an all Spanish language album atop the Billboard charts. Like for me, I have to say, like Latinas, we have like this special energy of fun and love what we do, and I feel so proud that there are like so many Latinos that I'm getting like we're doing big things. And what's bigger this year than landing a song in the hit Barbie movie? Our thanks to Deborah for that sneak peek, and you can see the year 2023, hosted by Robin Roberts tonight at 9, 8 central on the ABC Network. Well, thank you for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. From breaking news to all the stories that matter to you, you can always find us on various streaming services, on the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com as well. The news never stops. We'll be right back. America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? 
<laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. ABC News, America's number one news source. Today on ABC News Live, crisis at the border. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrives in Mexico amid a surge of new migrant crossings. His meeting with the Mexican president as they discuss the situation down south. Donald Trump stays on the ballot in Michigan, the state Supreme Court rejecting the latest challenge to Trump's candidacy. What it means for the former president and for his bid to return to the White House. And massive winter blast blizzard conditions in five states as more than a foot of snow pounds parts of the heart heartland. We follow the storm and its impact on your holiday travel plan. Hi everyone, I'm Terry Moran and our top story this hour President Biden and the First Lady Dr. Jill Biden are vacationing in St. Croix in the Virgin Islands, where they will remain through New Year's. All this as Secretary of State Antony Blinken and other top U.S. officials travel to Mexico today to meet with Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. The crisis at the border tops today's meeting in, South, in Mexico. And it comes as another caravan of migrants, estimated to be the largest in more than a year, with as many as 6,000 people makes its way north towards our border. President Biden spoke with the Mexican president last week and Obrador saying the United States and Mexico need each other and need to work together. Avis News' Elizabeth Schulze is in St. Croix covering the president. She joins us now with the tough duty down there, but uh, nice weather. <laughs> but the subject is tough, that's for sure. This is really a huge issue. Uh, the president of Mexico has called out what he says are inhumane activities along the U.S.-Mexico border. What's he mean by that, and what can we expect out of today's meeting? Right, Terry. Now, as President Biden has just arrived here in St. Croix, he really has dispatched these high-level diplomats from his administration to try to get at some of the root causes of this migration problem. So we know Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas are meeting with Mexico's president today. And as far as what they're trying to do, a key motivation is to try to get an agreement on enforcement of some of the border security to try to stem the flow of migrants. As you mentioned, there is this caravan of an estimated six to 10,000 people making its way toward the U.S. border through Mexico from countries including Honduras, Venezuela, El Salvador. And the president is trying to get that uh, flow lesson. Of course, the U.S. and Mexico reached an agreement earlier this year to try to limit the number of Venezuelans specifically coming across the border. So there is an assumption and part of their phone call, they agreed that border security and just trying to increase the enforcement is really a key goal. But uh, it comes, as the president of Mexico, Terry, is saying, building walls and just increasing enforcement is not enough. They want to get at the root problem, and he says that currently the discussions from the U.S. side are too focused on putting up those barriers and not at getting at the reason why a lot of these people are fleeing their countries in the first place. So part, walking that line as far as trying to understand what can be done from the U.S. side to address those root problems while addressing the problem now that is overwhelming so many of those border communities, Terry. Yeah, I, I wonder, Elizabeth, isn't the root problem that the U.S.-Mexico border represents the largest wage differential across the border, largest income differential in the world by far? And that's what that's really the root problem. Solving that is going to be tough. Uh, and I just want to ask about the uh, American Congress's efforts to solve that problem. People will remember just before uh, the Christmas holiday, Congress working on a border package that could also go with Ukraine aid and Israel aid. They, the negotiations stopped for the holiday. They're resuming. What can we expect? Is there a potential deal 
among um, American politicians to do something about the border. And as you point out so rightfully, it has been decades before there has been any comprehensive action to address how to actually fix that flow or understand how to get people into the U.S. through the legal process. And when it comes to the negotiation that's happening right now with Senate negotiators and the White House, it is not a lot, not a lot of that, Terry, is focused on those long-term fixes. They're looking at how to increase technology at the border. They're looking at how to deal with some short-term asylum restrictions. So these are fixes that Republicans have been pu pushing for as part of their effort to say that any additional aid for other countries, and they have said Israel and Ukraine, that needs to come with more money going toward the southern border. So those negotiations we do know have resumed today. Senators are, me are talking virtually over that package that would include uh, from the White House, they've put forward t 10 to $13 billion toward the border. That's an additional to $60 billion for Ukraine, other billions for Israel. Um, those negotiations are continuing today. And we expect that they will continue to say that there's progress as Congress is still out of session, though, Terry. So, Elizabeth, uh, President Biden came into office uh, promising he'd take a different approach from President Trump. Uh, some people think it's not different enough. Others think it's not similar enough. It's a political issue is the point. How concerned is the White House about this issue and what are they going to do about it? Look, no question, this is a political liability for President Biden. He started the year making a trip to the southern border at the urging of so many Republicans in Congress. He went down and he said this is a priority for the administration. And now here we are, it's the end of the year, and this is still something that is clearly not resolved. The White House, by sending the Secretary of State to Mexico City, is, is making the assumption that this is something that they need to be taking seriously and something that the president knows he needs to take seriously as we head into an election year. All right, Elizabeth Schulze in St. Croix there with the president. Thank you very much for that. Speaking of politics and law today, the Michigan State Supreme Court rejected an appeal to bar former President Donald Trump from the state's 2024 primary ballot for his role in the January 6th insurrection. Court said in a three to nothing opinion that the challenge was not ripe on procedural grounds. It hadn't come uh, to the right point for the justices of the state Supreme Court to review it, but that they were quite, there are questions, they say, there that should be reviewed by their court, just not yet. Trump had celebrated the ruling on social media saying the Michigan Supreme Court strongly and rightfully denied disparate, desperate Democratic attempt to take him off the ballot. This comes after Colorado's Supreme Court surprised everyone and disqualified Trump from their 2024 primary. Senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky joins us now with more details. Uh, Aaron, this all centers around the 14th Amendment, passed after the Civil War, trying to keep Confederate insurrectionists out of government uh, positions. What does this ruling in Michigan mean for that effort, mounted by Democrats and liberals, to keep Donald Trump off the ballot? It doesn't really settle anything, because we've got that contrasting opinion in Colorado, Terry. So the question of whether the 14th Amendment applies to our modern-day politics, and specifically January 6th, whether it's akin to what the framers might have imagined in the case of the, of the Confederacy, um, uh, you know, that, that doesn't, doesn't help us. Uh, the, the question is, should former President Trump uh, be disqualified for engaging in insurrection after he previously took an oath to defend the Constitution. Uh, and, and the Michigan court didn't even hear the, the, the appeal, didn't hear the challenge to a lower court decision, which said this is a, a political question, not one that's ripe for judicial review. And so the Michigan Supreme Court uh, seemed to think that that's, that's the right answer, that, that it should be left uh, to politics, to the voters, and not necessarily to the courts. So, Aaron, thank you for that. It, it, we've got Michigan going one way, saying, you know, that this is a political question, shouldn't really be part of our purview as judges. And we have the Colorado Supreme Court saying, we can take this case, and in fact, we're barring Trump from the primary ballot in that state. It, it feels like this is headed for the Supreme Court. It does, doesn't it? Because you have these contrasting outcomes in, in Michigan and Colorado and, and other viable challenges uh, in Maine and Oregon, which have yet to... Uh, to come to any definitive answer. Other states where there have been some significant challenges based on the 14th Amendment to Trump's eligibility on the ballot, uh, those have been 
denied. So uh, right now, Colorado is an outlier, but there are other states pending. And it does seem like the, the U.S. Supreme Court is the place for this to be decided. Now, they're under no obligation to take it up. Trump has not even filed his appeal yet of the Colorado outcome, but he said today that he will. Yeah, I'm going to ask you to put on your political reporter hat uh, for a moment. What, what does this effort to use uh, the 14th Amendment to keep Trump away from the White House again, what impact do you think that has on his campaign for the nomination and beyond, and on, on Democrats as well, that that's, that that's the choice of, of many of them to keep him out of the White House? Well, for Trump, it seems to be emboldening him, doesn't it? You uh, so, said that he was celebrating the outcome today on, on social media, and he's able to now say that this is just a desperate gambit by the Democrats to, to keep him off because he's the leading candidate. And, and he really seems to be leaning into this as he does all of his legal challenges to try and uh, incorporate it into a, a political case to make to his voters. Uh, for Democratic voters, uh, does it say that they're scared of Trump, that, that they don't think they can win at the ballot box? Or does it say that maybe there should be a consequence for January 6th, which they've come to believe is an insurrection. Only the House of Representatives, though, has reached that conclusion in the form of an impeachment. The former president was acquitted by the Senate. And Terry, when the special counsel charged him over efforts to overturn the 2020 election uh, and, and all of that, which culminated in January 6th, uh, notably, the special counsel did not charge Trump with inciting an insurrection. So that question has never really been decided. And there is, there is a federal law against insurrection and Trump wasn't charged. Aaron Katursky, thanks very much for that. Now to the war between Israel and Hamas. Israel says it is now close to dismantling Hamas battalions in northern Gaza. But military operations show no sign of slowing down. The IDF's chief of staff says the Israeli Air Force has been conducting what he claims has been a, quote, precise and focused campaign inside Gaza. As the White House and leaders from other Middle Eastern countries uh, continue to discuss the release of more than 100 hostages still being held by Hamas. Foreign correspondent Britt Clement has the latest from Tel Aviv, Israel. President Biden speaking with Qatar's Amir, talking in a phone call about the urgent effort to secure the release of all remaining hostages held by Hamas, including American citizens, and the need to boost humanitarian aid to Gaza. The high-stakes call coming just a day after top Israeli official Ron Derna met with Secretary of State Blinken at the White House, discussing military operations and the possible return of hostages. But this urgent effort growing more complicated this morning as Israel expands its ground offensive to central Gaza, launching over 200 rockets in a day, Hamas saying more than 250 people were killed in the last 24 hours. Israeli Army Chief of Staff Herzi Halevi now warning the war will continue for many more months. This amid rising concerns, the conflict in the region could grow even wider. Israel's defense minister saying the country is now under attack from seven different fronts, including Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon and Iran. <laughs> Protesters there taking to the streets after reports from state media claiming an Israeli airstrike in Syria killed a top Iranian general, directly responsible for arming proxy groups in the region. Iranian officials vowing revenge. And U.S. Central Command confirming Tuesday it shot down ten more drones and five missiles launched by the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. And our foreign correspondent, Britt Klenet, joins us now from Tel Aviv. Britt, I was struck in your report by the remarks of the Israeli commander saying this war could go on for many more months. I, uh, what is that about? Are they, they going to make the rubble bounce? I mean, as Winston Churchill said when they said there are no more targets in Germany, he said make the rubble bounce. What, how are they going to sustain a war that has already been so destructive for many more months? Yeah, and, and I think you're right, Terry. And I have to say, you know, when we are in southern Israel, one thing that really surprises us, I guess, is that despite all these attacks, this bombardment by Israel, that we are still seeing interceptions above our head by the Iron Dome. So, again, how do they still have the capabilities to fire rockets from uh, inside of Gaza towards Israel? That's a huge question. Meanwhile, overnight, in the 24-hour period, Israel fired more than 200 rockets uh, towards Gaza. The IDF uh, saying that targets were hit by 
by land, sea and air. The UN expressing grave concern after Israeli strikes reportedly killed dozens of people in Berej, at Nuzerat and Magazi camps. Uh, that was in recent days. But heavy fighting is also continuing uh, to the south in the city of Han Yunus. Commandos uh, fighting there say they've destroyed tunnels, uh, killed what they say many, uh, uh, many terrorists are killed and carried out operational focused attacks, uh, destroyed infrastructure and weaponry. That's according uh, to the IDF, Terry. And, and one of the war aims, Brit, of Israel is to get the hostages back, more than 100 still being held. Uh, and what are the status of those negotiations oh, and maybe a ceasefire coming with them? Well, publicly, at least, not much movement there, Terry. You know, we know that efforts uh, are being made by Egyptians and the Qataris, but nothing concrete. Several hostage deals are being discussed, and, and the latest round, we discussed this uh, yesterday, you know, uh, which was brokered by Egypt. That ended in a failure. It was a deal that would see a, a government overhaul in Gaza, and that was perceived uh, by Hamas as something that would weaken it. So they did not agree to that. Uh, Hamas saying it wants an end to Israel's campaign in Gaza before it releases any of the hostages. And Israel wants an end to Hamas. Uh, so uh, obviously there is more in this war to come, alas. Britt Clenet in Tel Aviv. Thanks very much. We're going to take a break. Coming up, wicked winter weather. A brutal holiday storm is wreaking havoc across the heartland. Now it's taking aim at the northeast. The forecast coming up next. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Oh, welcome back. The second in a series of major storms is hitting the West Coast today, bringing heavy rain and high winds from Northern California into Oregon and Washington. Wind gusts could reach up to 65 miles per hour there. The storm is also producing huge waves up and down the West Coast. Meanwhile, the storm that brought snow to the Midwest is now disrupting holiday travel uh, and is affecting the East Coast now. Millions this morning dealing with fog and now heavy rain on the I-95 corridor from D.C. to New York City. ABC meteor meteorologist Kenton Gawicki joins us now for more. Kenton, uh, what are you keeping a lookout for? Yeah, Terry, so this storm that did bring all that blizzard-like conditions over to the heartland has kind of broken off into two now. Uh, now we have the uh, still some snow over in the heartland. St. Louis now starting to see some of that rain change over into a bit of snow, but really it's over here on the east. That's the bigger story now at this point with rain already moving through much of the mid-Atlantic, but now it's getting into the northeast through D.C., Philadelphia, New York City. Here's 9 9 p.m. here this evening and we can see that heavier rain getting through New Jersey and still along the I-95 corridor. So if you're traveling out there this evening, certainly make sure that you are cautious, taking it slow. There's going to be pondings on some of these roadways. Uh, and then as we head towards tomorrow morning around 7 a.m., it's getting through Boston, maybe some sprinkles still there, but otherwise it will be drying out. But we're looking at about two to three inches for a lot of this area along that I-95 corridor, including New York City and New Jersey. Again, that is where we have the greatest risk for some potential for some flat flooding. Otherwise, out in the west, as we mentioned earlier, we do have another storm coming on. High surf there, breaking waves up to 35 feet and beach erosion possible there too. So we'll keep an eye over on the west as well with more storms to come uh, in the coming days, Terry. All right, Kenton Jewicki, thank you so much for that report and forgive me for getting your name wrong. There. You got it. it. Thanks very much.
Uh, that winter storm is, as Kenton was saying, impacting travel plans for millions of Americans since now, now who are now making their way home, getting ready to ring in the new year. The TSA says more than 2.5 million people made their way through airports nationwide yesterday, and that travel rush is expected to continue over the next several days. Here's ABC News transportation correspondent Gio Benitez. The mad dash to get back home after millions of travelers hit the roads and skies for Christmas. Both our flights left late. You've got to expect it to be crazy. The TSA is screening more than 14 and a half million people at airports between last Wednesday when the holiday rush began through Christmas Day Monday. That's almost two million more than last year. The lines at TSA have been going really well, um, long but smooth. Travel itself also mostly smooth, with airlines like American and United reporting their best performance ever. But TSA and FAA staffing issues creating hiccups at Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport, the busiest in the world. Our Faith Abube was there. You can see the TSA screening line is wrapped around the atrium. It goes all the way over there. Some travelers telling me it's taken them about two hours from the time they walk through the doors to drop off their bags to getting through the security line. We've never seen it this crazy. We live here, so we know to get here way early. The TSA telling ABC News, we did have an unusual number of employees call in sick today. Additionally, there were blizzard warnings issued, creating a very busy morning at ATL. I think we're in a way probably twice as long as our flight. And in Denver, ground stops because of weather and staffing at air traffic control. Super busy. It was kind of like organized craziness. Yeah. <laughs> And the next busiest day for air travel is this Friday, so make sure you're getting ready for that. Meanwhile, on the roads, they're going to be very busy between 1 and 7 p.m. today. But gas prices are looking pretty good. The national average right now is at 3.12 a gallon. That's up a bit over last week, but still down 13 cents from last month. Terry? Bit of good news there. Gio Benitez, thanks very much. Well, coming up, a new record is set in the NBA, but for all of the wrong reasons. We'll tell you why the engines are stalled in Detroit. They are bad in just a sec. We have really good news. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Reporting from Mar-a-Lago in Florida, I'm Jay O'Brien. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Here are some of the other top headlines we're following at this hour. Jody Hildebrandt, the business partner of YouTuber and Utah mom Ruby Frankie, appeared in court today on charges of child abuse. Hildebrandt will face the same judge as Frankie in Utah's Washington County after Frankie pled guilty to multiple counts of aggravated child abuse and agreed to testify against her. Both were charged with multiple counts of child abuse after one of Frankie's children escaped from Hildebrandt's home and ran to a neighbor's house asking for food and water. But the New York Times is suing OpenAI and Microsoft, alleging that both companies are advancing their AI tech, artificial intelligence tech, through what they call the, quote, unlawful use of the Times work, 
to create artificial products that compete with it. The New York Times wants Microsoft to stop using its stories to train its chatbot and alluded to other copyright infringement issues as well. Microsoft declined to comment while OpenAI has yet to respond to the story. And making the wrong kind of history, the Detroit Pistons are bad. They've lost 27 straight games last night. That is a new NBA record for the longest losing streak in a single season. They're now just one loss away from tying that 76ers 28-game losing streak. That one spanned two seasons, so they're just somewhere in between. That's the longest losing streak in all of pro sports. Come on, Detroit, go, go win one, just not against the Bulls. But now we want to turn to the stars, new stars, and shows that have made 2023 so memorable. The ABC News special, The Year 2023, brings us those unforgettable pop culture moments from movies and TV and music. 2020 co-anchor Deborah Roberts brings us a preview of all those breakout stars we'll see on tonight's show. Take a look. 2023 was Pedro Pascal's year. Put your seatbelt on. Are we going to help him? No. And we were just along for the ride. I only watched The Last of Us because of Pedro Pascal, okay? I think what happened with Pedro this year is that he sort of embodied himself. Because he knows that we're out here. He knows that we're liking TikToks of him. He knows, and he winks about it. And next on the menu... How could you remember the name? Because you're the bear. Jeremy Allen White had us saying... Yes, chef. You want a uh, star? I think it'd be nice, yeah. With comedy chops as sharp as her knives, it's no surprise Vanity Fair was hungry for Ayo Adebri. Stop, stop, I'm eating my spaghetti. <laughs> spaghetti. Italian, I'm literally fluent. My precious. This year, young Hollywood was in the fast lane. And for Ashley Park, it was all about the journey. I guess it kind of sounds cliche, but I would say it was about growth for me. Before her leading role in the summer smash hit Joyride, Ashley was known for buzzy shows like Emily in Paris, Beef, and even a new stint in season three of Only Murders in the Building. Growing up, I never wanted to just be like the Asian girl, but I think that through the process of doing Joyride, I realized I want everyone to know that I'm an Asian person and also see me as the full person that I am. Twenty twenty three has been a groundbreaking year for Carol G, becoming the first woman to debut an all Spanish language album atop the Billboard charts. Like for me, I have to say, like Latinos, we have like this special energy of fun and love what we do, and I feel so proud that there are like so many Latinos that I'm getting like we're doing big things. And what's bigger this year than landing a song in the hit Barbie movie? Our thanks to Deborah for that sneak peek, and you can see the year 2023, hosted by Robin Roberts tonight at 9, 8 central on the ABC network. Well, thank you for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. From breaking news to all the stories that matter to you, you can always find us on various streaming services, on the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com as well. The news never stops. We'll be right back. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me.
I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the FBI, I'm Pierre Thomas. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Today on ABC News Live, crisis at the border. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrives in Mexico amid a surge of new migrant crossings. His meeting with the Mexican president as they discuss the situation down south. Donald Trump stays on the ballot in Michigan. The state's Supreme Court rejecting the latest challenge to Trump's candidacy, what it means for the former president and for his bid to return to the White House. And massive winter blast blizzard conditions in five states as more than a foot of snow pounds parts of the heartland. We follow the storm and its impact on your holiday travel plans. Hi, everyone. I'm Terry Miranda. And our top story this hour, President Biden and First Lady Dr. Jill Biden, they're vacationing in St. Croix, where they will remain through New Year's. This as Secretary of State Antony Blinken and other top U.S. officials are meeting with Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador today in Mexico. The crisis at the border tops today's meeting, and it comes as another caravan, estimated to be the largest in more than a year, with as many as 6,000 migrants, is making their way north. President Biden spoke with the Mexican president last week, Obrador saying the United States and Mexico need each other and need to work together. So let's talk about this. Joining us now, Elizabeth Schulze in St. Croix and Maria Villarreal from Fort Worth, Texas. Elizabeth, you, let's start with you. You're there with the president uh, in the Caribbean. President of Mexico has called out what he calls inhumane activities along the U.S.-Mexico border. What's that about? And what, what do they hope to get out of today's meeting between the Mexican president, Secretary Blinken, and other U.S. officials? And, well, Terry, as President Biden is vacationing here in St. Croix, this is an incredibly high-level meeting between the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, and Homeland Security Secretary, Alejandro Mayorkas, and Mexico's president. The goal, and a National Security Council spokesperson tells us, is to build on the cooperation between the U.S. and Mexico to try to strengthen existing enforcement, to try to stem the flow of migrants across the U.S. border, while also trying to get to some of the root causes of the migration especially from countries including Venezuela, El Salvador, Honduras. Now, the president had that phone call, as you mentioned, with the president of Mexico last week. In that call, the White House said that both sides agreed that stronger enforcement is necessary. And clearly, by sending these two high-level administration officials, Terry, the White House is trying to send the message that it is taking seriously this influx of migrants that we are currently seeing at the southern border. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. So, <clears throat> um, Maria, this is a problem, obviously, for the United States, but also for Mexico. These are mostly not Mexican nationals. They're, they're, trans, uh, trans, uh, they're going across the country to get to the U.S. border. What does Mexico want? And what is Mexico's proposal to stop this uh, mass migration, really, uh, through Mexico to the United States? You know, Terry, a lot of what we're going to hear probably today coming from this meeting is the funding part of it, right? How are we going to help Mexico in this situation? You know, obviously, there's been a question of whether or not the country is doing enough on their end to, to stem the flow of migrants coming through their country, Mexico, and into the U.S. and onto the U.S. border. Um, and, and the simple answer is, yes, they have been doing a lot, but but a more explicit or, more, or you know, extensive answer would be, but they need more funding. I mean, just this past month, we heard them in early 
early December is saying that that their immigration task force has taken a hit. They don't have enough funds to continue doing what they're doing, housing migrants, sheltering them, feeding them, and in some cases deporting them back to their home countries as necessary. Um, they just don't have the funds to continue to do that. So I think what we're going to probably hear is, yes, everybody wants to be on the same page because both countries are feeling the effects of the migration crisis. But Mexico is going to be very clear in saying we need more funding in order to do this as well. And, and Murray, you know, we, we hear record after record being set uh, in terms of the number of people crossing, attempting to cross into the United States. And now we hear about this caravan, uh, you know, a very large group of migrants heading to the border. What can you tell us about that? So as of right now, the numbers are roughly about 6,000 migrants are in this caravan. Most of them are from Latin America, and they're coming up from the southern border through Mexico. I would imagine, as in most cases, this caravan will probably pick up more people along the way as they get closer to the border. That being said, we also will hope that, th that this kind of a meeting that we're seeing happening today will also impact what Mexico could potentially do with migrant caravans like this. Obviously, they're going to try and hinder the approach of these people. But again, I think it's all going to stem on the success of what what is happening today. All right. And, and Elizabeth, uh, sources tell ABC News that bipartisan negotiations resume today with senators on that potential border security package that got held up before the holiday. Are they making any progress? Well, as we understand it, Terry, there is some progress that those negotiators in the Senate are meeting remotely today to talk about how to move forward with that border security package. Now, remember, this is the deal that is part of that supplemental aid package that includes aid for Israel and Ukraine. As part of that deal, Republicans have insisted any aid to Israel and Ukraine must also come with additional money for the border. So President Biden, the White House, had put forward a proposal that's being worked on and negotiated with White House officials and negotiators in the Senate, and they had cited good progress before Congress went out on recess. They are continuing those conversations today. Still a long way from any sort of comprehensive immigration reform deal, though, Terry. All right, Elizabeth Schulze, Maria Villarreal, thank you very much for that. Today, the Michigan Supreme Court rejected an appeal uh, in a case involving voters and activists who are trying to ban former President Donald Trump from Michigan's 2024 primary ballot because of his role in the January 6th insurrection and the language in the 14th Amendment that might prohibit him from being president again. The court said in the three to nothing opinion that this challenge was not, quote, ripe on procedural grounds. And they were, quote, not persuaded that the questions presented should be reviewed by their court. This comes days after Colorado's Supreme Court disqualified Trump from their 2024 primary in Colorado. Senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky joins us now, along with legal contributor and trial attorney Brian Buckmeyer. Great to see you both. Aaron, break down this ruling and, and what it means, how it comes out of the 14th Amendment, how that might apply, and what this ruling means for this effort to ban Trump from ballots. And we still don't fully know, Terry, whether the 14th Amendment would apply to former President Trump. It says that uh, candidates for federal office should be barred from the ballots if they've previously taken an oath to uphold the Constitution and subsequently engaged in insurrection. We know the former president took the oath. Whether January 6th constitutes an insurrection, the House of Representatives said it did in the form of impeachment, but a court has never resolved that question. And in the case of Michigan, a lower court decided that's a political matter, not something that bears judicial review. And here, the Michigan Supreme Court said there was no reason to review the case. So the ruling stands. Trump is eligible for the ballot. Of course, there have been different outcomes, say, in Colorado. And, and thank you, Aaron. Brian, it, unlike in Colorado, Trump's case in Michigan, it never reached a trial to review evidence. That it did in Colorado. A judge at the trial level heard evidence, took the January 6th committee's report as evidence, uh, and decided that Trump uh, and the, the Supreme Court there decided Trump should not be on the Colorado ballot because of the 14th Amendment. So uh, what do you think uh, m might have made an impact in the ruling here? The Michigan Supreme Court saying, no, we, we don't want to hear this case. So, Terry, this is very much has to do with how Colorado and Michigan operates in terms of uh, selecting a person for the general uh, nominee for either party. 
for Michigan, the, the main question here was whether or not the Michigan Secretary of State has the authority to limit a potential party's nominee to be voted in, uh, either as the, like I said, the nominee for that party or the president. Specifically to Michigan, that constitution, that state constitution, seems to suggest, based on what the Michigan Supreme Court is arguing, that he lacks or she lacks that authority. In Colorado, the way in which they select an individual to become a nominee for either party vests way more power within the state secretary. So it's really about how states decide how the ballot should be operated. You know, uh, Brian, I'm going to follow up. Why are Democrats doing this, do you think? And there are some Republicans. Well, obviously, they don't like Trump. This is going to end up in the Supreme Court most likely. But would that really settle it? Wouldn't people who wanted to vote for Trump, don't people who like Trump see this as just an effort to, to block their, their Democratic wishes? Absolutely. There, there's a valid argument to say that the former president, Donald Trump, was never convicted of being an insurrectionist or a rebel under any federal statute, and that this, as the Michigan Supreme Court is saying, is a political question. And I'm not saying political question as like a kind of a buzzword. There's an actual legal term called the political question doctrine that the judiciary will not encroach on the responsibilities of Congress, the legislature, or the executive branch. And so for them, they, they have, a, I would say, a, a valid legal argument. However, Democrats have a, an equally valid argument that the Article 3 under the 14th Amendment bars a person from taking office. Just how I can't be the president of the United States because I was not born in the United States. Just like a person who's under the age of 35 can't be the president of the United States. There are rules within the Constitution, and it seems Democrats are trying to enforce that, while the conservatives or the Republicans are saying there's due process issues here, that the checks and balances haven't been made out. All right, well, the whole issue sounds like it will be settled by the Supreme Court and then maybe by the voters. Aaron Katursky, Brian Buckmeyer, thanks. Now to the war in the Middle East. Israel says it is close to dismantling Hamas battalions in northern Gaza as military operations show no sign of slowing down. The IDF's chief of staff, that's the Israeli Defense Force's chief of staff, says the Israeli Air Force has been conducting what he claims are, quote, precise and focused uh, attacks inside Gaza. As the White House and leaders from other Middle Eastern countries continue to discuss the release of the more than 100 hostages still being held by Hamas, foreign correspondent Britt Clenet has the latest from Tel Aviv, Israel. Terry, Israel fired more than 200 rockets in a 24-hour period. The IDF saying targets were hit by land, sea and air. Now, the UN has expressed grave concern after Israeli strikes reportedly killed dozens of people in Baraj, Nuzerat and Magazi camps in the last few days. Heavy fighting is also continuing in the south, in the city of Han Yunus. Commandos fighting there say they've destroyed tunnels, they've killed what they say is many terrorists and carried out operational focused attacks, destroyed infrastructure and weaponry. Uh, they said that they took over a mosque which was being used by Hamas as a lookout point. That's all according to the IDF. Meanwhile, Hamas run uh, health ministry. It says uh, that 20 people died in a building near the uh, Red Cross Al Amal hospital in Han Yunus. That, as Hamas uh, says, that the death toll is has climbed beyond 20,900. Uh, so this is all coming with fears of a wider war growing. Because of Gaza, uh, the region uh, has escalated in tensions. Many Arab countries see the U.S. as a partner in this war against Gaza. The U.S. Uh, targeted a militant group, and Iraq sees that as a hostile act. Uh, U.S. strikes on targets in Iraq and, and fresh attacks by Houthi militants on shipping in the Red Sea. Uh, it's provided the latest kind of warning uh, that the war is widening. Terry. All right, Britt Clenet, thank you very much for that from the war in the Middle East. Here at home, the New York Times has filed a lawsuit in federal court against Microsoft and chat GPT maker OpenAI over copyright infringement. 
The New York Times claims that both of those tech companies, Microsoft and uh, OpenAI, are responsible for, quote, billions of dollars in statutory and actual damages. The 69-page lawsuit claims that OpenAI and Microsoft used millions of New York Times articles to train its artificial intelligence programs to, quote, create products that compete with it with the Times. Microsoft declined to comment. Well, OpenAI has yet to respond to this story. Joining us, ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host Mike Muse. Mike, this is quite a, you know, quite a lawsuit here. Let's break it down a little bit. One of the big reasons people are really concerned about artificial intelligence technology is that it might take their jobs. Is that what's going on here? Yes and no. There is a strong argument that artificial intelligence could possibly take uh, society's jobs. But in this case in particular, it really is going to the heart of the integrity uh, of journalism. Uh, journalism is a key uh, part to our society. It is one of the guardrails into our democracy. Um, and as people begin to use generative AI tools such as ChatGPT to source information and queries, uh, they are now looking at these type of products in order to secure news uh, and part of their research. Uh, and part of that, as a result of ChatGPT learning off of the New York Times articles, it is producing queries and outputs that are reflective of journalism uh, from the New York Times. The concern of the Times, though, is this part that is called hallucinations, uh, which is uh, bad evidence or bad documentation or data uh, that is attributed to a source, such as the New York Times. Uh, and their concern is that it may undermine uh, the integrity of the Times, as well as it might have an impact on its readership and subscribers base mm. and and the copyright infringement you're right you mentioned that that open ai artificial intelligence learns by just hoovering up just sucking up all the printed material and video material in the world and then grinding its 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 program through there to replicate the kind of thinking that is in uh those articles and the new york times says that's just basically stealing our our work so that you can make money off of it. But the New York Times doesn't specify monetary damages. What's it looking to get out of this? They're looking at that they haven't yet outlined the monetary that they're looking at, but they're looking at OpenAI, uh, ChatGPT, uh, to remove all testing samples and data tools that they've used uh, for the machines to learn off of in order uh, to create output. And so they're asking to remove all sources of New York Times from their training modules that the machine learns off of in order to create an output uh, for the end user. All right. It is a fascinating case. And Mike Muse, great to see you. Thanks for being with us on it. All right. Well, coming up, wicked winter weather, a brutal holiday storm is wreaking havoc across the heartland. It's pretty mild out here, but it is now taking aim at the Northeast. We'll have the forecast ahead. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? 
<laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. Let's talk weather. The second in a series of major storms is hitting the West Coast today, bringing heavy rain, wind, and high winds from Northern California right through Oregon and Washington. Meanwhile, the storm in the Midwest that brought nearly a foot and a half of snow to the Nebraska panhandle, disrupting holiday travel there, is now affecting the East Coast. Millions this morning are dealing with fog and now heavy rain up the I-95 corridor from D.C. to New York City. ABC meteorologist Kenton Juecki joins us now for more. Kenton, what, what are you looking out for out there? Hey, Terry, good afternoon to you. And we're watching that storm still out in the heartland. It's still over there. It's still dumping snow. This started on Christmas Eve. So it's been days now. Still some snow over there. Even getting into Missouri now, just some light snow. But it is, of course, this east storm that's really catching our eye now because as it's moving up really past the uh, mid-Atlantic now at this point, it's getting through D.C., Philadelphia, New York City, and it's going to be heavier as we head into our overnight hours. So here's 10 p.m. You can see that heavy rain in New Jersey and getting into New York city overnight too and it's going to be mostly an overnight system where we could have some flash flooding potential especially through new jersey and into new york city so if you're traveling on the i-95 corridor from dc up to the northeast watch out for this rain and just take it a little slower so you're not going to be hydroplaning out on the roads by boston there tomorrow morning could have some sprinkles but a lot of this system is out of here by the morning rush which is some good news but we are looking at a total here of about one to three inches for a lot of places but again we're going to be watching for any of that heavier rain that might dump a little more and increase that uh, flood threat. Meanwhile, on the West Coast, we're seeing another storm come in there. It's a series of storms coming over, and that's going to be uh, bringing in a lot of wind with it, too. High winds here gust up to 55 miles per hour, 65 miles per hour, actually. We also have high surf warnings, too, with a breaking wave up to about 35 feet possible breaking waves there. Uh, so we'll be talking more about this coming up a bit later, Terry. Wow. Kenton, thanks very much for that. Appreciate it. Well, that winter storm is impacting travel plans for millions of Americans now making their way home and getting ready to ring in the new year. The TSA says more than 2.5 million people made their way through airports nationwide yesterday, and that travel rush is now expected to continue over the next several days. Here's ABC News' transportation correspondent, Gio Benitez. A mad dash to get back home after millions of travelers hit the roads and skies for Christmas. Both our flights left late. you got to expect it to be crazy. The TSA is screening more than 14 and a half million people at airports between last Wednesday when the holiday rush began through Christmas Day Monday. That's almost 2 million more than last year. The lines at TSA have been going really well, um, long but smooth. Travel itself also mostly smooth, with airlines like American and United reporting their best performance ever. But TSA and FAA staffing issues creating hiccups at Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport, the busiest in the world. Our Faith Abube was there. We can see the TSA screening line is wrapped around the atrium. It goes all the way over there. Some travelers telling me it's taken them about two hours from the time they walk through the doors to drop off their bags to getting through the security line. We've never seen it this crazy. We live here, so we know to get here way early. The TSA telling ABC News we did have an unusual number of employees call in sick today. Additionally, there were blizzard warnings issued, creating a very busy morning at ATL. I think we're in a way probably twice as long as our flight. And in Denver, ground stops because of weather and staffing at air traffic control. Super busy. It was kind of like organized craziness. Yeah. <laughs> And the next busiest day for air travel is this Friday, so make sure you're getting ready for that. Meanwhile, on the roads, they're going to be very busy between 1 and 7 p.m. today. But gas prices are looking pretty good. The national average right now is at 3.12 a gallon. That's up a bit over last week, but still down 13 cents from last month. Terry. All right, a little good news there. Gio Benitez at the airport. Thanks very much. Well, coming up, it's closed. The Eiffel Tower isn't open to visitors today, all because of a union strike. Find out when it will reopen when we return.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the Fulton County Courthouse in Atlanta, Georgia, I'm Olivia Rubin. Wherever the story goes, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Some of the other top headlines we're following this hour. Jody Hildebrand, she's the business partner of YouTuber and Utah mom Ruby Frankie, appeared in court today on charges of child abuse. Hildebrand entered a guilty plea on four counts, leading the court to accept her plea and subsequently dismiss two remaining charges. She faced as the same judge as Frankie in Utah's Washington County, after Frankie pled guilty to multiple counts of aggravated child abuse and agreed to testify against her, both were charged with multiple counts of child abuse after one of Frankie's children escaped from Hildebrandt's home and ran to a neighbor's house asking for food and water. Well, the Eiffel Tower's doors are closed to the public today after a strike over contract negotiations. Unions in France say they're worried about long-term prospects for the monument and timed this protest to coincide with the 100th anniversary of the death of its creator. The city of Paris technically owns the 134-year-old beautiful monument. We'll get to that. And the hips don't lie even in bronze. A bronze statue of Grammy-winning Colombian singer and songwriter Shakira was unveiled in her hometown of Barranquilla. The statue was created by artist Yino Marquez, channeling the dance moves from her 2005 hit music video, Hips Don't Lie. In the caption of the photos, Shakira noted that it was her mother's birthday, and she said how happy she was to have this statue unveiled in her hometown. That is something, and she is too. Well, this time of year, so many dogs in shelters are hoping for a new best friend to bring them a forever home. All too often, certain dogs are overlooked, especially senior dogs, but one couple is working to change that. Here's ABC's Danny New. You want some belly rubs? At shelters, dogs in their golden years may not always be the first to get adopted. They have extra medical needs and maybe a little more attention. He's running! But what if those medical costs that usually accumulate with age were already covered? All they have to do is love the dog and we take care of the rest. Hi! Hi! Kelly and Andy run a San Diego-based shelter called Frosted Faces Foundation. Because senior dogs get like little white hairs. Yep. And basically, when you adopt one of the senior dogs at their facility, its medical costs, no matter how large, are covered for life. These dogs do end up passing away, and then someone's like, sure, I'll get my next dog from you, because then I get a dog and I get free medical care. Go find it. He's looking all around. 
Frosted Faces was born back in 2014. Kelly was working at a different shelter and was just very disappointed with how many senior dogs would either be put up for adoption or would never get adopted because of the expense. Our shelter system that nationwide, like, there's a crisis going on. Sit. Oh, that's very good girl. But now county shelters all over Southern California turn to Kelly and Andy to take those dogs that need a little more love. And nine years later, Frosted Faces is helping between 500 and 700 a year get adopted. Super rewarding. However, that's not going to be enough for Kelly and Andy. What are your goals for the future? Our goal is to help more cats. <laughs> like that's a good direction to go in. What a great cause. Our thanks to Dan and you for that story. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. From breaking news to all the stories that matter to you, you can always find us on various streaming services, on the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com as well. The news never stops, and we will be right back. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. ABC News, America's number one news source. Today on ABC News Live, crisis at the border. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrives in Mexico amid a surge of new migrant crossings. His meeting with the Mexican president as they discuss the situation down south. Donald Trump stays on the ballot in Michigan. The state's Supreme Court rejecting the latest challenge to Trump's candidacy, what it means for the former president and for his bid to return to the White House. And massive winter blast blizzard conditions in five states as more than a foot of snow pounds parts of the heartland. We follow the storm and its impact on your holiday travel plans. Hi, everyone. I'm Terry Miranda, and our top story this hour, President Biden and First Lady Dr. Jill Biden, they're vacationing in St. Croix, where they will remain through New Year's. This as Secretary of State Antony Blinken and other top U.S. officials are meeting with Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador today in Mexico. The crisis at the border tops today's meeting, and it comes as another caravan, estimated to be the largest in more than a year, with as many as 6,000 migrants is making their way north. President Biden spoke with the Mexican president last week, Obrador, saying the United States and Mexico need each other and need to work together. So let's talk about this. Joining us now, Elizabeth Schulze in St. Croix and Maria Villarreal from Fort Worth, Texas. Elizabeth, you, let's start with you. You were there with the president uh, in the Caribbean. President of Mexico has called out what he calls inhumane activities along the U.S.-Mexico border. What's that about? And what what do they hope to get out of today's meeting between the Mexican president, Secretary Blinken, and other U.S. officials? And, well, Terry, as President Biden is vacationing here in St. Croix, this is an incredibly high-level meeting between the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, and Homeland Security Secretary, Alejandro Mayorkas, and Mexico's president. The goal, and a National Security Council spokesperson tells us, is to build on the cooperation between the U.S. and Mexico to try to strengthen existing enforcement, to try to stem the flow of migrants across the U.S. border, while also trying to get to some of the root causes of the migration especially from countries including Venezuela, El Salvador, Honduras. Now, the president had that phone call, as you mentioned, with the president of Mexico last week. In that call, the White House said that both sides agreed that stronger enforcement is necessary. And clearly, by sending these two high-level administration officials, Terry, the White House is trying to send the message that it is taking seriously this influx of migrants that we are currently seeing at the southern border. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. So, <clears throat> um, 
Uh, Maria, this is a problem, obviously, for the United States, but also for Mexico. These are mostly n not Mexican nationals. They're, they're, trans, uh, trans, uh, they're going across the country to get to the U.S. border. What does Mexico want, and what is Mexico's proposal to stop this uh, mass migration, really, uh, through Mexico to the United States? You know, Terry, a lot of what we're going to hear probably today coming from this meeting is the funding part of it, right? How are we going to help Mexico in this situation? You know, obviously there's been a question of whether or not the country is doing enough on their end to, to stem the flow of migrants coming through their country, Mexico, and into the U.S. and onto the U.S. border. Um, and, and the simple answer is yes, they have been doing a lot, but but a more explicit or more, or, you know, extensive answer would be, but they need more funding. I mean, just this past month, we heard them in early December is saying that that their immigration task force has taken a hit. They don't have enough funds to continue doing what they're doing, housing migrants, sheltering them, feeding them, and in some cases deporting them back to their home countries as necessary. Um, they just don't have the funds to continue to do that. So I think what we're going to probably hear is, yes, everybody wants to be on the same page because both countries are feeling the effects of the migration crisis. But Mexico is going to be very clear in saying we need more funding in order to do this as well. And, and Murray, you know, we, we hear record after record being set uh, in terms of the number of people crossing, attempting to cross into the United States. And now we hear about this caravan, uh, you know, a very large group of migrants heading to the border. What can you tell us about that? So as of right now, the numbers are roughly about 6,000 migrants are in this caravan. Most of them are from Latin America, and they're coming up from the southern border through Mexico. I would imagine, as in most cases, this caravan will probably pick up more people along the way as they get closer to the border. That being said, we also will hope that, th that this kind of a meeting that we're seeing happening today will also impact what Mexico could potentially do with migrant caravans like this. Obviously, they're going to try and hinder the approach of these people. But again, I think it's all going to stem on the success of what what is happening today. All right. And, and Elizabeth, uh, sources tell ABC News that bipartisan negotiations resume today with senators on that potential border security package that got held up before the holiday. Are they making any progress? Well, as we understand it, Terry, there is some progress that those negotiators in the Senate are meeting remotely today to talk about how to move forward with that border security package. Now, remember, this is the deal that is part of that supplemental aid package that includes aid for Israel and Ukraine. As part of that deal, Republicans have insisted any aid to Israel and Ukraine must also come with additional money for the border. So President Biden, the White House, had put forward a proposal that's being worked on and negotiated with White House officials and negotiators in the Senate, and they had cited good progress before Congress went out on recess. They are continuing those conversations today. Still a long way from any sort of comprehensive immigration reform deal, though, Terry. All right, Elizabeth Schulze, Maria Villarreal, thank you very much for that. Today, the Michigan Supreme Court rejected an appeal uh, in a case involving voters and activists who are trying to ban former President Donald Trump from Michigan's 2024 primary ballot because of his role in the January 6th insurrection and the language in the 14th Amendment that might prohibit him from being president again. The court said in the three to nothing opinion that this challenge was not, quote, ripe on procedural grounds and they were, quote, not persuaded that the questions presented should be reviewed by their court. This comes days after Colorado's Supreme Court disqualified Trump from their 2024 primary in Colorado. Senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky joins us now, along with legal contributor and trial attorney Brian Buckmeyer. Great to see you both. Aaron, break down this ruling and, and what it means, how it comes out of the 14th Amendment, how that might apply, and what this ruling means for this effort to ban Trump from ballots. And we still don't fully know, Terry, whether the 14th Amendment would apply to former President Trump. It says that uh, candidates for federal office should be barred from the ballots if they've previously taken an oath to uphold the Constitution and subsequently engaged in insurrection. We know the former president took the oath. Whether January 6th constitutes an insurrection, the House of Representatives said it did in the form of impeachment, but a court has never resolved that question. And in the case of Michigan, a lower court decided that's a political matter, not something that bears judicial review. And here, the Michigan Supreme Court said there was no reason 
to review the case. So the ruling stands. Trump is eligible for the ballot. Of course, there have been different outcomes, say, in Colorado. And, and thank you, Aaron. Brian, it, unlike in Colorado, Trump's case in Michigan, it never reached a trial to review evidence that it did in Colorado. A judge at the trial level heard evidence, took the January 6th committee's report as evidence, uh, and decided that Trump, uh, and the, the Supreme Court there decided Trump should not be on the Colorado ballot because of the 14th Amendment. So uh, what do you think uh, might have made an impact in the ruling here, the Michigan Supreme Court saying, no, we, we don't want to hear this case? So, Terry, this very much has to do with how Colorado and Michigan operates in terms of uh, selecting a person for the general uh, nominee for either party. For Michigan, the, the main question here was whether or not the Michigan Secretary of State has the authority to limit a potential party's nominee to be voted in, uh, either as the, like I said, the nominee for that party or the president. Specifically to Michigan, that constitution, that state constitution, seems to suggest, based on what the Michigan Supreme Court is arguing, is that he lacks or she lacks that authority. In Colorado, the way in which they select an individual to become a nominee for either party vests way more power within the state secretary. So it's really about how states decide how the ballot should be operated. You know, uh, Brian, I'm going to follow up. Now, why are Democrats doing this, do you think? And there are some Republicans as well. Obviously, they don't like Trump. This is going to end up in the Supreme Court most likely. But would that really settle it? Wouldn't people who wanted to vote for Trump, don't people who like Trump see this as just an effort to, to block their, their Democratic wishes? Absolutely. There, there's a valid argument to say that the former president, Donald Trump, was never convicted of being an insurrectionist or a rebel under any federal statute, and that this, as the Michigan Supreme Court is saying, is a political question. And, and I'm not saying political question as like a kind of a buzzword. There's an actual legal term called the political question doctrine that the judiciary will not encroach on the responsibilities of Congress, the legislature, or the executive branch. And so for them, they, they have, a, I would say, a, a valid legal argument. However, Democrats have a, an equally valid argument that the Article 3 under the 14th Amendment bars a person from taking office. Just how I can't be the president of the United States because I was not born in the United States. Just like a person who's under the age of 35 can't be the president of the United States. There are rules within the Constitution and it seems Democrats are trying to enforce that, while the conservatives or the Republicans are saying there's due process issues here, that the checks and balances haven't been made out. All right, well, the whole issue sounds like it will be settled by the Supreme Court, and then maybe by the voters. Aaron Katursky, Brian Buckmeyer, thanks. Out of the war in the Middle East, Israel says it is close to dismantling Hamas battalions in northern Gaza as military operations show no sign of slowing down. The IDF's chief of staff, that's the Israeli Defense Forces chief of staff, says the Israeli Air Force has been conducting what he claims are, quote, precise and focused uh, attacks inside Gaza. As the White House and leaders from other Middle Eastern countries continue to discuss the release of the more than 100 hostages still being held by Hamas. Foreign correspondent Britt Clenet has the latest from Tel Aviv, Israel. Terry, Israel fired more than 200 rockets in a 24-hour period. The IDF saying targets were hit by land, sea and air. Now, the UN has expressed grave concern after Israeli strikes reportedly killed dozens of people in Baraj, Nuzerat and Magazi camps in the last few days. Heavy fighting is also continuing in the south, in the city of Han Yunus. Commandos fighting there say they've destroyed tunnels, they've killed what they say is many terrorists and carried out operational focused attacks, destroyed infrastructure and weaponry. Uh, they said that they took over a mosque which was being used by Hamas as a lookout point. That's all according to the IDF. Meanwhile, Hamas run uh, health ministry. It says uh, that 20 people died in a building near the uh, Red Cross Al Amal Hospital in Han Yunus. That, as Hamas uh, said, 
says that the death toll is has climbed beyond 20,900. Uh, so this is all coming with fears of a wider war growing. Because of Gaza, uh, the region uh, has escalated in tensions. Many Arab countries see the U.S. as a partner in this war against Gaza. The U.S. Uh, targeted a militant group, and Iraq sees that as a hostile act. Uh, U.S. strikes on targets in Iraq and, and fresh attacks by Houthi militants on shipping in the Red Sea. Uh, it's provided the latest kind of warning uh, that the war is widening. Terry. All right, Britt Clement, thank you very much for that from the war in the Middle East. Here at home, the New York Times has filed a lawsuit in federal court against Microsoft and chat GPT maker OpenAI over copyright infringement. The New York Times claims that both of those tech companies, Microsoft and uh, OpenAI, are responsible for, quote, billions of dollars in statutory and actual damages. The 69-page lawsuit claims that OpenAI and Microsoft used millions of New York Times articles to train its artificial intelligence programs to, quote, create products that compete with it with the Times. Microsoft declined to comment. Well, OpenAI has yet to respond to this story. Joining us, ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host Mike Muse. Mike, this is quite a... You know, quite a lawsuit here. Let's break it down a little bit. One of the big reasons people are really concerned about artificial intelligence technology is that it might take their jobs. Is that what's going on here? Yes and no. There is a strong argument that artificial intelligence could possibly take uh, society's jobs. But in this case in particular, it really is going to the heart of the integrity of journalism. Uh, journalism is a key uh, a part to our society. It is one of the guardrails into our democracy. Um, and as people begin to use generative AI tools such as ChatGPT to source information and queries, uh, they are now looking at these type of products in order to secure news uh, and part of their research. Uh, and part of that, as a result of ChatGPT learning off of the New York Times articles, it is producing queries and outputs that are reflective of journalism uh, from the New York Times. The concern of the Times, though, is this part that is called hallucinations, uh, which is uh, bad evidence or bad documentation or data uh, that is attributed to a source, such as New York Times. Uh, and their concern is that it may undermine uh, the integrity of the Times, as well as it might have an impact on its readership and subscribers base mm. and and the copyright infringement you're right you mentioned that that open ai artificial intelligence learns by just hoovering up just sucking up all the printed material and video material in the world and then grinding its 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 programs through there to replicate the kind of thinking that is in uh those articles and the new york times says that's just basically stealing our our work so that you can make money off of it, but the New York Times doesn't specify monetary damages. What's it looking to get out of this? They're looking at that they haven't yet outlined the monetary that they're looking at, but they're looking at OpenAI, uh, ChatGPT, uh, to remove all testing samples and data tools that they've used uh, for the machines to learn off of in order uh, to create output. And so they're asking to remove all sources of New York Times from their training modules that the machine learns off of in order to create an output uh, for the end user. All right. It is a fascinating case. And Mike Muse, great to see you. Thanks for being with us on it. All right. Well, coming up, wicked winter weather, a brutal holiday storm is wreaking havoc across the heartland. It's pretty mild out here, but it is now taking aim at the Northeast. We'll have the forecast ahead. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television.
from America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. Welcome back. Let's talk weather. The second in a series of major storms is hitting the West Coast today, bringing heavy rain, wind, and high winds from Northern California right through Oregon and Washington. Meanwhile, the storm in the Midwest that brought nearly a foot and a half of snow to the Nebraska Panhandle, disrupting holiday travel there, is now affecting the East Coast. Millions this morning are dealing with fog and now heavy rain up the I-95 corridor from D.C. to New York City. ABC meteorologist Kenton Juecki joins us now for more. Kenton, what, what are you looking out for out there? Hey, Terry, good afternoon to you. And we're watching that storm still out in the heartland. It's still over there. It's still dumping snow. This started on Christmas Eve. So it's been days now. Still some snow over there. Even get it into Missouri now. Just some light snow. But it is, of course, this east storm that's really catching our eye now because as it's moving up really past the uh, mid-Atlantic now at this point, it's getting through D.C., Philadelphia, New York City, and it's going to be heavier as we head into our overnight hours. So here's 10 p.m. You can see that heavy rain in New Jersey and getting into New York city overnight too and it's going to be mostly an overnight system where we could have some flash flooding potential especially through new jersey and into new york city so if you're traveling on the i-95 corridor from dc up to the northeast watch out for this rain and just take it a little slower so you're not going to be hydroplaning out on the roads by boston there tomorrow morning could have some sprinkles but a lot of this system is out of here by the morning rush which is some good news but we are looking at a total here of about one to three inches for a lot of places but again we're going to be watching for any of that heavier rain that might dump a little more and increase that uh, flood threat. Meanwhile, on the West Coast, we're seeing another storm come in there. It's a series of storms coming over, and that's going to be uh, bringing in a lot of wind with it, too. High winds here gust up to 55 miles per hour, 65 miles per hour, actually. We also have high surf warnings, too, with a breaking wave up to about 35 feet possible breaking waves there. Uh, so we'll be talking more about this coming up a bit later, Terry. Wow. Kenton, thanks very much for that. Appreciate it. Well, that winter storm is impacting travel plans for millions of Americans now making their way home and getting ready to ring in the new year. The TSA says more than 2.5 million people made their way through airports nationwide yesterday, and that travel rush is now expected to continue over the next several days. Here's ABC News' transportation correspondent, Gio Benitez. The mad dash to get back home after millions of travelers hit the roads and skies for Christmas. Both our flights left late. You've got to expect it to be crazy. The TSA is screening more than 14 and a half million people at airports between last Wednesday, when the holiday rush began, through Christmas Day Monday. That's almost 2 million more than last year. The lines at TSA have been going really well. Um, long but smooth. Travel itself also mostly smooth, with airlines like American and United reporting their best performance ever. But TSA and FAA staffing issues creating hiccups at Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport, the busiest in the world. Our Faith Abube was there. You can see the TSA screening line is wrapped around the atrium. It goes all the way over there. Some travelers telling me it's taken them about two hours from the time they walk through the doors to drop off their bags to getting through the security line. We've never seen it this crazy. We live here, so we know to get here way early. The TSA telling ABC News we did have an unusual number of employees call in sick today. Additionally, there were blizzard warnings issued, creating a very busy morning at ATL. I think we're in a way probably twice as long as our flight. And in Denver, ground stops because of weather and staffing at air traffic control. Super busy. It was kind of like organized craziness. Yeah. <laughs> And the next busiest day for air travel is this Friday, so make sure you're getting ready for that. Meanwhile, on the roads, they're going to be very busy between 1 and 7 p.m. today. But gas prices are looking pretty good. The national average right now is at 3.12 a gallon. That's up a bit over last week, but still down 13 cents from last month. Terry. All right, a little good news there. Gio Benitez at the airport. Thanks very much. Well, coming up, it's closed. The Eiffel Tower isn't open to visitors today, all because of a union strike. Find out when it will reopen when we return.
whenever, wherever news breaks. It's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. <laughs> Welcome to Crooks, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of Crooks 2023. <laughs> the Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from a flood-ravaged Montpelier, Vermont, I'm Trevor Alt. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Some of the other top headlines we're following this hour. Jody Hildebrand, she's the business partner of YouTuber and Utah mom Ruby Frankie, appeared in court today on charges of child abuse. Hildebrand entered a guilty plea on four counts, leading the court to accept her plea and subsequently dismiss two remaining charges. She faced as the same judge as Frankie in Utah's Washington County, after Frankie pled guilty to multiple counts of aggravated child abuse and agreed to testify against her, both were charged with multiple counts of child abuse after one of Frankie's children escaped from Hildebrandt's home and ran to a neighbor's house asking for food and water. Well, the Eiffel Tower's doors are closed to the public today after a strike over contract negotiations. Unions in France say they're worried about long-term prospects for the monument and timed this protest to coincide with the 100th anniversary of the death of its creator. The city of Paris technically owns the 134-year-old beautiful monument. We'll get there. And the hips don't lie even in bronze. A bronze statue of Grammy-winning Colombian singer and songwriter Shakira was unveiled in her hometown of Barranquilla. The statue was created by artist Yino Marquez, channeling the dance moves from her 2005 hit music video, Hips Don't Lie. In the caption of the photos, Shakira noted that it was her mother's birthday, and she said how happy she was to have this statue unveiled in her hometown. That is something, and she is too. Well, this time of year, so many dogs in shelters are hoping for a new best friend to bring them a forever home. All too often, certain dogs are overlooked, especially senior dogs, but one couple is working to change that. Here's ABC's Danny New. You want some belly rubs? At shelters, dogs in their golden years may not always be the first to get adopted. They have extra medical needs and maybe a little more attention. He's running! But what if those medical costs that usually accumulate with age were already covered? All they have to do is love the dog and we take care of the rest. Hi! Hi! Kelly and Andy run a San Diego-based shelter called Frosted Faces Foundation. Because senior dogs get like little white hairs. Yep. And basically, when you adopt one of the senior dogs at their facility, its medical costs, no matter how large, are covered for life. These dogs do end up passing away, and then someone's like, sure, I'll get my next dog from you, because then I get a dog and I get free medical care. Go find it. Just looking all around. Frosted Faces was born back in 2014. Kelly was working at a different shelter and was just very disappointed with how many senior dogs would either be put up for adoption or would never get adopted because of the expense. Our shelter system that nationwide, like, there's a crisis going on. Sit. Oh, that's very good girl. But now county shelters all over Southern California turn to Kelly and Andy to take those dogs that need a little more love. And nine years later, Frosted Faces is helping between 500 and 700 a year get adopted. 
super rewarding. However, that's not going to be enough for Kelly and Andy. What are your goals for the future? Our goal is to help more cats. <laughs> like that's a good direction to go in. What a great cause. Our thanks to Dan and you for that story. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. From breaking news to all the stories that matter to you, you can always find us on various streaming services, on the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com as well. The news never stops, and we will be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're gonna take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. Here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah. 
president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Today on ABC News Live, Donald Trump stays on the ballot in Michigan. The state's Supreme Court rejecting the latest challenge to Trump's candidacy. I'll speak with Michigan's Secretary of State about this important ruling. Crisis at the border. Secretary Blinken is in Mexico amid a surge of new migrant crossings. His meeting with the Mexican president as they discuss the situation down south. And massive winter blizzard. Conditions in five states as more than a foot of snow pounds parts of the heartland. We follow the storm and its impact on your holiday travel plans. Hi, everyone. I'm Terry Moran. Our top story this hour comes out of the election. Today, the Michigan Supreme Court rejected an appeal which was brought by Michigan's Secretary of State and several voters who are seeking uh, to bar former President Donald Trump from the state's 2024 primary ballot uh, for his effort to overturn the 2020 election culminating in the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. The court said in a three to nothing opinion that this challenge was not, quote, ripe or ready to be decided at this point and because the judges were not persuaded that the questions presented should be reviewed by this court. Uh, Michigan's Democratic Secretary of State Jocelyn Bennett says it shouldn't be up to her or any other elected official in her position to rule on these challenges. In a Washington Post op-ed in September, Benson writes, quote, the nearly universal view of those who want secretaries of state to unilaterally keep Trump off the ballot is, quote, misguided. And Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson joins me now. Uh, thank you for being with us. I should correct uh, what I just said. You were a defendant in this case because you don't want, think it's your job to remove uh, any candidate's name from the ballot, and it was these voters who tried to get you to do that. So what's your reaction to today's ruling? Well, thanks for having me. I think it's clear the court affirmed our position that my office as the Secretary of State, I am the Chief Election Officer, but the law does not provide me with the authority to delve into this really thorny and complicated legal issue. Uh, and, the, and the court affirmed my decision in that regard that unless uh, the U.S. Supreme Court rules otherwise, uh, the former president, Donald Trump, will be on our primary ballot. Interestingly, the Michigan Supreme Court also, though, indicated that the timing of this question may be premature, suggesting that we may see another round of challenges if Donald Trump is the Republican Party's nominee and comes back with the question of his qualification to serve on the ballot in the general election. So this is over, but the question of who should decide squarely still remains in the courts, not with election administrators like myself. Got it. Well, let me follow up on that. So in Michigan law, unlike Colorado law, which does provide the secretary of state of that state the authority to remove people from the ballot if they aren't properly qualified or if they affirm something that isn't true, Michigan state law doesn't empower you as the secretary of state there to do that. What would be the difference in the general election? Could you step in in the general election, or is this something that the courts of Michigan will have to decide? Well, notably, 
the primary law in Michigan for presidential primaries says that any individuals generally advocated for by the national media to be potential presidential candidates should be on the ballot. And so that's the law that the Supreme Court in Michigan here and all the other courts we're looking at in our state, which there's nothing about qualifications. It also uh, bears to, to witness that this particular qualification challenge is a little more nuanced than a more simple cut and dried issue where the facts are clear in terms of a candidate's age or place of birth. This is a much more nuanced decision about what's an insurrection, uh, did this candidate engage in an insurrection, and what the 14th Amendment really says with regards to that. And that, again, is, is why with the nuances of that issue, it's all the more appropriate that this court and ultimately the U.S. Supreme Court should decide that. Uh, but it's just notable that in the dissenting opinion, Justice Welch also notes that this is a decision in Michigan that only applies to the primary, uh, and that indeed, if there's a general election question, uh, then there will be an opportunity potentially if plaintiffs bring a case to revisit the president's qualifications to be on the general election ballot should his party nominate him to be on the ballot at that time. Got it. So, Secretary Benson, it does. this is a hot potato for courts, right? With the exception of Colorado, a lot of courts are saying, you know, we don't want to deal with this at that point. Uh, we're seeing dismissals on procedural grounds as they have done in Michigan, and, and none have called uh, that Trump engaged or incited an insurrection. There was a trial in Michigan that did so as well. But do you think the courts are reluctant to take this up simply because it runs against the American sensibility that voters choose presidents, not judges? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is actually, I say this as a former law professor and dean of a law school, none of the way in which this is playing out in the courts is surprising either. The courts are rightfully reluctant to both engage in what is often terms as a political question, best meant left to the voters in terms of a candidate's qualifications. Uh, and then also you have the very sort of nuance and, and novelty of this question. This has never been presented before, and the magnitude to which this is being presented is, is quite significant for our country. And in general, there's a philosophy and, and legal jurisprudence that if there's uncertainties about whether someone should have access to the ballot, you decide in favor of giving the voters the choice to um, and, and allow that person on the ballot to give the so you see that playing out a bit here, I think, in the many states that have declined to go forward with this challenge, this idea that in a democracy, voters should ultimately decide who should be, in this case, president, uh, is you know a big part of the way in which this question is playing out nationwide. For sure, and rightly so. Now, you're a Secretary of State of Michigan, the state's top election officer. You're also, obviously, uh, an elected official. You won a statewide election in Michigan. Secretary of State, in a lot of states, that's a stepping stone to the governorship. I won't ask you about that, but I will ask you about whether you think, from uh, putting on your, your uh, politician's hat as a, as a candidate and as a successful Secretary of State, is this dumb for Democrats to do? Isn't it just uh, making Republicans angry for taking away their choices at the ballot box? Yeah, I get it. Usually if there's an issue of qualification that's cut and dried, like is someone's age or uh, past service through term limits disqualify them, then everyone agrees on the facts and the law, and it's much easier and clear cut to make a decision about ballot access that would deny someone that access. Similarly, if someone didn't commit enough or submit enough signatures to be on the ballot, if that's what the law requires, it's much easier to make a clear case in that. This case is so complicated and uh, creates so many questions of facts and law that are not not universally resolved, that it's a lot more complicated even for courts to weigh in on. Uh, and so, you know, I think we'll see how the criminal proceedings play out uh, with regards to Donald Trump that are still ongoing. Uh, and I, I think, in my view, no matter what and how this legal qualification issue plays out in the courts or at the U.S. Supreme Court, voters have the ultimate authority and should have the ultimate authority to decide with their power who should become president. And I think that's ultimately what voters observing all of these proceedings need to think about in terms of how they're cast their ballot, certainly in the primary stage of this process, but also potentially in the general election stage. I think that is what most people probably feel deep down. Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson, thank you very much for helping us out with an important ruling today. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Well, President Biden and First Lady Dr. Jill Biden, they are vacationing in St. Croix, where they'll remain through New Year's. 
This is Secretary of State Antony Blinken and other top U.S. officials are meeting with the Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador today in Mexico. The crisis at the border, of course, tops today's meeting down south, and it comes as another migrant caravan, estimated to be the largest in more than a year, heads north with as many as 6,000 migrants so far. President Biden spoke with the Mexican president last week, and Obrador said the United States and Mexico, quote, need each other, need to work together. So joining us now, ABC News' is Elizabeth Schulze. She's in St. Croix with the president, Maria Villarreal, live from Fort Worth, Texas. Elizabeth, uh, let me begin with you. The Biden's vacationing in St. Croix. That's, uh, that's why you're there. But he's getting criticism from mayors in deep blue states as well as Republicans on this surge of migrants uh, over the course of the year, over the course of his presidency. How is Biden trying to get a hold of this and convince Americans he's handling this crisis? Look, you know, Terry, there's just no question that President Biden and his administration are under pressure, especially as we're seeing this record surge at the southern border. The president knows that this is a political liability for him as we head into an election year. It was a year ago about that he made the trip down to the southern border, the first of his presidency, to meet with the president of Mexico to try to discuss some of these longer term solutions to try to stem the flow of migrants. And today he's dispatching his secretary of state and Homeland Security secretary to to meet with the Mexican president to follow up and figure out exactly how they can specifically increase enforcement of some of those measures. In that call last week, the president Biden had with Mexico's president, both sides agreed that additional enforcement is necessary. But at the same time, we are hearing from Mexico that more needs to be done from the U.S. when it comes to addressing some of these root causes of the migration crisis. There are conversations going on in Congress to try to come down to comprehensive immigration reform, but still a long way to go before some of those root Root causes in that comprehensive package can be close to getting past, Harry. Absolutely. Those root causes, uh, Murray, include the, the fact that just that the, the border is there. We are looking uh, earlier at the president of Mexico uh, and the Sec United States Secretary of State and their staff sitting down together for this important meeting. So, Maria, you know, that, that border represents the largest uh, wage differential across any border in the world by far. There's Secretary of State Blinken. Uh, we're seeing them. And um, you've reported on this. It's such a vast problem. You've reported on it for a long time. What could come out of this meeting and, and beyond that of, of the talks between the U.S. and Mexico that would represent progress on this just giant problem that's been plaguing, you know, the, the region, the country for years that, that the American people could say, OK, they did something. You know, I think this is all going to come down to, you know, a compromise, not just with Mexico, but also within our own country, right? We keep talking about the funding that the country is now debating over uh, how much we're going to give Ukraine versus how much we're going to give to border security and what that compromise will look like. It's very clear that Mexico is also watching these discussions. And on top of that, the cartels are watching this as well because it is creating chaos along the border. I think what we potentially could see is a compromise where Mexico says, listen, what we want to see is us helping countries, you know, that are not Mexico, that are south of here, Latin American countries that need this help. We need to, um, you know, invest in things like job creating, you know, uh, economic development in some of these countries. Um, and then on top of that, I think one thing we will hear from the president of Mexico is is this discussion over building more border wall. Obviously, he knows what is happening in our country and what funding could be tied to. He's also seen what has happened here in Texas along the southwest border and what Governor Abbott has been promising to do with some of the funding that he has put together for border security. So I think what he wants is reassurance that he is going to be dealing with the Biden administration and the federal government and not Texas or other governors like Abbott um, when it comes to this issue. And, and that's a great point because the governors are getting anxious. They're under political pressure. Elizabeth, the White House and Biden running for re-election under political pressure. What do they hope can come out of this high-level meeting today, at least as a first step? Now, uh, Terry, a National Security Council spokesperson tells us that the goal is to have a robust conversation with Mexico to f talk about some of those enforcement actions that could try to stem the flow of people coming across the U.S. border, but also to try to get at potentially 
uh, reopening some ports of entry, figuring out how both the U.S. and Mexico can work together. The, the reality is that Mexico's president has told President Biden that his country needs those resources. And there is pressure, as Maria points out, to, to put some of the funding directly toward not just the initiatives the Republicans are pushing, for example, uh, loosening, uh, tightening asylum restrictions, uh, increasing border technology, also toward putting some of those funds directly to the countries that they say need them most. Terry. All right, Elizabeth Shelsey, Maria Villarreal, thank you very much for being with us on that. Well, the second in a series of major storms is hitting the West Coast today, bringing heavy rain and high winds from Northern California to Oregon and Washington. Meanwhile, the storm in the Midwest that brought nearly a foot and a half of snow to the Nebraska Panhandle, disrupting holiday travel there, is now affecting the East Coast. Millions this morning dealing with fog and now heavy rain up the I-95 corridor from D.C. to New York City. ABC meteorologist Kenton Juecki joins us now for more. Kenton, what are you looking out for out there? Terry, good afternoon. We are watching for that flooding, and we do have a flood watch now in effect for more than 10 million people here in the Northeast. It includes Philadelphia and Atlantic City, too, and that's because of this heavy rain that's already coming down from D.C. up to New York City, and it's only going to get stronger as we continue into these evening hours. Look at this heavy rain you see in these shades of orange and yellow. That's very heavy rain coming down. It is, again, in an overnight time period. So here's 11 p.m. on the East Coast. Philadelphia getting that heavy rain also up to New York City there. So if you're on the I-95 corridor overnight tonight, certainly note this. You're going to want to take it much slower and be cautious. There could be some hydroplaning out on the roads overnight. That will start to push out, but by 7 a.m., we are still looking at some of this rain sticking around. New York City, you could still have some rain at 7 a.m. as well as Boston with some moderate rain showers still here. Up, especially in parts of New England. And we're looking at a total of about one to three inches for a lot of places, but we could see more in some locations where we see that heaviest actual rainfall come on through. Otherwise, on the West Coast, there is another storm coming in. It's a series of storms, and it's a lot of wind with it, and that's causing multiple issues. It's gusting 55 to 65 miles per hour, but it's also bringing coastal flooding to the Bay Area and a lot of dangerously large waves too, Terry. Yeah, dangerously, that's the key there. You see high surf warning. Some people get eager for that, but mm. uh, that's pretty intense. Kenton, thanks very much for that. Yep. Well, coming up, a major twist in the case of convicted murderer Alex Murdoch. Why a court clerk is bringing this case back in the open after a short break. We'll be right back. Thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight, we are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Welcome back. There's a new twist in the case of convicted murderer Alex Murdoch, who is currently serving life in prison for the murder of his wife and son. The outspoken court clerk in his case is now under fire after writing a book about the trial and about the Murdoch family. In an ABC News exclusive, her co-author now alleges that the clerk plagiarized part of the book, putting her credibility in question. ABC News' Trevor Alt has the details. Yet another twist and scandal surrounding the trial of convicted murderer Alec Murdoch, once again centered around the county clerk who read his verdict. Guilty, guilty, guilty. In the aftermath of that bombshell trial, Becky Hill co-wrote Behind the Doors of Justice, The Murdoch Murders, in which she details her role in the trial and her decades-long personal relationship with the Murdoch family. But she's now accused of plagiarizing a section of that book. I was shocked. I was disappointed, 
I was sad. Neil Gordon is the book's co-author. He says he discovered what he called the ethical gaffe while reviewing thousands of Hill's emails that had been released to reporters through Freedom of Information Act requests. She said that she felt like she was under a lot of deadline pressure and she remembered that that particular article was on her email. This screenshot shows in February, Hill received a lengthy excerpt of an article by a BBC journalist about the trial. It appears Hill copied from it directly for the opening of the book, prompting Gordon to publicly apologize to the BBC and the reporter. I decided to look at our book because the words were very familiar to me. And sure enough, it was the preface of our book. I was sick to my stomach. Hill has spoken openly about the Murdoch trial on numerous occasions, including giving an interview in a Netflix documentary series about the case. I had a feeling from our time together with the jury out at Moselle that it was not going to take our jury long to make the decision in this case. In a statement responding to these new allegations, Hill's attorneys say she's deeply remorseful for this unfortunate lapse in judgment. And this comes just months after Alec Murdoch's attorneys had accused Hill of jury tampering, saying she pressured jurors to reach a quick verdict in hopes of securing a book deal for herself, a claim she denied and prosecutors called unfounded and not credible. Because of the seriousness of these charges, when the judge holds the evidentiary hearing to consider whether to grant a new trial, Becky Hill probably won't be able to testify. If she does, she's going to risk being cross-examined and her credibility is completely shot because now she's an admitted liar. And Terry, Becky Hill's attorney says she reached out to that BBC journalist to personally apologize. This book had been self-published, only available through Amazon and Audible, but both authors now say it has since been unpublished. Terry? Mm. Trevor Alt, thank you for that report. This case just can't keep out of the news. ABC News legal contributor and managing partner of the Cochrane Law Firm, Shauna Lloyd, joins us now for more. Shauna, I mean, really, we, all this is coming on the heels. There was a jury tampering accusation. Now this, uh, does any of it, uh, could it lead to any kind of uh, progress on appeal or a mistrial for Alex Murdoch? So these allegations of plagiarism will have no real effect on the trial. What they could have an effect on it potentially could be her credibility. Because remember, let's this jury tampering charge is really about credibility and what she said to the jury. The plagiarism is going to stand on its own because it's not very similar to jury tampering charges. So it will have no influence on that or the appeal. Got it. And, and so now Becky Hill might face a lawsuit for plagiarism. Could, could that be brought by the by the authors who feel aggrieved by it? Absolutely. The authors, authors can bring um, some form of an action against her. Typically, we're not going to see criminal charges for plagiarism unless there is something that violates the copyright law. So if this article was not copywritten, then we won't see any sort of criminal charges come out of this. But we could see some civil action because it is an ethical violation if you are plagiarizing. All right. And finally, Alex Murdoch. So you know, the country, much of the country watched the trial. There were books, there were documentaries about the, about the story, and he's, now he's in prison, convicted by a jury of murder, sentenced to life in prison. Uh, what happens next for him? Is there any, is there any uh, progress on his appeal? How do you, how do you look at it? Is, is it for him, even though for the country may still be addicted to the story, is it over for him? It's not over. He still has an appeal pending. We still have to have the trial regarding the jury tampering, which will all be under a new judge because Judge Newman has stepped down and they've appointed a new judge. So those hearings and motions still have to be decided. And from there, we'll make a determination as to whether or not there will be a retrial. Got it. Well, uh, if there is, I know we'll be seeing you again and on other cases as well. Shauna Lloyd, thanks. Always good to see you. Great to see you, Terry. Well, coming up after the break, a popular South Korean actor has been found dead. What authorities are now saying after they found the 48-year-old's body inside of a parked car. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I hug you. 
Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. We have really good news. <laughs> Congratulations, you're pregnant. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Reporting from the Fulton County, Georgia Courthouse, I'm Rena Roy. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Here are some of the top headlines we're following this hour at ABC News Live. Jody Hildebrand, who is the business partner of the YouTuber and Utah mom, Ruby Frankie, appeared in court today on charges of child abuse. Hildebrandt entered a guilty plea on four counts, leading the court to accept her plea and subsequently dismiss two remaining charges as part of her plea deal. She faced the same judge uh, as Frankie in Utah's Washington County after Frankie pled guilty to multiple counts of aggravated child abuse and agreed to testify against Hildebrandt. Both were charged with multiple counts of child abuse after one of Frankie's children escaped from Hildebrandt's home and ran to a neighbor's house asking for food and water. Well, a popular South Korean actor best known for his role in the Oscar-winning movie Parasite has died. Authorities say Lee Sun-kyun was found in a car after police investigation into the actor's alleged drug use. Police had been searching for the 48-year-old after receiving a report that he was missing. They refused to provide further details, including whether they had determined at this point whether Lee killed himself. Well, thank you for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. From breaking news to all the stories that matter to you, the news never stops, and we will be right back. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crux, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner, our Crux 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. Today on ABC News Live, Donald Trump stays on the ballot in Michigan. The state's Supreme Court rejecting the latest challenge to Trump's candidacy. I'll speak with Michigan's Secretary of State about this important ruling. Crisis at the border. Secretary Blinken is in Mexico amid a surge of new migrant crossings. His meeting with the Mexican president as they discuss the situation down south. 
and massive winter blizzard conditions in five states as more than a foot of snow pounds parts of the heartland we followed the storm and its impact on your holiday travel plans Hi everyone, I'm Terry Moran. Our top story this hour comes out of the election. Today, the Michigan Supreme Court rejected an appeal which was brought by Michigan's Secretary of State and several voters who are seeking uh, to bar former President Donald Trump from the state's 2024 primary ballot uh, for his effort to overturn the 2020 election culminating in the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. The court said in a three to nothing opinion that this challenge was not, quote, ripe or ready to be decided at this point and because the judges were not persuaded that the questions presented should be reviewed by this court. Uh, Michigan's Democratic Secretary of State Jocelyn Bennett says it shouldn't be up to her or any other elected official in her position to rule on these challenges. In a Washington Post op-ed in September, Benson writes, quote, the nearly universal view of those who want secretaries of state to unilaterally keep Trump off the ballot is, quote, misguided. And Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson joins me now. Uh, thank you for being with us. I should correct uh, what I just said. You were a defendant in this case because you don't want, think it's your job to remove uh, any candidate's name from the ballot. And it was these voters who tried to get you to do that. So what's your reaction to today's ruling? Well, thanks for having me. I think it's clear the court affirmed our position that my office as the Secretary of State, I am the Chief Election Officer, but the law does not provide me with the authority to delve into this really thorny and complicated legal issue. Uh, and, the, and the court affirmed my decision in that regard that unless uh, the U.S. Supreme Court rules otherwise, uh, the former president, Donald Trump, will be on our primary ballot. Interestingly, the Michigan Supreme Court also, though, indicated that the timing of this question may be premature, suggesting that we may see another round of challenges if Donald Trump is the Republican Party's nominee and comes back with the question of his qualification to serve on the ballot in the general election. So this isn't over, but the question of who should decide squarely still remains in the courts, not with election administrators like myself. Got it. Well, let me follow up on that. So in Michigan law, unlike Colorado law, which does provide the secretary of state of that state the authority to remove people from the ballot if they aren't properly qualified or if they affirm something that isn't true, Michigan state law doesn't empower you as the secretary of state there to do that. What would be the difference in the general election? Could you step in in the general election, or is this something that the courts of Michigan will have to decide? Well, notably, the primary law in Michigan for presidential primaries says that any individuals generally advocated for by the national media to be potential presidential candidates should be on the ballot. And so that's the law that the Supreme Court in Michigan here and all the other courts we're looking at in our state, which there's nothing about qualifications. It also uh, bears to, to witness that this particular qualification challenge is a little more nuanced than a more simple cut and dried issue where the facts are clear in terms of a candidate's age or place of birth. This is a much more nuanced decision about what's an insurrection, uh, did this candidate engage in an insurrection, and what the 14th Amendment really says with regards to that. And that, again, is, is why, with the nuances of that issue, it's all the more appropriate that this court and ultimately the U.S. Supreme Court should decide that. Uh, but it's just notable that, in the dissenting opinion, Justice Welch also notes that this is a decision in Michigan that only applies to the primary, uh, and that, indeed, if there's a general election question, uh, then there will be an opportunity, potentially, if plaintiffs bring a case to revisit the president's qualifications to be on the general election ballot, should his party nominate him to be on the ballot at that time. Got it. So, Secretary Benson, it does. this is a hot potato for courts, right? With the exception of Colorado, a lot of courts are saying, you know, we don't want to deal with this at that point. Uh, we're seeing dismissals on procedural grounds, as they have done in Michigan, and, and none have called uh, that Trump engaged or incited an insurrection. There was a trial in Michigan that did so as well. But do you think the courts are reluctant to take this up simply because it runs against the American sensibility that voters choose presidents, not judges? 
Yeah, I think, I mean, this is actually, I say this as a former law professor and dean of a law school, none of the way in which this is playing out in the courts is surprising either. The courts are rightfully reluctant to both engage in what is often terms as a political question, best meant left to the voters in terms of a candidate's qualifications. Uh, and then also you have the very sort of nuance and, and novelty of this question. This has never been presented before, and the magnitude to which this is being presented is, is quite significant for our country. And in general, there's a philosophy and, and legal jurisprudence that if there's uncertainties about whether someone should have access to the ballot, you decide in favor of giving the voters the choice to um, and, and allow that person on the ballot to give the so you see that playing out a bit here, I think, in the many states that have declined to go forward with this challenge, this idea that in a democracy, voters should ultimately decide who should be, in this case, president, uh, is you know a big part of the way in which this question is playing out nationwide. For sure, and rightly so. Now, you're a Secretary of State of Michigan, the state's top election officer. You're also, obviously, uh, an elected official. You won a statewide election in Michigan. Secretary of State, in a lot of states, that's a stepping stone to the governorship. I won't ask you about that, but I will ask you about whether you think, from uh, putting on your, your uh, politician's hat as a, as a candidate and as a successful Secretary of State, is this dumb for Democrats to do? Isn't it just uh, making Republicans angry for taking away their choices at the ballot box? Yeah, I get it. Usually if there's an issue of qualification that's cut and dried, like is someone's age or uh, past service through term limits disqualify them, then everyone agrees on the facts and the law, and it's much easier and clear cut to make a decision about ballot access that would deny someone that access. Similarly, if someone didn't commit enough or submit enough signatures to be on the ballot, if that's what the law requires, it's much easier to make a clear case in that. This case is so complicated and uh, creates so many questions of facts and law that are not universally resolved, that it's a lot more complicated even for court to weigh in on. Uh, and so, you know, I think we'll see how the criminal proceedings play out uh, with regards to Donald Trump that are still ongoing. Uh, and I, just, I think, in my view, no matter what and how this legal qualification issue plays out in the courts or at the U.S. Supreme Court, voters have the ultimate authority and should have the ultimate authority to decide with their power who should become president. And I think that's ultimately what voters observing all of these proceedings need to think about in terms of how they're cast their ballot certainly in the primary stage of this process, but also no. potentially in the general election stage. I, I think that is what most people probably feel deep down. Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson, thank you very much for helping us out with an important ruling today. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Well, President Biden and First Lady Dr. Jill Biden, they are vacationing in St. Croix, where they'll remain through New Year's. This as Secretary of State Antony Blinken and other top U.S. officials are meeting with the Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador today in Mexico. The crisis at the border, of course, tops today's meeting down south, and it comes as another migrant caravan, estimated to be the largest in more than a year, heads north with as many as 6,000 migrants so far. President Biden spoke with the Mexican president last week, and Obrador said the United States and Mexico, quote, need each other, need to work together. So joining us now, ABC News' is Elizabeth Schulze. She's in St. Croix with the president, Maria Villarreal, live from Fort Worth, Texas. Elizabeth, uh, let me begin with you. The Biden's vacationing in St. Croix, that's, uh, that's why you're there. But he's getting criticism from mayors in deep blue states as well as Republicans on this surge of migrants uh, over the course of the year, over the course of his presidency. How is Biden trying to get a hold of this and convince Americans he's handling this crisis? Look, you know, Terry, there's just no question that President Biden and his administration are under pressure, especially as we're seeing this record surge at the southern border. The president knows that this is a political liability for him as we head into an election year. It was a year ago about that he made the trip down to the southern border, the first of his presidency, to meet with the president of Mexico to try to discuss some of these longer term solutions to try to stem the flow of migrants. And today he's dispatching his secretary of state and Homeland Security secretary to meet with the Mexican president to follow up and figure out exactly how they can specifically increase enforcement of some of those measures. In that call last week, the president Biden had with Mexico's president, both sides agreed that additional enforcement is necessary. But at the same time, we are hearing from Mexico that more needs to be done from the U.S. when it comes to addressing some of these root causes of the migration crisis. There are conversations going on in Congress to, to try to come down to comprehensive immigration reform, but still a long way to go before some of those 
root causes in that comprehensive package can be close to getting past Terry. Absolutely. Those root causes, uh, Murray, include the, the fact that just that the, the border is there. We are looking uh, earlier at the president of Mexico uh, and the second United States Secretary of State and their staff sitting down together for this important meeting. So, Murray, uh, that, that border represents the largest uh, wage differential across any border in the world by far. There's Secretary of State Blinken. Uh, we're seeing them. And um, you've reported on this. It's such a vast problem. You've reported on it for a long time. What could come out of this meeting and, and beyond that of, of the talks between the U.S. and Mexico that would represent progress on this just giant problem that's been plaguing, you know, the, the region, the country for years that, that the American people could say, okay, they did something. You know, I think this is all going to come down to, you know, a compromise, not just with Mexico, but also within our own country, right? We keep talking about the funding that the country is now debating over uh, how much we're going to give Ukraine versus how much we're going to give to border security and what that compromise will look like. It's very clear that Mexico is also watching these discussions. And on top of that, the cartels are watching this as well because it is creating chaos along the border. I think what we potentially could see is a compromise where Mexico says, listen, what what we want to see is us helping countries, you know, that are not Mexico, that are south of here, Latin American countries that need this help. We need to, um, you know, invest in things like job creating, you know, uh, economic development in some of these countries. Um, and then on top of that, I think one thing we will hear from the president of Mexico is is this discussion over building more border wall. Obviously, he knows what is happening in our country and what funding could be tied to. He's also seen what has happened here in Texas along the southwest border and what Governor Abbott has been promising to do with some of the funding that he has put together for border security. So I think what he wants is reassurance that he's going to be dealing with the Biden administration and the federal government and not Texas or other governors like Abbott um, when it comes to this issue. And, and that's a great point because the governors are getting anxious. They're under political pressure. Elizabeth, the White House and Biden running for re-election under political pressure. What do they hope can come out of this high-level meeting today, at least as a first step? Now, uh, Terry, a National Security Council spokesperson tells us that the goal is to have a robust conversation with Mexico to talk about some of those enforcement actions that could try to stem the flow of people coming across the U.S. border, but also to try to get at potentially uh, reopening some ports of entry, figuring out how both the U.S. and Mexico can work together. The, the reality is that Mexico's president has told President Biden that his country needs those resources. And there is pressure, as Maria points out, to, to put some of the funding directly toward not just the initiatives the Republicans are pushing, for example, uh, loosening, uh, tightening asylum restrictions, uh, increasing border technology, also toward putting some of those funds directly to the countries that they say need them most, Terry. All right, Elizabeth Schulze, Maria Villarreal, thank you very much for being with us on that. Well, the second in a series of major storms is hitting the West Coast today, bringing heavy rain and high winds from Northern California to Oregon and Washington. Meanwhile, the storm in the Midwest that brought nearly a foot and a half of snow to the Nebraska Panhandle, disrupting holiday travel there, is now affecting the East Coast. Millions this morning dealing with fog and now heavy rain up the I-95 corridor from D.C. to New York City. ABC meteorologist Kenton Juecki joins us now for more. Kenton, what are you looking out for out there? Terry, good afternoon. We are watching for that flooding, and we do have a flood watch now in effect for more than 10 million people here in the Northeast. It includes Philadelphia and Atlantic City, too, and that's because of this heavy rain that's already coming down from D.C. up to New York City, and it's only going to get stronger as we continue into these evening hours. Look at this heavy rain you see in these shades of orange and yellow. That's very heavy rain coming down. It is, again, in an overnight time period. So here's 11 p.m. on the East Coast. Philadelphia getting that heavy rain also up to New York City there. So if you're on the I-95 corridor overnight tonight. Certainly note this. You're going to want to take it much slower and be cautious. There could be some hydroplaning out on the roads overnight. That will start to push out, but by 7 a.m., we are still looking at some of this rain sticking around. New York City, you could still have some rain at 7 a.m. as well as Boston with some moderate rain showers still here. Up, especially in parts of New England. And we're looking at a total of about one to three inches for a lot of places, but we could see more in some locations where we see that heaviest actual rainfall come on through. Otherwise, on the West Coast, there is another storm coming in. It's a series of storms, and it's a lot of wind with it, and that's causing multiple issues. It's gusting 55 to 65 miles per hour, but it's also bringing coastal flooding to the Bay Area and a lot of dangerously large waves too, Terry.
Yeah, dangerously, that's the key there. You see high surf warnings. Some people get eager for that, but mm. uh, that's pretty intense. Kenton, thanks very much for that. Yep. Well, coming up, a major twist in the case of convicted murderer Alex Murdoch. Why a court clerk is bringing this case back in the open after a short break. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Welcome back. There's a new twist in the case of convicted murderer Alex Murdoch, who is currently serving life in prison for the murder of his wife and son. The outspoken court clerk in his case is now under fire after writing a book about the trial and about the Murdoch family. In an ABC News exclusive, her co-author now alleges that the clerk plagiarized part of the book, putting her credibility in question. ABC News' Trevor Alt has the details. Yet another twist and scandal surrounding the trial of convicted murderer Alec Murdoch, once again centered around the county clerk who read his verdict. Guilty, guilty, guilty. In the aftermath of that bombshell trial, Becky Hill co-wrote Behind the Doors of Justice, The Murdoch Murders, in which she details her role in the trial and her decades-long personal relationship with the Murdoch family. But she's now accused of plagiarizing a section of that book. I was shocked. I was disappointed. I was sad. Neil Gordon is the book's co-author. He says he discovered what he called the ethical gaffe while reviewing thousands of Hill's emails that had been released to reporters through Freedom of Information Act requests. She said that she felt like she was under a lot of deadline pressure and she remembered that that particular article was on her email. This screenshot shows in February, Hill received a lengthy excerpt of an article by a BBC journalist about the trial. It appears Hill copied from it directly for the opening of the book, prompting Gordon to publicly apologize to the BBC and the reporter. I decided to look at our book because the words were very familiar to me. And sure enough, it was the preface of our book. I was sick to my stomach. Hill has spoken openly about the Murdoch trial on numerous occasions, including giving an interview in a Netflix documentary series about the case. I had a feeling from our time together with the jury out at Moselle that it was not going to take our jury long to make the decision in this case. 
In a statement responding to these new allegations, Hill's attorneys say she's deeply remorseful for this unfortunate lapse in judgment. And this comes just months after Alec Murdoch's attorneys had accused Hill of jury tampering, saying she pressured jurors to reach a quick verdict in hopes of securing a book deal for herself, a claim she denied and prosecutors called unfounded and not credible. Because of the seriousness of these charges, when the judge holds the evidentiary hearing to consider whether to grant a new trial, Becky Hill probably won't be able to testify. If she does, she's going to risk being cross-examined and her credibility is completely shot because now she's an admitted liar. And Terry, Becky Hill's attorney says she reached out to that BBC journalist to personally apologize. This book had been self-published, only available through Amazon and Audible, but both authors now say it has since been unpublished. Terry? Mm. Trevor Alt, thank you for that report. This case just can't keep out of the news. ABC News legal contributor and managing partner, the Cochrane Law Firm, Shauna Lloyd, joins us now for more. Shauna, I mean, really, we, all this is coming on the heels. There was a jury tampering accusation. Now this, uh, does any of it, uh, could it lead to any kind of uh, progress on appeal or a mistrial for Alex Murdoch? So these allegations of plagiarism will have no real effect on the trial. What they could have an effect on it potentially could be her credibility. Because remember, let's this jury champering charge is really about credibility and what she said to the jury. The plagiarism is going to stand on its own because it's not very similar to jury tampering charges. So it will have no influence on that or the appeal. Got it. And, and so now Becky Hill might face a lawsuit for plagiarism. Could, could that be brought by the by the authors who feel aggrieved by it? Absolutely. The authors, authors can bring um, some form of an action against her. Typically, we're not going to see criminal charges for plagiarism unless there is something that violates a copyright law. So if this article was not copywritten, then we won't see any sort of criminal charges come out of this. But we could see some civil action because it is an ethical violation if you are plagiarizing. All right. And finally, Alex Murdoch. So, you know, the country, much of the country watched the trial. There were books, there were documentaries about the about the story. And he's now he's in prison, convicted by a jury of murder, sentenced to life in prison. Uh, what happens next for him? Is there any is there any progress on his appeal? How do you how do you look at it? Is, is it for him, even though for the country may still be addicted to the story? Is it over for him? It's not over. He still has an appeal pending. We still have to have the trial regarding the jury tampering, which will all be under a new judge because Judge Newman has stepped down and they've appointed a new judge. So those hearings and motions still have to be decided. And from there, we'll make a determination as to whether or not there will be a retrial. Got it. Well, uh, if there is, I know we'll be seeing you again and on other cases as well. Shauna Lloyd, thanks. Always good to see you. Great to see you, Terry. Well, coming up after the break, a popular South Korean actor has been found dead. What authorities are now saying after they found the 48-year-old's body inside of a parked car. We have really good news. <laughs> oh I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. To crush the families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. 
Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. All across the globe, the world will be celebrating the new year. And you can see it as it happens live. The global celebrations. See the new year as it comes in live. Streaming all day and night on ABC News Live. Reporting in St. Petersburg, Florida, in the aftermath of Hurricane Adelia, I'm M. Wynn. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Here are some of the top headlines we're following this hour at ABC News Live. Jody Hildebrand, who is the business partner of the YouTuber and Utah mom, Ruby Frankie, appeared in court today on charges of child abuse. Hildebrandt entered a guilty plea on four counts, leading the court to accept her plea and subsequently dismiss two remaining charges as part of her plea deal. She faced the same judge uh, as Frankie in Utah's Washington County after Frankie pled guilty to multiple counts of aggravated child abuse and agreed to testify against Hildebrandt. Both were charged with multiple counts of child abuse after one of Frankie's children escaped from Hildebrandt's home and ran to a neighbor's house asking for food and water. Well, a popular South Korean actor best known for his role in the Oscar-winning movie Parasite has died. Authorities say Lee Sun Kyun was found in a car after police investigation into the actor's alleged drug use. Police had been searching for the 48-year-old after receiving a report that he was missing. They refused to provide further details, including whether they had determined at this point whether Lee killed himself. Well, thank you for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. From breaking news to all the stories that matter to you, the news never stops, and we will be right back. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas, I'm John Quinones. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hello, I'm Terry Moran, and here are some of the top headlines we're watching at ABC News Live at this hour. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and other top U.S. officials are meeting with the Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador today in Mexico regarding the crisis at the U.S. southern border. 
Prior to the meeting, the Mexican president said the U.S. should be investing in poorer countries in Central America to curb the influx of migrants, rather than putting up walls along the border and barbed wire and rivers. This as the biggest caravan in over a year, over 6,000 people heads north towards the U.S. border. And the closing bell is sounding on Wall Street. Stocks ended flat today. As traders kept an eye on the S&P 500's march towards a new record. It's up nearly 25% this year. The Dow, S&P, and Nasdaq all little changed on the session, with pharmaceuticals leading today's gains. Oil prices declined as traders assessed disruptions in the Suez Canal region, with shipping firms returning to routes through the Red Sea. The price of crude settled at $74 a barrel. And the Michigan Supreme Court rejected an appeal to bar former President Donald Trump from that state's 2024 Republican primary ballot. A watchdog group had filed the appeal on behalf of a group of Michigan voters. This after Colorado Supreme Court made the historic move to ban Trump from that state's ballot last week. That was based on the court's finding that the former president, quote, engaged in insurrection in his efforts to overturn the 2020 election, culminating in the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. And Maine's Secretary of State intends to announce a decision this week on the former president's eligibility, eligibility for Maine's primary, which is scheduled for March 5th, Super Tuesday. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on various streaming services, on the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com as well. The news never stops, and GMA3 starts right now. At its core, music is about connection, connecting to others, to our future, to our past, and for some, even connecting to a higher power. I'm Phil Lipoff, and this is The Playlist. We are showcasing three amazing acts for you who use their art to uncover something bigger than themselves. A contemporary Christian songwriter with soul to spare, a musical legend who is embarking on a meaningful second act. But first, a trio proving three is certainly not a crowd. Lady A has dominated country music charts for years, and now they're taking fans along for a new creative endeavor, one that's both personal and reflective. Picture perfect memories scattered all around the floor. Right out of the gate, Lady A took the music industry by storm. With their 2008 debut album and first number one hit, I Run To You. Since then, the trio has earned 15 top 10 hits on Billboard's Hot Country chart, three platinum albums, and five Grammy Awards, cementing Hillary Scott, Charles Kelly, and Dave Haywood as country music royalty. We sat down with the band to see how they make that magic. We didn't have to wait long. Kicking into those signature harmonies before our interview even began. Won't you let me go down? When you guys got together and started making music, how did the harmony work? Is it a discussion every time you do a song, or do you just slip into it like you just did? I mean, that, that happens a lot, like especially in the that. writing room. <laughs> um, when we're working on something and we've found the chorus and then it's like once we all land in together in harmony, we're like, okay, we're on to something. That's what we fell in love with was there's some kind of blend in our voices with, right. mm -hmm. you know, you know, kind of the gritty voice, soulful voice, just kind of all combining. What if I never get over you? Like the way it just kind of all sounds like a Lady A thing on, the, on a lot of our choruses and stuff. But yeah, I mean, we do think about it. For all three members of Lady A, the connection to music began when they were young. I wanna try to touch a few hearts in this life. I grew up in a musical home, we all did. You know, whether it's siblings that played and started bands together or whether parents played and instilled that, you know, into us. I mean, I, I was into everything when mm. I grew up, but Hootie and the Blowfish was mm. up there for me. That album, top to bottom, um, crack, crack, crack review. review. Yeah, yeah just absolutely. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have this video of, of me um, singing Hold My Hand when I was like 12 or 13 years old. Hey, 
so when Darius, you know, had signed over at, at the same label, I, I, I sent it, sent that video to uh, to our label head, and I said, "Can you please share this with Darius? Like, I just think he'll think it's hilarious." Before y'all were friends, and now right? we're like best yeah. friends. After more than a decade together, in June of 2020, the band decided to undergo a name change, officially becoming known as Lady A, shedding the former name that referenced the pre-Civil War era. It puts a little sound in an empty space and the power of musical connection is at the core of Lady A. Just last year, they released What a Song Can Do, a tribute to the lyrics that changed their lives. It can make you It'll make you give your heart and get it back, change your mind just like that. When it's like every single line was written for you. How many songs have you listened to where you're like, oh my God, they're speaking oh, yeah. directly to me. Ain't it crazy what a song can do? Well, it really sparked that song. Hillary always says it. Uh, she's like, there's songs out there that say how I'm feeling better than I can express it. And I can't think of how many songs do that for me. I kind of want to like just play it while we're here. Sure. Yeah, we'll play it. Let's I mean, do it. Do it. I mean, it's we have a guitar. Well, well, well it's like a, a, it was like, I couldn't tell if it was a set piece, but. Um, so the chorus? Yeah. It can make you dance and make you cry Make you own and give it one more try Start a band and kiss that girl And break some rules Ain't it crazy what a song <laughs> Hillary, Charles, and Dave understand what a song can do. For their fans, this tour is a chance to reach out to the band and request your favorite song. I wanted to kind of get back to our catalog and be like, what do the fans want to hear? Not just the singles, but what deep cuts? Because we always have songs that we call the ones that got away. Our first song we ever wrote called it, um, oh, All, All We'd Ever Need. need. Just songs like that where you're like, gosh, we haven't played these in a long time. Ten albums and more than 100 songs recorded. Their latest release, Love You Back. You can love a memory, but a memory, I can't love you back. We write about 80% of our music, and but over the years we've learned, you know, when you when you get sent a great song, you don't say no just because you didn't write it. Anytime we get sent a song, same thing with this, this current single, Love You Back. You know, it was a male lead, and I immediately was like, how do we make this a Lady A song? And I was like, gosh, this is, would break your heart even more if you get both perspectives. And we always feel like it's our little secret weapon as a group with multiple leads. Does it affect the way you write? Love that. So like a song like I Run, I Run To You, for example, our co-writer Tom Douglas was training for the National Marathon, and he, he got just this poem. That's, he started writing on one of his runs. This world keeps faster, I run from hate, I run from prejudice. And so he presented us with these lines that were already there in this poem. But then, you know, we have other songs where I'll come in, we'll have titles in our, like a running note in our phone where you hear something or someone you love says something in a conversation, you see it in a movie. Need You Now, for instance, you know, I had like just this melody. It's a quarter after one, I'm all alone. Da 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 da. And then it was like, it's quarter after one, what, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, you, you're missing somebody. And then someone yells out, and I need you now. And you're like, oh, that's it. And that was the reaction when Dave, who plays multiple instruments and harmonizes, but usually doesn't take lead vocals, came to Hillary and Charles with an out-of-the-box idea. I had written a song for my wife for Mother's Day. I was trying to think of a unique gift. Um, and this kind of idea poured out, and I was like, well, she loves music, she loves singing too, and I wrote her a song. And then I was like, well, let me just show it to the guys and see if they like it at all. Um, and they were like, yeah, why don't we put it on the record? A beautiful love song called Working on This Love. Get to working on this love we made. He's got a great voice, and it's like, you know, it's, it's fun to 
finally show the fans, hey, you know, I can, I can carry the lead as well. It was fun to flex a different muscle for sure. At this point, they know each other so well in the studio that they lean on each other in life as well. Charles, you've talked openly about the last year or so yeah. of, of battling alcoholism. How did these two people in your life help you through that? I say it all the time. I mean, I would like to think I could have overcome it on my own, maybe. But like the immediate support I got from my bandmates, from everybody on my team that works with me in the, in the community, and most importantly, my wife, it it made the road so much easier for me. And I just feel like I've been given this kind of second chance at life and, I, I, and really purpose, I should say, that, you know, I just, I feel so much gratitude to, towards my bandmates. Now, happy, healthy, and on tour, playing the hits, of course, taking requests from fans and one from us as well. All right, here we go. Two, three, four. You can love a memory. I love how when you ask them to talk about their harmony, they'd prefer to sing it than describe it. We thank them for being on the playlist. Coming up next, Christian meets contemporary meets pop. Lauren Daigle is pushing the boundaries of what it means to be a Christian singer. And it's earned her a place in the spotlight. The Louisiana native was named Billboard's top Christian artist of 2023 and the top female Christian artist of the year with a nod to the way she works with gratitude and purpose. I sat down with a two-time Grammy winner to talk about writing lyrics with the hope of making human connection and creating a space of love and understanding. Two, three, Jesus! Things for these people out here. A quick but meaningful prayer. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Moments before Lauren Daigle takes the stage. The audience on this night in Philadelphia, a mix of Christian music lovers and fans who just can't get enough of her voice. You say I am loved when I can feel a thing. Her 2018 breakout hit, You Say, introduced Lauren to the world. When I am falling short. The song rocketing to number one on the Hot Christian Songs chart and staying there for a record setting 100 weeks. It also became the first Christian song to hit number one on the adult contemporary chart and number five on adult pop songs. You Say was the crux of when I was trying to figure out, do I want to stay in this industry or do I want to go home? Because it was just so polarizingly different. I love different. it how that's a crossroads and it's got a half a billion streams on Spotify. I know. <laughs> Everybody should have such a crossroads. <laughs> I, I hope it happens again. <laughs> You Say So Widely Embraced, Lauren immediately found a larger audience outside of Christian music. Her voice compared by some music critics to Adele's. The hit song and the album it's on, Look Up Child, solidified the contemporary Christian singer as a global star. I hear you say, look up child. Her dynamic voice and innate ability to write chart toppers. Look up child, Lauren Diego earned her two Grammys in 2019. I just think it's such a gift. This community of music, I love it so, so much, and I'm just incredibly grateful. All the glitz and glamour of Hollywood, though, a long way from her humble beginnings in Lafayette, Louisiana. My brother used to say, Mom, make her stop screaming. She screams all the ground. There was um, like a radio or whatever, and I'd lay on the ground and just wait. I'd be like, how much longer until one of the, their songs comes on? Her favorites, Celine Dion and Whitney Houston. The best voices yeah. in the business. Oh, so that's, yeah. couldn't get enough. Whitney just, still to this day, I'm like, oh my God, I, is there ever going to be another voice like that? Lauren found her voice in high school, homebound for two years with an immune deficiency that she calls an extreme form of mono. My mom, to like kind of keep me out of depression because I was turning a leaf, she was like, would you want to sing? The first time that I realized I had a voice or anything like that was I was singing at church and it was a tiny church, like 100, 200 people, right? And my, I was scrubbing toilets to, uh, I was somebody's maid in exchange for voice lessons. And right. I remember thinking, I was a little high school student, right. I didn't have any money. And I just thought I will work to get voice lessons. Once she did, 
Lauren's sights were set on American Idol. Lauren tried out in 2010, then again in 2012. She didn't make it to Hollywood, but not long after that, found herself back up for a male lead singer in a band, auditioning for a record label. And the morning of the showcase, he gets this appendectomy. They asked me to step in and sing lead. So I stepped in and sang lead and then got signed right after that. Her 2015 debut album, How Can It Be, spent six weeks at number one on the Billboard Christian Albums chart and eventually went platinum. The title track, How Can It Be, a hit. Three years later, the 2018 release of her Grammy-winning Look Up Child. You're not threatened by the war, you're not shaken by the storm. Lauren is a prolific writer, surprising us by revealing where she writes so many of her songs. Half of my songs. Really? Oh, a thousand percent. In the bathroom. One thousand percent. Rescue, written in the bathroom. Stop. Yeah. Oh, that's such a great song. Fine. Lauren chooses her words carefully, looking to write about what she calls a deep human connection. And if you can, like, tap into what people long for, what people care about, what people desire, yeah, it allows you to see yourself in the audience. It allows you to say, oh, you feel that? I feel that too. Oh, you care about this? I care about that too. That ability to connect through her lyrics and live shows landed Lauren an invitation, also in 2018, to sing on The Ellen Show. Please welcome Lauren Daigle. A triumphant television performance, but then something she never saw coming. I get this call from my manager and she's like, your phone might be blowing up soon. She's like, yeah, I mean, um, some radio stations are not playing your song or that might be a possibility. And I was like, oh, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And then when it became personal is when I was like, Wow, this is unbelievably painful. Now that you save me. Backlash from some in the Christian community for singing on a show with an openly gay host. It was the total antithesis of what I was putting out into the world, right? I'm like, oh, I want right. an environment for people to feel accepted and loved and, and feel like finally a place I can let my hair down because people are kind here. And then the opposite was happening. Five years after that painful moment, her latest self-titled release with powerful songs like Thank God I Do. Other songs on the album showcasing her Louisiana influence, like New. I don't see the old you, I just see the new. And Inherited, about loving what is passed down, even the lines on your face. I have tears for the sorrow you lived. I try to love the way you do. Everybody thinks it's me, but I inherited from you. And then this, seven years after disappointment on American Idol, invited back to surprise a contestant singing her Grammy-winning song. It was very real. It was very live. Right. It was very honest. We wrote this song. It's called Thank God I Do. Real and honest, that's what Lauren says she strives for in life and in her music. Ultimately, she says, it's about that human connection. Like yesterday, I was singing at this event, and all I did was see a dad hold his son like this and just close his eyes. And he just sat there with his eyes closed. I don't know where he's going. I don't know what it is that he's experiencing, but I do know that there's something deep within that says, oh, yeah, me too. And that that moment, the evolution of the pin to the page to a live setting, it's like, it's one of my favorite things. I love it so much. That's what it's all about, the evolution from the pen to the page right to the fans. Singer-songwriter Lauren, thank you for that. Well, it's a new chapter in a musical journey that has spanned decades, and he's actually a hero of one of the artists you just heard from, Lady A. Coming up, Darius Rucker talks about writing a good song no matter the genre and who he's dedicating his new album to. Everything about it is about me. It's about me growing up. It's about, you know, every song that we mentioned in there is a song that meant a lot to me. And that 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 is one of, that's one of the most of, I've written a lot of songs and I'm but one of the songs I'm most proud of is so I sing because I've never been as about as honest as I could be right there. If I would speak
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. So if Darius Rucker's music career had ended in the 90s after his turn as lead singer of Hootie and the Blowfish, it would have been considered a remarkable success. But his second act as solo country artist for the past 15 years is the stuff of legend. Closing out 2023 with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, I met with Rucker to discuss his unique musical journey and his new album, Carolyn's Boy, dedicated to his mom, he tells us, who didn't live long enough to see it all unfold. Well, I ain't gonna Today, just wanna sit around and play. Country music powerhouse Darius Rucker churning out huge hits like Beers and Sunshine. All right. And for the first time. His cover of Wagon Wheel becoming a smash hit. Streamed more than 600 million times. And only one of four country songs ever to be certified diamond, meaning 10 million units sold. It's an amazing and rare achievement, especially when you hear how his country career began 15 years ago in Nashville. I was told to my face by several people that uh, they didn't think their, their audience would ever accept a black country singer. Ever was the word. Ever. Even my, the guy who uh, signed me was told that if he signed me, he'd be the laughing stock of country music because it's just never going to work. And he took his chance, and we went out and we did what we did. Just like he did almost two decades before that with his first iconic Grammy-winning band, Hootie and the Blowfish. With Rucker's distinctive voice, the band's debut release, Cracked Rear View in 1994, produced three top ten hits right out of the gate. Hold My Hand. Let her cry. Just let her cry. If the tears fall down my then only want to be with you. Only want to be with you. All of that just a few years after his biggest supporter, his mom, died of a heart attack when he was 26. When she died, Hootie the Bullfish became a mission. It be, you know, I wanted it before. I wanted, you know, I was willing to go play all the clubs and do all the things. But like, when she died, it, be, it was my sole focus was making sure that we got a shot. And when my mom died, that intensified like crazy. After winning two Grammys and playing with Hootie and the Blowfish for more than a decade, Darius turned to Nashville, releasing his debut solo country album in 2008. His first single, "Don't Think I Don't Think About It." Now, his 2023 album release, simply called Carolyn's Boy, is dedicated to his mom, who truly believed his success would happen, but never got to see it. At the end of the day, you're just your mom's boy. You're just your mom's son. What does it mean to be your mom's son? It means to be kind. It means to care. It means to work hard. You know, she was just special. She, we didn't have, we grew up without much, but she was always helping people and always making sure we were, you know, helping people. The new album's lead single, written during the pandemic, over Zoom. The only BS I need is beers yeah. and sunshine. Um, how does something like that happen? Because everybody hears BS all day long, yeah. but they don't think beers and sunshine. Exactly. And I think when we were writing that song, we had been on lockdown for a couple months. It was early in the, in the pandemic. And it was just started out being about that. And when we came up with that line, we went around and around about it. And I, I, you know, I actually said, they're not going to play it on the radio. Well, just because it's BS? Because of the word BS. Yeah, but... And we, but then we... The, it just worked, and it was just so right. It was exactly what we wanted to say. You know, the only BS I need is beers and sunshine. From a young age, Darius had eclectic music tastes. 
growing up in an all-black neighborhood and everything, I, had, I took a lot of grief, especially for my cousins who, li- who also lived in the neighborhood. Who would, you know, come over to the house and I'd be singing, you know, Charlie Pride or Charlie Rich or something, or, or singing some Kiss record. And, you know, they'd come in and start, you know, why are you singing that white boy music? Why what are you listening to that? My mom would always, I remember one time she grabbed my cousin Frank by the collar and just threw him against the door and told him, that he, <laughs> you better leave me alone and let me listen to whatever I want to listen to. That's right. And, you know, and, and I always say, if I didn't have her doing that, if she was part of the chorus of you can't do this, I wouldn't be here. His biggest defender showering him with unconditional love, leading to this deeply personal song in 2014, So I Sang. No one believed in me as much as mama See, she worked overtime to buy my first guitar I had to stop playing that song because yeah. I cried almost every time we right. played it. Everything about it is about me. It's about me growing up. It's about, you know, every song that we mentioned in there is a song that meant a lot to me. And that 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 is one of, that's one of the most... I've written a lot of songs, and I'm, but one of the songs I'm most proud of is So I Sang, because I've never been more, that's about as honest as I could be right there. Pop, country, whatever Darius is writing, he says he writes to connect. That's the genius <laughs> of, of music. Yeah. Is that we, you can write about something that people do every day, but you do it the right way and with the right words and the right melody, and, you know, people love it because they can relate to it. Like Sarah off Carolyn's Boy. You happened to put Sarah together with Ed Sheeran. Yeah. I'm curious how that came about and what it was like to write with him. We just kept talking about we're going to write someday. And finally, I just said, forget it, and got on a plane and flew to England when he was off. And we started writing. And the first song we wrote, he asked me, in the middle of the song, he said, who's your first love? And I told him it was my fifth grade girlfriend. The beginning of that is so beautiful. I mean, 30 years later, does it blow your mind that that's what you do for a living, that that's what you get to do for a living? You have no idea. And this is as honest as I can be with you. It's, I've been, Hootie and the Bullfish, we've been playing for 40 years, almost. We've been a band almost 40 years. And ever since I was four, all I wanted to do was sing. And now you can reach out to people yeah. like anybody, get a call from Darius, yeah, sure. Let's go right. Yeah, and then and then becomes this bigger playground for you. And that's that's a great thing. That's what it is. It's it's a playground that just happens to be my job, and I love it. That love and his tremendous success now helping to pave the way for other black country artists. One of the things I'm most proud of. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love my success, and it's great. And I'm, I hope I get get to play as long as I want until I want to retire. But seeing came round. You know, seeing Mickey Guyton, seeing seeing the Warren Treaties. I'm so proud of that because I know one, one of the catalysts was that was when they told me it wouldn't work on my first record. We had three number ones in a, in a top five, and that proved that you're wrong. And one of his favorite moments of the last 40 years, validation that loving a band like Kiss as a black child in the South was, as his mom told him, just fine. If that, was, that was one of the full most circle. full circle moments of my he- life. When Kiss gave us that Grammy. You got well, grief for listening to Kiss. I got so much grief for listening to Kiss for my family. So much grief. Because I love Kiss. I, you know, I listened to them all the time when I was, was for a couple of years. And when they gave me that their second Grammy, that was a, such a full circle moment. It was the, unbelievable. The other one was Tupac, right? Tupac. Tupac and, and Kiss. Tupac and Kiss. And Kiss and Makeup for the first time since 79. Hootie and the Blowfish. It was unbelievable. It's mind-blowing. It was unbelievable. And yet believable. If you're a fan of his voice, his ability to write hit songs, and you know how his mother made him feel, like anything was possible. I grew up in the church in the South, and my spirituality is very important to me. It was just part of our life. Does it make you believe that your mother is seeing all Absolutely. of this? Absolutely. You know that in I your heart. I believe 100%. I really believe in my heart that she's the reason. You know, she got to heaven and she pulled her strings and did the manipulations, and, you know, here we are 30 years later, and I'm still getting to talk to you. You know, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> That right there is the crossroads of gratitude and extreme talent. That's where Darius Rucker lives. And that's our show. You can watch episodes of the playlist right here on ABC News Live and streaming on Hulu. I'm Phil Lipoff. Until next time, the music never stops. Thanks for watching.
Give it to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Hello, I'm Terry Moran, and here are some of the top headlines we're watching at ABC News Live at this hour. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and other top U.S. officials are meeting with the Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador today in Mexico regarding the crisis at the U.S. southern border. This as the biggest caravan in over a year, over 6,000 people, heads north to the U.S. border. And today, New York City's Mayor Eric Adams announced a new executive order requiring charter buses transporting migrants to provide 32 hours notice in advance of their arrival into New York City. This announcement was made in a joint virtual media briefing with the mayors of Chicago and Denver as they all call for more federal aid to respond to the national migrant crisis. Mayor Adams said New York City is seeing another surge of migrants as Texas Governor Abbott continues to transport migrants north from Texas. The Michigan Supreme Court today rejected an appeal to bar former President Donald Trump from that state's 2024 Republican primary ballot. A watchdog group had filed the appeal on behalf of a group of Michigan voters. This after Colorado Supreme Court made the historic move to ban Trump from that state's ballot last week. That was based on the court's finding that the former president, quote, engaged in insurrection in his efforts to overturn the 2020 election and the attack on the Capitol on January 6, 2021. And Maine's Secretary of State now intends to announce a decision this week on the former president's eligibility for Maine's primary, which is scheduled for March 5th, that's Super Tuesday. And a federal appeals court has paused a ban on the import and sale of certain Apple Watch models. The U.S. International Trade Commission initially banned the watches after finding that the tech giant infringed on a patent for blood oxygen sensor in the Apple Watch at Series 9 and the Apple Watch Ultra 2. Today, that ruling is on hold, and the watches can be sold until a court can hear Apple's full appeal. Well, thanks for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis, and you can always find us on various streaming services, on the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com as well. The news never stops. We'll be right back. Music is powerful and can be deeply personal, a way to find your place or even your purpose. I'm Phil Lipoff and this is The Playlist, where we are highlighting artists who celebrate their uniqueness, an indie frontman connecting to his roots, a crooning duo spending decades on the road playing for a loyal fan base. But first, a singer-songwriter with soul. This is Ray's moment for sure. The British-born artist is selling out shows all across the world. And at first, her voice was the soundtrack to some of the biggest dance hits on the charts. Now, she's on her own, and it's the honesty in her songwriting and the vulnerability in her performances. I spent some time with Ray to talk about her journey to stardom and her fight for creative freedom. Ray has been running towards stardom her whole life. Sleezing and teasing, I'm sitting on him. Her 2022 release, Escapism, streamed more than half a billion times. That success, and perhaps more important to the 25-year-old, her artistic freedom, did not come overnight. When I signed my record deal when I was 17, in my mind, I was going to be like, but here's my album, and they were like, yeah, OK, great. And I'm like, OK, so you could go and do some sessions mm -hmm. with these people. Go and work right with them. She says her label ignored what she wanted to create, instead put her together with some of the biggest DJs and producers to make dance hits like You Don't Know Me. Ooh, 
The Jax Jones 2016 release featuring Ray climbed to number three on the UK charts. After that, Secrets. What a way to drop a bombshell, baby. Cause you really didn't think I'd find out. And then, Bed. I got a bed, but I rather be yours. Another top ten hit with her friend and DJ legend, David Guetta. Her voice becoming synonymous with the genre. But only that genre. I was there for seven years, and in my mind, I had written many, many different albums worth of stuff that were that would have made sense in it. You know, like, it's like hundreds of songs. She even wrote hits for other artists, like Bigger for Beyonce. Can you hear it Finally, after seven years in 2021, Ray says she had had enough and took to social media claiming that her label was preventing her from releasing her own album instead of just single after single. Shortly after that, she was let out of her contract. Suddenly, untethered, independent and ready to be Ray. Ultimately, it forces you as an artist to focus on the only thing you can control, and that is the quality of your art. And the idea is that if it gets into one person's eardrums, you're like, you know, they're, they're listening and they're like, wow. You said, um, I don't want to create music for the purpose solely to sell. That doesn't give me joy. I, when, I heard you, when, I, when I heard you say that, I wrote it down immediately. I had to get to a place where I was like, I don't care how this music performs. I don't care what it does. What I care about is the fact that I love it. That love for music began when Ray, or Rachel Agatha Keene, was a child in Yorkshire, England. I sang at church, and my parents are definitely musical, but were never professionally musical. At seven years old, I turned around to my dad, and I was like, Dad, I'm going to be a songwriter. My granddad used to write songs. Um, it's just in the blood, the passion's in the blood. It's an interesting thing for a seven-year-old to say. I wrote and recorded my first song when I was about eight. Um, I still have the recordings, but you are not allowed to hear them because well, I what, sound what terrible. Was the, what was the name of the song? The song was called Change My World, and I wrote this song about a homeless man that I'd seen, and I was really upset. One line? Um, cold and tired and hungry. Life is just so hard for me. Um, yeah, all I want is a peaceful world, something like that. The writing was on the wall. In her teens, her passion for music grew, inspired by legends like Nina Simone. Ray seen here singing Feeling Good. All these years later, opening for stars like SZA and Kaliuchis, seen at fashion shows with Ice Spice and Lil Nas X, now headlining her own tour, and Ray fans around the world finally have her first full-length solo album, My 21st Century Blues, and it begins like this. Ladies and gentlemen, give a warm, heartbreak welcome to the wonderful Ray. A 13-song journey pop mixed with jazz, R&B, and a little dance, with lyrics to match the highs and lows of the life she's lived. There's Oscar-winning Tears. She performed in August on Good Morning America's concert series. And deeply personal songs like Ice Cream Man. Coming like the ice cream man Till I felt his ice cold hands written about being sexually assaulted. Whenever you go to that place, I think a lot of people who experience some of these things experience PTSD and experience the aftermath of trauma that was dealt to you that you didn't deserve. Like, you know, having to figure out how to pick your life up after you've been completely broken and, and abused. And, and um, that's a song that I made to just remind myself how strong I am. She makes that very clear in the chorus. Cause I'm a woman, I'm a very big, a brave, strong woman. And I'll be damned if I let a man ruin. How I walk, how I talk, how I do it. Do you sing it every night you play? No, not every night. That would be difficult. Yeah, I really try, I really try to as much as I can because I know every time I sing it, I know there's at least one little girl in the audience who is like, thank you for singing this song. One of the many new benefits of having creative control. Here's another one. Thank you. Escapism, her first single as an independent artist shot to number one in the UK. 
<laughs> Equally as thrilled to show us her platinum album hanging on the wall. And now, a live album recording at the famed Royal Albert Hall in London. The announcement came this spring on Instagram. What's it going to be like? It's going to be amazing. I definitely, it's definitely not cheap. Like, just so people know, OK? Remind me that you are, in you are the independent. Artistry. Independent, <laughs> independent artist. Independent artistry. No, it's, it's going to be a dream come true. That's exactly what it's going to be. I think escapism is going to be insane with... Dun, 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 you know, them <laughs> chords. The song is upbeat, but for us, Ray played it like this. Sleezing and teasing, I'm sitting on him. All of my diamonds are dripping on him. I met him at the bar, it was 12 or something. I ordered two more wines, cause tonight I want him. Cause I don't wanna feel how I did last night. I don't wanna feel how I did last night. Da, 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 da. Have mercy on me, take this pain away. You're asking me my symptoms, doctor. In the middle of her longest tour yet, 133 shows. When I come out the other side of that, um, we'll see. Yeah. But I do have some things in the vibe, so we'll just, there's no rules. I don't know, and I'm also a very spontaneous person. I could wake up tomorrow and be like, guys. <laughs> I feel like we're gonna drop uh, an EP full of this, this, and that. Like, I just, you just don't know with me. So there's nothing to regret other than this 4 4 kick drum pounding in my head. Hmm. One thing is for sure, though, there is a lot of good music ahead coming out from Ray. After decades on the scene with a body of work cementing them as an indie music staple, Young the Giant is still finding ways to innovate and connect to a deeper meaning. On their fifth and latest studio album, American Bollywood, lead singer Samir Gadia taps into his family history as inspiration to write and produce songs about identity and roots. I sat down with Samir to talk about his career and the importance of representation as one of the only Indian frontmen in American music. Young the Giant's self-titled album released in 2011 to critical acclaim. Their first huge hit, My Body. And of course, there was also Cough Syrup. The band formed in 2004 under another name, The Jakes. But some members go back further than that, a teenage talent show. I was in middle school with, with two of them, but at the time they were doing their own thing. It was a couple other guys I roped into doing it with me. We sat down with lead singer Samir Gadia in Houston at 713 Music Hall. Some of my favorite shows of this tour are not necessarily the most noteworthy venues or the most iconic. Oftentimes it's just the place you wouldn't even expect. That must be like a euphoric feeling. It's amazing. A feeling Samir almost left behind at a crossroads in college when he was pre-med at Stanford. I think my parents wanted me to be successful, an avenue that there was a lot of representation in. So obviously it's the stereotypical ones or, you know, the doctor, the lawyer. But when Samir thought about being a professional musician, he could only name one other Indian rock star. Queen's Freddie Mercury, born Farouk Bulsara to British Indian parents. But Farouk changed his name to Freddie. You know, it blows my mind how many uh, Indian people or brown people still don't know that he's Indian. I knew from a very young age, and I didn't think about that, but maybe it, it made these decisions in me that, okay, maybe I have to change some things a little bit for it to be accepted by a larger group of people. And I think those are very, like, small but insidious things that I've, like, picked apart over the course of time and made that intention not to do that. Samir chose not to change his name and has been out front for more than 20 years. My goal also is to be able to not necessarily just be a role model, but to be just an example of representation and success and show that there are other ways to be successful. Um, there are other ways to do it. And if, if I'd seen that when I was younger, maybe I would have embraced it sooner.
And he says he wishes musicians weren't separated by genre. You say it segregates the artists who make it. So tell yeah. me what you mean by that. Like urban music, you know, and the, the way you describe an urban population. It's very similar music and like any art form responds or ripples to the secret codes that we have in our culture. Mm -hmm. And so there are ways outwardly, objectively, that people classify music nowadays. Maybe I think there was a certain point of time where music maybe did classify the style of music. But I think now more than ever in, a, in an era where there's kind of, we're kind of post-genre in terms of the way stuff is sounding, like there's influence coming from all over the place um, and we're all melding stuff together. Young the Giant has certainly done that over the years, like with Mind Over Matter, the title track off their 2014 release. In 2018, Superposition off Mirror Master. And for their fifth studio album released in 2022, an homage to his roots. It was an empowerment of the sound of the South Asian diaspora of music and its stronghold on Western music over the decades. And so, you know, at the beginning, we are start, we're using more traditional Indian elements that people can pick apart and be like, oh, okay, this is a tabla, this is a sitar. The lyrics in Wake Up, the first line, as you were talking about, is walking through the desert of the Indus Valley. I was going backwards and I swear I saw me. I love that line. Yeah, I mean, it sets the tones. The, the record is um, loosely inspired by the act structure of the Mahabharata, which is part of the Bhagavad Gita, which is a, you know, larger... Indian Hindu text. Now that you're here with American Bollywood, where you are musically, what kind of feedback have you gotten from your family? You know, American Bollywood, that song in particular, is the story of my parents and the story of my father. You know, tw 24, he touches down in Michigan. That's the first time he ever saw snow. American dreams were hard to conjure without a bed to sleep in. And I think um, it was validating for them, you know, for all the stuff that they've endured over the course of their life. Samir is now a father of two boys who don't have to look far at all to see themselves represented in music. Young the Giant is still selling out shows, always grateful for their hardcore fan base. And on this night in Houston, a special pre-show performance. I was the one to blame, calling you up on the phone. And just before taking the stage, kind enough to indulge a longtime fan with a verse from Cough Syrup. If I could find a way to see this straight, I'd limp away to some fortune that I heard should have found by And after almost two decades, Samir's favorite part of the music business is still the live show. You know, I am open and ready, and I don't ever want to be closed off to inspiration. The second I think that, I don't know, I forget who said this, but I think the second that an artist thinks that they're the ones who are writing their songs, it's when it's done. Because you really are just channeling something. You're channeling some creativity. And again, want to thank Samir for indulging me. Love cough syrup. It's still to come, for more than 40 years, this duo has been serenading lovers with some of your favorite ballads from the 80s. I sat down with love song legends Air Supply to talk about how their hits have stood the test of time. We've also considered ourselves always a touring rock and roll band because we don't sit home for any length of time. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Thank you.
They are a staple of the 80s who put out some of our favorite love ballads. And the hits Air Supply is known for have stood the test of time for sure. The Australian duo still spending most of their time, like decade after decade after decade, touring. The legendary pair sharing the secret to longevity. Big, bold, beautiful love songs that stand the test of time. Few groups have done it better than Air Supply. From their hits, All Out of Love, and Lost in Love, to every love song in between. Graham Russell and Russell Hitchcock have been recording huge hits and touring the world for almost 50 years. We've toured every year except COVID year f for since 1976. That's without, amazing. Without a stop. On this night in Red Bank, New Jersey, we watched as the audience sang every word. Then we sat down with the legendary duo. Thank you both for doing this. We started with how they met in 1975, both in the same production of Jesus Christ Superstar in Australia. Neither of us had any musical background or any training of any kind. But when we met, we knew something was going on because we'd sing between shows in Superstar and people would come by and go, wow, you guys sound amazing. We went on tour the next day after Superstar closed. We had a number one record in Australia. Their self-titled debut album. It happened that fast, and just a year later, they were on a whirlwind tour opening for Rod Stewart. But when the tour ended... We got back to Australia, we couldn't get arrested, you know. We, uh, we had seven in the band, I think. We were getting offered $200 a night to play. After touring with Rod Stewart? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we were, we were no, no, nowhere, nothing. I went and stayed with my sister in Melbourne and, and got work doing jingles here and there. Um, and then Graham said he'd written some songs, why don't you come to Adelaide? And one of those songs was Lost in Love. And I went, that's a monster mm, right yeah. there. And it was. Their 1980 release, Lost in Love, changed everything for the British-Australian rock group, certified double platinum in the U.S. From the title track, to All Out of Love and Every Woman in the World. After that, there was no looking back. The next year, they dropped The One That You Love with hits like Here I Am. Here I Am. Three more albums in the 80s, another four in the 90s, and three releases so far in the 2000s. There are bands that last, if, if they have 15 or 20 years, that's a successful career. Yeah, yeah. You guys are now on 47. You're mm. selling out shows. You're mm. doing... Two a week, mm. all year long, mm. still. We're valid in 2023, just mm. as much as we were in 1976. Making love out of nothing at all, even the mm. nights are better. Yeah, yeah. Every woman in the world, mm. the list goes on and on. They cross decades because it was you were writing love mm. songs mm. On, on a guitar with piano and your voices yeah. that are as valid as you say today, as relevant yeah. today as they, as they would be then. Mm. Was there... Was that conscious? Was that a conscious decision? Or was that just what, how you were writing and singing? It's just the, the way I, I wrote songs and still do. Uh, we, uh, to have a conscious decision for us is very rare. When we made our first record, uh, which was Love Another Bruises, Love Another Bruises. we didn't have a plan. We, well, we really didn't know what we were doing. We just knew that we both loved this song. And when Russell went in to sing it, uh, everything changed because suddenly it was, you know, beautiful song, then Russell just popped it out at the end and he just happened to jump up the octave and sing it higher because he could do that. And, and in the studio, everyone did, whoa, that's mm. it. So suddenly our sound was created. And when you write the kind of moving lyrics that Graham does, and sing them the way Russell does. The songs become a part of fans' lives, especially during deeply personal moments. We had a young guy at, at a show, and he said, I just came out to my dad, and he's disowned me. And uh, 
I was actually thinking about killing myself mm. and I got put on one of your records or something and I thought, whoa, you know, this is not worth any of this. You go, whoa, this is, this is far beyond somebody paying 20 bucks for a concert and going home with somebody saying, oh, that was great. Mm. You know, actually changed somebody's lives. Saved. Saved. In there that case, yeah, saved yeah, yeah. somebody's yeah. life. So we don't take that for granted. And that is at the core of Air Supply, taking nothing for granted and reaching as many fans as possible. Helping them do that on tour, an amazing group of musicians building on those gigantic love songs. With guitar solos. Hard-hitting drums. A solid bass line and a charismatic pianist keeping it all together. We just love to play and, you know, we love stepping on stage and seeing people's face, faces light up. I mean, you can't buy that. You also can't buy the kind of support they get from their wives. Russell married to his wife, Carrie. Graham first met Jody on the set of their music video for Making Love Out of Nothing at All. She was cast as his love interest. They later married. Even the nights are better Now that we're here together now in their 70s, the legends are not slowing down in the middle of yet another world tour. You guys are rock stars. Yeah, we've also considered ourselves always a touring rock and roll band because we don't sit home for any length of time. We've done over 5,300 shows in our career. And no slowing down, you're doing 100 plus shows no, a year. Yeah. No, we're doing 120. I mean, think about that. 120 shows a year, you're touring most of the year. For 50 years, and these guys are 80. Amazing. That's our show. You can watch full episodes of the playlist right here on ABC News Live, also streaming on Hulu. I'm Phil Lipoff. Until next time, the music never stops. Thanks for watching. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Oh. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Matt Gutman reporting in Gaza City right next to Al Shifa Hospital. Wherever the news is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, a mysterious note and a gun left on the counter. Who killed a former sports star and his wife? 2020 begins right now. This case is a parent's worst nightmare. 
the murder retrial of A.J. Armstrong. You now have all the evidence in this case. Do you think it's possible to convince 12 jurors to acquit? Now we have a verdict? It's a showdown in a Texas court years in the making. I was making my way down the stairs, and that's when I heard the gunshots. We start to hear, it's two people shot. We believe it's the mother, father. Don had been shot in the head. What? And suddenly you realize that they suspect you. I was in complete shock. I can't even put into words how I felt. But how does he feel about his third trial for murder? You don't think a 16-year-old kid is going to be a suspect. I thought some of them lost their mind. George, my grandson, was killing his mom and dad. Hey, I saw the guy. Like, I feel like I should have done something. Did you physically see somebody? Or... Yeah, I saw him running. There was a pistol and a note with a message scribbled on it. And it said, I have been watching for a long time. And then up in the corner, it was scribbles. Come get me. This is not right. And to be accused. It is the case that has captivated Houstonians for years. The husband and wife shot in their bedroom. Chilling details about the night the Armstrongs were murdered. The Armstrongs are the perfect example of a Texas family. This is a family that is so respected in this community. They're a family that's all about faith and football. Right, let's get it in, guys. A family which appeared to be perfect and wasn't. A loving family ripped apart. I've been covering this story for years. And tonight, the explosive new evidence that upended this case and is the reason we're bringing it to you now. Everything, everything points to him. You better get that camera out of the way. It got emotional. It was intense. Both sides very fired up. This is the latest twist in what seems to be a never-ending case. And now, finally, a decision. A verdict has been reached. All eyes for the jury. But this whole sordid tale began seven years ago with gunshots in the middle of the night and a 911 call from a terrified-sounding 16-year-old. Houston 911, do you need medical police or fire? Do you police? He's whispering. His eyes and he just heard gunshots in the parents' room. Is this a house? Yes. And your name? AJ. Any medical attention needed? I, I heard gunshots, so I don't really know. In your parents' bedroom? Yes. How did you get into my parents' He was whispering. He was very quiet, concerned somebody may still be in the house, constantly asking on the condition of his sister. I need to get my sister. Your sister is downstairs on the first floor? How old is she? Uh, I remember AJ coming into my room, waking me up. Hera, 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 you got to get up. Come on, you got to get up. Come on, come on. Hera, I need you to get up. Here, I need you to get up. I was halfway asleep, so I didn't ask any questions. I just got up and walked. Come, just come with me. Come on, come with me. Just grab my hand and stay behind me. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Okay, police are on their way. Okay, you like to outside of my house. What do I do? When they knock on the door, you can go down there. Is anyone on the first level? No, it's just our living room kitchen. Okay. Just listen for the police and listen for instructions. When police arrive at the home, AJ has to deactivate the alarm system to let them in the door. Yeah, I'm the one that, I'm, I'm the one that called. AJ opens the door, and he and his 12-year-old sister, Kay, will walk outside to find this line of officers. There were maybe like seven police officers standing outside the door. Stand by. There's going to be people walking. I'm Courtney Fisher, and I'm a reporter for KTRK in Houston, Texas. Now to some breaking news from Southwest Houston. Eyewitness News reporter Courtney Fisher is live from the scene with what police know so far. Good morning to you, Courtney. I have covered this case from the beginning. It was 3 a.m. Police tape is already up. This just happened a couple hours ago, so it's very busy out here. Good morning, my name is investigator Jimmy Dotson with the uh, HPD Homicide Division. I was sitting on the desk on that night um, that the call came into the, to the unit. My lieutenant at the time had asked me if I could go help with a, with a murder that had occurred. 
There was a lot of family members that showed up on the scene that night. The first person that I saw was my older brother, Josh. John and Antonio Armstrong have a third child, Josh. He'd recently moved into an apartment, and it's just a few blocks away from the family home. I just remember being woken up by Josh yelling, babe, get up, get up, somebody's in the house. You know, I was startled. I just woke up out of my sleep, and he's, like, yelling this, and then I see him running out the door. Hannah was staying over at Josh's apartment that night, and she described that he was so upset he was hyperventilating, trying to explain to her the phone call he had received from AJ. He runs over there, and Hannah makes her own 911 call. There's somebody just shot at him. I'm at my boyfriend's apartment, and he ran over to his house because he lives like two minutes down the street. He just got there and just called me and told me that his parents had been shot. <laughs> My daughter, Olivia, got the phone call. She said we had to go to Antonio and Don's home, that there were shots. When AJ called, I could hear it in his voice. He was afraid. He was hysterical. He said, there's been some gunshots. And, uh, you know, somebody was here. They were in the house. I, I didn't know what to think. The police immediately go through the house to secure the house and make sure there's no one else in the house. As they are going through the house, they're not sure what they have. Someone could be jumping out at any moment. The officers found out very quickly that they showed up to a house that was locked. The windows are all closed, the blinds are all down, the locks are all in place, and there's no forced entry. Don and Antonio are upstairs in their bed, and when the police went in there and the paramedics, they believed that Don had been shot twice in the head and was deceased and Antonio had been shot once in the head, and he was alive, but in critical condition. They had pillows over the tops of their heads. It appears that they were placed on after the fact. It was kind of odd. I don't know why you would shoot someone and then place pillows over their head. We start to hear, it's two people shot. We believe it's the mother, father. We immediately start to think, is this a murder-suicide? We know one woman shot, her husband also shot. The couple's children inside the home, a teenage boy and a girl. I just remember seeing police cars in the ambulance. And somebody was rolled out on a stretcher. They were saying that Antonio was being rushed to the hospital. And that Dawn had been shot in the head. What? They make the decision to separate the children. I was trying to get to my grandbabies, Kayra. She was only 12. I remember being escorted to a police car, and an officer came by, and I asked them. I was like, what's going on? And they were like, your mom has passed away, and your dad is fighting for his life, and he might not make it and someone brought me these bags around my hands and told me to put it on and that I couldn't take them off. The children were tested for gunshot residue, so they bagged their hands in order to preserve any gunshot residue. It's not that they think that the person is responsible at that point. It's just they don't exactly know what happened. I just did not know what was being told to me. And I still had the bags in my hand, so as I was crying, I just couldn't wipe my face or anything. I just sat there alone. She was so traumatized, and I was so concerned about her. I wanted those bags off her hands. AJ was also alone. Police had bagged his hands and had him sitting in the back of a squad car. After they secured the house and took the victim out of the house, they looked around for any evidence they could find. They come in the kitchen, the drawers were open, like it had been ransacked. There was a pistol and a note with a message scribbled on it laying on the counter. It appeared to be a staged crime scene to them. When the police found the note, it was really hard to read, and it said, I have been watching for a long time. And then up in the corner, it was scribbled, come get me. The fact that there's no gun in that bedroom, they know this is not a murder-suicide. This is something very different. I find out that somebody else in the house shot this husband and wife. And it's like, wait a second, over there. And you see this kid, he's really young, he has handcuffs on. I did see them put cuffs on him and put him in the backseat of the car and drive him off. 
but I didn't understand why. There is someone in the back of that squad car. He is handcuffed. We don't know the relationship right now to the victims. When you got that call, what specifically did Chris tell you? Told me that mom was dead, dad was struggling, and AJ was in custody. That teen remains in juvenile custody this morning. You don't think a 16-year-old kid is going to be a suspect. Houston police say the 16-year-old shot both of his parents. Killing his mother, his dad, fighting for his life. It didn't make sense. There's no way that AJ could have done this. Just not AJ. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Oh. Welcome to Crux, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of Crux 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Dawn Armstrong has been murdered in her bed. Her husband, Antonio, has a gunshot wound to the head and is clinging to life. And their 16-year-old son, AJ, is in handcuffs being taken in for questioning. We traveled to Houston in early 2019 for the first of what will become many interviews with A.J. Armstrong and his legal team. Hi. Matt. A.J., nice to meet you. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three. And you clap. We're good? All right. That night, the police come in and you're looking for help, and suddenly you realize that they suspect you. I was in complete shock. I can't even put into words how I felt. Uh, it was a mix of shock. It was a mix of anger. It, it was a lot of different things. Like, why me? First time you've ever had handcuffs on. First time I've ever had handcuffs put on my hand. And for me, it was, there's no way possible. I couldn't even fathom the idea of killing my parents. I immediately went to the hospital. And it still didn't cross my mind that they took AJ to the police station and maybe you need to get an attorney there or something. I found out, uh, you know, Don had been killed and Antonio had been transported to a hospital and was on life support. Chris was at the hospital. He was their family attorney and he also was Antonio's friend. Uh, I remember getting off the elevator and the entire waiting room was packed with people from everywhere. When you saw Antonio? He was on a ventilator. I, I, I told him goodbye. It was clear he wasn't going to make it. No, we knew it. I told him to fight, you know, that he's a fighter. But we knew, we knew what the situation was.
waiting for police to come talk to all the media who's standing outside. Get some mic check, one, two, three. Everyone ready? And one of the first things Sergeant says to me was, this is the all-American family. Uh, this was an outstanding family. Um, the, the male in the family was an absolute hardworking breadwinner. He's a great guy. Um, and the family, the mother was a great mother. I wanted to really get across to the media and to the people out there that these were really good people. Everybody just loved them, loved their personality and just them as a couple. Tell me about Antonio Sr. A monster of a man dedicated to his family. Antonio was my big brother. We're proud of him. Just to watch the things that he'd accomplished. Antonio was raised in a very poor situation. His father, he never really knew. His mother was 15 when she gave birth to him. I raised Antonio in Cashmere Garden here in Houston, Texas. It's mixed, some working, some welfare, and a lot of areas of uh, drug infested. And when Antonio graduated from high school, he went to Texas A&M University, played football there. This is a guy who got a full ride to Texas A&M, where he played linebacker. <laughs> Texas A&M football is not just a big deal. Football is life. Antonio played at A&M from 1991 to 94. In the Cotton Bowl in 94, against Notre Dame, named Defensive Player of the Game honors. Second sack of the ball He had eight tackles, three sacks. He went off. No doubt he was going to be picked in the NFL draft. He was drafted sixth round to the San Francisco 49ers and went to the Miami Dolphins. I'm like, is this really happening? You know, are we getting out the hood? How good of a football player was your father? Uh, he was amazing. I've never seen an outside linebacker better than my dad. Don came to visit the church that I pastored. They met then. My daughter, she was a charmer. She was one of a kind. If you met her, you would love her. When Antonio met Don, she had a, a baby boy. And Josh became Antonio's son. He adopted him, basically, as his own. Josh didn't learn Antonio wasn't his birth father until he was 16. But according to the family, Antonio always treated Josh like his biological son. Don and Antonio did have two kids together, AJ and Kara. Don was very involved with her kids. Don was the mom that took the pictures every moment. She didn't want to miss anything. She was the perfect mom for me. I don't think like another mother could have come in and handled me better than she did. She just knew how to always talk to me. How was your relationship with your dad growing up? He was there for everything from football to basketball. When I wanted to play soccer, he was there. That was my go-to best friend. AJ wanted to follow in his father's footsteps and play football. And once he started playing, he was good at every position he played. Hello, everyone. My name is Antonio Armstrong, owner of First Class Training. Once Antonio's professional football career was over, he began to open up gyms. Antonio Armstrong knows what it takes to get in shape and stay there. And team good. They had three gyms. Antonio, he worked day and night to provide and do for his family. AJ grew up in the Bel Air area, southeast Houston. Bel Air is family area. There are a lot of bigger homes. For Antonio to come from Cashmere Garden and end up living near Bel Air, owning a gym in Bel Air, it was as different as day is from night. And it was a major accomplishment. Tell me about life in your household previous to 2016. It was amazing. I was attending a great school. The kids went to Kincaid, a very prestigious private school. He just finished up his sophomore year. He has a lot of friends. He has a girlfriend. He loves his parents. They appear to be this perfect family. But that picture-perfect family is now shattered with both of the Armstrongs shot in their bed and AJ is in handcuffs. People were saying to me, you need to get AJ an attorney. I said, for what? You have a 16-year-old in a room with two experienced police officers. Does your dad own a gun? Yes, he does. Police say, you sure you never touched that gun? And the story changes. 
I can explain the gun. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the Capitol, I'm Rachel Scott. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. It's been five hours since A.J. Armstrong made that 911 call. Most of his family is at the hospital where his father is still fighting for his life. At what point did you hear that A.J. was now the number one police suspect? It was one of the family members that told me that A.J. had been arrested and taken downtown. So I just had simply asked, is anybody taking care of A.J.? Chris wanted to do something for his friend's 16-year-old son. But he knew he was going to need help. I know Rick had uh, handled a similar case, and so I called him. Rick, when you got that call from Chris, what did he tell you? He was pretty upset, and he was asking me what I would do as far as dealing with AJ and being in police custody. I didn't know what was going on. I kept asking questions, like, can someone tell me something? And like, I got no answers. When it comes to a juvenile, it's important in the state of Texas, and the law says it, is that a judge has to read a juvenile their magistrate warnings. By my watch, it is approximately 6.53 in the morning. I'm going to go over your rights with you. She has to read the warnings to AJ, so he understands he doesn't have to talk to police. She makes AJ repeat it back to her. You are warned that you may uh, remain silent and not make any statement at all. Any statement that you make may be used in evidence against you. What does that mean to you, Antonio? That if I don't want to say anything, I don't have to. That's correct. After being magistrated by a judge, he's down at the police station giving his story. He denied legal counsel. I asked him, why did he do that? He said, Nanny, what did I need legal counsel for? He said, I, I just wanted to tell them whatever they wanted to know so they can find out who did this. When I walk into the room where AJ Armstrong is in the homicide division, he was just very calm. How was your relationship with your parents? It was, it was a pretty good relationship. OK, uh, you get along with your mom? Me and my mom, like, we, I mean, me, like, me, my brother, and my sister, like, had our, like, little issues with my mom, but it was never anything, like, serious. Like, we, it was just, like, family stuff. When we ask AJ about his relationship with his mom, it's actually one of the more telling things that he says. He immediately kind of villainized her, which was pretty telling to us because we already had the thought process that she was potentially shot first. And what about dad? Uh, dad was, like, the go-to. Okay. Any any recent problems, any issues between you and him or anything like that? Uh, no. Like, my dad's a pretty, like, chill guy. 
The questioning of AJ was gonna be important because we want to lay out the timeline of the day in the household. We wanna know if there was any arguments. We wanna know if mom and dad had a bad running into with someone out in public. All of those things need to be established because you're trying to find a motive for why his parents were killed. My mom, she came back around five, and it was me, my dad, and her. Me, my dad, and her. And then my mom and dad got dressed, and they went to one of my dad's, like one of my dad's uh, friends' events that he had. So they were gone until like eight. And then when they got back, uh, I went, I went to go pick up my little sister from my grandmother's house. AJ came and picked me up, and he took me home. He seemed happy, like always, just in a good mood. Like we got back to the house at like nine or ten. So we locked the doors. I set the alarm and went upstairs, so I went to bed. My parents were laying in their bed, I don't know what they were doing, and I was just upstairs just watching Netflix still. And then I, it was like probably one or two, getting ready to go to bed, and I went to the restroom, and when I came out, I heard the door open, and I haven't been, I haven't been feeling well like this whole day, so I've just been at home. And uh, I thought it was my parents, so I like walked downstairs, so I was gonna ask if I can get some medicine and I was making my way down the stairs, and that's when I heard the gunshots. That's when I got like four or five stairs down, and I like looked. Do you know how many you heard? How many you heard? I mean, I think I heard two, but it may have been three. I'm not really like 100% like okay. positive. I just like personally felt bad, because like I saw the guy, like I feel like I should have done something. When AJ's being questioned by police, he makes a huge revelation. He says he saw a masked intruder. Did you physically see somebody? Or... No, like, I saw him running. Like, I saw him running. What did he look like? I mean, they had a, uh, it was like a mask, and like, you could only see the eyes and the mouth, but he looked like a, he looked like a black guy. <laughs> I'd say like six feet, maybe. He's on that 911 call for 16 minutes. Never in those 16 minutes does he say he saw a masked man. Don't you think that would be one of the first things that you would tell officers at the scene? Hey, I saw an intruder. I understand your point there, and it makes sense. But remember, this is a 16-year-old. You cannot put yourself in his shoes and imagine what's going on if he's just heard gunshots. And remember, on that 911 call, AJ does seem to briefly allude to someone being in the house. Police say they didn't find any evidence of an intruder in the house that night, and they have now determined that the gun used belonged to Antonio Sr. They want to see what AJ knows about it. Does your dad own a gun? Yes, he does. Do you know what kind of gun it is? I just know it's like a pistol. I think it's a 22, but I'm not like 100% positive. Like, I've only, only time I've ever like used it was when I we went to the gun range when I was like eight years old. Then, detectives confront him with a puzzling piece of evidence found at the scene. They found a bullet hole that went through his bedroom floor down to the second floor study right outside of his parents' bedroom. A.J. Armstrong had covered the bullet hole in the floor of his bedroom with socks. It was like almost a teepee of socks to throw off authorities that there was a hole in the carpet. Police say, well, wait a second. You sure you've never touched that gun? And the story changes. I can explain the gun from the room upstairs. Uh, it was like two, three, it was like, I think it was two, maybe three weeks ago. Like, uh, me and one of my friends was just like playing around. I was like, hey, like, have you ever shot a gun before? <laughs> and they were like, nah, I've never done it. And I was like, do you want me to show you how to? And the gun was under my dad's bed. AJ tells the officers, at least initially in the interview, that he never touched his dad's gun. That wasn't true. There's not a, not a lot of ways to, to, to describe it, except that he's a 16-year-old knucklehead, and he might have been scared that he'd get in trouble for touching his dad's gun. They were playing around with the gun. Stupid, sure, but that doesn't make him a bad guy. It makes him a stupid teenager. I think anytime you're talking to police and your story starts to change, that could be a bit of a problem. But none of it was really very plausible. You could tell that he was someone who is trying to be smarter than other people, but not mature enough to pull it off. That's kind of what his explanations came across as. And investigators seem to be finding more problems for AJ back at the house. More suspicious evidence that just isn't adding up. I understand this situation does not look good at all for me. We got really good, Dan. Congratulations, you're breaking. 
I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. A nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Investigators have been questioning AJ for more than half an hour, and they've asked him about evidence found at the house. There's that bizarre note that says, I have been watching, and the bullet hole in the ceiling. But it's not just those things that investigators have questions about. They've also noticed a suspicious burn mark on the carpet at the top of the stairs on the floor where AJ's parents' bedroom is. So I know you guys saw the black little thing on the carpet when you walk upstairs. I was like playing with matches and I dropped one and didn't realize it and I just walked away and then like the carpet set on fire and then my dad came in front of me about it and I was like, uh, I don't know. He tells the investigators he originally lied to his dad, his dad got upset. And he was like, you guys like lied to me. But I mean like me and my dad, whenever we do have problems, like we sit down and we talk about it and we solve it. It was something that was odd to us. He says, oh yeah, I was playing with matches, I accidentally dropped one. Well. The problem was that burn mark smelled like accelerant, so it smelled like a petroleum-based, either gasoline or rubbing alcohol. By this point, detectives have also started to talk with other family members, and they're telling investigators that AJ had started having some issues with his dad recently. They said that you recently got in trouble with your pop. Yeah, you it, was the, it was the carpet. They said you got caught with drugs, too. That was a really long time ago. I'd probably say, like, three, three, six months ago. Okay. Whenever AJ would come over to the apartment, him and Josh would smoke weed together. I remember a few times Josh's mom calling about AJ and his grades were falling and all he wants to do is party now. Can you, you know, talk to him? Can you try to steer him on the right path? What AJ doesn't know at this point is that he is the main suspect and investigators are trying to appeal to him to just fess up. There's a time in your life, even even at 16, when you have to man up and accept responsibility for, for doing something right. wrong, losing your cool, whatever it is, OK? Throughout the entire interview, AJ maintained his innocence. He never once said that he had anything to do with it. Detectives are telling him, we bagged your hand so we could run a gunshot and residue test. It's going to tell us if you fired the gun or not. Gunshot residue is the blowback that comes after a weapon is fired and the residue comes flying out of the gun. Now, in most instances, it's going to end up somewhere on your clothing. It could be on the gun. It's possibly also going to be on your hands. The gunshot residue is talked about so much during the interrogation. And AJ keeps saying, you'll see, there will be no evidence on me. I can tell you now, there's nothing that will come back that it's on me. There's, there will be no gunpowder. There's my fingerprints on nothing like that will come back on me. I had nothing to do with this. Even as AJ maintains his innocence, the detectives continue to ratchet up the pressure in the interview, trying to get him to admit that he knows more than he's saying. 
I mean, like, just being man to man here, there's four people in the house. The house is completely secured with locks and with an alarm system. I, I honestly don't buy that somebody was able to rush out the house, place a gun, write a note, you know. No one else got in that house tonight, Antonio. No one else got in that house, man. I mean, I, I don't... Like, I, did Casper come in and do it? Detectives also have another card to play. They claim the 911 call points directly to AJ's guilt. We still haven't knocked on the door. I'm on the third floor, so I may not hear it. It's not loud. Okay. And I'm in my closet. Your parents have both been shot, and you're very calm on the phone. That that's not normal. I, like, that's not that's a normal not scenario. Been, not been, like you can ask the police that have been like I'm just like. I was crying, but my brother calmed me down. I, oh, like, no, I, I was I, bawling, I crying that. coming out of the house. I understand that. I'm talking when you called 911 when this incident happened. I'm not talking about down afterwards, several minutes after your brother showed up. I didn't really know what happened. I didn't know if, like, they were actually dead. I didn't know if, like, I just didn't know what happened. Now, that 911 call is 16 minutes long. And there's something that AJ whispers about seven minutes in that would raise the eyebrows of any detective. Under his breath, AJ says, it's all my fault. He said, it's all my fault. It's all my fault. I mean, I felt like I could have done something. When we were listening to the 911 call, AJ makes what we think to be a Freudian slip. That was an accidental confession. Two sides take this very differently. AJ's attorneys believe he was saying, it's all my fault because I couldn't protect my parents. Well, if you felt you could have done something, the first thing that comes to mind is say there's a masked man in the house as soon as you call 911. I am, I understand this situation does not look good at all for me. Well, it's not that it doesn't look, it doesn't make it sense. It doesn't make sense, I understand it's just, that. But it's I'm, tell, I'm telling you, I didn't get, get anyone to do it, it and I didn't do it. Maybe when my dad was up, just talking to him, because it has nothing to do with me. But at the hospital, his dad is on life support, and ultimately, Antonio never wakes up. You know how you watch movies, and you see those doctors that come in, and they say to you, to the family, I'm so sorry, but the person didn't make it? That is exactly how it happened. And it was... It was hard. It was hard. My mom said, let him go. He wouldn't want to be here. And I told my brother I love him. Don't know to this day if he could hear me or not. But I did, and I appreciated life. After his interview, AJ is booked as a juvenile on charges of capital murder. I thought someone had lost their mind trying to charge my grandson with killing his mom and dad. But then, with A.J. sitting in juvenile detention, something happens that his defense team says could be related to the murders. A break-in at one of the Armstrong gyms. They throw a brick through the window, they come inside the gym, and it looks like they're looking for something. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the 
biggest. It's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner, oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. That night is just a blur. So why do you think the police focused on you so quickly? Your guess is as good as mine. And the idea is there were four people in the house. Two, Two of them were severely shot in a house that's locked with the alarm on so that only the occupants inside the house could have conceivably committed this murder. And there were no signs of forced entry. The sweet little girl couldn't have done it. Has to be AJ. I'm Kate Ober, and I am AJ's girlfriend. We met when I was in the seventh grade, so long time. That's my girl. We've been through everything together. Not only her, but her family has been supportive of me this entire time. You couldn't ask for nicer. He treated Kate with such respect. You could just look at him and tell that he really cared about her. You know, I felt like she was safe with him. That night, I was on the phone with him, and his parents were in the background. They were all laughing and joking, just being goofy together. After the phone call, we continued to text and talk um, like normal. I wake up the next morning, and I'm texting AJ, and my texts aren't sending. Kate kept saying, AJ's not answering his phone. We just happened to walk into the room, and then it was on the TV. You could see the police cars and this baby's hair. You could see that it was him standing there. At this point in time, it's an ongoing investigation. We're following up on some leads, trying to narrow down some things to uh, gather a suspect. It was really hard. He's mourning loss of his parents while being accused of murdering them. I can't even begin to understand, like, the pain he went through. I was taken to the juvenile detention center downtown. For me being in there on a capital murder charge, that's, that's scary. A 16-year-old boy is expected to be in Harris County Juvenile Court tomorrow, charged with killing his parents. I went to see him in juvenile detention. So what was that like? Unbeknownst to me, I may have been the first person that told him that his dad passed. And I could see just everything kind of drained out of him. That's when everything, like, hit. Like, it was real. Like, they were gone. And, uh... It's just, it's not, it's not easy at all. It's just not right. And to be accused just makes everything so much worse. It makes it so much harder for my family.
If you want to see how much Don and Antonio Sr. were loved, you just had to go to the funeral. It couldn't even be held at their home church. It had to be moved to a bigger facility. And if you don't mind doing that, can you just touch somebody by you and tell them this is a celebration of life? That was powerful. To see all the lives that they touch, all the people that they knew. Don and Antonio were still living. They're just living in a heavenly place. Thousands of people, and, and I was among the crowd, and, and I was touched by, uh, by the ceremony. Were you allowed to attend their funeral services? Yes. That was a, a little blessing. He was on the very front row, and they had him handcuffed. And so he had a jacket over his arms. Just staring, like just looking at two caskets with the people that like I love more than anybody and knowing that I'll never get to have a conversation with him, I'll never get to see him. After the funeral, AJ is taken back to juvenile detention. Ms. K says she would visit him twice a week. And it was the most difficult thing was seeing him and having to leave him there. There were some visits, he cried the whole visit. How often were you allowed outside? There was no outside. You never saw the light of day? We saw light through our window, but there was no going outside, fresh air. There was none of that. I knew what I was dealing with emotionally, so I could only imagine what a 12-year-old is dealing with. It was really hard on Kara. It was. No 12-year-old should have to wake up and find out that both your parents are no longer here. When I went back to school, I just kind of felt out of my body, really. They would talk about stuff, and I couldn't tell you what was being said because my mind was just gone. I would think about my parents. I would think about AJ. Did she ever ask you point blank if you killed your parents? No, she doesn't need to. She knows me. Not a single doubt in my mind he couldn't have. The truth is, this is an amazing kid who no way would hurt his parents. Those test investigators have been waiting for start coming back, and the results, very surprising. And investigators believe that the perpetrator had to have had intimate knowledge of the home to commit this crime. But could there be someone else out there who knew the house just as well as AJ? Then a last minute discovery of evidence changes everything about this case. My first reaction was, you gotta be kidding me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. from Lewiston, Maine, I'm Lindsay Davis. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. A.J. Armstrong not only killed his parents, 
He had been planning on killing his parents for days. AJ prepares for the fight of his life. The district attorney's office confirms it will try AJ for a third time. This is the latest twist in what seems to be a never ending case. There's also the question of why AJ, who seems to be living a pretty typical teenage life, would want to murder his parents. It's impossible, just totally impossible. Everything, everything points to him. You have to put the gun in his hand, and they haven't done that. Within minutes, the Houston Police Department decided he was the suspect in this case. We decided we would bring the crime scene to the courtroom. You got to be kidding me. How, after seven years, is this just now being discovered? Whose blood is this? Here we go again for a third time. We've lost Antonio and Don. We're no closer to who murdered them. But here you are t pulling us back in court again. Do you think it's possible to convince 12 jurors to acquit? Houston 911, do you need medical police or fire? I heard you got dropped downstairs in my parents' room. In your parents' bedroom? Yes. And your name? AJ. Antonio and Don Armstrong were gunned down at point-blank range while they slept at their home. Now their 16-year-old son, AJ, who called 911 that night, stands accused of the unthinkable, being the person who pulled the trigger. He was charged with capital murder, and so after that, he was transferred into custody, and then he had to go through the juvenile proceedings. The prosecutor had a meeting with the family members very early in this case, and we knew about it. And they said, look, the evidence is going to come back with a gunshot residue on his hands. It's going to come back. There's going to be a DNA on him. I do remember hearing the DA tell us that if these results come back and they have no evidence, hey, I'll be free to drop the case. The charge is dismissed. That didn't happen. So you're 16? Yes, sir. Are you a junior or anything? Yes, I'm You are a junior. Junior, yes. OK. AJ gave his statement because he felt like I didn't have anything to hide. I've told you guys everything. Like, I mean, y'all, like, all the tests you guys run. I, no, I know. Like, we'll come back with no, it has nothing to do with me. And that was odd to us because we had just laid out every piece of evidence we have against you and how it points to you. And that was the first thing you could say. You weren't upset. You weren't mad. You weren't sad. You didn't cry. You just said, yeah, what evidence do you have against me? That's an innocent person saying, I didn't commit this crime, and you're not going to find evidence of it in my house. So all those tests that police told AJ they were going to run come back, but they seem to confirm what AJ had been telling those detectives all along. AJ didn't have gunshot residue on his hands. Kara Armstrong's hands, which were also tested, came back clean. And detectives are surprised that there's no gunshot residue found anywhere on AJ. But there could be a simple explanation for that. It's common that the type of gun that was used, which was a 22, doesn't produce gunshot residue. The gun at the scene was found on the kitchen counter next to a note. The note was on a piece of paper clearly torn out from a pad that was in the kitchen drawer. And when police test everything, there are no fingerprints of his on the gun. AJ's fingerprints are not on the notepad. They're not on the pen. They're not on the note that was left there. His fingerprints are nowhere. And then there's the question of blood spatter. Rick DeToto actually says if AJ shot his parents at point blank range, you'd expect there to be some blood on his clothing. So the lack of blood spatter on him could point to him having time to clean himself up. He was on the phone with 911 for 16 minutes, which is a really long time. We don't know how long he waited from the time he pulled the trigger to the time he called 911. Everything that they had access to was tested. There was no water in the sinks. No one used soap. They didn't find any gloves. There's absolutely nothing that links him to any physical evidence in this case. Where on earth did it go? In order to try someone for murder and put these charges to him and take away, you know, my nephew's life, then you have to put the gun in his hand. And they haven't done that. 
Police say at this point they are not sure of a motive in the shooting. And there's also the question of why AJ, who seems to be living a pretty typical teenage life, would want to murder his parents. As we kind of establish the relationships going on in the home, specifically with AJ and his parents, uh, the motive that starts to come out is just disgruntled teenager. He's a 16-year-old kid whose entire world has just imploded on him. Prosecutors have a few theories. AJ was really struggling at Kincaid. He was basically failing, and that's not acceptable for Don and Antonio. What was going on? Why did you let your grades go south? Uh, I was a 16-year-old kid. I had just got a car, so school kind of took a back seat. All I was worried about was football. I had a car, so, like, kind of the freedom got to me. Because you were struggling at school at yes, Kincaid sir. after your sophomore year, your parents decided to pull you out. Yes, sir. Were you upset? I wasn't upset.